I wanted to cover this because we love Stefania Marisi. We always are talking about what's going on with Assange news, but this again is a story I haven't seen anybody talking about, which is that Stefania, who is the FOIA queen, I don't know if you are aware of who Stefania Marizzi is. Follow her on Twitter at S Marizzi, M A U R I Z I. She's an Italian journalist. All of a sudden, I hear myself echoed, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> what she learned in this new FOIA release that was published just the other day uh, on Tuesday was that exclusive FOIA documents expose how in July 2010, when WikiLeaks hadn't even published the secret files on the war in Afghanistan, a large-scale investigation on WikiLeaks had already been launched with the American authorities relying on spies, informants, and hidden microphones. This is in 2010. And yet, U.S. authorities had no certainty that the WikiLeaks journalist who had chatted with Chelsea Manning was actually Julian Assange. The WikiLeaks founder had denounced spying and surveillance tactics against WikiLeaks from the very beginning, and many media had dismissed those concerns as paranoia. Documents vindicate Assange. Once again, he was right. What are we talking about? Well, again, Stefania has been relentless in pursuing and filing FOIA requests with governments all over the world to learn about what they knew about Julian Assange and what, they're, what they were communicating about Julian Assange. And what she says here is that U.S. authorities considered detaining him in the US, at the U.S. border in July 2010 before WikiLeaks had revealed the secret documents on the war in Afghanistan and had enlisted at least one informer willing to wear a microphone to spy on conversations about WikiLeaks during a well-known hackers conference in New York to which Assange had been invited. Now it makes me think that the invite itself was a setup to try to nab him. Just 12 weeks after mm -hmm. WikiLeaks published a collateral murder video, the U.S. investigation into WikiLeaks involved several military units, including Army intelligence agents, agents with the Department of the Army, Army CID, um, the Computer Crimes Investigate, Investigative Unit, and Army CID and attorneys. But despite all these investigative resources, four months after the arrest of Chelsea Manning, U.S. authorities had yet to establish with certainty that the person who had talked to Manning under the nickname Nathaniel Frank was, in fact, Julian Assange. Huh. Revealing this information for the first time are exclusive documents we've been able to obtain after a lengthy battle under the FOIA, uh, under FOIA in the United States against the, the State Department. They reveal what happened behind the scenes in those months of 2010 when WikiLeaks published the classified U.S. documents for which Assange now risks 175 years in a maximum security prison. Wow. After publishing the collateral, the collateral murder video, WikiLeaks became an international phenomenon. On July 7, 2010, U.S. authorities wrote, quote, Army CID developed a plan to conduct surveillance in New York City in a mid July at in mid July at a large gathering of well known computer hackers, Army CID believes that the WikiLeaks case will be a topic of discussion, and have enlisted a cooperating individual, a CI, to assist in their investigation. Army CID anticipates that the founder of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, may attend the event, the conference. The large gathering in New York was and still is one of the most important hackers conferences in the U.S. That year, Hackers on Planet Earth, or HOPE, was to be held July 16th through 18th, a week before WikiLeaks published the Afghan war logs. This is, this is, I didn't know any of this stuff, right? Um, Chelsea Manning, who of course we know is the source who leaked the classified U.S. documents to WikiLeaks, had already been arrested on May 27, 2010, after confessing during a chat with Adrian Lamo, despite having never met him before, that it was she who had leaked these documents to WikiLeaks. The files included classified U.S. Army information and around 260,000 U.S. diplomatic cables. 
What better opportunity for the American authorities than to nab Assange at the HOPE conference? <laughs> Army CID may attempt to detain Assange at the New York-Canadian border if they get information about its arrival, FOIA documents read. However, Assange did not travel to the United States. American investigative journalist and computer security ex expert Jacob Applebaum gave a keynote address at HOPE on his behalf. Sounds like he may have known something was up. And not only that, he was a week away from publishing. Yep. He was head down, man. He was nowhere near being able to attend a conference like this. Despite the HOPE conference being a public event, FOIA documents reveal that the Army CID had a cooperating individual who has agreed to wear a microphone while attending the HOPE conference. It is reasonable to conclude that the microphone was presumably intended to spy on private conversations regarding WikiLeaks, considering the public talks and conversations held were accessible to everyone. Yeah, why wear a wire to a place that it's public keynotes? Obama gave his keynote, then flew to Europe, but upon his return to the U.S., was detained and interrogated at the airport. By the way, they do this to every independent journalist now. That is standard procedure. They detained um, Caleb Maupin, I believe, when he returned from the U.S., uh, from Russia after observing their elections. And I believe they did the same to Dan Kovalik. Um, although the U.S. authorities could rely on microphones, informants, and considerable resources, almost four months after Manning had been arrested, they were apparently not yet certain that Nathaniel Frank, with whom Manning had chatted before passing on the U.S. classified documents, was actually Julian Assange. They believed that they believed it, but they didn't know. There's a minority opinion that Frank could be a WikiLeaks associate. Okay, that's what a FOIA document dated in September 2010 says. The name of the WikiLeaks associate is redacted in the FOIA document, as are many other items of information. We will soon be initiating a legal battle to get those redactions removed. The U.S. authorities have obstructed the FOIA process. Yeah, I want to know who the rat is, who they thought, who they think that was going to wear a wire. The U.S. authorities have obstructed the FOIA process for years. In our FOIA litigation, we've been represented completely pro bono by two American lawyers, Alia Smith and Lauren Russell, with the Ballard Spar Law Firm. Well, we've been frustrated by the incredible amount of time it's taken for the Department of State to complete the processing on Maurizi's FOIA request, they told uh, FQ Extra. Even given the complications of reviewing co during COVID, the years of delay have been unacceptable. We are glad to have helped our client get the bulk of the requested records all the six years since she submitted her FOIA request and hope this matter can finally come to a close soon. Contacted by Il Faro Quotidiano, and asked to comment on these revelations, WikiLeaks editor Kirsten Hernafson replied, quote, it is worrying that Julian was in the U.S.'s crosshairs this early. It shows the early determination by the U.S. administration to stifle journalism when it suits them, unquote. Well, yeah. yeah this is the problem with, with the uh, plea deal, too, that has been talked about recently, because, like, I think we didn't we read somewhere that for those plea deals he has to come over here anyway to like do that. I did not read that, and but like I, him I was, being on U.S. soil, right? I, I I distinctly remember that like they couldn't do it over the phone or whatever, and that was an issue. You know, like, as you see in the chat, free Julian Assange. So journalism is not a crime. Yep, yeah. this man should be free, a hundred percent. Um.
Richard Medhurst wrote for Al Mayadeen. Um, so somebody decided they wanted to publish his article, and I really appreciate that. And this is an, an Assange article, and who better to write an Assange article than someone who's been in the courtroom for all of the hearings since 2020. So he publishes some of his photos and some other photos and the, a tweet about Cryptome from 20, from September of 2020 while he was covering the... I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry, you mean Cryptome? <laughs> Cryptome. Is that Melto, Meltome? <laughs> yeah, Marissa Tome. Um, speaking, of crypto, speaking of Cryptome... I did a little investing and yeah, a little Crypto looking May. into Crypto May. What happened to mm -hmm. them? And um, we we mutually followed each other yesterday on Twitter, which was kind of cool at Indie Media Today, which I thought was pretty uh, interesting. He's he asked really hard questions that I don't think a lot of people really want to ask, and that's another story for another day. But he's here for an important reason, and we're going to get to it. But Richie wrote an incredible article. And he also did this in, a, in about a 14 or 15 minute video and he can summarize it much better than I can with a lot of passion. But I want to go through this because there's so many important points and he kind of glazes over them and he, he goes at lightning speed and you got to keep up with Richie. And that's one of the things I love about him, but I want to take a little bit of a deeper dive. And what I love about this article is that this is really for an entry point for somebody who's never heard of the case. Where do you start? And I've been looking for an article kind of like this. I mean, I know there are good videos, Declassified UK, Juan Passarelli did a good one. There's a few good ones. But we haven't seen Focused a more recent Assange edition. Effectively. So this so that's what this is. So Julian Assange is an Australian journalist in the United Kingdom and the founder of WikiLeaks. He published documents that were given to him by a US soldier called Chelsea Manning, which showed that US war crimes were happening in Iraq, Afghanistan, and much more. The U.S. wants to extradite Assange from the U.K. to America and put him on trial for publishing these classified documents. They're threatening him with 175 years in prison. The reason this case makes is so serious is because it essentially makes journalism illegal. He says this in very simple, like, you know, explain it to me like I'm five terms. I love that. Mm -hmm. The United States claims Assange man, uh, asked Manning for classified documents mm -hmm. and that, that, that this is a crime. It is not. The U.S. alleges that Assange having classified documents in his possession and publishing them is a crime. It's not. Asking for classified documents, protecting sources, these are things that journalists do every single day all around the world. But because these files were so embarrassing to the United States and exposed the brutality of their war crimes, they are threatening Assange with almost two centuries in prison, and to do it, they're accusing him of being a spy and a hacker, charging him with 17 counts under the Espionage Act and with one count of conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. And this is the first page of the superseding indictment against him. His video shows all kinds of funky graphics and good stuff. I'm now hearing your headphones and your mic. But that's just probably to me. I don't think that everyone else hears that. The goal of this indictment is to make an example out of Assange, of course, and to make other journalists afraid to publish things that the public has a right to know. For sure. If extradited, Assange would be placed in the worst prison conditions imaginable, Special Administrative Measures, or SAMs, a strict regime of solitary confinement, no, co no contact with other prisoners allowed, and barely any contact with your family. Sams are internationally recognized as torture. Of course, Julian would be sent to the worst prison in America, ADX Florence, a su super maximum security facility in Colorado. I also want to add that he would be tried in a, the intelligence court in Virginia, and I believe he covers this later, but the intelligence court has a 98% conviction rate of those that are accused and that come before it. So it's almost a fait accompli that he would be convicted and sentenced to ADX Florence. <laughs> On January 4th, 2021, we rejoiced 
as British judge Vanessa Baritzer blocked Assange's extradition because U.S. prison conditions would be so oppressive in his current state as to drive him to suicide. Nevertheless, despite blocking the extradition on health grounds, she agreed with all the political and trumped-up charges. Richie attended all of Assange's court hearings and saw the smears against him debunked by dozens of expert witnesses. But the judge still chose to side with the U.S. He chose to essentially criminalize journalism, even drawing dangerous equivalencies between the U.S. Espionage Act and Britain's Official Secrets Act. That's very dangerous. After this, the U.S. went to the English High Court to appeal her ruling and won by providing empty promises that they would supposedly treat Assange well, even though the U.S. has a history of violating extradition assurances. We and Richie, Richie exposed this when he published classified documents from David Mendoza's extradition from Spain to the U.S., a case previously cited in court by Julian's lawyers. By the way, go to IndieMediaToday.com for the free Julian Assange from February 11th, we actually had that article embedded, so you don't have to go digging for it from Richie's article. <laughs> and he published that on Substack more than two years ago. I think we covered it through his art through his Substack article. We went through it in detail on this show more than two years ago. Yeah, we've been doing this that long. We're geezers, we're geezers, I say. Anyway. Love you, Richie. After the U.S. succeeded in overturning the lower court's ruling in December 2021, there was only one thing left, a signature from the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, who allowed the extradition to go ahead. So the above was everything that took place between 2020 and 2024, which now brings us to the latest okay, hearings at the Royal Courts of Justice in February, which we also covered on INN and on this in the left media or Indian INN channel um, last month, live outside the hearings at the Royal Courts of Justice, Richie was inside. He was one of the people giving speeches, and we actually have his speech cut, and it was part of something that we did, a bunch of things that we did. I know it was part of something you did on INN News, right, right, Reef? Pretty sure. He's I might have missed Richie's, but I think somebody grabbed it. So, I know he grabbed it. Somebody did something with it. So on the first Christy point, did it, I think. Was it Legion? Yeah, it might have been Chris Legion. Check him out. No labels podcast. If you chat, if you go to the um, INN Substack, and the INN Substack link is here. I'm going to drop that right here. Um, every week, I publish an update with all of the live streams and appearances by all the members. Uh, including that one, which is a live stream that Chris and Big Bad Crab did together Friday morning. Um, so check that out. But anyway, so point one is that they're going to appeal the ruling for, of the lower court, and that's what the U.S. is trying to do. Assange's lawyers are arguing that the judge was correct to block the extradition on health grounds, but she was wrong to agree with all the political charges. Why? Because they're saying it very plainly. This case is undemocratic. It criminalizes journalism, and it doesn't take into account the fact that the documents Assange posed exposed enormous U.S. war crimes that the public had a right to know about. And so he's just using the collateral murder video, right, which we've shown, but we don't want to get taken down from, <clears throat> um, from YouTube from showing collateral murder. Another claim made by the U.S. is that Assange harmed informants by publishing unredacted cables, but ironically, this was proven false by the U.S.'s own military when they court Mar Marshal Chelsea Manning, who was again the soldier that gave the files to Assange, who actually did the hacking, who actually stole the material and leaked it to WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks only published the classified material that was delivered to them. The U.S. military couldn't find a single example of anyone having been harmed by the disclosures. And again, there's a link there to a Guardian article from 2013 at the sentencing hearing, which I believe Kevin Gostola was actually at. Yeah. The assertion by the U.S. 
Julian Assange simply published all these documents without censoring or redacting names also simply is not true. Richie himself listened to many journalists tell the court how they spent countless hours meticulously redacting names with, with Assange. Yeah. His, yeah. <clears throat> His lawyers also argue that the judge in the lower court failed to undertake a balancing act. She blindly accepted the U.S.'s premise that the lives of, of informants who weren't harmed are more important than the people killed and tortured by the U.S. That the, that the, the, the leaks revealed, because there were literally 15,000 Iraqis buried in a mass grave that nobody knew about that were confirmed by WikiLeaks, for example, that were in the Iraq war logs. This is tantamount to saying the United States should be allowed to continue committing these war crimes in secret, not just the United States, but the people we were talking about before, too. And that somehow it's okay for them to butcher people in Iraq and Afghanistan and the public have no right to know. That's exactly, unfortunately, what the U.S. wants people to believe. But even if what the United States is saying were true, these documents were not published first by Assange. John Young, the owner of a website called Cryptome.org. Go ahead. Cryptome. Testified to the court that he was the one who published the documents first, and the United States never prosecuted him nor asked him to take them down. Wow. Yeah, how about that? Most people don't don't even know about this. You hear about this? You hear about this? We need that, Jimmy Volmer. You hear about this? Once. This demonstrates that the whole case against Assange is selective, political, and has nothing to do with the law. Hmm. And again, this is a tweet from September 24th, 2020, where this man every single day went into the Old Bailey, listened to the hearing, ran to his hotel room, live streamed, and dumped his thoughts onto a live stream meticulously with his notes. It was, oh, wow, it was outstanding. And you can go back and watch those live streams, and it's still just an incredible piece of journalism, honestly. Um, so that's the John Young telling the old Bailey that he published the unredacted cables first. The U.S. government never prosecuted him. So that's the screenshot with date and timestamp. Right. It's important to remember that Julian Assange is a journalist and a publisher. He is not a government employee nor a soldier who has signed a government contract or a contract that binds him to government secrecy. He is under no obligation to be quiet. Julian Assange isn't even free from, isn't even from the United States. He isn't free from the United States either. And has never lived or worked there. He doesn't owe the United States anything. However, the prospect of the United States, a foreign government, imposing its laws on British soil, British soil to snatch a foreign journalist should scare anyone who's serious about press freedoms, anti-imperialism, and a British judi judiciary free of U.S. influence. Yes, the extraterritorialization oof, I got through without stumbling, of U.S. laws has uh -huh. been a hallmark of the U.S. war on terror. <clears throat> war on terror. The hate is for our freedom. The Espionage Act that Assange is being charged under was created during World War I in 1917. It has always been used as a political tool against dissidents such as Eugene Debs or whistleblowers like Daniel Ellsberg and Edward Snowden, who exposed true, the true extent of the U.S. war in Vietnam and NSA mass surveillance. Snowden, though, was a government employee, contractor. Nah, nah. He did sign something, as did Daniel Hale. Thank God he's out. Welcome home, Daniel Hale. If you're charged under the, es under the Espionage Act, you're also forbidden from arguing a public interest defense. This means that even if you expose colossal government crimes, you still go to prison. Again, it's shoot the messenger. Yeah. 
The Home Secretary, of course, was wrong to allow the extradition is point number two, that this constitutes the second point of Assange's appeal, which is that it's illegal in Britain to extradite someone to another country knowing that they could face the death penalty. This clearly came out during yes. the, the, the Royal Courts of Justice appeal hearing because they straight up asked if the Home Secretary, who has the final say in extraditions, is aware of such a risk, they're compelled to bar the extradition. And it's inconceivable. Right? Go ahead. I, you have that one, right? I, it, it takes me a second to get that one, but okay. yeah, somewhere. It is inconceivable uh, that Pretty Patel, uh, that one, that Pretty Patel, conceivable. right, was, she's the Home Secretary, that she, it's inconceivable that he, that she was aware of who Julian Assange is and the likelihood that he would be killed in the United States. Once in U.S. jurisdiction, the U.S. could pile on additional charges or simply execute him as espionage is a capital offense. So they would have to act. Thank you. Even without a specific death sentence at 52 years old, even a 30 year bid is akin to a death sentence. And the hollow assurances given by the United States do not preclude the death penalty. And on top of that, the Home Secretary didn't even bother asking for assurances that would. So. How could the Home Secretary agree to send Assange to a foreign country that was so that so clearly wants to see him dead? Well, we know that Mike Pompeo, Pompeo, former Secretary of State, former Kansas Senator, who was then back then at that point head of the CIA and then President Donald Trump launched this legal case against Julian Assange. In the past, Donald Trump had called for Assange to be given the death penalty, which is insane. While Pompeo mm -hmm. proclaimed Assange had no First Amendment rights or any constitutional rights, which, wait a minute, if you're going to try him under U.S. law, even though he's not really technically subject to it, you're also not going to extend him the rights uh, pro provided under U.S. law? How the... Okay. After WikiLeaks published a trove of CIA documents dubbed the Vault 7 Leaks, uh, Mike Pompeo declared war on WikiLeaks by publicly labeling it a non-hostile, non-state hostile intelligence service. But Don't we believe be we believe that it's actually a step further, and they actually non-state hostile intelligence service actually has other connotations, and that actually invokes the word terrorism, which allows them to do a lot more. Yeah. All these political denunciations of WikiLeaks and Assange were then followed up with threats against him and his family. As we heard in court in 2020 from protected witnesses, the CIA had drawn up plans to potentially kidnap or assassinate Ju Julian. Now, at that point, we didn't even know who his wife and child were. They were still anonymous, I believe, in September of 2020. That had not come out yet. Or it had just come out, maybe during the February trial. The United States is accusing Julian Assange of espionage. Mm -hmm. But normally, this is where the case should be thrown out, because espionage is considered a textbook political offense. And it is forbidden to extradite yeah. someone for a political offense under the U.S.-U.K. Extradition Tr Treaty, Article 4. So you've got that he... Yeah, which they're that, just throwing out the window. They're throwing it all out the window. Yeah. Halo Benson, at these recent hearings, when asked about more charges that could lead to him being given the death penalty, the American attorneys would not give assurances that that would not happen. Because they can't. A, they're not always going to be the lead attorneys on the case. So they can't give those kinds of assurances, nor can the United States. Because if they did, they would be lying. We know this. Don't lie. So, Max RJ says you can't publish the truth unless it's a lie. That is also, sadly, unfortunately, correct, at least in corporate media. Gamer, go see the White House counselor, as Kit likes to say. Oh, cookies too? Oh, we're going to have a long line at the White House counselor's office. Oh, boy. Okay, you all were checking out MMH. Mastermind Hour, we love him, so it's okay. All right, you're forgiven for this moment. Say 
Say three hey ladies and we're good. No, I'm just fucking around. <laughs> anyway. Or nobody Hillary. cares. Yeah, yeah, nobody cares. That's right. So, again, Article 4 automatically deems that any espionage case is instantly political and should be thrown out based upon the extradition treaty, but yet they're ignoring that too. They're just ignoring all the rules. And people get really mad when you remind them that they're ignoring all their rules. They go, whoa, but he should be in prison, but he should be. No, he shouldn't be. Customary extradition treaties have always forbidden extradition for political offenses such as espionage and treason. And this line of defense has been used before in court to successfully block extraditions. And there is Article 4 laid out in all its glory. I love when Richie writes. Again, he writes at a level that everyone can really understand this. Free Julian Assange. That's absolutely right. Thank you. Bad cookies. Here's where the problem arises. Here's where it arises. As if we hadn't stumbled upon like six. Right. Here's your problem. The Extradition Act, which is the implementation of the U.S.-U.K. Treaty inside British law, is missing this section. This is likely due to the fact that it was passed at the height of the War on Terror in 2003, giving the Americans carte blanche to snatch people, drag them to the U.S., and throw them in dungeons. Yes, dungeons. We sent them to the yes, dungeons. Like the Tower of London. Yes. At the time of its passage, many criticized it, the extradition treaty as being extremely one-sided in favor of the United States because Tony Blair was our bitch. But there is that Extradition Act of 2003. Very simple. No matter how you look at Assange's case, it is unfair and illegal. Yes, it is. The United States wants to prosecute Julian Assange under U.S. law, but at the same time deny him any protections under U.S. law, such as free speech. If Assange has no First Amendment rights as a foreign national, then how can he be punished as a foreign national who is not even in the U.S.? This is such a flagrant yeah. double. Well, that's why they're dying to bring him here, and they want to get him on U.S. soil uh -huh. so they can claim that now he is here. Not by his own accord, yeah. of course. He would never come here. Again, mm -hmm. ever. This is such a flagrant double standard and selective application of the law. Well... Yeah. Shah. Shah. Um, the European Convention on Human Rights is incorporated into British law through the Human Rights Act. Upon examination, it is clear that Julian's rights are being flagrantly violated by Belmarsh Prison themselves. He's obviously yeah. been ill-treated. He wasn't even well enough to attend his own appeal hearing via Zoom. Because they didn't want people to see how sickly he was, and they claimed that he had broken ribs from coughing too hard. Come on. Yeah, well, ha what? Come on, Stop. man. You violated the law. Here's another one that Article 5 protects one from arbitrary detention. So, how long have they been keeping him? Because this is a political case, it would be a violation of the extradition treaty to send him to America. Therefore, he has no reason to be in prison right now, and therefore is being arbitrarily detained in violation of his Article 5 rights, held without charge in the UK. Jesus. We know that the U.S. spied on Assange's conversations with his lawyers when he was inside the Ecuadorian embassy, stole his electronic devices, and collected medical and legal records. We know this. Because in 2020, I sat in court with Fidel Narvaez, the former consul to the Ecuadorian embassy in London, and we listened to the submissions of two protected witnesses who confirmed that they had spied on Assange. They worked for a company called UC Global because the security company they worked for, again, wow, UC Global, I just said that, had been contracted by the CIA to do so. Also by Sheldon Adelson. It may not have been the CIA. We think it was the CIA. We're pretty sure it was CIA. If not, it might have been Adelson, Mossad. There's a lot of questions as to who actually hired them. But, yes, they're eventually tied back to the CIA. 
Uh, they also discussed plans to potentially kidnap and poison Julian Assange and to harvest DNA from his baby, or at least from his baby's diaper. The spy on someone... Why? Why? Well, to confirm that he actually... Him? No, they wanted to confirm that he had actually fathered those children. Uh, and according sure. to the DNA records, he had. So to spy on someone's privileged conversations with their lawyers... To use tainted evidence in court is scandalous beyond words, uh, to, co to quote it in Richie's vernacular, and violates the fundamentals of due process in any jurisdiction. We need, you know what we need? We need Pete and Baz to do this one. Any judge would have thrown this case out from day one. Well, any judge that actually didn't have to listen to their bosses who are part of the intelligence apparatus that all know that this is all trumped up and revenge. We also know that Assange will not get a fair trial in America because the jury will be selected from a pool of people who work for the CIA, NSA, or have friends, working, and family who work in the intelligence community. These are the very same people whose crimes Julian Assange exposed. Sure, the court in Virginia that issued the charges would hold this trial is used specifically for this reason, because the jury is biased and the government knows it can't lose. It's already 100% guaranteed that he will get convicted and go to ADX floor and Supermax. I mentioned that earlier. Again, like I said, this is a thorough, comprehensive, I'll explain it to me like I'm five kind of story here. Additionally, and anyone would turn around and say, and how are they still holding this guy? Well, because nobody's stopping him. Additionally, the U.S. could use secret evidence against Julian Assange that he wouldn't even be allowed to view due to it being classified during the court hearing. You've got to be shitting me. Article 7 protects one from being published retroactively. The case against Julian Assange is unprecedented. No publisher in America has ever been prosecuted, let alone convicted for publishing classified documents. This case criminalizes journalism and therefore also violates Article 10, which guarantees freedom of expression. They're, they're not doing so great with violating articles here. So, Assange's lawyers went over the ECHR repeatedly because it's incorporated again into British law, meaning that the court is obliged to follow it. But they're not anyway. Not only that, but this was their way of hinting to the judges that if you don't give us permission to appeal, we will go to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, and that court will look upon your decision unfavorably. Do you want to be overturned? Because you're going to be. So, Assange's lawyer, Mark Summers, you see Mark Summers, argued very clearly that the Strasbourg court will see that A, these war crimes were real, B, they were happening on the ground at the time, and C, by publishing these documents, Assange altered the United States' behavior. The helicopter massacres, like in the collateral murder video, stopped, and the Iraq war came to an end. Literally. Didn't the guy say that if wars could be started by lies, then peace could be started by the truth? Yes, I do believe that was Julian Assange's quote. Assange's team put together a very compelling defense during this week's hearing. As they went back to the 2021 ruling, we heard many of the same arguments presented at the Old Bailey in 2020. And that is a good thing, because they're crucial points that cut to the core of the issue. Journalism is not a crime. The crimes committed by the United States are far greater than any alleged harm to informants. And the public has a fundamental right to know. That's right. That's right, bad cookies. WikiLeaks has never had to write a retraction. Washington Post wrote four of them just last week. It was refreshing to see the high court justices, Johnson and Sharp, actually express interest in what was being said and asking pertinent questions as opposed to the previous judges thus far who were either silent, indifferent, or hostile to Assange. These are the, the interjections of the High Court justices that stuck out most to him last week. Again, 
These are the thoughts and words of Richard Medhurst, journalist who was in the courtroom inside the Royal Courts of, Ju of Justice in London uh, last month for the appeal hearings. Justice Johnson said that, quote, if a journalist in this country was aware of significant crimes by a government intelligence agency and asked an employee there for information, would this be a prosecutable offense? Matt Kennard certainly was interested in that question, publisher for Declassified UK, as was Mark Curtis. Justice Johnson also asked that once someone is in U.S. jurisdiction, is there anything preventing the U.S. from piling on new charges and handling and handing the, down a, gov a death penalty? The government lawyer replies that there is essentially nothing to stop the U.S. from doing this. Again, as Halo Benson pointed out earlier tonight, confirming our worst fear that yeah. he could be killed once in America. Justice Johnson also asked Dobbin, if there's any evidence to support the idea that foreign nationals are given equal rights or treatment to U.S. citizens, and she says no. Once again, the prosecution openly confirms that he will be treated unfairly, that he'll get hit with all nasty parts of U.S. law, and he'll get none of the basic rights like free speech. Isn't that wonderful? Justice Sharp also asks yep. Mark QC Mark Summers, are the names mentioned in the WikiLeaks publications the people who participated in war crimes and torture? Yes, that is exactly what these people were engaged in and supporting. While all this okay. plays out in court, Assange, of course, is slowly dying in prison. Same judge, Baritzer, that blocked Assange's extradition because his precarious health position pr condition presided over his bail hearing two days later on January 6, 2021. Anything else happened that day? I don't remember. Richard also attended like that, that hearing. Yeah, but something else in the United States happened on that day, too. I was live streaming that afternoon. Mm. The judge mm. obviously appreciated that his health was bad enough to bar extradition, yet she refused to let him out on bail despite the strong guarantees put forward and the risk that his health would worsen in prison, which it did. Now, remember why he was put in prison in the first place was, again, I believe, for a bail violation. So... That is their justification for not issuing bail. A few months later, during a hearing in October 2021, Richard could barely recognize Julian, and that's the last time we saw him. We then learned from his wife, Stella, that he'd suffered a mini-stroke during the hearing. Julian was put in Belmarsh prison on purpose by the security state. Belmarsh is, of course, known as Britain's Guantanamo Bay, the worst prison in England, and notorious for housing violent criminals and terrorists. Terrorists! It is no place for journalists convicted of bail infractions or held on remand pending extradition. There's simply no reason for him to be in prison, let alone a Category A maximum security prison locked up 23 hours a day, by the way, with all communications to the outside world removed. It's important to note that before being taken to Belmarsh, Assange was forced to go to the Ecuadorian embassy in London and seek political asylum. He stayed in what is a tiny apartment for seven years out of fear that the United States would try to grab him and take him to America the moment he set foot outside. And unfortunately, he was right. The motherfuckers are paranoid because the motherfuckers are right. Because of his prolonged prosecution, persecution and prosecution, his health has gradually declined. He's in poor physical and mental shape and has been deprived of a normal family life. The times I saw him in court, he looked very unwell. Again, quoting Richard Medhurst, journalist who wrote this article. The United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention ruled that this confinement amounts to arbitrary detention. Go figure. Many UN experts, doctors, lawyers, and NGOs all agree that Assange's human rights have been violated, and the conditions he was put in, both inside the embassy and then in Belmarsh, amount to torture. And the U.S. is fucking thrilled. The aim of the United yeah. States is to kill Julian <laughs> Assange, either in America or slowly in an English prison, making him jump from one court to the next. The process is the punishment. And that again is a 
uh, Sydney Morning Herald article um, from 2012, where he predicts that this is what they're going to do to him. Why? Because he exposed the brutality of the U.S. wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as if we didn't know. He exposed their kidnapping, their rendition and torture programs, their abuse of Guantanamo Bay prisoners, and the strong arming of their own allies to protect CIA torturers. Unfortunately, this is how the U.S. and Britain treat journalists. The corporate outlets, main corporate owned and mainstream media, that I hate to say that term, such as the New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, and Der Spiegel, who profited immensely from working with media partners as media partners with WikiLeaks and publishing Assange's explosive materials, could have launched dozens of campaigns and public appeals by now to secure his freedom, but have done fuck all nothing. This entire case is so damning to the political and media establishment that it's being conducted like a secret trial in a kangaroo court. Because if it came out, the public would never stand for it. Again, Richie has attended yeah. all the hearings in this case mm -hmm. and has seen how unnecessarily difficult they make it for journalists to get access and for NGOs and politicians to observe the case. The proceedings have been plagued since the start with technical difficulties making it impossible for people to hear or see anything if they're attending remotely or just next door in an overflow room. By the way, I want to make note, Kathy Vogan sent me a message, and God, what a privilege it is to have Kathy Vogan actually correct the record in your DMs. There's one simple you, sugar Thank hack you. anyone can do but to it was balance Muhammad glucose levels that could almost not, overnight. Uh, that, that has a problem with his hand and could not write. I said last week that it was Stefania Marizzi that reported that they didn't yep. give them a place to write, but it was actually technically, it was, it was Mohamed El Masi who was reporting for the dissenter. I, I at and, least knew it wasn't Stefania. And then they removed his credentials for day two completely and blocked him from being able to enter the yeah. building, which is fucked yeah, up. Yeah, and put in, and put in a mainstream asshole instead. Yep. So. So. Yep. Richie says he cannot say how, how, the, how, how the high court will rule, but if Assange is not afforded permission to appeal, his lawyers can temporarily block the U.S. from putting him on a plane with a Rule 39 order, then take his case to the European Court of Human Rights. That's okay. assuming they don't just throw him on a plane anyway, in the middle of the night. Yeah. This again, of course, however, can take years to pan out, all the while Assange's life hangs in the balance as the U.K., keeps him locked up in a maximum security prison at the behest of the CIA and the U.S. government. Julian is the most famous we political... We sit out here and wait a long periodically time. Right? Julian Assange is the most famous political prisoner in the world, but time is running out. This case is, without question, the biggest attack on free speech and journalism... Richard is chronicling these events as a witness to warn current and future generations that if we do nothing, journalism will die. And he is being censored and deplatformed and de not deplatformed, but demonetized on YouTube. He's had his PayPal screwed yeah. with. He's had his Cash App screwed with. Support him. He's on Rumble, which I believe then dumps his money into PayPal. So I don't know how you do that there. He's on Rockfin. You can support him there. You can get him crypto. He has a GoFundMe as well. Amazingly enough, they haven't screwed with him over there. Um, but he's uh, he's one of my faves, and he's you know indie media award honoree. Uh, again, support independent media. Support indie. Thank you. Support INN. We added a couple of names because last week we got a couple of Kofi's and donor donations. That actually should say Sean Miller. I mistyped that there. And Sean Miller was already on the list before, but thank you again, Sean, for your generous donation the other night. Um, Colin Care Bear, of course. I noticed Care Bear's given a lot, but he was never on the list. You know what? Screw it. INN personnel, if you if you donate, you'll get the list too. So thank you, and I love you. I love you, Care Bear. So that's that. Um, chat, chat, chat. We got everybody that's not chat GPT, that's chat INN. Ooh, let's do that. Chat INN. So, um, oh, cookies, don't say that. Don't put them in the same edge cell. 
Epstein died died in. Ugh. And yes, if he comes here, it's very likely they, that they will charge him for Vault 7 and likely put death penalty charges on him. This one I, I love, and I love this woman, and she's just one of my favorite people. And I can tell you now, she's getting an Indie Media Award this year. Laura Kay, Normal Island News. Everybody needs a little bit of humor, a little bit of snark, and a little bit of sarcasm in their life. And I am, I, I love sarcasm. So Laura, she she's brilliant. She's British. She writes probably three to four pieces a week. And every single one of them is just punches you right in the face it but it's funny mm -hmm. it's funny and you're gonna see this one written about our friend julian uh julian you know what before we do that julian. let's just put up the donate links one more time now that more people are here <laughs> welcome to everyone and thank you to everyone that does that has already contributed donated subscribed we've got cash app we've got rumble we've got substack we got patreon we also have kofi you can see the qr code up there now all right, you can just scan yep. that QR code with your phone and it, you can pay via PayPal or credit card and it goes right to our PayPal. They didn't even take a fee. Kofi's really nice. We like those guys. So <laughs> Laura's article starts and I, I literally, you know, look, uh, she has me giggling before I even start reading the article. Man could be extradited to the U.S. for telling the truth. He set a disturbing precedent. Yes. So I like to put this in reader mode. It's a little easier to see. All right. A man could be extradited to America due to disturbing allegations that he attempted to tell the truth while doing journalism. A shiver just went down my spine as I typed those words. Some of us attended journalist school for years just so we could ignore everything we were taught and repeat the propaganda of our leaders to enrich ourselves. Then some do-gooder made a website that attempted to upend all that by revealing the undeniable truth about things we wanted to keep secret. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love her. Okay, thankfully, the most principled factions in U.S. politics, Hillary Clinton supporters and people with Confederate flags who get aroused by AR-15s, are disgusted with the man who told the truth and want him to be locked up for 175 years in a supermax prison. Personally, I would Don't feed him... Shame. Personally, she would feed him to the rednecks. <laughs> Normal Island no. News, of course, is a reader-supported publication, so let's uh, hook her up. The man who told the truth is called Julian Assange, and his highly informative website is called WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks! That's another one you've got to get from Trump. If you're a sensible person, yep. you should avoid WikiLeaks under all circumstances because it would help you stay informed about your leaders rather than just voting for one of the two identical teams to save your country from the other identical team who are the most terrible people ever, apart from the people who don't play the team sport. Obviously, you should know that your entire system is based on lies and corruption because you're too stupid to process all that, and it would only upset you. Therefore, you should get irrationally angry at the man who tried to upset you with the truth. He's to blame for all the bad things that are happening in the two best countries ever, Britain and America. America it's is des- <laughs> well, Yes, ever. America is desperate to get yeah, its hands on Assange so the Clinton Foundation can torture him to death for national security reasons and make up for the time Hillary failed to take him out with a drone strike. <laughs> However, if the enormously popular 106-year-old Joe Biden somehow loses the next election, Jared Kushner and Marjorie Taylor Greene will drown Assange in the swamp that Donald Trump pretended to drain last time he was president. Funny she says MTG because MTG is actually advocated to free Julian but I think once Trump is president, you'll hear her shut up very quickly about that. 
If you're getting a bit lost because you're not sure where America is or why the hell we always do do as it tells us to, I can confirm that America is a is that country across the Atlantic that is sometimes called Angry Canada because it won't stop killing brown people in the name of self-defense. Holy shit. <laughs> the country that let its schools become shooting ranges won't give people cancer care unless they can raise enough money on GoFundMe cares enormously about the safety and security of its people. This is why it's got a bomb budget so big it gives surplus bombs to its little brother called Israel. As you can see, America is the most sensible country in the world, and we should definitely be sending journalists Censored? who... No, sensi oh, sensible. Sensible. And we should definitely Sensi be sending sens journalists sensible. who don't do as they're told there. I'm so glad a shameless propagandist who would never bother to inform you because it means I would never become a target of the state and live in a very nice life, thank you. Uh, only honest, honest journalists become targets. So Assange is a hate figure in America because he tricked the few Americans who pay attention into not voting for Hillary Clinton in 2016 by publishing factual information about him. Yes, yeah. factual information about her and the Podesta leaks. <clears throat> but also about the State Department cables and about the Iraq war logs and about the Afghanistan war logs. It was not, and he's not even being tried for the Podesta leaks. He's being tried for the Afghan and Iraq war logs. This enabled 17 Americans to make informed decisions based on the facts, and they refused to vote for the person whose values are the opposite of their own. Those 17 Americans, yeah. of course, who pay attention definitely handed the election to Donald Trump even though they were never going to vote for Hillary and didn't vote for Trump. This was all part of Assange's plan, and Trump was so grateful he dredged up an archaic law that hadn't been used in a hundred years to prosecute Assange. As you can see, the logic of Hillary supporters is infallible, and they're totally right to blame the 17 people who didn't understand it was her turn. In America... You're supposed to choose one side, stick to that side forever, allow the worst people imaginable to be entitled to your vote, no matter how genocidal they are, and scream at people who vote for the other genocidal person on social media. If you don't... Russian scum! Well, yes, he's one of them, and if you don't, it's because you don't love freedom, of course. Freedom. Amer America, America has the most sophisticated electoral America. system on Earth, and this is why it calls itself the land of the free even though no one else does. <laughs> mm -hmm. Obviously, the yep. UK is trying its utmost to follow in the footsteps of the US, and this means WikiLeaks was not going to let our wonderful corrupt, non-corrupt politicians off the hook. It was WikiLeaks that revealed Rishi Sunak is a, re is a robot that uses ChatGPT as its operating system, which is why it can make impressively human-like public speeches. Wes Streeting is a soulless career politician who was somehow cloned from the toenail clippings of David Cameron, even though toenails don't mm. contain DNA. Sir Keir Starmer. Who are these people? Yes. Oh, we got Ooh. a Kofi. We, we, we got a we, Kofi. Yeah. Look at that. All right. New Keir Starmer. Kate. Appreciate you, Kate. Thank you. Keir Starmer is not responsible for his own U-turns and is bullied into them by corporate donors who give him lots of money and, of course, Liz Truss Lettuce Head, is an idiot who became Prime Minister when she accidentally walked through the wrong door and couldn't find her way out of the building. The Tories were so desperate for a leader, they, they saw Liz holding a telephone upside down and realized her skill set exceeded that of all the other candidates. And on top of all these shocking revelations, Assange revealed that politicians in Britain and America are really fond of things like mass surveillance, torture, and war crimes. Yep. Sadly, some, pol some members of the public don't understand that those things are only bad when other countries do them, especially if they have the wrong religion or skin color. God. Definitely. <laughs> when our politicians violate human rights and, and line their own pockets, it's totally fine. And it's only the people who expose those non-crimes who have committed a crime. This is because we are civilized countries that respect the rule of law. And the most corrupt people imaginable make our laws. I love her so much. I mean, I I, I wish I could Brian write Marrier. like that. I, you know what? I I made a post about two weeks ago <laughs> that said if I wasn't already married, yeah. I would 
I, I, I'd be proposing to this woman. She's phenomenal. And she gets a ton of love and restacks and 58 comments. And everyone, yeah, this is one of your best. Her and Caitlin Johnstone demonstrated beyond question that 1984 was not a work of fiction, but prediction. The world is truly in danger, and the USA is the monster the in charge. Poet, and they didn't know it. Seriously. I mean, just mwah, poetry. Absolutely. Because I yep. can't just do one Assange story. There's so much Assange news. Like, seriously? Oh, my God. Now, so first of all, we covered that the two days in front of the Royal Courts of London, the Royal Courts of Justice in London. Reef manned the board for almost the entire time for two days, 19 hours worth of live stream coverage. We supplemented that with clips of Assange-related stuff from all the different INN shows. And... It was it was really a, a, an honor to be involved and included in in Juan Passarelli's footage. There were some great speeches, yep. and we're we're hoping that he's freed. And you know we're waiting on a decision which could come any day. Um, what I wanted to bring up, and this was from Joe Loria and Kathy over at Consortium News sent me a, a message tonight that they stitched together two days worth of conversation that they had with all the reporters that were there from. Matt Kennard, to Richard Medhurst, to um, Chris Hedges, Joe Loria, and several others. And they did like this big roundtable sit down over two days, and they stitched that all into a video. So check that out over at Consortium News. This is a Consortium News article that Joe wrote up. And a lot of this you've probably seen already from other people's coverage. However, he did make some point that I wanted to, um, that I wanted to, to bring up here. And he said that accredited journalists anywhere in the world were given remote access to cover both Assange's September 2020 extradition hearing and the 2021 U.S. appeal hearing at the High Court. This is how Consortium covered those two appearances. But this time, if you weren't in England or Wales, or other words, in other words, within the High Court's jurisdiction, you couldn't cover the hearing. That shut out reporters yeah. in Australia and the U.S. who have a special interest in the case. Fortunately, Consortium had long planned to be in London for the hearing and were there in person. He said, my hotel was just three blocks from the Royal Courts of Justice, a five-minute walk away where the Strand turns into Fleet Street. As I approached, Jeremy Cor Corbyn was addressing the crowd. Guess what? We were already live at that point as he approached during Corbyn's speech. I believe I actually went to bed during that speech. Yep. And Reef took over for me. It was 3 3.45 in the morning here that night. Nearly a thousand Assange supporters flooded the street, causing a double wall of yellow vested cops to open a path into and out of the court. It was like a corridor. Now we also covered, and I know that you had Halo on and Matt O'Brien was on with um Misty on TNT radio last week talking about how. There's no smaller courtroom in the Royal Courts of Justice, and that's where they packed everyone into. Stefania Marici even yep. reported that she couldn't type, and she's got this thing she can't write. She's got a disability, and they didn't give her a table to put her laptop on, and there weren't enough seats. I don't know if that was her. I don't know if that was her or someone else, but one was of those it someone guys else? It was somebody. That problem. Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So Joe says that he was in the last batch admitted with no apparent seats left in a wood panel courtroom, which is seven rows of 14 seats each. At the end of the row where I stood sat Claire Daly. God bless her. Okay. Um, and she tried to squeeze into her left to make room for me, but it wasn't even possible. And you know that Claire Daly is like skinny as a rail. 
right? Yeah. And tiny. I was then pointed to a seat at the end of a long wooden table directly below the barrister's lecterns immediately in front of the clerks where Justice Jeremy Johnson and Dame Victoria Sharp perched above looking down their noses at us a mere five meters away. It was very tight and he got pushed right to the front. So we were seated. We were so near to the barristers behind us that on the second day, a flustered Claire Dobbin KC for the prosecution fumbled her papers after being asked a question from the bench and in the process knocked over a glass of water that dribbled down the back of Chris Hedges, who sat next to me. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> Yeah. This whole thing was crazy. Like, he tells a story about how he's wearing a shirt inside out, and they actually made him. It said, I'm with WikiLeaks. He's like, I turned it inside out and went into the courthouse Wednesday morning, wearing it under a green jacket. However, in the afternoon, for some reason, I took off the green jacket. And the security guard wanted to know what was on my shirt inside out. I lifted it up, and, and he saw the writing, and he, that's why I turned it inside out. That's protest material. They almost tried to stop him, so he said, I ripped the shirt off and threw it on the table, and for a few seconds, I was totally naked from the waist up in the middle of the Great Hall of the Royal Courts of Justice in the Strand in <laughs> London. I love you, Joe Loria. I grabbed my green jacket, buttoned it up to oh, my yeah. neck. So good. So what he's saying here, also, Fleet Street. This is what's important. The Royal yeah. Courts of Justice Strand on the eastern end of the Strand, a major thoroughfare that begins at Trafalgar Square and runs into the city of London. Now, it gives you like a whole lesson here about Fleet Street, which is basically like the reporter's hub, the journalist's hub that used to be downtown central London. All right, 1702. Yeah. This goes way, way back. The repeal of a duty on paper in 1861 led to an explosion of national titles and nearly all yeah, of them published on Fleet Street. However, by 1900, there were dozens of publications located there. It became synonymous with journalism, and then came Rupert Murdoch. In 86, he moved the Times and the Sun out of the street to Wapping to break the print union. It led to violent clashes, but Murdoch succeeded in destroying Fleet Street as the nucleus of the press. Right, basically, this is where everyone used to kind of come together, and they'd share stories and share ideas, and... It was a bit of a boys club for sure, but a lot more stuff was being covered in his mind better. Newspaper culture nur nurtured in the pubs, in the neighboring newsrooms, and in the courthouse down the street was broken up. The press was on its way to decline, if not ruin, because it was one of society's estates. They wanted to destroy the fourth estate. Yeah. New York City had its own printer's row, and what he's effectively saying is, we need to bring like a Fleet Street type of environment back. Where is it? While there have been sporadic intellectual acknowledgments of the threat to press freedom that the prosecution pro opposes, such as occasional editorials and the, and the joint letter sent to the Biden admin or DOJ asking to drop the case, there's no passion among elected officials to defend Assange. There's nothing resembling the newspaper campaigns of the days when reporters from competing newspapers bumped into each other on Fleet Street. He said, this is what we've attempted to do with our, uh, uh, you know, with our um, re limited resources at Consortium News, an old-fashioned, actually reported newspaper campaign to write a great injustice. And he's saying that there needs to be a place where all independent media, a space, a square, comes together and kind of shares ideas and stories and kicks stuff back and forth, debunks each other, and makes their stories better, stickier, and more truthful, not... Stickier? <laughs> yes, stickier. Ew. By the way, Consortium News Ew. and Joe Loria, of course, Indie Media Award on Rees. That's to the best. So, um, again... Please, if you can, support, donate. Those are the links to do so down there in the corner. Those are the people who have already helped out and supported. Thank you to Kate and to Anna Mayers, whose names were already up there, I believe. If not, they will already. They will definitely be. And Anna definitely was. Pretty sure Kate was too, but um, we'll get her up there. Oh, God. No, Himbo. We're not doing a show called Sticky Stories. Ew. Gross. No. Okay. 
<laughs> Who are these people? Stella. She got. She got stood up. Um. So. Australian Prime Minister Albanese refuses to meet with Assange's wife. So this is from WSWS. Um, Oscar Greenfeld over there. Um, in a gratuitous display of contempt, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese yesterday refused to, which would be a couple of days ago now, refused to meet with Stella Assange, the wife of Julian Assange, Australia's most prominent political prisoner. The snub came even as Stella was inside the federal parliament having traveled to the country to campaign for her husband's freedom. Asked by independent MP Andrew uh, Wilkie why he would not meet with Mrs. Assange, Albanese brushed aside the question declaring, who I meet with is determined by the priorities that my office has. Which means, okay. what again? <laughs> like, I'm going to do what I want. That's what that sounds like. Uh, uh Press freedom, not an issue for you. Like, no, yes, you don't, not an issue because you don't want people like exposing your shit. So, mm -hmm. if there is any. So, so, over the past month, Albanese has met with a multitude of business tycoons. He attended the wedding of right wing radio shock, gock, shock jock Kyle Sandilands along a convicted, alongside a convicted drug dealer and reputed crime boss. So that's who his priorities, his office has. Um, most recently, Albanese fawned over U.S. President Joe Biden in Tokyo. On the weekend, Biden is overseeing the attempt to extradite Assange from Britain and imprison him for 175 years for exposing American war crimes. Albanese proclaimed in Parliament he was not interested in meeting Assange's wife, which he said would be akin to a, quote, demonstration and, quote, grandstanding. Albanese in sought to best, in the best possible way. Way, ever. yes, like actually standing for some morals. Um, Albanese sought to dress up the refusal by reiterating vague comments that quote, "Enough is enough." In retali in relation to the Assange case, it's not like he's out. So apparently, like, and he cannot see that anything is served by the WikiLeaks founders continued incarceration. So like, I don't know, maybe talk to the lady's wife. While Albanese claims he has made this position clear to the U S administration, there's no evidence of that, including an extensive correspondence obtained under freedom of information requests between various American and Australian government bodies. Labor continues to give carte blanche to the very administration seeking Assange's destruction. So private versus public. Uh, policies here. The obvious question is, if Albanese won't meet with Assange's wife, a basic act of respect and courtesy that he has extended to thousands of others over the course of this year in office, why would anyone think the Prime Minister is waging a fight for the imprisoned Australian journalist's freedom behind closed doors? As part of her visits to Australia, Stella Assange yesterday addressed the National Press Club in Canberra. The speech was a powerful plea for Assange's freedom and exposure of the draconian conditions under which he is detained in Britain's maximum security Belmarsh prison and a clear outline of the fundamental issues of democratic rights at stake in the attempted prosecution of her husband. Um, Stella noted a groundswell of support for Assange. She stated, I would like to thank the overwhelming dedication of the Australian people who have brought about a sea change in awareness and solidarity for Julian's plight the unity and support for my husband is a source of enormous encouragement for our family. It, nurge, it nurtures Julian's ability to continue on. She added, the reality is that to regain his freedom, Julian needs the support of his home country. This is a political case, and it needs a political solution. And discussing her presence in Australia, and also what she speaks about with her husband, Stella stressed Assange's connection to Australia. He has been... He had been raised in the country and had shared his extensive memories from surfing in Byron Bay to beekeeping in Melbourne's Dadong Ranges and riding in a horse of New South Wales' northern rivers. That's how I imagine Julian when he is free, she said. Today, Julian's feet only ever feel the hard, dull, even cement on the prison floor 
When he goes to the yard for exercise, there is no grass, no sand, just the bitumen pavement surrounded by cameras and layers of razor wire overhead. I can tell you exactly what Julian is doing right now. It is 3 a.m. in London. Julian is lying in his cell, probably awake and struggling to fall asleep. It's where he spends 22 hours a day, every day. Julian's cell is about three by two meters. He uses some of the books to block out the unpleasant draft coming from the window in the cold winter nights. Stella outlined the draconian security procedures required for her and her two children to visit their father. They had to pass him innumerable checkpoints, searches, and scans for their visit. The children had only ever see their father in the inhospitable prison visiting room. For the elder of the two, now six years old, prisons feature in his dreams and his nightmares. Turning to the case, Stella stated, a 175-year sentence is a living death sentence, a prospect so desperate that the English court found that it would drive him to take his own life. Rather than live forever in hell, we must do everything we can to ensure that Julian never, ever sets foot in a U.S. prison. Extradition in this case is a matter of life and death. She explained, for most people, Julian is a symbol, a symbol of staggering injustice because he is in a prison on trumped-up charges for exposing the crimes of others, a symbol because he faces a bewildering 175-year sentence for publishing the truth, a symbol of a sophisticated form of state violence dressed up in complexity and indirection that not even Franz Kafka could have imagined. For the press and the public, Julian's case is the most brutal attack on press freedom that the Western world has ever seen. In the last 70 years, a foreign government is using the political offenses in its statute books to indict a foreign national abroad because of what he or she published in a different country. Accurate, damning publications exposing their war crimes, if sovereignty is to mean anything, if jurisdiction is a proper legal and political real reality, <clears throat> the case against Julian cannot be understood as anything other than absurdity. Despite the dire threat to press freedom, the address was largely subjected to a media boycott, only a handful of nationally recognized journalists attended. Several prominent publications sent junior staff, fresh out of university, armed only with arrogance and obnoxious questions based on the slanders that have been used to attack Assange. <clears throat> the shameful display underscored the fact that broad sections of the official media function as nothing more than state propagandists while they are cheering on each new step in Australia's integration with the U.S. preparations for war with China this corrupted layer is hostile to a genuine journalist who exposed war crimes. In the Q&A, Stella, together with Jennifer Robinson, one of Assange's lawyers, elaborated on the issues in the case. Two questions. Repeated the fraud that WikiLeaks had in 2016 received material from the Democratic National Committee via Russia. The questioners, despite refusing to be journalists, were hostile to the 2016 publications, even though they continued true and newsworthy information. <clears throat> In response, Stella emphasized what had been revealed. The 2016 publications shown that the campaign of Hillary Clinton had subverted the DNC primaries to scuttle the candidacy of Bernie Sanders. This was carried out even through internal DNC polling showed Sanders would defeat Donald Trump, whereas Clinton would not. More broadly, Stella emphasized the core precept that journalists have a responsibility to publish information that is in the public interest. To suppress such information, would be a violation of journalistic ethics. In reply to another question, Robinson noted the historic significance of the 2010 publications for which Assange faces prosecution. They'd exposed massive war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan, including thousands of civilian deaths that have been covered up by the U.S. military for those very same releases for which he now faces 175 years imprisonment. Assange and WikiLeaks in 2011 received a gold Walkie Award the highest honor in Australian journalism. Both Stell and Robinson thanked Albanese and the Labour government for their statements and noted that this marked a shift from previous administrations. There is no question that the tepid statements of the Labour officials reflect in extremely limited and distorted form the vast popular support for the WikiLeaks publisher. However, all experience has shown that no confidence can be placed in the capitalist governments to extend a benevolent hand and free Assange Albanese was a senior member of the Gillard Labor government, which in 2010 and 2011 actively participated in the persecution of Assange. The current Labor government, moreover, is dramatically escalating Australia's front line in the U.S. preparations for war against China. This policy is incompatible 
with democratic rights and is being accompanied by a slew of reactionary national security prosecutions within Australia directly overseen by Labour. As the Socialist Equality Party has stressed, an Australian government will only fulfill its obligations to free Assange if it is compelled to do so by massed opposition from below. That means the development of a movement of the working class against the Labour government and its program of war, austerity, and authoritarianism. Thoughts, Care Bear? It's... <clears throat> this reminds me of... You know, people hating Assange who love Bernie. Yeah. So, like, really anybody who supports Bernie even now, but especially back in 2016, 2020, knowing about Assange should be more applicable to you because as Stella basically reported, you know, like, there's proof that the DNC basically um, cheated Bernie out of winning. Yep. And if he were to go against Trump, uh, he would have won. So yep. <clears throat> the idea that people are not necessarily aware of that, but then I know some people who are basically like fuck Assange who are like Bernie Sands. It's just kind of like, you know, a huge disconnect there. But then again, it makes sense because anything regarding Assange has been severely suppressed, you know, even for us. Like, I'm sure, like, when we cut out this segment, this is going to be heavily suppressed and yep. at, at best demonetized. But you know, but, it, you know, it's the idea of having that relate to having a president or the potential of a president who is really centrist in scope relative to, like, the rest of the world, but you can make the argument that he would have done more in certain ways to push the narrative towards more progressive policies within the limitations that we have in terms of our capitalist government over some the over what we have currently mm -hmm. and the idea that assange exposed that as well as the forever wars that we had in iraq and afghanistan really should be talked about more well, I, yeah. I also think the fact that they're all talking about, well, it's got to be a groundswell of support from the from below. And it's like, what well, that exists. It's been here. It's been here for like a decade now. And then right. some. So like. Right. And then like people like shout out to Misty, you know, like yep. who has been, you know, people might just argue that she's like a one issue person in terms of like all she talks about is Assange. But Assange Honestly, encompasses so much. I mean, that's the problem, right. you know? Right. And, so. and I would rather have someone who is fully invested in an issue and knows, like, like, I don't know as much about, and I admit, I don't know as much about Assange other than, like, whatever you pull or whatever I pull um, to present to our family here or whatever Misty tells us or anything that I remember from Richie Methurst, what he explained about Assange. Actually, really, the, like, he was the first one who even, you know, mentioned the idea of Assange to me back in 2020. You know, yeah. he was the first. And then, you know, obviously Misty has carried the torch for me in terms of, you know, and having interaction with her and going uh, to protests, you know, for in, in recognition of him. Since, you know... Um, you know, it's a big deal. And, but people don't necessarily connect, as you said, that how much is tied to a very livelihood in this country because there would be a lot of corruption otherwise that would not be talked about or even known about if it wasn't for a journalist like Assange. But he represents what true journalist journalism is, which 
is not what it should be anymore. It's more or less propaganda. You know, going back to the tweet that I pulled in regards to, I forgot their names now, but the TikTok boys. If that's what I'm going to call them now, the TikTok boys. Yeah. Um, like, you know, they mentioned like, oh, white supremacy is like the thing that's killing this country. No, it's a propaganda that you guys are spilling. Right. That is making people dumb and making people like assume that what you're saying is true when it's not. Um, and having people just kind of living out a lie or not revealing the full truth of what is really happening, mm. you know? So the idea of people being fully aware, you know, you can't have that because then people will actually make moves in order to try and have a better life for themselves and their communities, which again, our government can't have that. Any capitalist government can have like an uprising of uh, the proletariat. Yeah. Um, but speaking but, of proletariats. You know, who are these people so if anyone doesn't know uh julian assange is probably about to be extradited here um so being more is, likely at this point yeah the article by chris hedges the imminent extradition of julian assange and the death of journalism. So I felt like this was a great article that summarizes a lot in a succinct manner. And for once, Chris Hedges didn't write an entire dissertation. So I figured that that was also useful. Um, so uh, Washington, D.C. He also posted this to Sheer Post. High Court Judge Jonathan Swift who previously worked for a variety of Brit British government agencies as a barrister and said his favorite clients are, quote, security and intelligence agencies, rejected two applications by Julian Assange's lawyers to appeal his extradition last week. The extradition order was signed last June by Home Secretary Priti Patel. Julian's legal team have filed a final application for appeal. The last option available in the British courts. If accepted, the case could proceed to a public hearing in front of two new high court judges. If rejected, Julian could be immediately extradited to the United States where he will stand trial for 18 counts of violating the Espionage Act. Charges that could see him receive a 175 year sentence <laughs> as early as this week. Excuse me. The only chance to block an extradition is the final appeal is rejected as I expect it will be says Chris Hedges, would come from the European Court of Human Rights, the parliamentary arm of the Council of Europe, which created the ECTHR, that's that Human Rights Council. Their commissioner for human rights opposed Julian's detention, extradition, and prosecution because it represents a dangerous precedent for journalists. It is unclear if the British government would abide by the court's decision, even though it's obligated to do so. If it ruled against extradition, or if the UK would extradite Julian before an appeal to the European court can be heard, Julian, once shipped to the US, would be put on trial in the US District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia, where most espionage cases have been won by the US government. Judge Vanessa Barrister at Westminster Magistrate Court refused to authorize the US government's extradition request in January because of the severity of the conditions Julian would adore in the US prison system. That was in 21. Faced with the conditions of near total isolation without the protective factors which limited his risk at Her Majesty's Prison, Belmarsh, I am satisfied the procedures described by the U.S. will not prevent Mr. Assange from finding a way to commit suicide, said Barrister when handing down her 132-page ruling. And for this reason, I have decided extradition would be oppressive by reason of mental harm, and I order his discharge. Barrister's decision was overturned. After an appeal by U.S. authorities, the high court accepted the conclusions of the lower court about increased risk of suicide and inhumane prison con conditions, but it also accepted for assurances in U.S. diplomatic note number 74, given to the court in February 21, which promised Julian would be well treated. They promised, Colin. The U.S. government claimed that its assurances entirely answers the concerns which caused the judge in the lower court to discharge Mr. Assange. 
The assurances state that Julian will not be subject to special administrative measures, aka SAMs. They promote the Julian. An Australian citizen can serve his sentence in Australia if the Australian government requests his extradition. Where where are they at, Colin? Um they promise he will receive adequate clinical and psychological care. They promote that pre-trial and post-trial Julian will not be held in the administrative maximum facility in Florence, Colorado. No one has held pre-trial in ADX Florence, but it sounds reassuring. ADX Florence is not the only supermax prison in the U.S. Julian could be placed in one of the other Guantanamo-like facilities in a communications management unit. CMUs are highly restrictive units that replace the near isolated imposed near isolation imposed by SAMs. None of these assurance are worth the paper they are written on. All come with escape clauses. None are legally binding. Should Julian do something subsequent to the offering of these insurances that meets the test for the imposition of SAMs or designation to ADX, he will, the court conceded, be subject to those harsher forms of control. If Australia does not request a transfer, it cannot be a cause for criticism of the USA or a reason for regarding the assurances as in inadequate to meet the judge's concerns. The ruling read, and even if that were not the case, it would take Julian 10 to 15 years to appeal his sentence up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which would be more than enough time to destroy him psychologically and physically. This is a guy who's already had a stroke, correct? Correct. Um, the extradition of Julian will be the next step in the slow motion execution of the publisher and founder of WikiLeaks and one of the most important journalists of our, our generation. It will ensure that Julian spends the rest of his life in a U.S. prison. It will create legal precedents that will criminalize any investigation into the inner workings of power, even by citizens from another country. It will be a body blow to our anemic democracy, which is rapidly metamorphosing into corporate totalitarian totalitarianism. Totalitarianism. Totalitarianism? There we go. Um, I am stunned by this full frontal assault on journalism as I am by the lack of public outrage, especially by the media. The very belated call from the New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, Der Spiegel, and El Pais, all of whom published material provided by WikiLeaks. To drop the extradition charges is a little is too little too late. All of the public protests I have attended in defense of Julian in the U.S. are sparsely attended, our passivity yeah. makes us complicit in our own enslavement. Julian's case from the start has been a judicial farce. Former Ecuadorian President Lenin Moreno terminated Julian's rights of asylum as a political refugee in violation of international law. He then authorized the London Metropolitan Police to enter the Ecuadorian embassy, diplomatically sanctioned sovereign territory to arrest a naturalized citizen of Ecuador. Moreno's government which revoked Julian's citizenship, was granted a large loan by the International Monetary Fund for its assistance. Donald Trump, by demanding Julian's extradition under the Espionage Act, criminalized journalism in much the same way Woodrow Wilson did when he shut down socialist publications such as the masses. The hearings, some of which I attended in London and others, of which I sat through online, mocked basic legal protocols they included the decision to ignore the CIA's surveillance and recording of meetings between Julian and his attorneys during his time as a political refugee in the embassy, eviscerating attorney-client privilege. This alone should have seen the case thrown out of court. They included validating the decision to charge Julian, although he is not a U.S. citizen, under the Espionage Act. They included Kafkaesque contortions to convince the courts that Julian is not a journalist. They ignored Article 4 of the UK-US Extradition Treaty that prohibits extradition for political offenses. I watched as the prosecutor, James Lewis, representing the US, gave legal directives to Judge Barrister um, Baratzer, who promptly adopted them as her legal decision. The judicial lynching of Julian has far more in common with the dark days of Lubyanka than the ideals of British jurisprudence. The debate over arcane legal nuances distracts us from the fact that Julian has not committed a crime in Britain, other than an odd charge of breaching bail conditions when he sought asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy. Normally, this would entail a fine. He was instead sentenced to a year in Belmarsh prison and has been held there since April 2019. 
The decision to seek Julian's extradition, contemplated by Barack Obama's administration, was pursued by the Trump administration following WikiLeaks' publication of the documents known as Vault 7, which exposed the CIA cyber warfare programs designed to monitor and take control of cars, smart TVs, web browsers, and the operating systems of most smartphones, as well as Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Julian, as I noted in a column filed from London last year, is targeted because of the Iraq war logs released in October 2010, which documented numerous U.S. war crimes, including images seen in the collateral murder video of the gunning down of two Reuters journalists and 10 other civilians and severely injuring two children. He is targeted because he made public the killing of nearly 700 civilians who had approached too closely to U.S. convoys and checkpoints, including pregnant women, the blind and deaf, and at least 30 children. He is targeted because he exposed more than 15,000 unreported deaths of Iraqi civilians and the torture and abuse of some 800 men and boys aged between 14 to 89 in Guantanamo Bay detention camp. He is targeted because he showed us that Hillary Clinton in 09 ordered U.S. diplomats to spy on U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and other U.N. representatives from China, France, Russia, and the U.K., spying that included obtaining DNA, iris scans, fingerprints, and personal passwords, all part of the long pattern of illegal surveillance that included eavesdropping on U.N. Secretary General Kofi Annan in the weeks before the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq in 03. He is targeted because he exposed that Obama, Hillary Clinton, and the CIA backed the June 2009 military coup in Honduras and overthrew the democratically elected president Manuel Zelaya, replacing him with a murderous and corrupt military regime. Par for the course for us, he is targeted because he released documents that revealed the United States secretly launched missile, bomb, and drone attacks on Yemen, killing scores of civilians. He is targeted because he made public the off-the-record talks Hillary Clinton gave to Goldman Sachs, talks for which she was paid $657,000, a sum so large it can only be considered a bribe, as well as her private assurances to Wall Street that she would do their bidding while promising the public financial regulation and reform. For revealing those truths alone, he is guilty. The U.S. court system is even more draconian than the British court system. It can use SAM's anti-terrorism laws and the Espionage Act to block Julian from speaking to the public, being released on bail, or seeing the secret evidence used to convict him. The CIA was created to carry out assassinations, coups, torture, kidnapping, blackmail, character assassinations, and illegal spying. This targeted U.S. citizens in violation of its charter. These activities were exposed in 1975 by the Church Committee hearings in the Senate and the Pike Committee hearings in the House. Working with UC Global, the Spanish security firm, and the embassy, the CIA put Julian under 24-hour 20, video and digital surveillance. It discussed kidnapping and assassinating him while he was in the embassy, which included plans of a shootout on the streets with involvement by London Metro Police. The U.S. allocates a secret black budget of $52 billion a year to hide multiple types of clandestine projects carried out by the National Security Agency, the CIA, and other intelligence agencies, usually beyond the scrutiny of Congress. All these clandestine activities, especially after the attacks of 9-11, have massively expanded. Senator Frank Church, after examining the heavily redacted CIA documents released to his committee, defined the CIA's covert activity as a semantic disguise for murder, coercion, blackmail, bribery, and the spreading of lies. The CIA and intelligence agencies, along with the military, all of which operate without effective congressional oversight, are the engines behind Julian's extradition. Julian inflicted by exposing their crimes and lies, a grievous wound. They demand vengeance. The, they, the control these forces seek abroad is the control they seek at home. Julian may soon be imprisoned for life in the U.S. for journalism, but he won't be the only one. Thoughts, Care Bear? Um. Oh, um. This is hard. Um, yep. Hard in the sense that we knew this was going to happen. Um. 
I mean, we've talked about Assange enough on the show, but I think for me, I mean, I always started hearing about Assange when Richard Meher started talking about him in 2020. Um, and now almost three years later, you know, he's more likely going to be extradited and, you know, Chris Hedges is right. Like there has not been enough outrage over this and shout out to Misty. Uh, you know, she is like our Assange guru and she has, and she leads Assange, uh, rallies in DC often the last one that i went to in i think it was on october this past year um was probably the best that was attended i would say there was about over 200 people there at this time but i've been to assange rallies in dc that she has hosted that there were only maybe about 50 if not less yeah so it's just not surprising, but it is surprising of how much little discussion has had, you know, mainstream media, we know it's not going to be, but even, I think even in independent media, you know, um, yeah. like people don't talk about Assange enough and especially being in this space, it should be talked about more because we're essentially doing, uh, we, I wouldn't call myself a journalist, but we are reporting you know, or at least commenting on the news and essentially well, the censorship that we're seeing on YouTube is an extension you know, and, of, of this. It, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so speaking of Bedhurst, um, he's hosting this, uh, I don't know if he's hosting, but he's being I a think part he's of, hosting it, but I think he's, he just, um, tweeted this out. Yeah. Uh, parliament square, London, 1 PM Saturday, 24th of June. If you know anyone in the UK area? especially London, please tell them to show up for this. Even if they're mm -hmm. not supporters of Julian, I think it'd be a good idea for them to show up, see what's happening. So if you care about free press, if you care about censorship, you should, which should be everybody. Yeah. You, if you're in London, you should participate. Yep. Um, I agree. But. So. But yeah, that's it's, it for me tonight, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, it's just sad that we knew this day was coming, but I think the fact that we're pretty much there now, it's it doesn't it doesn't make it any better or feels any worse, I would argue, that, you know, a, a non-U.S. citizen is going to get extradited here and essentially has been slowly tortured to death yeah. in terms of doing his job. Yeah. Which... It's, it's depressing for sure. Um, so, and it's probably going to be some military tribunal that we can't have access to or see what's happening and right. he'll be locked away and the key will be thrown down a well. Um, and then know. like the idea of putting him in a max prison like why what kind of risk is he like what kind of risk is he going to try, try, try and commit people that they like, openly plotted the assassination of like we're gonna give them the right to incarcerate at like especially with after what happened with epstein i don't, I don't think they should be allowed to touch it so you know uh um so, yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, a uh, boat crashes or helicopter gets lost or something, you know, anything. Um, but yeah, uh, I think we definitely should watch it, especially if this becomes breaking news. Yeah. Later we'll, in the week. We'll be there for it. So Yeah, and I'll be free by then, so <laughs> I'll be able to report quickly if. Um, okay. if this is a breaking story by week's end or early next week, um, but yeah, but okay. it's well. so
And then, of course, on the left is the legendary Julian Assange, free Julian Assange. We're going to talk about some Julian stuff first. Julian. Let's get into Julian news, because there, there was some Julian news. And I want to also shout out some, some people that are still carrying the torch like we are every week. And it's important to keep this story alive and to continue to fight for Julian Assange. He can't fight for himself locked in a hole in Belmarsh. There's a lot of people out there doing it. And we say, as always, free Julian Assange, as always. So the Don't Extradite Assange campaign, which has been around for a long time, I believe they actually arranged the Assange DAO. They have now changed their handle. And... I'm a little, this makes me a little sad, actually. Uh, the Indie Media Awards is logged in right now to Instagram. So I'll be the 50th like on that. But I'm surprised only, thank you. I'm surprised that only 50 people have liked it. Free Assange News, at Free Assange News is now what the, what the page and the organization will be called moving forward. Rather than don't extradite Assange, it's Free Julian Assange, which makes a whole lot of sense. It's a whole lot easier. Mm-hmm. And um, it it just kind of fits. So I'm kind of surprised they're amplifying their international efforts. The sad thing is, and the reason why I'm sad about it, is because it's because they they're probably they probably know that it's inevitable at this point that he will be extradited. So to keep the handle of don't extradite him when that's inevitable, I don't think that that is. You know, necessarily, you giving up to a point. It's just shifting where you know where the focus is going to be from from freeing him to you know from extraditing to free. Uh, Max RJ, yes, that is correct. Stella Assange has a YouTube channel. She also has a Substack now as well. She's publishing stuff to Substack. I I don't have to. They're gonna have to pay me royalties after a while. I did have Warriors, one, Julian. Thank you. I did have one article, um, and this happened a few weeks ago, but I didn't talk about it because we were off, and I thought that it was something that was important to mention, which was that we had a strongly worded letter sent to, I don't know, the president and and or the Justice Department from a bipartisan group of small group of Congress people, but this represents, as Chip Gibbons at the dissenter, that is uh, Kevin Gostola's outlet, newsletter subscribe to that i'm a paid subscriber he's actually offering the mm -hmm. entire month of december for free he sent an email out to his paid subs that he's offering everything unlock all his new content for free all month so please by all means go to the dissenter.org and subscribe chip gibbons bipartisan group of congress members to biden who says don't extradite julian assange hey how about that and it was led by jim mcgovern massachusetts and Thomas Massey from Kentucky, who they all suck, but he's turning out to be more principled than just about all of them when it comes to several things, including the the recent vote about anti-Semitism versus anti-Zionism. And he was one of the lone people to stand up and courageously and, and correctly state that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, and he could not vote for the measure, though there were a lot of good things that he agreed with that were in the measure. That was really the right. whole point of it. What sure. Chip was saying is that 16 members of the Congress sent a letter, right? You had Jim McGovern and, and Thomas Massey, like they said. It marks the second time this year that members of Congress have signed a joint letter to the Biden administration urging them to end mm -hmm. the prosecution. Joint. Right. Uh, urging. You know, you know, whenever you say urging, it's toothless. Like, we're urging you. Okay. Yeah, yeah thanks. It's meaningless. This is not urgent. On press freedom grounds, and as the first bipartisan and bicameral letter, it represents the largest congressional effort, and it's like a little bit building here and there. Who also signed off on it? I'm not terribly thrilled with a couple of these names, but you're going to need a lot of them. Um, Paul Gosar is the one I don't like at all. Paul Gosar is a straight-up Nazi and has admitted so, and his entire family literally wrote a letter to the people of Arizona saying don't vote for this guy because he's a Nazi <laughs> and we're not even like sugarcoating mm. it like literally like likes to get dressed up in the in the Nazi stuff Marjorie Taylor <laughs> Greene yeah. Marjorie Taylor Greene whatever you know she's a she's she's the 
Republican AOC, who also, by the way, signed off on this. You see, you have Jamal Bowman and Rashida Tlaib and Chewy Garcia and Rand Paul. So a lot of the people who usually kind of yeah, Chewy Garcia, like a Ben and Jerry's flavor. He's no, no. He's, he's he used to be the Chicago alderman or a Chicago mayor. Um, Kit. Sure. Shout out to shout out to Kit at at Hardlands. He he was excited when Chewy went into Congress, and man. Chewy has just bent the knee, left, right, sideways, and straight down, over and over. Alderman, according to Dr. Nick Rivera. Rivera. Thank you, Dr. Nick. Yes, Chewy was an alderman. alderman. So, and now he is a congressman who, <clears throat> I don't remember whose seat he had. Um, I think it was, it might have been, um, what's her name? Marie Newman, possibly? He took Newman. over for him. Newman. Greg Kasser, he's also a quote-unquote progressive. Matt Rosendale, I'm not familiar with. I'm I'm surprised that I don't see um, Matt Gates on here. I would think that he would be all about this, but that would that kind of surprised me that I didn't it. see. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> free free Assange. Yeah. Uh, we, why don't we get Matt Ju M Mike Judge to do that? Oh my God, we've got to get him to do a sure. whole thing about that. The letter signatories were largely drawn from the Congressional P Progressive Caucus and the Libertarian or MAGA wing of the Republican Party. Okay. Well, of course, because anyone in the corporate side and in the intel side, he exposed all their secrets and let out their dirty laundry and made them all look like schmucks over and over again. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and they're all still subservient to either the Clintons or the Bushes, you know, and, and the people who were within the Bush administration. Although such a coalition may defy, so yes, and Henry Kissinger, of course, who could who could forget Henry Kissinger, who is pleading the fifth, but yeah, sorry, man, you're guilty. Don't be rude. Yeah. Although such a coalition may defy conventional political wisdom, similar coalitions between congressional progressive and libertarians have emerged in recent memory around up around efforts to rein in surveillance state or reassert Congress's war powers. I would not call well, Gosers a MAGA. I guess that's what um what's his name is? The guy from uh Rosendale from Montana, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Well, yes, they are the people who have been pushed at, you know, who are most um suspicious of what they call the deep state or, you know, the, of the Intel mm -hmm. community and the influence of the Intel community, as we keep having proven out week after week after week, the sen the censorship industrial complex. You're right. Now we've, yeah. They're, now, they're against it unless it works for them and then they're fine. Right. Now you we've know? got, now we've got the CTI league uh, files, which mm -hmm. by the way, I, I was going to do a thing about that. I'll probably cover that next week. Whitney Webb did a whole, Think about how that's nice, Mikey, that you caught on to this part, but it's actually much bigger than that. And we wrote about this three years ago, but it's I'm glad that you're bringing it to light. And here, here's more info. So Whitney was trying to be nice, but of course, Whitney is amazing, and she's <laughs> she she knows how to dunk on people without even trying. Mm -hmm. So on April 11th, which was on the anniversary of Assange's arrest and expulsion from the Ecuadorian embassy. Seven, de seven Democrats sent a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland, and Misty was in Washington, D.C., standing in front of Merrick Garland's office that day, speaking. Letter was initiated by Rashida, yep. who had tweeted four years ago today, Julian was arrested for publishing the truth. So they recognize it. I don't think they're being loud enough. I think that it gets old after a while, but at least... Expo you know, let's talk about what they did, you know, and why he's there. And it's not just that he published the truth. It's about whom and why. And it's a little bit more than just that he published the truth, because a lot of people publish the truth and they don't end up in Belmarsh in a hole. All seven of the signatories were from an informal grouping within the left wing, quote unquote, of the CPC, often referred to as the squad. Oh, goodness gracious. OK, what? well, I, I guess they're as left as it's as it gets right now. But and it probably isn't going to get any further left because they're going to spend one hundred million dollars to make sure they don't go any further left. And 
further pushback for, to the right, I'm guessing. That's already started to happen. There is the, there's always the macro and then there's the micro. Oh. Her, her bank account's a, mank, a macro, her fundraising bank account. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, additionally, mm -hmm. following an October oversight hearing with Merrick Garland that was held up by the House Judiciary Committee, Bush sent a follow-up letter, Corey, in addition to asking questions around mass incarceration, the death penalty, and the treatment of Stop Cop City protesters, he even raised the matter of his extradition. He's currently detained in Belmarsh's high-security prison, of course, in London, as the U.S. seeks to yeah. extradite him for a trial on espionage, char espionage act charges which is crazy in itself. Each of the charges against him stem from his role as WikiLeaks editor-in-chief. He's a publisher. Yeah, I love, I love how every Assange article has to explain, like, the entire story every time. Well, it has like to. Every because... Spider-Man movie has to go through a Spider-Man origin. Well, it has to because there's so you know? many people. Look, it's yes, been spun no so many times. And, and not I just know. that, but the shit libs turn and they decide to twist it yep. every single time. And use the, the wrong story that they heard mm -hmm. from XYZ. And unless you continue, God, it feels like the Passover story. We have to continue to tell this story every <laughs> year so that our ancestors will every know year. exactly what happened to Julian. Yes, Julian. Mm -hmm. So in 2010 and yeah. 2011, the That's media organization published classified information as uh, about the U.S. government's wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, military prison at Gitmo, and the backroom dealings of the State Department. All this was published while U.S. Army whistleblower Chelsea Manning, who was the source of the documents, of course, was a number was one of a number of whistleblowers charged under the Espionage Act under President Barack Obama. The Assange indictment. Thanks, Obama. Yeah, thanks. Pursued under, of course, President Donald Trump. It's kind of funny that Trump supporters now want to. See Assange freed when Trump was the one that actually went after Assange, but that I digress. Hey, if they turn it around, great. And I think that they always wanted to see him free Assange. Honestly, I think that from the day that he Whoa. was there, I I disagree with that. So, yeah, first time publisher was ever charged under the Espionage Act. They at the Belmarsh trial or at the old Bailey trial that Richard Medhurst and Kevin Gostola, who is the publisher of the dissenter, covered, you know, in the gallery, in the gallery uh, on a daily basis and then had to and then came out and did live stream reports every day. It was like 14 days long. Um, Daniel Ellsberg, yep. Nils Melzer. There were tons of people that testified that said that, hey, the U.S. prison system and they're going to get to this, I'm sure here. But and. In spite of Obama's unprecedented use of the, uh, the Espionage Act to silence journalists, sources, and whistleblowers, and its open antipathy for Assange and WikiLeaks, because they made him look like a dumbass a ton, the Obama administration balked at the prospects of formally indicting Assange under the Espionage Act. They feared the wide-ranging ramifications for press freedom of a successful prosecution under that act, also by the fact that he's not an American. They're bringing him in from foreign soil because they don't like what he published about us. How the hell do you do that? Mm -hmm. The Trump administration, um, of course. What, just like this. Well, we know the Trump because, administration, you know. guided by Attorney General Jefferson Beauregard Sessions and CIA Director yeah. Mike Fuck Fuck You, We Lie, We Cheat, We Steal Pompeo, reversed course. Both officials escalated. An interesting middle name. Well, yeah, he, he is a we lie cheat. He is the liar, cheater, and, and thief, for sure. And he was former Secretary of State, former CIA director. Both officials escalated U.S. security agencies' extra-legal activities that's kind against Assange and brought the unprecedented indictment. So, quote, we believe the Department of Justice acted correctly in 2013 during your vice presidency when it declined to pursue charges against Mr. Assange, this is from the letter now, for publishing the classified documents because it recognized that the prosecution would set a dangerous precedent. We note that the 1917 Espionage Act was ostensibly intended to punish and imprison government employees and contractors for providing or selling state, state secrets <laughs> to ever, enemy governments not to publish who punish journalists and whistleblowers for attempting to inform the public about serious issues that some U.S. government officials might prefer to keep secret. 
especially mm-hmm. if it might land some of those U.S. officials in jail, by the way, they don't add. Which is which is why they tried to tie Assange to both China and Russia all the time. Yep. Like... Well, on top of the fact that they've secretly probably classified him as a terrorist in order to put the charges that they have put against yeah. him and the level of surveillance against the people who he was with, because it's the only way to justify yep. it. Um, we are aware that the Assange case has been cited by officials of the People's Republic of China, quote, right? China. China to China to claim that the U.S. is, yeah, yeah, is hypocritical when it comes to its purported support for media freedom. We are also well aware that should the U.S. extradition and prosecution go forward, there is a significant risk that our bilateral relationship with Australia will be badly damaged, unquote. Yeah, right. You mean something like a nuclear submarine that has... You know, Australian, U.S. Navy, Australian Navy joint. Like an Australian officer literally on board a U.S. naval ship at all times. Yeah. With the star spangled kangaroo on the side of the fucking ship. Yeah, we covered that. Yeah, no, we months ago gave them a nuclear sub. That's that's how that works. Yep. And then yeah, the the USS Canberra. Fucking yeah. Canberra. Yeah, we, we covered that on... How do we miss that? You can go back yes, and look did. up that clip. So, while the Biden administration has made press freedom a key rhetorical commitment and sought to distance mm-hmm. itself from Trump's attacks on democracy... Oh, goodness gracious. Yes, but they both attacked the democracy. Officials have barreled along with the prosecution... One recent report indicated that the FBI has tried to convince journalists to testify against Assange during a U.S. trial. And uh, is that mm-hmm. the Craig Murray thing? I think it was. Yeah. They've used the Rage Against the War song on loop to try to do that. Right. Mm. Progressives and, again, libertarians in Congress um, and just non-corporate Republicans. Like the two of them. Right. Like the three of them that if- did this. Right. Well, no, it was, it was right. Gosser, it was that guy from Montana, yeah. and it was um, Rand Paul. And, Rand, Rand Paul And Massey, and Massey, who's not, who is a an independent, not a libertarian, but he's an independent. So they keep, you know, mm-hmm. Chip keeps using the, Chip also works with Jacobin. So, you know, take for that what what you will, but Chip is an excellent Assange reporter, and I give him a lot of credit for being on the story, and I credit a lot of people that are on the Assange story when they stay yeah. on it, and I mean, Kevin wouldn't give him a column. The New York Times, the the, the Schmardian, Lumiere, Der Spetzel, El Pays, like, yep. even they're, they're all on it. Yep. <clears throat> So exactly right. They've all criticized it. Civil liberties, human rights, press freedom orgs, the ACLU, Amnesty, CPJ. Everyone has has called for in Freedom yeah. of the Press Foundation, Reporters Without Borders, repeatedly called for charges. Everybody wants the charges to be dropped, except for the people who it implicates are the ones who are running the government still. And there's enough of them doing that. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and officials in his government have repeatedly raised the issue, including a during a recent visit to D.C. Enough is enough, I believe, is what he said to. Yeah, but wouldn't 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 meet with fucking Stella. Nope. When she showed up there. Nope. Pass pass that off right. to like he's to David um, Shoebridge. So shout out to David right. Shoebridge, and I hope he eventually becomes prime minister and does not choose to bend the knee. Um, again, so far, the Biden admin yep. has been unmoved by members of Congress, but with increasing opposition from key international allies, mainstream newspapers, press freedom groups, as well as parts per, per, of the progressive coalition, that he must depend on for re-election. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's unclear if Biden can continue to carry on with business as usual without facing some kind of consequence. And if he thinks that Dropping the charges and can, first of all, it's he would have to issue a pardon, which isn't even the right move. We need 
Merrick Garland to drop the charges, really. Otherwise, they're going right. to run around and say that he was guilty, guilty, guilty. Yeah, precedent. Right. Well, it's also the precedent that sets, yeah, is awful. Right. I don't, so we want to see the charges dropped, and it's really lobbying the Justice Department more so than anything. Now, our friend Matt O'Brannon, uh, O'Brannon, uh, he was just on Misty Winston's recently. I don't know if you know about this guy. He's amazing. Um, he has decided to wear an orange jumpsuit for a year. And walk around mm. with this sign in chalk around his neck. And he's gone all around the world and gone around Europe and he's done radio shows and he's done TV and all kinds of stuff. Um, so I wanted to bring this video that he brought on Instagram about, he says, uh, it feels good and cracks me up to think about the amount of car honks outside Belmarsh is scientific evidence that the free Assange cam uh, campaign and is growing exponentially stronger. <laughs> So he has a little something to say. Let's hear what Matt has to say. One of the drivers in these cars uh, honked his horn after he read my sign and gave me the... And you get that more and more now. The volume is rising. In London, where I'm off to, I've oh, spoken dude. to the campaigners there who always go to Belmarsh Prison where Julian is every week. And they say that the honks on the horns are increasing. And no, I just yeah, love that. No it's music, like an no objective music, no measure music, of the no campaign music. for Julian Sange. I can't no have the music. music. It's 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 got American pie music. Take heart and keep fighting. Free Assange, free the truth, free us all. Just on my way to London, and one of the drivers in these cars uh, honked his horn after he read my sign. It's awesome. I mean, he's he's great. Um, he's a former teacher. You can uh, actually go and listen to the hour that he spent with Misty on her Substack. If you go to mistywinson.substack.com and look for bad, it's about two weeks ago. Every day we publish who her guest is going to be with all their links and a little background and bio. And you can follow him on Instagram and Twitter. I know he's definitely on. I think he's also got a YouTube, but he doesn't really do much over there. One other thing I wanted to, to, to give a, a nod to was Shanda, our friend and Indie Media Award honoree now, by the way, um, for live streaming and for being awesome um she was at port she was at the cpi convention last minute trip to portland to see some amazing commentators right so she saw caleb and there's caleb i believe in the background right there as, as well mm -hmm. as a few others i think and I see carl nixon and um oh there you go scott ritter david, Rov david rovix pasta Oh, really? I didn't know Pasta was going there. That's, that's yeah. badass. I love it. Pasta was there. Nice. So so Shanda was there. So shout out to Shanda for being there. And thank you. She had a table for free Assange. So that's not only did she show Good up, for you. he showed up and set up a table. That's fucking great. I love her for it. So so shout yeah. out to her. Shout out to Paula as well as, as, um, as Kendra. Kendra runs the Denver free Assange. Paula is up in Boston running the Boston free Assange. All these incredible people are dedicated to to the cause, and and I love them all dearly for it. Um, so Matt is saying that it feels good about, you know, to, to feel that that there's more momentum happening every day, and you can see that from the number of people that are signing on to the letter, and now that now the DEA campaign is changing to free Assange, so. There was one more part of this story, I and I have to get back to it. Sorry, everyone. Uh, let's go back to that, which is this. Next Saturday afternoon, if you are in the D.C. area, sign up for this. You can also live watch it on a live stream, and it's the Belmarsh Tribunal. And it's not necessarily a lot of people that we like, support, or know that are there, but it's important. Um. I'll just read this out. The extradition against Julian Assange is now entering its final phase, and the international pressure for his freedom is mounting. From presidents mm. and prime ministers to Nobel Peace Prize winners, the international community is crying out against the injustice of Assange's prosecution and its implication for press freedom worldwide. On December 9th, the world's leading journalists, lawyers, and human rights defenders will gather at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. as witnesses 
to the Biden administration's crackdown on free speech in the First Amendment. Join them. It's not too late to stand on the right side of history. Register now to attend the tribunal, either in person or follow the proceedings online. And Kevin Gastola, by the way, said that he would do something to try to get some kind of live stream going. So this is at 2 p.m. on Friday. The show, the co-chairs, I'm not I'm not fans of either one of them, but I'm fans of what they're doing uh, here and what they're getting people together. But it's Ryan Grimm and Amy Goodman. Yes. But we've can, got can Marjorie. We pick other two other people. Well, two other got, people would be nice. Like put Kiriaku instead. Well, we've got Kiriaku and, and Rebecca Vincent. And we've got Abby Martin down there as well. We got Marjorie Cohn from mm -hmm. Truth Out, as well as some other folks and lawyers, and Ewan McCaskill from formerly Guardian. I believe he will worked with Julian, possibly. I mean, mm -hmm. there's been so many attendees and people who have testified mm -hmm. at this tribunal. This is like the third or fourth one already. Um, hey, maybe you might be able to burn. I mean, buy Ryan Grimm's book while you're there. Um, that would be cool, you know. Yes, if you can burn it for um, sure, but we don't burn books around here. That's, <laughs> no, no. That's yeah, that's a whole that's a whole other stuff. Doing that's that. Moms for Liberty. By the way, freaky icky. If you oh, dude, no, we, what? We, we don't we don't burn books here, but we we might advise you to use them as toilet paper if things get tough. They're trying to intimidate Trump Assange supporters. Doing. They're trying to, 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 you know, erase him, as Caitlin says. <laughs> yep. so, free, free Julian Assange. Can I, can I say that enough? Free Julian Assange, like now and like yesterday. And journalism isn't a crime and publishing isn't a crime. And he's absolutely a journalist. And nobody's ever died from anything that he published. But a lot of people died from the stuff that he uncovered and from the crimes that he uncovered. Yep. So. Who are these people? Um, <laughs> the um, new Australian prime minister is squandering uh, his leverage on Assange. And I don't know if you've been paying attention to uh, Miss Misty Winston or, you know, Andrew Zygman over at A for A talking about... Are these people uh this weekend tons of stuff happened um i know you guys probably saw it around uh you might have even been in dc to be there um you know viewers at home but uh protest mark third anniversary of assange's arrest is from popular resistance uh the third anniversary of the arrest and incarceration of julian assange in a maximum security prison has sparked protests in london and the united states and i think this is like an older-ish article that they're redoing. Um, tomorrow marks three years since the WikiLeaks founder was forcibly dragged from the Ecuadorian embassy where he had sought asylum. Oh, this is before the embassy. He was there for like, you know, how long was he at the embassy? Like two... Uh, about seven years, I think. Yeah, so on top of this. So, uh, um, seven or eight years? Right. So vigils were due to held yesterday at the embassy, Westminster Magistrate Court at Belmarsh Prison, where he has been held for the past three years. Um, Mr. Assange's family, friends, and supporters are calling for his release in the U.S. to drop its extradition case against him. Protests are also planned today in D.C., outside the British Embassy, and the Department of Justice office. Uh, speaking at the International Journalism Film Festival on Saturday, Mr. Assange's wife, Stella, warned that with every day he is locked up in Belmarsh, his health deteriorates further. Monday will be three years of his incarceration in Belmarsh prisons, he said. He's locked in by himself for many hours a day, and you can just imagine what kind of effect that has on a person. He's in prison surrounded by a very dangerous people, but also a prison that cannot address his needs. He had a mini stroke in October, and obviously that is a sign of his health dramatically deteriorating. The pair who have been who have two children together married last month inside Belmarsh. Mr. Assange is facing extradition to the US where he was wanted for publishing thousands of classified documents. Relating to the Iraq and Afghanistan war, which exposed U.S. war crimes, a spokesperson from Doctors for Assange said, as another shameful anniversary passes, Julian Assange's life remains in danger. Three years of political imprisonment in Belmarsh preceded by seven years of arbitrary detention in the Ecuadorian embassy 
have predictably taken a terrible toll on Mr. Assange's mental and physical health. And still, unconsciously, he faces the prospect of extradition to and continued psychological torture in the United States. This political punishment by process must end now. So that was just a general article talking about the protests from this weekend. Um, we have, uh, we also had protests in LA, right? For the mandates, right? Um, and this is just a, a segment just on all the protests that happened this weekend. So we'll let Max uh, talk about why he's here at, at this protest. I'm Max Blumenthal from thegrayzone.com, and I regret to inform you that I'm a member of the media, the worst profession in the country. <laughs> Actually, I'm one of the good ones. We'll talk about that in a second. I want to talk about what's been happening in the world for the last two years, because for two years, we have seen one of the biggest grassroots movements unfold before our eyes. The medical freedom movement, which has seen millions of people around the world march against unscientific anti-worker mandates in their own societies, from the indigenous Bolivians of El Alto, to Moroccans of Casablanca, to Iranians in Tehran, from Beirut to Berlin, to Boston, to Los Angeles. And what is this about? It's about decent working people around the world trying to hold on to their humanity, their basic rights, their bodily autonomy, and their very sanity in the face of a cold and ruthless machine that seeks to reduce every individual to a QR code and condition their participation in society and their very ability to work on their willingness to take an experimental gene therapy. That is unacceptable. And you know what else is unacceptable? Those who try to make this into a right versus left issue. All they're trying to do is confuse, divide, hoodwink, and bamboozle on behalf of the billionaire class that represents the real winners of this pandemic. This is not about left versus right. This is about our economic rights, our human rights, and our constitutional rights. And that's why we're here today. We've watched for the past two years as Big Pharma and its oligarchic investors puppeteered our governments, putting the FDA and CDC in its back pocket while turning our politicians into corporate sales reps, guaranteeing Pfizer and Moderna combined profits of $65,000 per minute, per minute using your bodies as profit centers while working class Americans suffered the sharpest increase in poverty in 50 years. We've watched the wealth of the world's 10 richest men double since the lockdown began. We have watched small businesses be destroyed, entire countries plunge deeper into debt, while the most vulnerable youth were deprived of their right to education. And now in New York City, we watch as wealthy and famous celebrities are allowed to work without a mandate, but healthy firefighters, medical workers, and teachers, people doing the most important jobs in this country, are not allowed to work because they disobey the mandate. And we are here to say, let them work! 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 Indeed, Angel. How dare he? Um, I don't yeah, see so why had... he have a meltdown. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. And 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 he goes on yeah, for yeah. another three minutes or so. You know, so he's already getting chance in the middle of his set. You know, so. He but... invited me. Hell, I'm ready to go fight. <laughs> right. Definitely. Max is Max is great at that. Um, but I also have. Um, this, our, our shout out to our, our friend of the show, Ricky Rant, for getting this coverage. Um, Ricky. We, we, we have, we have, uh, Miss Fiorella Isabel of the Convo Couch, everybody. It's really Ooh. shitty out there. <laughs> the airports are a mess. People aren't working. People are in dire straits right now. And for the longest time, the United States has waged war against countries and hasn't seen the side of hold on i gotta fix it slides doesn't like me today 
it's really Ooh. shitty out there. <laughs> it still won't the full airports screen for are some a mess. Reason. People aren't working. People are in dire straits right now. And for the longest time, the United States has waged war against countries and hasn't seen the side effects. The people living here haven't really lived what it is to live as a victim of imperialism. But that's changing. And we can see that shift happening with what's happening with Russia and Ukraine, where the U.S. is waging a proxy war with Russia via Ukraine. It's really Ooh. shitty out there. <laughs> Did I restart it again? What is going on? All right, hold on. Let me close this browser and like restart this whole slideshow. He's right. It's really shitty out there. But, uh... It really is. It really is. <laughs> oh, she's right, you know. Absolutely. Um, let's go one more time. And action. Yeah, there we go. And of course, that's the wrong one. It's really Ooh. shitty out there. <laughs> yes, it is. The Fee. airports are a mess. People aren't working. People <laughs> are in dire straits right now. And for the longest time, the United States has waged war against countries and hasn't seen the side effects. The people living here haven't really lived what it is to live <clears throat> as a victim of imperialism. But yep. that's changing. And we can see that shift happening with what's happening with Russia and Ukraine, where the US is waging a proxy war with Russia via Ukraine. And the massive propaganda that's happening, probably around here where you'll see people demanding a no-fly zone where they completely lack the significance of what that means. And we know that it means World War III. Under the skies of democracy, under the guise of humanitarian aid, why would Americans think that Joe Biden or any leader in the last few decades gives a damn about humanitarian aid or democracy when we don't have it right here? Tomorrow will be the anniversary, the third anniversary, not something celebrating, but the third anniversary where Julian Assange will, uh, has been in Britain's Guantanamo Bay in Belmarsh. And more than ever, journalism and truth are in so much jeopardy. Everything that's happening now has been a culmination, uh, has, has come to this culminating point where we are here today and the vast majority of people are still ignoring the reality that we're living in. The ruble keeps going up <laughs> and the dollar keeps devaluing and people don't like understand what that means. And I don't think people realize what's happening here. This is a historic moment that we're living in where we're seeing people start grasping that perhaps this time we will feel the side effects of war in economically because a lot of Americans don't really start complaining until they feel it in their pocket. And I understand that because a lot of people are propagandized. This is the most propagandized country in the world. A lot of people don't have the, um, the, the awareness that a lot of you have here today. A lot of people are overworked, but the time for excuses has, has got to stop. We're at a point where people are going to suffer here. People are suffering already. People are suffering in Europe because of this war and they have absolutely nothing to do with it meanwhile we have journalists we have people who used to work for the u.s government getting censored all over social media because they're telling the truth they dare to tell a narrative that goes against the nato narrative and it, it's something that we've been talking about for a long time a lot of you have been screaming about censorship for decades and now we're at the moment where even people who were so pro-censorship and so critical of, of, of saying, well, Twitter's well, I, I a private can't, company. I can't pause the video YouTube right now, YouTube is a private right? entity. Are seeing that there is no Not difference between YouTube, Twitter, you know? the surveillance state, and the government. There is no difference between them. They are one and the same. This is why Jen Psaki can go get a job at MSNBC tomorrow. Because guess what? She's doing the same job for better pay. And she gets to go and spew her propaganda. Right. And she the vast be... majority of people have started to see that, but we're in an age of cognitive dissonance right now where it's just so hard for them to look up and see 
that that's the reality they're living in. And it's more than ever vital for us to be out here, for us to be here tomorrow, talking about what's happening to Julian. Because if we don't do it, nobody else will. And at the end of the day, in this moment, I think it's important to note that today we have voices here who speak out against the propaganda. The propaganda that's ignored the deaths of 14,000 Russian and ethnic minorities in the Donbass region for eight years, but has decided that somehow the United States and their goons in NATO care about people dying in Ukraine. They're weaponizing these people. This isn't about Ukraine. This is about the United States control of natural resources and the region in Eurasia. But there is a shift, a multipolar shift happening right now where we're seeing China push back, Russia push back. And you don't have to pick teams, but I am telling you right now, the power that the United States had where they had one in one hand and they were able to decide whatever happened, that is no longer the case and be aware that it's going to affect each and every one of us. What does and the damn wars mean? And the damn wars means literally and wars, but sometimes they weaponize our emotions and our attempts to have no wars to try to get us to say, well, I hate all wars, so let's pretend the R Russians and the United States empire that has thousands of military bases all over the world are the same. No other country in the world has the amount of military bases that we have. There is no comparison. We we are an empire. The United States is not a, it's not a nation, it's not a democracy, it's not a republic. It's an oligarchy. It is essentially a military industrial complex with a movie production company, as you can see with Sean Penn and Zelensky going to the Grammys and putting up green screen performances. So I thank all of you for being here and I, um, I didn't, intend to make a speech but I really appreciate all of you guys being here and I hope to see you tomorrow where we really are going to be demanding that a journalist does not get punished for doing journalism we're all in danger thank you so there was fee um we had is it gonna let me out of full screen now go ahead well, America is a dying empire. That's just an empire. We're dying. That's yeah. the thing. Yep. She's right. But we're a dying empire. And she should have added that. But. Yep. Yeah, I could yep. say that <clears throat> out of, I mean, the Assange persecution is probably, as a journalist, he is probably the the journalist of our time, like he is the guy of our time because what he did was he exposed a lot of secrets, the biggest dump, a hundred percent like accuracy rating. Uh, and it, this is basically a, this is all that they're torturing him for one reason, for one reason only, but two reasons. One is they hate it. They hate him so much. They want to do this to him. But the second reason is this is a warning shot. This is a warning shot to every single journalist who's not on the take, which is very few. Yeah. That um, if you do what he did, you're going to suffer the same fate and we're going to torture him until he dies. Mm -hmm. This is what they're doing. This mm -hmm. is this is basically what it is. So I, this is my opinion. And I, and I think that he needs to be martyred because... Uh, it's the only thing we're going to be able to do for him. I mean, I'm 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 being pessimistic, which is I shouldn't be, but I do not see like a good outcome for him in this. Uh, he's just their number one enemy. Um, the American people don't give it. I mean, honestly, with the exception of people who who are trying to help him, like you know activists. But in my opinion, a majority of American people just don't even talk about him anymore. They don't care about right. him. And it's seeing that is to me is extremely disturbing about it's, yeah. it's just saying it's just saying that the majority of the population just doesn't give a shit. Yeah. And the fact that they're going to get away with this, in my opinion, is is just extremely disturbing. I just so I, I think the only thing we can do is martyr him and and try to use what has happened to him to encourage other journalists to step up and and have it have the reverse effect of what they're trying to do 
Yeah. Uh, you know, instead of trying to scare everyone shitless into do, not doing what he did, we have to sort of martyr him and make sure that journalists want to do what he did. That journalists, some journalists will be willing to sacrifice their freedom to right. help people see the truth. And that that's to me, it's probably the way I take the whole thing. Yeah. But I, I, obviously I do hope and I, and I do want him to get out. I do want him to you know, see his family again. Well, and I would think it would be great that if 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 he can get at least some part of his life back, you know, but it's just it's it's the most it's extremely depressing and sad to see. Yeah, uh, just what's happened to him, and just the fact that nobody really cares, I and mean, it's sad. It's just sad. To see what kind of world we've become <clears throat> to do that. Um, well, it wasn't but four or five years ago, ten years ago, that people did care. You know. When he was calling out Bush's double taps or, you yeah. know, the, the lies yep. about WMDs exactly. or, you know, any of the times where he's not had to rescind something he's put out into yeah. the world as far as what he's published. He's a publisher. Right. That's what he does. He yeah. publishes other people's information, you know, but, you know, I know, I know. They, Misty... hated, they hated him like the intelligence community hate him at that point, but he still had support of Democrats and the Clintons and things of that nature because he exposed the Bush administration. But in the end, the minute he exposed Hillary Clinton and the Bethesda emails, that yeah. was the end because was there, the was end there was a yeah. lot in those emails. There was a lot in those emails. Even the stuff, the war crimes that he exposed about Iraq and Afghanistan. The minute he exposed all the stuff that the Clintons were into, involved with. Yeah. All the, uh, believe it or not, all the pedophilia stuff that was coming out of those leaks. It really, it really showed a lot of people a lot of a lot of serious stuff, and the the touch of Kenny was like, we can't, we can't, we can't have this, you know. Well, well I know. He's the, he's Go ahead, Angel. The, he's the Cronkite of our time, and on top of that, when uh, he was exposing Bush administration crimes, he was like, he was beloved. If you remember, I remember 20 years ago, he was beloved. It's like, wow, Assange is cool. Then once you, as you said, once he started exposing Obama administration crimes and Clinton crimes, oh my God, he was the worst enemy ever. He had to be arrested. He had to be charged. He had to be prosecuted. He spent 10 years. This is now over a decade. He's he first spent um, time in the Ecuadorian embassy for like, what, seven, eight years. And then now the last three years, he's been in Belmarsh, yeah. one of the worst prisons in the world. He's willing to die for what he believes in. And I have so much respect for that man that, that I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm amazed that he's still alive somehow. I mean, I, so much respect yeah. for that man. I mean, I don't know if I can put up with what he has. I mean, I know. I mean, so and much, he's not able, he's had a mini stroke. Even yeah, like, yeah, exactly. you know, so, uh, you know, this, this to me, I know, I know Misty has talked about with, with, you know, we, we have this, um, his extradition, uh hearing essentially the 20th right um mm -hmm. where and, and and you know she thinks it's probably just going to be a, a you know stamped page procedure you know yeah um, it does you it does give us here. an opportunity to um because he's here in the states right we now it's like now the torch is being sent over to the the the, the american side right where you know, we have the opportunity to be in places where he's at, possibly. You know, we haven't heard from him. Like, no, my, right. My my biggest hope for him is that you know, obviously, I think he's going to get extradited here. But my yeah. biggest hope is that they extradite him here, and then they say, okay, we got him, and then they let him go. Yeah, sort of like a, making a like time served. Hoping, sort of, yeah, right. Yeah. I'm hoping that they do that. Like they they say, okay, we got him. He's his mind is gone. He's pretty much a vegetable, right? Let's let you let him go now. I, I'm hoping that's like the best case scenario. Well, that's and the that's worst the case saddest, scenario is that it's the saddest part of it to me. You know, and 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 the first time I heard Misty say it, I was like, it just it it killed me. I was like, Jesus Christ! You know, it's like she essentially said, we'll never have the same Julian Assange. It'll never be the same. You know, I mean, even if he not, gets I mean, out, it'll never be the same. to him. Yeah, I mean, you could tell they drugged him. I mean, they did so much things to him. Yeah, I um, mean, you can see it. So it's just a depressing but, case to follow. You know, you know that's the thing. Um, 
if he would have taken Trump's deal, none of this would have happened. Remember when uh, Trump offered him that deal? In exchange for his um the source in the Russiagate story, he was willing to let him go. Yeah. But yeah. He, he stayed with his principles, like, no, I'm not giving up my source. So he's willing to martyr himself for his beliefs. And I and I yeah. salute him. I mean, he I mean, I would have taken that deal probably. I'll be real with you guys. I mean, if I were him, but I have so much respect for that man that but I'm willing. I mean, if he if he's actually tried to hear it to the U.S., I mean, we get we, this fight isn't over. But he'll, but, but yeah, I have so much respect for that man. Like I said before, that. Yeah. Um. So mm-hmm. uh, also this weekend, this is also uh Ricky stuff. Um. You know they they this is the pots and pans march. Yes, man. So in the dams wars. No war with Russia. Disband NATO! No war with Russia! No war with Russia! So they, they, they did that, so super good of them. I would like more Ricky. of that, please. Ricky in there, you can, you, can, you can hear Ricky representing. Yes. Um, but we also have a uh, friend of the show, Misty, who I should be on Misty. in an hour and a half on her show. So yeah, people should awesome. go check that out. Um, but... We have some banners. Hold on. Come for a walk. <laughs> We're going on a walk, Alex. So we have some banners down here. Big old banner. So that's on. I'm trying not to show. I've been told not to show anybody's houses or cars because we don't want to get in trouble by Secret Service. I'm not trying We're to get arrested done. this time. Um, okay, so we have oh, Free Assange and candles out. Another banner. Everybody say hi to Alex Hills. Hi, Alex. Hi, Alex. We love you. Oh, Alex is a badass. And also for the new people that joined in as well, because I know that's... Oh, yeah. And people. and other people who are not Alex. We love you, too. <laughs> we love you, too. So, yeah, we're just out here chilling. We're chilling. We're going to be here until maybe, like, I think sunsets at 730. So... Yeah, they're out there all day for that. You know, don't so, go Mary Garland's house. How dare yeah. you? Right? Don't do that. Don't Washington whatever you do. That. You know. Um. Yeah, I wish I'd have, I could have been there, but I had. Yeah, uh, me too. I duties. wanted to be there, but <laughs> yeah, it happens. <laughs> Who are these people? So, um, Colin is mentioning this plea deal. Uh, about Julian Assange, everyone's favorite publisher and, you know, truth teller. Um, but we'll, we'll get into who this lady is in a second. I'm sure people in the chat know her very well already, but if you're new, you'll find out. Um, so this is from Sheer Post, uh, the old, uh, Joe Loria, you know, uh, he's out here, consortium news, uh, favorite. Um, this time putting some stuff in sheer posts. So, um, he writes the U S ambassador. Well, I should go back to the title, huh? Uh, Carolyn Kennedy says U S open to Assange plea deal. Um, so this was August 15th, not that long ago. Um, the U S ambassador to Australia believes a plea bargain could free imprisoned WikiLeaks publisher, Julian Assange, allowing him to serve a shortened sentence for a lesser crime in his home country, Carolyn Kennedy told the Sydney Morning Herald in a front page interview published Monday that the decision on a plea deal was up to the U.S. Justice, Justice Department. So it's not really a dipl- diplomatic issue, she says. Right off the bat, we're fucking big swings and misses to me. Um, right. But I think that there absolutely could be a resolution, she told the newspaper. And I think this is only because of public support for Assange has grown in australia right um so kennedy noted the firm comments by u.s secretary of state anthony blinken on july 31st in brisbane that mr assange was charged with very serious criminal conduct in the united states in connection with his alleged role in one of the later compromised compromises of classified information um or was I? Oh, compromises of classified yeah. information in the history of our country. So I say that only because uh, 
just as we understand sensitivities here, it's important that our friends understand sensitivities in the United States. Ugh. Like, what? Like, that's, that's what that sounds like. Um, right. Very so, serious criminal. Can you share the same what it was? Uh, huh? <laughs> like, very no he told the truth about us that's what that's what happened right um <laughs> he said we, we didn't want him to say to people um despite blinken's strong words kennedy said but there's a way to resolve it you can read the newspapers just like i can i wouldn't read those newspapers actually just saying um right Gabriel Shipton, Assange's brother, told the Herald, Carol and Kennedy wouldn't be saying these things if they didn't want a way out. The Americans want this off their plate. Right? Do they? Or do they want it handled? I would argue the latter. Yeah. Make this go away. Make this go <laughs> away, please. Um, which we'll get to how that might happen. The newspaper said there could be a David Hicks style plea bargain. Colin, do you know that man? You heard of this guy? David Hicks? No. Cool. We'll get to him. A so-called Alfred plea in which Assange would continue to state his innocence while accepting a lesser charge that would allow him to serve additional time in Australia. The four years nope. Assange has already served on remand at London's maximum security Belmarsh prison could perhaps be taken into account. So this is no. Nope. This is saying nope. that they're saying that this could happen. Doesn't mean that it nope. does. If it does, nope. we have this. So David Hicks, an Australian, violated his rights by jailing him after Guantanamo transfer. Okay, so comes out of Guantanamo. Okay goes to Australia, okay, the same kind of deal, right? So David Hicks mm -hmm. was arrested in Afghanistan in 2001, sent to the U.S. Naval Base at Git Gitmo uh, in January 2002. In March 07, after pleading guilty under a plea agreement, okay, right. he was, con which I don't, they tried to state earlier that he could plea innocence but just take a lesser charge. That's not how it works. That's right. not how plea deals work. Explo riddle me that. Um, right. Typically, a plea deal, you give information that you want in exchange. So right. why are you exchanging? Right. What what information not would do you want him to give? What? I, you know what I'm saying? That's part it. of it. Well, he the gave, thing the is, I think they was the problem. I think they want. I think they're looking for reds. I think they're saying, look, take a bleed deal, give up your Russian sources, quote unquote. You know what I mean? Ah, true. Like, true. or any source. Right. Pick a source. I'm sure there's plenty of sources Assange has that they don't know about. You know? Right. So he may not be willing to do that to accept that plea. Um so he was convinced under the U.S. Military Commission Act of 06 with, quote, providing material support for terrorism and given a seven-year sentence. Most of it suspended, right? That's That was the plea deal. We'll suspend most of it, okay? Acceptance of the plea agreement was a condition for his return. He was transferred in May 07 to Australia, where he served the remaining seven months of his sentence in prison, Okay. By the time Mr. Hicks right. was transferred, there was a lot of information available that raised serious concerns about the fairness of the procedures by the U.S. Military Commission that should have been enough to cast doubt among the Australian authorities as to the legality and legitimacy of the sentence imposed on him. So Mr. Salvioli, Australian officials had also visited Mr. Hicks at G Gitmo and were therefore in a good position to understand the conditions under which he was held and tried. However, Australia did not do so, and by accepting to imprison Mr. Hicks for the remainder of the sentence, Australia violated his rights under Article 9 of the Covenant the committee found. As a party to the ICCPR, Australia is obliged to make full reparations to individuals 
whose rights have been violated. In Mr. Hicks's case, Australia's actions regarding the transfer arrangement were intended to help him and did, in fact, mitigate the harm he would have suffered had he remained in U.S. custody. And so the finding of a violation was sufficient reparations, the committee noted. What committee, Colin, do you think said all this and then eventually just went, ah, it's whatever. Which committee do you think right. that is? Jesus these Christ. these committees, okay? So we get back to Sheer Post. David Hicks was an Australian imprisoned by the United States in Gitmo for five years. He was ultimately released by the U.S. after pressure from the Australian government when he agreed to an Alfred plea, in which he pled guilty to a single charge, but was allowed to assert his innocence at the same time on the grounds that he understood he would not receive a fair trial. Okay, so it's right. essentially saying plead guilty. Say you're innocent. Right. Right. So Hicks was then returned to Australia where he served an additional seven months in prison. His case was then thrown out on appeal when it was established that the charge of giving material assistance to terrorists was not yet a crime on the books at the time of his arrest. Okay. Which we, they distinctly left out of that last article. Um, the Herald quoted Don Rothwell, an international law expert at Australian National University in Canberra, as saying that Assange would have to travel to the U.S. in order to work out the plea deal. So that means what, Colin? He's got to come over here. What does that mean? Not good. That's extradition. That's what that is. Right. That means Not we'll good. just round you up, put you in jail anyway, and screw whatever plea deal right. we were going to offer you. So right. um, everything that we know about Julian Assange suggests this would be a significant sticking point for him, Rothwell said. It's not possible to strike a plea deal outside the relevant jurisdiction, except in the most exceptional circumstances. However, Bruce Afrin, a U.S. constitutional attorney, told Consortium News CN Live webcast in May that it would indeed be possible for Assange to remain in Britain to work out the deal. Usually American nope. courts don't act unless the defendant is inside that district and shows up to the court, Afrin said. However, there's nothing strictly prohibiting it either, and in a given instance, a plea could be taken internationally. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's not barred by any laws. If all parties consent to it, then the court has jurisdiction. That's if you want to accept the plea deal, right? Which we right. don't know what that is yet, right? Is it, because what is it now? 185 years, something like that, right? You know, oh what, God. they drop it down to another 10? He could be dead in that time, yeah. you know? <laughs> like, literally, he had a mini stroke. Like, we're talking about, and Australian prisons aren't that much better than here, even if that was the case, Correct. So, on something he is not guilty of any crime, he's not. So right, and notice how they haven't said what his crime was. Yeah, right. Still yeah. waiting. Yeah, it's yes. So Afrin said that seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy in London and four years in Belmarsh, Assange obviously would have a fear of coming to the U.S. And our prison system is often known for rough treatment in terms of management units and solitary confinement. Afrin I mean, y'all seen Oz? Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. Not to be confused with our Oz, um, but Afrin said it was understandable that Assange would not trust the U.S. to follow through on a deal if he went to America. The U.S. sometimes finds ways to get around these agreements. Afrin said the better approach would be that he pleads well in the U.K. If at all, we resolve the sentence by either an additional sentence of seven months, such as David Hicks had or a year to be served in the UK or in Australia or time served. Shifton told the Herald that his brother going to the US was a non-starter. He said Julian cannot go to the US under any circumstances. Afrin said Assange would not necessarily have to plead to an espionage or computer intrusion offense, which is the, one of the two things he they are saying, right? Hacking or espionage, right? When he's not an American citizen. Right. That's what's happening, right? So he could plead simply to mishandling official information or even, in the worst-case scenario, conspiracy to mishandle official... Conspiracy to mishandle official information. 
a far lesser charge. I would argue conspiracy to mishandle official information wouldn't be necessarily be a lesser charge to me. I just think they're making this up. No, conspiracy conspiracy like, is thinking about doing it. Right, but in this case. But official information though, I would consider like well, arguably government Colin, it wasn't him that did that. It was the right. Washington Post. It was Right. They did that. No, the Guardian. I'm, right. I'm, that's what. All, but all I'm saying is, it just sounds like they're just trying to throw whatever. He didn't want to publish charge any of that they stuff could, yet. even though it doesn't make sense, and see what kind of sticks. That's what it. That's what the impression this kind of gives me. Yeah, I mean, and also they care espionage. Say, what? What? It, that's bogus too. Pretty much. Right. They're accusing him of spying for who? There has to be a reason for the spying. You have to right. spy for a country. Are you saying Australia used him as a spy? Are you saying Russia used him as a spy? That's what espionage I'm sure that's is. What gonna, I'm Absolutely. sure that's what they're going to go with. Right, which the, um, part of the plea deal would be like, I'm sure give up your source right. and your funding and whatever. So... Right. Um... That would also resolve the case and probably give the U.S. its satisfaction and would allow Julian essentially to hold his head up high after all these years. I disagree to some degree. No, the fact that you have I to claim disagree. any guilt when you weren't no. guilty at all. Like, like Assange is a lot more principled than that. Like, absolutely like not. The, the issue is, dude, he's been locked up in a hole for so long. He may right. take this just because it's a glimmer of hope to get out so i think this is why i want to think of it and missy can argue with this if i'm wrong i think he'll be like i think he would rather die and i think that's the kind of stance we all should be taking i think he's rather got die in revealing the truth bro, he's got two kids living, living a lot he's got two kids a wife like, you yes. might want to get back to them. Like, I'm just yes, saying, like... but here's the thing, and... I, I don't wish he would, but I, no, I think but it's a possibility. Here's, a, here's an aside, though, um, very quick. I've had this conversation with my dad in terms of... Um... You know, like, uh, I don't have the necessarily the best relationship with my dad. My dad is a Pan-Africanist very much for the movement. And, like, uh, he separated from my mom when I was very young. And one thing that I remember him saying at one point was, in a sense, he felt like he had to make a choice between his family or the movement. And he chose the movement. Do I feel that's necessarily the best decision he could have made? I don't know, because it's ended up not having I think I under I think back as a child teenager, like I didn't quite understand why he would not be for his family in the way that he should have versus like what his feelings were regarding black liberation. That being said, now as an adult, not to say I agree, but I understand why. Yeah. Because it's the idea of what do you want to be known for when you're dead and gone? And I think the idea that Julian has in his mind is, and I don't want to say that he wants to die a martyr, but it's the idea of what he represented in terms of free press and the idea of being a martyr for the truth. That, I think, at the end of the day, if he's able, the sacrifice he'll have to make for his kids, I totally get. But I think, in my mind, that's the sacrifice that well, that's, he's willing to make. That's if on he, top of the he, psychological if, torture right. involved. And that's only what we right. can, that we can see, let alone the stuff right. happening behind the scenes. So, uh, you know, I'm I not going to be upset if he chooses this, I will understand why he would have, 
Right. But right. But I think that's his decision. That's only a decision that he will have to make. But I would argue that, especially for his kids and Stella, yeah, you know, it's the idea of like that they will be able to kind of learn the truth and carry on that memory for their dad in honor of their dad. And I think ultimately to me, that will, that will something that will last beyond him, which I think to me, in my mind, that's a lot more powerful than him kind of taking a deal in this case, just to be home. That's a hard choice. I, I don't think there's any right or wrong in this, honestly. Yeah. Ultimately, that's the choice that Julian has to make. But as I said, given how I believe him to be somewhat principled, oh. I believe that obviously we don't want him, you know, to die from this, obviously. But it's the idea if you're willing to die for the betterment of the press in terms of truth, in terms yeah. of exposing, that's what's going to carry because right the press people are of, not going to right yeah. the, it's the president you know and people like us and like shout to misty if anything that's going to it could make things worse gain more momentum in terms of his advocacy well if my, that, if my um, issue with this he, is with it's a it's a half measure from these australian legal teams only because they're getting some public pressure from it to say that now we should have a plea deal. No. Right. Ask for him and, and out. Is, right. But who's to say the advocacy now should be no. Offer him He's asylum. Free. Like do right. something other than this. Right. This is this is just accept it so we can move on. That's what this is. Right. Right. And I don't think, and it sounds like, you know, Gabriel, it doesn't sound like that they're, they're not going to go for that, but mm. that's where the advocate, that's where the advocacy should fall right now is in terms of let him go. Or if you really want to mess with him, give him asylum. Yeah. You know, so um, here's uh, Bruce Afrin on Joe Laurie's and Kathy Vogan's show over at consortium. Uh, and we're, we're going to listen to him. I think the United States um, would consider offering such a plea deal, uh, this Alfred plea deal to Assange. Well, the U.S. does offer plea deals in many instances, especially in cases that touch on espionage and international issues of this nature. Julian doesn't have to plead to an espionage offense or a computer hacking offense. He could plead simply to mishandling official information or even in a worst case scenario, conspiracy to mishandle official information, a far lesser charge. And, and that would also resolve the case and probably give the US its satisfaction and would allow Julian That's essentially to hold his head up high after all of these so, years. Those charges are not in the original indictment, but you were saying to us before that the indictment could be amended to those charges. It can be amended to include what we call a lesser included offense. This is often done in cases of this nature. Kathy. Now, Stephen Kenny said to me that he hoped the U.S. wouldn't force Julian Assange to take a plea. But if so, he hoped they would never force him to come to the U.S. Would it be possible to do one without the other? You know, Kathy, that's a very interesting question. Usually American courts don't act unless a defendant is inside their district and shows up to the court. However, there's nothing strictly prohibiting it either. And in a given instance, uh, a plea could be taken internationally. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's not barred by any, any laws. If all parties consent to it, then the court has jurisdiction. And so I think that that is an option for Julian. I, look, I think that he's obviously in a troubled state of mind. He's gone through a, a horrendous experience and first virtual incarceration in an embassy, then being dragged out of the embassy, incarcerated for nearly a year for a bail jumping offense for a crime that was dropped, 
and now incarcerated for more than three years pending extradition. And so, you know, it, he obviously would have a fear of coming to the U.S. Um, and our prison system is often known for rough treatment in terms of management units and solitary confinement. And the U.S. sometimes finds ways to get around these agreements. The better approach would be that he pleads while in the U.K. We resolve the sentence by either an additional sentence of seven months, such as David Hicks had, or a year to be served in the U.K. or in Australia or time served. He's already served more than three years, which is probably what he would get anyway in a normal trial setting. So there are ways to do this if, if everyone wants to find a solution. Uh, that's a very important point. Also, by the way, he could plead guilty and make a reservation as to the constitutionality of the charge and still seek an appeal on that ground. That's really what happened in the Hicks case. In any event, there are ways to solve these problems if both sides want to. Um, anything to add on that, Care Bear? You do. I mean, as I said, it's make this go away in the way that is the most expedient for the people involved other than Assange. Yeah. So it's, it's tough because as I said, If, if this is a way for him, and, and that's not even discussed, and that's the thing, it's like, will he be able to go home? Or like, will, like none of that, is, it's just basically more prison time, basically yeah. is what we're hearing right now. You know, so to me, it's just kind of like, how different is that going to be from where he is now? The only difference is he's going to be, if he is extradited here, you know, he's going to potentially going to be put where, like, you know, the situation is going to be way worse. For him. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, like, like so he could get more like the same black sites that here, they like, put people like Epstein in that kind of stuff. Right. Um, right. And like, and I, I don't want to say stuff, you know, in terms of like, but, you know, some mess can happen. Yep. accidentally accidentally and or and the cameras you know, might not so, work and and work. and and so um right so so uh, the issue is right now is that he's in limbo right like mm -hmm. legally he's in belmarsh they haven't decided to like actually grab him and bring him here so i mean uh, you know, so on May 22nd, two days before President Joe Biden was due to visit Australia on a trip, he then canceled, right? Assange lawyer Jennifer Robinson okay. said for the first time on behalf of Assange's legal team that they would consider a plea deal. Robinson told the National Press Club in Canberra, uh, we are considering all options. The difficulty is our primary position is, of course, that the case ought to be dropped, which I would agree with. We say no crime has been committed and the facts of the case don't disclose a crime. So what is it that Julian would be pleading to? Assange right. remains in Belmarsh awaiting a final 30 minute hearing before the high court of England, Wales, which is on summer recess until October 1st. Okay. More limboing, right? Um, Assange's lawyers will attempt to reverse a decision by the high court not to hear his appeal against the Home Secretary's extradition order and against most of the lower court's ruling in his extradition case. That court, in January 21, ordered Assange released on health grounds in the conditions of U.S. prisons, but sided with the U.S. on every other point of law. The U.S. then won its appeal before the high court, which overturned the order to release Assange. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese is due to visit President Biden at the White House at the end of October at which time Assange supporters may hope that an arrangement to send Assange to Australia could be finalized. But the High Court could convene before that. If it rejects as Assange a final appeal, he could be put on a plane to Alexandria, Virginia, where he faces up to 175 years in a U.S. dungeon for publishing article information about U.S. war crimes and corruption. Yo, 
Alexandria is just right across the river from me. If that happens, there's going to be enough people here that will fly into Virginia uh -huh. to protest against that. Yeah. So 2,000 years later. Uh, Greg Barnes, a human rights lawyer. Go ahead lawyer. and do it. Right. Greg Barnes, a human rights lawyer who advises the Assange campaign. Colin's talking about getting a posse together with dynamite, and I'm down. You know, a couple of lassos. It's going to be a great time. You know, you can ride your old time horse, right? Um, <laughs> told the Australian Associated Press that Assange had come between the U.S. and Australia as Washington gets Canberra's cooperation to set up new U.S. military facilities in Australia as it ramps up pressure on China. That's why this might even be happening. Right? right? That they're saying like, hey... If we're going to do your dirty work, you're going to have to, like, let us have this one. Right. You know? So, it's clearly a diplomatic issue because it has engaged the prime minister and the foreign minister. It's not an ordinary, run-of-the-mill extradition case, Barnes said. This matter has become a sticking point in the alliance. So, yeah. Um, he's, he's not guilty. Drop the case into story. Um, anything else? I'll let him go. Look, as I said, this, if I was in his shoes, I, I, I don't think in this case, there's a right or wrong answer for him of what he should do. But I would argue I like to believe that he is as principled as I've been told he is and will not do it, even if that means his life. Um, yep. Because, again, it's the president that it will be set. You know, that um, speaks to other people who will want, like, that kind of puts other people like journalists in danger if he does. So mm -hmm. who's to say they can't implicate like Ava Bartlett or or anybody, you know, the president or anybody or us they, like it, like if, or our audience if they choose to go into citizen journalism. Like who's it like who's to yes. say that that can't happen yep. to any one of us if that happens? Look at uh like the the president here that what conspiracy to maluse government information that was pretty much what it said right like mm -hmm. the precedent of that like if he pleads guilty to that then what is that they go after everyone right. with that right and then you might so, get how given... how long in prison how long has he been there? That's then the precedent. Right. And possibly more if they then tack on espionage and whatever. Like, then it could just be, a, well, we definitely can get you for this, but we'll try to get you for the other stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So a whistleblowing would stop. There, That would not be a thing. You would just ruin every whistleblower protection you have. Which right. there really isn't any to begin with. So anyway. Julian Assange, keep the pressure on. Free Julian Assange, as you know, as we all say, like all the time, every week. Bam. First off, our friend Gordon Dimmack. We all know Gordon Dimmack. Dimmack. All right, so Gordon, the return oh, of Demac, right? Uh, where's that on the board? <laughs> so, Gordon is one of the, you know, longtime supporters and staunch advocates for the freedom and, and release of Julian Assange. Um, he's been, you know, screaming for his freedom for a long time, and he wrote a new article saying when all is exposed, 98% of Washington will fall. It had that title, which is, of course, a quote of Julian's. Okay? Yep. 
For any citizen of the U.S. of A. reading this article, I want to make one thing clear. None of what I'm about to say applies to you, to all of our American brothers and sisters. Americans have treated Gordon absolutely fine throughout his entire life. In fact, when he was spending time across the pond years ago, family he was staying with needed help. He watched as ordinary Americans rallied around to help their family, neighbor, and friend. Americans, in his experience, are good, honest, caring people. And many friends in America, and no doubt some of them will read this. I heartily, certainly hope so. Well, guess what, Gordon? One of them's reading right now. The people yep. I'm addressing this article to are those in power in the U.S. who Julian Assange would say are those regrettable elements in it that hate truth, liberty, and justice. This article is directed toward you, Joe Biden, Anthony Blinken, and many, many others in the administration and simps that cover for them, as well as plenty in the Republican Party, I'm sure, that don't, that aren't on board with this shit. Everybody hates you, America. Everybody. Absolutely every country on the planet hates you. Not just those who are your presumed enemies in Russia and China, or those who are th those countries in the Middle East, Africa and South America, who you've been sanctioning and bombing into submission in order to steal their resources for decades while assassinating any person in other sovereign nations or at home uh, who was a threat to your hegemony over this planet. Germany. Not just those countries, but all of your allies hate you too. The French hate you, America. They really do. The French fucking hate your guts. So do the Germans, the Italians, and the Dutch. The rest of Europe hate you too, especially <laughs> those who knew you blew up Nord Stream and are responsible for the deindustrialization of their continent. The British hate you for sure. Even my mom hates you, and she's the loveliest 80-year-old you could ever meet without a bad bone in her body. I'm not going to do this in Gordon's accent. I bet. I'm sure she's a wonderful woman, Gordon. You haven't seen her at the pub yet, Gordon. Everybody you know? hates you, America, <laughs> including your allies. In fact, you don't really have any allies at all. <sighs> the whole Epstein-Maxwell trafficking children to nobody saga, where none of their rich and powerful clients were even named in public, let alone prosecuted, in an obvious honey trap blackmail operation run by U.S. and Israeli intelligence services, exposed this truth to the world. Yeah. You don't have allies. Jesus was there. Mm -hmm. He knew. He knew. <laughs> he was there. Jesus well, is everywhere. Well, Jesus is your co-pilot. Then yes, he he, <laughs> he had to fly on the yeah. Lolita Express to Epstein Island. That's that's Reef's joke of the week. Um, I'm sure all our Christian brothers and sisters will just love that. Sorry, it's true. Yep. You don't have allies. You have vassal states that you hold hostage with threats of blackmail. If any country does not succumb to your whim. Whatever that may be, the file comes out and the threat of the videotapes appearing on the internet or the pictures appear in Z papers, follows, or maybe a gas pipeline critical to your country and continent gets blown to kingdom come. Make no mistakes about it. The United States of America bombs and sanctions its enemies and blackmails its friends. And I love that he includes a, chip, a clip from the Jimmy Dore show. No country on this planet joins a military alliance with the United States because they're afraid of what China and Russia will do if they don't. They join. They only join an alliance with America because they're afraid of what the United States will do if they don't. 100% true. And in the UK, where Julian Assange is being held in prison, serving no sentence for no crime, it is no different. In the UK, Julian Assange is being held in prison, awaiting extradition to the United States for publishing the truth about their war crimes. War crimes including the murder and subsequent cover-up of journalists. The UK's Crown Prosecution Service is refusing to release the full documentation of communications between their offices and the United States during the time Julian Assange sought refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy. Note, Derek Keir Stormer was head of the Crown Prosecution Service during this time. And now he's, oh, right, the prime minister. Mm -hmm. The reason they will not release this information is to do so would have a chilling effect on extraditions worldwide. Yeah, because they lied and they're covering it up. When journalist Stefania Marizzi appealed this denial of freedom of information, the head of CPS denied, to access, denied access to it again, saying the chilling effect to extraditions worldwide is worse now than in 2017, but the reason given is redacted. Yeah. We covered that story Great. too about, about Stefania and the, and the FOIA 
thing and and the, the demand and they did release some info that yeah. further confirmed what we already knew two questions sprung to mind when gordon saw that document firstly how can any country call itself a democracy while being so secretive about a matter that is clearly of such importance to the general public and in their interest and secondly what else could this reason be that to tell us what the u.s said to the cps would have a chilling effect on extraditions worldwide other than the united states of america blackmailing its closest ally or worse threatening it with all-out war should they refuse to extradite a journalist whose only crime is that he published the truth we've talked to gordon what are your thoughts so far on this one i mean he's spot on as always uh you know so, so i mean it's the Assange case is one of those things where to us it's so cut and dry that like we're surprised anyone else has differing takes you know yeah. like so you know it's like he's an Australian citizen shouldn't be tried here at all there should be no extradition like I mean you just go through the spiel again you know for a crime he didn't commit so, you know yeah, they, they right. absolutely cooked it up they keep reissuing the charges at the last minute so that they can't prepare a proper defense. Anyway, what he's saying is that if the United States can do this, if they can criminalize good journalism and reach into another country's borders and the, punish... Go ahead. What? The reason he's being <laughs> detained is because of an uh, accusation made by someone who admitted he was lying. Siggy Thorson. Like, mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, I mean on gordon though yep so if the u.s can do this if they can criminalize good journalism and reach into any other country's orders to punish any person telling the truth about their crimes and criminal activity except for russia they are not only destroying democracy worldwide they're crossing a line that fascists cross yes they are fascists and that is doppelganger stefania marici uh tori doppelganger stefania marici and that is a, a clip from a gordon uh, thing about this is the death of your right to know. He filmed this. Thank you, Deepa. And thanks to all. Deepa Driver. It's a, a great honor to be here. And I. And this was a whole speech that she gave. So this is in the Gordon article. For the UK to even consider extraditing a journalist to his certain torture and death at the hands of fascists because he did good journalism must mean what these fascists are threatening them with explosive information, with information so explosive that it could bring the entire nation to its knees. Maybe Prince Andrew and Epstein Island. Maybe somebody else. I don't know. Maybe. And if those regrettable Maybe. elements within the U.S. government that hate truth, liberty, and justice are doing this abroad, blackmailing their closest allies into torturing people for telling the truth, what do you think they're doing with their politicians and ruling elite at home? Remember President Bill Clinton flew mm -hmm. on Epstein's plane 26 times. What do you think he was doing on those trips? And why has no journalist ever seriously questioned him about it? Well, that's because they, they won't let anyone get near him, close enough to him to ask that question. And if they do, they'll shepherd him away very quickly, and then they will really be disappeared likely. Is the only way that a person gets to any position in power in the United States is if the intelligence community has leverage on them? Well, the answer is, of course, yes. Remember, these are people that will not, under, under any circumstances, release the JFK files no matter how much they promised to do it, when on the campaign trial, trail. Um, not mm -hmm. that the world doesn't know who killed them already, of course. These are the people that tried to get Martin Luther King to kill himself. A lot of these people say uh, eventually completed that job themselves. It's the same people that lied about the Gulf of Tonkin, incubator babies, and weapons of mass destruction in order to start wars that cost millions of lives and profited their buddies by billions of dollars. These are the same people whose explanation for why 9-11 wasn't stopped was that they were tracking all the hijackers who toppled three buildings in New York with two planes for years when they were in other countries, but stopped tracking them the minute the hijackers entered the United States and didn't tell anybody, let alone the FBI. Uh -huh. That's their official story. Do you think, knowing this track record for lying, that the United States should be the arbiters of truth worldwide? Do you think they can be trusted to tell the truth about anything at all? Yes. 
Forget World Trade Center, oh. Tower 7. The regrettable, uh-huh. yeah, the regrettable elements within the U.S. government that hate truth, liberty, and justice have lied so much for so long that I believe Assange is right. When, oh, when all is exposed, 98% of Washington will fall. If, however, Julian Assange is extradited to fascists in America, it won't just mean his certain death. It'll be the death of your right to know the truth. It'll be the death of Western democracy and the death of UK sovereignty. It will be the death of freedom. Because any of those things exist uh, now. Well, <laughs> you know, like... Or until Julian they, Assange They will free. definitely any... Right. None of us will be free. Um, Support our brother Gordon Dimack. Two more years, Julian. Two more years, Julian. Again, Gordon Dimack, but that's not the only Assange story I brought, and Reef loves it when I bring two Assange, two stories to to an article to a a segment. This one I caught in Counterpunch. Environmentalists owe an enormous debt to Julian Assange. Now, the reason why I picked this one specifically, I'm not a huge fan at this point of Counterpunch. They're okay. They're kind of shit, Libby. Eve Ottenberg does great work. Not crazy about the St. Clairs. But we have used them quite a bit. But we also talk about environmental disasters. And since we really hadn't talked about anything regarding the environment in this week, and we're talking about labor, and we're talking about press freedom, and we're talking about censorship, I thought this was a good way to tie in environmentalism into our second anniversary show, considering that it, it kind of is a microcosm of everything that we've done over the last two years. So, Mm -hmm. stating the obvious, but just another angle and another reason why this man should be freed, environmentalists owe an enormous debt to Julian Assange. What what is Mitchell Cohen? That's better. What is Mitchell Cohen talking about? So, most environmentalists don't even know that they owe a debt of gratitude to WikiLeaks. It wasn't only secret recordings pertaining to war and crimes against humanity that WikiLeaks published, based on the heroic work of Chelsea Manning, who downloaded thousands of secret U.S. military files. A slew of U.S. cables that Assange published revealed massive U.S. government attempts on behalf of Monsanto to coerce governments to allow foreign corporate land ownership, and with it, genetically engineered agriculture throughout the world, and to squelch opposition to GMOs, breaking down existing laws prohibiting the genetic engineering of agriculture. The cables revealed U.S. officials applying financial, diplomatic, and frequently military pressure on behalf of Monsanto and other biotech corporations. Hmm. The cables revealed... uh, They were followed by revelations that the U.S., the World Bank, and IMF loans opened up to Ukraine to to major corporate inroads, writes Joyce Nelson, right, in The Ecologist and also in Counterpunch. Loan conditions are forcing the deeply indebted country to open up the GMO crops and lift the ban on private sector land ownership. U.S. corporations are jubilant at the gold mine that awaits them. The information... Which is why BlackRock is over there. Vanguard, that's right. And uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. I know Jamie Dimon has been instrumental, I know, in the the reconstruction, quote-unquote, garbage. The originalist asshole bank, J.P. Morgan Chase, that one. Well, it wasn't Chase then, but they just kind of inherited Chase thanks to... It was was J.P. Morgan. Yeah, thanks to Tim Geithner, they inherited Chase. Um, But free Julian Assange. I can't say that enough. Free fucking Julian Assange right now. Get this guy out of prison. We love him, and he's, he's a hero. Look at this. This is yet another reason why Julian's a hero. The information under the radar here in the U.S., Yeah, who? Julian. Julian. Julia. Um, Reveal stipulation. Yes, in in terms of the U.S.'s massive arms financing of Ukraine going back for more than a decade. This was not just uh, 2022. This this didn't start with Joe Biden decided to antagonize Vladimir Putin, and Putin decided to declare an independent zone for Donetsk and Luhansk, And say, if you cross this line, I'm going to have to go into Ukraine. Stop shelling these motherfuckers. Nobody wants to talk about that. And by the way, Dennis, WTM, sirs, February 16th is when the war started, not February 24th. I'm going to acknowledge it. I'm going to be another voice saying February 16th was massive shelling starting in Donetsk. And they don't want to report on that. 
but Ukraine started shelling and antagonizing. Yeah, it must be true. You know? And apparently Doug, Doug McGregor was talking about that. And and our friend WTM Serves, he used to be in the Convo Couch Discord. Shout out to him. He's been trying to get everyone to acknowledge that the war did not start on February 24th, but rather was antagonized by Ukraine on the 16th of February. And it was all done tried to try to poke the bear and get Putin to declare a strategic military operation, which he then did on February 24th. Anyway. On yeah. April 28, 2020, President Volodymyr Zelensky, <laughs> Pokey Smurf, signed a bill into law mm -hmm. authorizing the sale of farmland in Ukraine, lifting a moratorium that had been in place since 2001. This bill is part of a series of policy reforms upon which the IMF conditioned its $8 billion loan package. Huh, how about that? WikiLeaks revelations about agriculture became the basis for understanding the mechanisms imperialism uses. That's kind of important. The U.S. exerts its muscle on other countries to allow Monsanto et al. to take over huge tracts of land in Ukraine, bypassing direct purchase by foreign countries, by foreign companies. Foreign ownership of land had been prohibited by law in Ukraine, a sudden realization that so-called internet fact-checkers have been relying on to debunk news stories on the privatized dispersal of agricultural land there. But the debunkers mm -hmm. ignore the many mechanisms utilized by foreign corporations to gain ownership and control of the land and skirt the law. So we find massive U.S. corporate investments in Ukrainian companies controlling the kinds of seeds planted and how they are grown. What? Keep in mind, Russia has blocked out uh, Monsanto. What and GMOs the FNF? Entirely. Are you kidding me? That 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 deserves a Jimmy right there. Thank you. Okay, or not. Welcome. In a, I don't. It takes I, a second. God. In a. Fuck you. Thank you. In jam. In a 2007 cable, <laughs> Mark Confidential, Craig Stapleton, then U.S. Ambassador, Ambassador to France, which we know thanks to Gordon Dimmock, hates our fucking guts anyway, advised the U.S. to prepare for economic war with countries unwilling to introduce Monsanto's GM corn seeds. <laughs> he called for retaliation to make clear that the current path has real costs to EU interests and could help strengthen European pro-biotech voices. In fact, the pro-biotech side in France has told us retaliation is the only way to begin to turn this issue in France. So, the U.S. diplomatic team then recommended that we calibrate a target retaliation list that causes some pain across the EU, since this is a collective responsibility, but also that focuses in part on the worst culprits. Holy shit. Thank you, Julian. Oh, actual fuck? Yeah, so... These are coming from WikiLeaks cables. And if it weren't for WikiLeaks, we wouldn't know any of this. In another cable, this one from Macau in Hong Kong, a U.S. Department of Agriculture director, director requested $92,000 in U.S. public funds for media education kits, quote-unquote, to combat growing public resistance to genetically engineered foods. It portrays attempts to mandate the labeling of GMOs as a threat to U.S. interests and seeks to make it much more difficult for mandatory labeling advocates to prevail. Man, this food is killing us. It literally is. And But they're making billions of dollars in profit making it and producing it, and they're realizing that with the environmental disasters, there may not be a food supply to, you know, to really take care of the entire population, so they're trying to genetically engineer it and... A lot of times it, it's poison um, or they, at least it has well, some at how, little, bit, little bit in you. How much it affects. Uh, someone was saying that, you know, wars are resource management generally. Yep. Right. And now the resource management is over the ability of the global South and access to water and arid land. Enough <laughs> to like, you know. Water, do not, water war. Like, They're going to be fighting. <laughs> Do not come. Right. Do not, do not come. So, um, um, yeah, that's the uh, old Kamala. Yes. Do not come. Yes. 
I'm gonna come. Pokemon, go to the polls. Oh God. What? Go away. Go away. Oh. Her, oh. Her, her her name's gonna come up here. The cables released by WikiLeaks revealed that the the, the officials in the Obama administration, particularly in Hillary Clinton's State Department, intervened at Monsanto's request to undermine legislation that mm. might restrict sales of genetically engineered seeds. What a shock! Under Hillary Clinton, the U.S. State Department was gung so gung-ho to promote GMOs that Mother Jones writer Tom Philpot called the agency she presided over the de facto global marketing arm of the ag biotech industry, complete with figures such as high-ranking as high ranking as former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton mouthing industry talking points as if they were gospel. Why? Don't because be she, rude. Because she was a board member at Monsanto at the time or just beforehand. She had massive stake and massive interest in promoting this and pushing this. Gross. The New York Daily mm -hmm. News reported that State Department officials under Hillary Clinton were actively using taxpayer money to promote Monsanto's controversial GMO seeds around the world. Yep. And check, okay, then there's a Mother Jones article about pushing it in Kenya in 2009. U.S. officials recommend biotech and agriculture DVDs be sent to every high school in Hong Kong. What's that, China? Cost? Well, Hong Kong technically then, uh, yeah, I guess it was. Uh, the cables revealed the joint strategic planning of Monsanto and the U.S. government. That is literally the definition of fucking fascism. The state and the corporation merged into one to come up with a series of talking points. And videos on how to educate people. In one series, Monsanto concluded that northern Thailand would be an ideal location to cultivate genetically engineered corn for export to other countries due to the area's very low labor and infrastructure costs. Sure, they can exploit everybody. And in this cable released by WikiLeaks, one country, Peru, is mentioned as recipient, and the U.S. officials suggest that even with transportation expenses across two oceans included, it would nevertheless be more profitable to grow and ship GMO corn from northern Thailand than from neighboring Argentina or Brazil, since U.S. diplomatic efforts would be used to drive down the cost of production in northern Thailand, a.k.a. exploitation. The U.S. would press Thailand to drop its opposition to genetically mod modified cultivation, and the country would be rewarded with some type of an IMF loan or a World Bank loan, I'm sure, or some type of a forgiving of their loans so that they could continue to operate. That's the way that this works. The cables provide a fascinating and terrifying glimpse into the seemingly mundane mechanisms of global imperialism and consolidation of world agriculture on a very localized level. Thank you, Julian. WikiLeaks acquired and published a searchable database and unabridged text of the secret 2015 TPP, Transatlantic Trade and Invest, uh, TTP, TIP, and TSI, TISA Trade Services Agreement. By publishing the secret text of the agreement, Assange exposed the U.S. government's pressure on other countries to purchase and plant Monsanto's patent, patented genetically engineered seeds, which required the, con, the concomitant purchase of Monsanto's patented pesticides in order for the crops to grow. So you're, it's literally like you're a drug, drug pusher who say you're selling, the, here's the virus, I'm going to sell you the virus, and then I'm going to sell you the cure. It's literally like the same thing. I'm going to sell you the seeds, and then I'm going to sell you the pesticides to make sure those seeds grow. But it wasn't Scott's. Yep. It was Monsanto. Scott's miracle Grow is no better, but Monsanto literally is one of the most evil corporations on the face of the earth. And now they're also owned by Bayer AG, which is a German company. So... <clears throat> Treaties limited the ability of one country to legally challenge environmental de depredation in trade with another, making it abundantly clear that environmental issues could not be successfully addressed in piecemeal fashion, but must be seen as integrated political, technological, economic, and scientifically packaged warfare. To succeed, movements would be compelled not only to examine the dangers of each pesticide du jour, but the underlying mechanisms by which corporations such as Monsanto 
Bayer, Dow, DuPont, Syngenta, I never even heard of that one, Novartis, BASF, and other pesticide and pharmaceutical manufacturers have come to determine the government policies overall, right? They do, as well as those of global regulatory agencies, which in turn allow them to get away with masking the truth um, about and outright lying about their danger. Yeah, what a surprise. So <laughs> while socialist and ecology activists have always exposed the collaboration between government and corporate expansion, the details revealed by WikiLeaks published documents are nothing short of astounding. They reveal the need for ecological movements to develop far more radical strategies for dealing with the immense destruction by capitalism in practice, and not just in theory or in piecemeal fashion. For this largely unknown contribution by Julian Assange, ecological activists, along with anti-war radicals motivated by Assange's publishing of the now inf infamous collateral murder video, obtained by Chelsea Manning, owe Assange a debt of gratitude that can, of course, never be fully repaid. Getting him out of jail would be a huge debt to be repaid, but yes, we can never repay the debt. We can never restore any, uh, just him to, his, to himself, let alone the praise that he's well-deserving for exposing this kind of corruption and dedicating himself, and at this point, sacrificing himself for this kind of corruption. Today, Julian Assange is locked away in a prison in Brit Britain and is fighting for his life. That's Belmarsh. The U.S. government seeks to bring this Australian citizen to the United States for a show trial and then lock him up forever if they don't assassinate him en route, as the CIA and U.S. State Department had already discussed. Well, at least that's according to Michael Isikoff, which I don't know if I buy that whole story at all, but... It's quite possible Pompeo put it in front of Trump and other people have confirmed it, so who knows. But the sacrifices that Julian Assange has made are profound and his contribution to ecological as well as anti-war movements is enormous. It is incumbent on all to demand an end to his incarceration and torment by the U.S. and British governments. And yet, despite worldwide exposure of gliophosphate's dangers and its designation as a probable carcinogen, only a handful of governments throughout the world have joined with environmental activists and health professionals in banning Monsanto's Roundup. We need to turn up the volume. Free Julian Assange now. No to GMOs and the planet destroyers. And I also want to give a shout out to, um, what's, what's her name? Um, it's, it's Villa 4 Assembly, the number four, Villa 4 Assembly. I think it, it's Mary Villa. Um, she She's great. Um, she's been doing the Stop Monsanto campaign for a while, Stop Bayer Monsanto. And God, this is so well sourced. There's a lot of stuff. Michael Cohen, he's in coordinator of the No Spray Coalition in New York City. And amazingly enough, mm. he's got to be a boomer because he has a MindSpring email address. Do you know how old MindSpring is? Do you even know what MindSpring is? Um... It was a dial-up like Netscape. Uh, basically, it was a dial-up ISP in the early '90s that then yeah, became. I think I, I think I remember. They then became Earthlink, like in 1999. Yeah, like I remember, like, I remember Earthlink. Right, but this, now you're talking where I'm at. These fuckers predate Earthlink, and his email address is still around. Yeah. Mitchell Cohen, dude, I love you. I had a I had a MindSpring email address, a long, 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 long time ago. No, Julian. All right, that was a little long. I know. Sorry. Julian, come here. But that's a good one. And again, free Julian Assange. We love you, Julian Assange. Get him out. Um, there's some uh, there's some big stuff happening, and you know, we know that there's talk of potentially a deal happening. Elbow is now going to be coming to. Uh, that's uh, Albanese, the Prime Minister of Australia, will be coming mm -hmm. to the United States at the end of October. Misty's talking about getting some kind of an action or some kind of an organization thing together. The beautiful, wonderful, and Tara Reed look-alike, or Tara Reed do doppelganger twin, Stefania Marizzi, brilliant journalist, um, 
maybe on this list, this year's list of indie media award honorees, but was not on the initial list. Certainly, certainly deserves and earns the the honor to be there. She's been publishing and working with WikiLeaks for years and years and years. <clears throat> so, first of all, I want to shout out to INN's Misty comrade, Misty Winston. Stefania is my hero. We mean we need more people like her. Hashtag free Assange now. There was a um, at some kind of an event in Oslo where they actually had one of the freed Guantanamo Bay prisoners who was giving yeah. a speech about <clears throat> imprisonment and torture. And Jeremy Corbyn was there. And um, it was a, an all star lineup that was shared by Matt O. Oh, Matt O'Brien, and uh, shout out to Matt as well. Hope you're watching. Good to see you. Thank you for all you do out there to keep awareness and keep this story out there and alive. Because I know that you're an activist pretty yep. pretty deep, and Misty said that you're fantastic, and we kind of agree. So, judge ordered the Crown Prosecution Service service to come clean about the destruction of key documents on Julian Assange. Now it's really starting to come out, folks. It's like years later. There's a lot of pressure to free him. The Biden administration is now kind of under orders. They're the third administration now to be pushing this. WikiLeaks. So after years of running up against a brick wall, the first crack has appeared in, with the latest ruling on Stefania's FOIA case issued by Judge O'Connor. In addition to the ruling, British Labor MP John McDonnell has just obtained new info from the Crown Prosecution Service McDonald is calling for an independent inquiry into the CPS's role in the Assange case. That's big. That's a Labor member of yep. Parliament. Like, what? Yep. For the last six years, they've rejected all of our attempts to shed light on the destruction of key documents in the Assange case, even though the emails were deleted when the high-profile controversial case was still ongoing. Amazing. But now the British authorities at the CPS have to come clean. They must declare whether they hold any information as to when, how, and why that documentation was deleted. And if they do hold it, they must either release it to us or clarify the grounds for their refusal. This order was just issued by the London First Tier Tribunal, chaired by Judge O'Connor, in response to Stefania's litigation based on the UK Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, in which they're represented by top-notch FOIA specialist Estelle Dehan of Cornerstone Barristers in London. Wow, that's that's like earthquake stuff. This is big crack in the in the wall. Like, are they starting to, you know, let a little air out of the balloon so that they can prep to maybe let him out? Like, they got another story coming up that. I think they're going to have to let him go. I really do. So CPS. Must, we we must, can whisper of a dream. I'm whispering. No, I'm screaming of a dream. But the CPS must comply with this judicial order by June 23rd. So we're going to find out quick. And, fa and any failure on their part to do so could lead to contempt proceedings. And I don't know what that entails and what the punishments are under contempt. Ever since 2017, when we first discovered the documents had been destroyed, we've consistently run up against a brick wall. CPS has always maintained that deletion of those documents was in conformity with their standard operating procedure. A previous ruling in 2017 by the London First Tier Tribunal, chaired by a different judge, Andrew Bartlett, averred that there was nothing untoward about their deletion, right? Uh, and that the British body instituted to uphold information rights, the, uh, the ICO, has always been pleased with the decision that there was nothing untoward about it. This new ruling by Judge O'Connor is the first crack in the brick wall. So, hmm. Judge O'Connor's also confirmed that WikiLeaks is a media organization, not a spy agency. Though he rejected all our requests to access the full correspondence between CPS and the U.S. State Department, the U.S. Department of Justice, Swedish Prosecution Authority, and the Ecuadorian authorities on the Julian Assange case from 2010 to 2019. And we know why. And we're going to we're going to talk about why in a minute, but it seems that at some point they actually reclassified Assange as a terrorist and as and WikiLeaks as a terrorist organization, which is why there were there were plans drawn up to assassinate him in London. And again, we're going to get to all this. Right? I'm sorry. 
Relative to the correspondence between CPS and Ecuador, the judge ruled in favor of the CPS, maintaining an exemption to the neither confirm nor deny that the British and Ecuadorian authorities had exchanged emails on the case. Great. Free Julian Assange. Free him right now. Let this man out like now. I don't care that it's four in the morning. Let him out. As for the case on all other correspondence <clears throat> between the CPS and, and Swedish authorities, between CPS and State Department, Justice Department, Judge O'Connor ruled that if released, the documentation would risk damaging the, the relationship of trust and confidence that underlies information sharing between prosecuting authorities and that it would likely have a chilling effect on the relationship with both the Swedish and U.S. authorities as well as with other foreign authorities. Yeah, because there's a lot of dirty laundry in there. The ruling was issued in two forms. A decision available to the public and a separate closed decision which can be accessed only by the UK authorities at the CPS and by ICO. That's interesting. The documentation on which the closed ruling is based includes, among other documents, over 552 pages of correspondence between the CPS and the Department of Justice, between the CPS and the State Department, between 2010 and 2019, including the provision of legal advice and queries on wider strategic matters relating to Mr. Assange's extradition to that country. That's the stuff that they were talking about in the Isakoff letter, in the Isakoff piece um, for, for Yahoo, the one where Pompeo was talking about assassinating uh, or have either him or somebody from CIA or someone from MI5 assassinating Assange in a shootout on a London street. I remember that was very clear. They were talking about that back in the fall. Yep. Right. So mm -hmm. amazing stuff. Um, so that was given, like they just said right there, like she said, that was given to CPS and ICO. They now definitely have or have to reveal those 552 pages of correspondence. We know they exist. I would like to know what's in that correspondence too. Hmm. So this correspondence is part of the documentation, which we've been requesting under FOIA for years and which has always been denied to us. And yet accessing it would be crucial as British authorities are assisting the U S government in extraditing a journalist for revealing war crimes and torture as if he was a mafia boss or drug dealer and jailing him as if he were a terrorist. Tired. I love how you literally mmmed your coffee. Mmm. Mm. Coffee. <laughs> My daughter literally licks her lips after she eats, so now I know where she gets it from. Thank you. Thank mm. you. Coffee. Mm. <laughs> You're welcome. It's, I'm, I'm Harvey You're Keitel. In, it's Harvey Keitel in, in Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Mm. From Amnesty International oh. to the International Federation. We have fun here, you folks. So the, even though yeah, this is do. horrific stuff. <laughs> man's locked I up know, in prison I for know. life and facing 175 years in prison, but we're 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 giggling and we have to make light of this as best yeah. we can. But see, it wasn't it wasn't like a normal like there's like a there's like mm. a, a, a the the hot mm, like mm, mm, that's hot. Mm, that's like, but no, yours was like mm coffee <laughs> like mm. that's yeah. anyway continue that. thank you so from yeah. amnesty international to the international federation of journalists all major organizations uh for the defense of human rights and freedom of the press have all called for the extradition case to be dropped in assange freed he remains in prison however waiting for british justice to decide on his appeal against extradition to the united states where he risks 175 years in prison for obtaining and publishing classified U.S. government files. Let's just talk about 175 years. 175 years? Okay. All requests to drop the charges and free Julian Assange have been ignored by the U.S. and British governments. Uh, all decisions and opinions of highly respected U.N. bodies, like the U.N. Working Group on Arbitrary Detention or the U.N. Special Rapporteur on Torture from 2016 to 22. 22, Nils Melzer, have been completely ignored by the British government, if not ridiculed, as occurred with the UNWGAD decision. 
Now that Judge O'Connor has rejected our request to access these documents, in particular the correspondence between the U.S. and U.K., the oversight rule that the Fourth Estate should play also risks being severely undermined. And yet we are not alone in our call for public scrutiny. In addition to this authoritative report by Nils Melzer and our FOIA battle, recently a British Labour Member of Parliament, John McDonnell, has submitted a FOIA request to the CPS full of detailed questions which were just answered by the Crown Prosecution Service. Speaking to IFQ, um, John McDonald told them that it's become clear that there must now be an independent inquiry into the role of the CPS in relation to the case of Julian Assange. We need full openness and transparency. I like that. So this talks about the role of the prosecution service in the Assange case. What, what did it do? It's been a key player since the very beginning, 2010, the year in which Assange and WikiLeaks published the first classified U.S. documents for which he risks life in prison. And the very same year, he ended up under investigation in Sweden for alleged rape. Since 2015, the author of this article, that's Stefania, has been engaged in trench warfare to unearth the facts about Julian Assange, uh, oh, the author of, and the WikiLeaks journalist through FOIA cases in the UK. Oh, right. So she wants to know what they, what they're talking about and what they know in UK, Sweden, US, Australia, we've experienced tremendous pushback and the process has been fabulously expensive. Four governments have been denying us access to the documentation. And nonetheless, our FOIA work has permitted unearthing some crucial information, such as the fact that it was the CPS that advised the prosecutors with the Swedish Protection Authority against the only investigative strategy which could have led to a quick resolution of the Swedish case, questioning Assange in London rather than insisting on questioning him only after extraditing him to Sweden. Why? To Sweden, yeah. Yeah. This legal advice was delivered by Paul Close, a lawyer with CPS's Special Crime Division, which is the division responsible for prosecuting high-profile cases and help create the legal and diplomatic quagmire which helped keep Assange arbitrarily detained in London from 2010, initially under house arrest for 18 months, and then confined in the Ecuadorian embassy for seven years. Ecuadorian prison for seven years. Oh, embassy. That wasn't a prison. Yep. Now he's been in Belmarsh, a real prison, in 2013. That's, yes. Well, even the Swedish authorities began to question the dead end into which they had waited at the advice of the British authorities by insisting on extradition. They considered dropping the extradition case, writing to the CPS, hope I didn't ruin your weekend. Why would a Swedish prosecutor dropping an extradition attempt for a sex case in Sweden ruin the weekend of CPS authorities? There are too many unanswered questions in this case. Some of the key decisions were taken when the CPS was headed by Keir Starmer, current leader of the British Labour Party. What role, if any, did Starmer play in the Julian Assange case? Why is he currently leading the Labour Party, and why is he, was he prime minister? Briefly. The highly anomalous handling of the Swedish case by both the Swedish prosecutors and the CPS resulted in justice for no one, contributed to the devastation of Assange's health, cost British taxpayers at least £13.2 million to keep the Ecuadorian embassy under siege, resulted in the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention decision that Sweden and Britain had arbitrarily detained him since 2010, and finally led the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Nils Melzer, to denounce 50 perceived due process violations. Not, not much, right? Yep. What, what role did Keir Starmer yep. play in that? I'll, I'll let you kind of wax poetic on that for a second. I think you have some thoughts on Keir Starmer and what the Brits have done to Julian. Yeah, I mean, there's so much. I mean, the fact that this is, they've thrown, it, it's straight up, he said he lied. Like, he said he lied in this case. Like, their, their main witness said he was lying. Yep. Like, how are we still detaining him? And why are the Brits detaining him? Other than completely, like, right. Being bullied Other than, by uh, 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 the U.S. They I, keep I, him in a holding pattern for us. They have, they have no case against him. 
Yep. Hey, he's an Australian citizen to begin with. So you're trying him for something that was lied about. He's not. Where's where's the Australian government to like get this guy out of here? Well, uh, we we know what just happened. Uh, they just they just made a deal. They just made a deal. Um, they're gonna they're gonna do more NASA shit in Australia, basically. Right, and that's what they got. Right, and you know that that's what they got for looking the other way and shutting the hell up. Because Alba was supposed to say something to Biden. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. So again, thankful. I'm great. I'm very grateful tonight. The Swedish case is now <laughs> I know. Swedish case is now closed. Yet not only do these questions and the alleged violations flagged by Nils Melzer remain unaddressed, but the CPS is still playing a prominent role in the Assange case, as the United States is acting through CPS to try to extradite him to the US. That's why it's crucial to dig into the actions of the CPS to assess its full correspondence with the American, Swedish, and Ecuadorian authorities, and in particular, to access the correspondence of Paul Close. Why? All authorities have refused to clarify how many pages they hold on Assange, but the Crown Prosecution Service did provide us with an estimate of their correspondence with SPA, that's the one in Sweden, from 2010 to 2015, they reportedly exchanged between 7,200 and 9,600 pages. Over the last eight years of our FOIA battle, we've obtained just 551 pages from the CPS and 1,373 yeah. pages from the Swedish Pro Pro Prosecution Authority. Of these 1,373 pages, only 310 represent correspondence between SPA and CPS. They got a bunch of other stuff with it. When we tried to access the full correspondence of Paul Close, the CPS replied that his account had been deleted after he retired in 2014 and that, quote, all right. the data associated all the data. with his account was deleted when he retired and cannot be recovered. How convenient. We covered this. Yep. By the way, on, I think I in the news. We covered I think you it did. As well. I think you did. Um, Is that yeah. Kiriaku did that part? I think I think that had something to do with a Kiriaku maybe, thing. Maybe somebody. We um, also destroyed somebody. a substantial part of the documentation on the case, including an email from the FBI dated more... March 2017, when we know the CIA was formulating plans to kidnap or kill Julian Assange. We discovered this fact only last February and only because the Crown Prosecution Service disclosed this information about their Swedish colleagues to us after we tried to obtain these documents from Sweden for years to no avail. To this day, the Swedish authorities have not provided us with any explanation as to why key documents were destroyed or when and how and on whose instructions. All of our attempts to shed light on the matter through litigation have failed. Not surprise. Um, why were key documents destroyed by CPS? It's probably the key question that he, they've always maintained there was nothing unusual about the deletion of his account. It was deleted three months after he retired in 2014. And at that point, Keir Starmer was no longer even director of prosecution at CPS. Hmm. It's also always maintained that the deletion of the account was consistent with their record management policies, but CPS's record management manual states that general correspondence related to a criminal case file should be retained for, quote, five years from the date of the most recent correspondence. That would still be five years from today because they're still going on, but they deleted it anyway, right? Because it's still a relevant active criminal file case. The guy's in prison there now. So, yep. after reiterating to us for years that Paul Close's emails were destroyed three months after he retired, last January, the CPS changed their version of the facts, stating that there is a document which is described as in desk instructions in relation to the deleting of material within 30 days. So, was Paul Close's account deleted within after three months or after 30 days? And why was it deleted? Is the Crown Prosecution Service confident that all the relevant emails and documents were transferred from the email account and copied to the case file before deletion? My guess would be no, but she's asking the question. So in recent months, we've got a member of parliament from Labor, John McDonald. He filed a FOIA request with the CPS to learn whether the then Director of Prosecution, Keir Starmer, was involved about the advice 
Paul Close gave the Swedish prosecutors not to question Assange in London and about the fact that the Swedes considered dropping the extradition case in 2013. Why they're getting so granular at this point? Why do you need this little nitpicky bullshit, whatever reason? Let the guy out. Free this man. Free this man. All right. He also asked which documents CPS destroyed, why, how, and on whose instructions, and if CPS could provide him with a list of legal cases in which the CPS deleted key documents in the last decade other than this. Finally, McDonald asked whether Paul Close's email account could be retrieved from any backup tapes or any other backup me methods. My guess is there's probably a backup dat sitting around somewhere that's got it. So, with regard to Keir Starmer, CPS replied to the British parliamentarian, a parliamentarian that has teeth, how about that? And the search yeah. of the documentation has revealed no indication that the CPS hold information on whether Starmer was involved about those key decisions relative to Assange. Yeah, they don't put that stuff in writing. However, they confirmed, they clarified, we hold 59 boxes of information pertaining to the case of Mr. Assange. Oh my God. The team concluded yep. that it would not be proportionate to review all of these in depth in keeping with the provisions of the FOIA Act. What? Why not? Give me those boxes right now. What's in the box? As with the destruction of Paul Close's email account, the CPS argued that it cannot know that all relevant emails were transferred to the case file before the account was deleted, though that was the standard practice. Finally, the public authority replied that CPS does not hold any backups of deleted email accounts and that in the last decade, they could only identify a single case of premature destruction of case material deleted to, related to a case other than that of Julian Assange. While CPS does not characterize the case that of the deletion of Paul Close's account as a data breach, in the other case, it does. That's also interesting. Such bad luck for Julian Assange. He was held in limbo for almost a decade in part thanks to the legal advice CPS gave to the Swedish prosecutors. Key correspondence on this case was destroyed perhaps three months or perhaps 30 days after the lawyer who worked on his case from the very start retired. There's no way to know what was destroyed and what was kept. There are no backups. In 10 years, there was only one case of premature destruction of documents. One other case. Assange's bat bad luck, back luck, was such that not only did the Pro Pro Crown Prosecution Service destroy documentation on his case, but Swedish prosecutors did so as well. As for the rest of the correspondence between CPS and the U.S. authorities, obtaining it by going through the law would seem to be mission impossible. Do, 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 do. That's, not, that's Mortal Kombat. Yeah, it's very similar. It's very similar. Right. John McDonald's believes that there must be an independent inquiry into the role of the CPS in relation to the case of Assange. It could be the last and only chance. Will it happen? After years of running up against a brick wall, the first crack has appeared in, with the latest ruling on Stefania's FOIA case issued by Judge O'Connor. In addition to the ruling, British Labour MP John McDonnell has just obtained new info for the Crown Prosecution Service, but the CPS must comply with this judicial order by June 23rd, and any failure on their part to do so could lead to contempt proceedings. A previous ruling in 2017 by the London First Tier Tribunal, chaired by a different judge, Andrew Bartlett, Verd that there was nothing untoward about their deletion, right? This new ruling by Judge O'Connor is the first crack in the brick wall, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about why in a minute. But it seems that at some point they actually reclassified Assange as a terrorist and as and WikiLeaks as a terrorist organization. We know they exist. The highly anomalous handling of the Swedish case 
by both the Swedish prosecutors and the CPS resulted in justice for no one, contributed to the devastation of Assange's health, cost British taxpayers at least £13.2 million to keep the Ecuadorian embassy under siege, resulted in the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention decision that Sweden and Britain had arbitrarily detained him since 2010, and finally led the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Nils Melzer, to denounce 50 perceived due process violations. Not not much, right? Yep. What what role did Keir Starmer yep. play in that? I'll I'll let you kind of wax poetic on that for a second. I think you have some thoughts on Keir Starmer and what the Brits have done to Julian. Yeah, I mean, there's so much. Thanks to the phenomenal people over at. Consortium News, Kathy Vogan. Shout out to Kathy. She's phenomenal. She is, yes, an Indie Media Award winner, or at least Consortium News is. But Kathy publishes this tweet and says, for all you techs out there who want to know exactly why the Assange hacking allegations are bogus, here's the statement of the forensic examiner, Patrick Eller, expert witness in the extradition hearing. She says, one thing I should add is that in re-examination, uh, uh, Eller apologized for using, for using Assange's name in his statement because there was no proof, nor was he asked to prove, that the moniker Manning was chatting with was Assange. And she puts that here with this T-skiff or whatever. This is very complex stuff. Rick Haddad writes a whole article about it, and that's what I want to share with you now. So let me go here and I will back out of, oh, go back one, uh, back here, keep out, bring this up and go to Tariq Haddad's article. It's actually like really deep stuff, metadata, <clears throat> uh, who broke it down? Matt O'Brien broke it down today and I don't I didn't bring that up damn it let me see if I can find it real quick uh, uh Matt, 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 Matt. Cue, cue the Jeopardy music alright release some chats oh boy I put the um <laughs> I put the link to our episode on INN News with special guest Misty Winston, um, where we talked about those Assange files being purged. So Sweet. people should control click that little link out and watch it after after boats. Sweet. Um, okay, I'm on I'm on his page. Uh, there's that Mansoor thing from earlier today. Uh, he broke it down. Where was it? This was here. It is boom. This is an awesome thread, and we're going to go through this thread real quick. Okay. Uh, you're not seeing my DMs. Good. Now let's go back here. We'll go to IndieBe. Okay. And we'll blow this up a little bit more so you can see it. So this is Matt O'Brien. Go follow him. He's awesome. So what he says is that even the allegation that, that Assange may have tried to help Manning be anonymous is bogus. They have nothing. Free Julian now. All right. And what he's saying is, is out of this report, and this is the report that actually was released in 2010, I believe, in 2020, September 25th, Assange extradition hearings statement of Patrick Eller. So we're just getting access to this. And what this is talking about is that this is shocking I, had, I at least thought that they had a slither of grounds for suspicion Assange may have tried to help Manning protect her identity, but they have nothing. This testimony is from none other than the former command digital forensic examiner for the U.S. Army. He kind of has some knowledge about this, right? Feel me? Mm -hmm. This expert testimony debunks the theory that Assange provided any assistance to Manning and strong evidence for an alternative explanation. Chiefly, Manning had 
Yeah, but that Manning had already leaked most of the documents before the Jabber chat alleged to be with Assange even happened. Oh, great. So he just collected all of it. Mm -hmm. cool. It was already out there and public. The hash Manning allegedly asked someone on this Jabber for help to crack would not have given her access to more material or even anonymous access to any material. Evidence is strong that she instead wanted it for reinstalling software after computers were re-imaged. More on her motive of cracking hash only to reinstall programs after re-imaging. Others testified during her trial that she was asked to help reinstall software that was not approved, but was deemed useful by her colleagues. And I, I read this earlier, so what a shock. Once again, key evidence was destroyed that would have helped to, pro to prove this alternative despite specifically being requested by the defense team. So you, what you see is, again, a pattern of things being, evidence being destroyed regularly. So to summarize, there is not a shred of evidence that Julian played any active part in the Manning leaking. Evidence to the contrary exists, and the key evidence was destroyed. This testimony was provided by the former digital command, command digital forensic examiner to the U.S. Army of all people where he says that he served for 20 years in the U.S. Army during which time he held positions of the role of criminal investigator and supervisor of, of investigations relating to digital evidence in particular. From 2012 until 2019, he was the command digital forensic examiner and was responsible for all administrative inspection and oversight functions within a digital forensic program, which included more than 80 forensic examiners at U.S. Army criminal investigation Head, uh, command headquarters in Quantico. This is the guy who testified that there's no way Assange could have performed any part of the hacking because all the material was already out there and Manning already had it before she contacted Julian Assange. That's what this is. So, again, why is the FBI not dropping the hacking case? Or not the, the, I mean, the Justice Department, not the FBI. Sorry. So that's because next. he did that hack that one time. Just that one time. Kristen, who is running WikiLeaks in Julian's absence, posted this post, this this tweet, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the FBI reopening the investigation into Julian. <clears throat> I think that we're going to probably glaze over that pretty quickly because there are there is that that new thing that happened with with um, El País today from from the Spanish newspaper that I really want to get to, but. DOJ's failed mission, not even a serial fraudster and sex offender Thor Asin could be relied on a star witness. Arson, persons previously hostile to Julian even refused to take his place now. Will they try next try to enlist astrologers and fortune tellers? The attempt to put legal cosmetics on the prosecution of Julian is becoming more pathetic by the day. Let's just stop this cruel force and free Assange now. So they've subpoenaed some, nice. some FBI agent named O'Hagan, and we have a long a little bit to talk about with O'Hagan. Um, now, there was a thread. I noticed a quote to you by Jara Perillo, um, who then writes this thread that's really fascinating. Oh, my God, I just noticed that the cops who went to question Andrew O'Hagan were from Counterterrorism Command. I previously wrote that UK and USA might have secretly classified Julian as a terrorist which would explain the bizarre twists in his case. And now I'm going to pause for a second, and we're going to open up to that thread, because that I found fascinating as well. Okay, let's go back here. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. perfect. Beautiful. Okay. Here's the article I wrote for Michael Westbiz two years ago, looking at all the Here's evidence suggesting. Article I wrote, right? 
that Julian one, had one been secretly that... classified as a terrorist. And that was, that's right here. And it was right there. Is it now cool for, and normal for UK anti-terror cops to deliver interview requests for the FBI? That's Australian, by the way. Uh, Empire State Building mm. in London. Oh, Empress. Uh, you know what? I read that three times when I saw Empire State Building. I was like, wow, I didn't <laughs> know there was an Empire State Building in London. No, Someone's em been Pavlov on that. The Empress yeah. State Building story. Maybe that's where the Empire State Building even got its idea from. I don't know, but. So here there were the, the, key, the key considerations in why they had classified Julian a terrorist secretly were the major stories disappearing from the media about Siggy, about the CIA assassination plans, about the CPS emails, etc., which we just talked about, the lack of due process in legal cases, the fact that Biden called Assange a high-tech terrorist, the U.S. government designating WikiLeaks a non-state hostile intelligence service, plus refusal to release FOIA docs in U UK, USA, U Sweden, Australia, exactly what Stefania was talking about. And the UC global cases, which had stalled in Spain, but now we've got a little break. And then, of course, the maximum security jail with strip searches for court appearances. So, will the UK cops ever use anti-terror laws to access O'Hagan's tapes? Would we ever know if they did? Well, in 2017, <laughs> Mike Pompeo called WikiLeaks a non-state hostile intelligence service after often abetted by state actors like Russia. Russia, Russia, Russia. Right. Labeling Assange a terrorist would help legalize the CIA assassination plans, and UK agreed to uh, to assist EJ by shooting plane tires. Right? He, who says, we have to recognize that we can no longer allow Assange and his colleagues the latitude to use free speech values against us. To give them the space to crush us with misappropriated secrets is a perversion of what our great constitution stands for. Misappropriated secrets. To crush us with the okay. Fuck you, Mike. With their with the truths that they got uh, that we didn't want them to get. That's what that you know. Okay. So now he says that update. I am reliably informed that a mutual legal assistance request might well be delivered by UK counterterrorism police in this strange new post 9 11 world we inhabit. Still, I will leave this thread up as I find it all very strange indeed. Strange is the least we can say about that. Yep. Um, let's talk about O'Hagan for one second. This guy, and we're going to rely on Craig Murray for this one. Craig says uh, in a response to someone who's a ta who, who is supporting O'Hagan, and this was from 2017, a post, a co comment under one of his articles, that O'Hagan is a deeply unpleasant establishment shill. He is wall to wall on the BBC lately. During the election campaign, he was given an amazing uninterrupted 10 minute monologue of the R4 Today program for a piece on how the government now needs to employ tens of thousands of censors in battalions for real-time censorship of the internet. Yes, really, I'm not making it up. And considering that BBC just came out with Verify this week, this is also relevant. O'Hagan received £100,000 from Canongate to ghostwrite Assange's autobiography. £50,000 was due to be passed on to Assange after being given all the, document the documentary materials by Julian, O'Hagan decided to renounce the deal and keep all the cash himself, by himself, by doing it without Assange, keeping the documentary material. A very, very nasty person. Not cool. So that's who yep. they're now trying to get the records from about his material that Assange had provided him.
get to the what I woke up to this morning, which was this story about UC Global that best that Bestie shared from El Pais. So um, yep. it's pretty unbelievable, but you can read here more than 250 extra gigabytes of files related to the surveillance of the founder. What? Huh? And then we also have Tariq Haddad who had written, who had written a thing about um, the 2020 release that we talked about earlier that Matt commented on as well, that Kathy has shared. Um, now we also have him commenting on this Al Pais piece. He's written up a report, including his own original reporting on the matter. Um, this is required reading in his opinion. And I would agree because it was really good. So let's go back there. Let's go back here. Let's go to Tariq Haddad's article and let's check out what he's talking about. Uh, but before we do that, let's go first to the El Pais article because I do want to give credit to the man who wrote this article and there's video here and it's, it's kind of heartbreaking, but I want to, I want to show this too. Um, all right. So the writer is Jose Maria Irujo. Irujo. Um, I want to make sure we've got volume up. Good. And go. Do a kickflip. That's not a kickflip. Channel your inner Rondi Mullen. Do it. Thank you to El Pais for giving us that and to the Ecuadorian embassy. I mean, to, you know, the UC global case that's going on in Spain. Um, and we'll have that. Grab us how uh, recent the footage is. Uh, that was from within the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, I don't know exactly when. So that would have been. That would have been like before how 2017. How long have you been in prison for? Well, that would have been before 2019. But I don't know exactly when. Yeah. Here's the uh, here's the article from El Pais if you want to check that out and read it. Um, but I do want to go through... Do the math, Rain Man. Tarika Dad's article. And there's David Morales. Okay, pictured at one of the company's offices with a colleague who is faceless. But that's David Morales right there. That's the guy that really rigged all this spying against Assange, either knowingly, he had to know what he was doing by the end of it, but 
This is the, the key thing, Tariqa Dad says. Spanish police omitted a very relevant volume of material in the judge investigating spying allegations against UC Global owner David Morales, the former Spanish Marine accused of breaching Julian Assange's privacy while the former while the WikiLeaks founder sought political political asylum in Ecuador's London embassy, according to a new report in El País. An investigation into Morales was opened by Spain's Audencia Nacional, a Madrid court with national jurisdiction to investigate major crimes in July 2019. It came after two witnesses from UC Global, the firm contracted to provide security for the Ecuadorian embassy, approached Assange's lawyers, alleging that Morales had used this access to surreptitiously eavesdrop on Assange, his visitors, as well as meetings held with lawyers and medical professionals, and handing over the acquired materials to America's Central Intelligence Agency. Yes, this is what happened. I, we, we have to go over this. Once a criminal case was open, the, premise, the premises of Morales' home and businesses were raided by Spanish police on 17 December of that year. In the process, police confiscated over 20,000 pounds, euros in cash. Not That's not pounds, that's euro in cash. Two guns with serial numbers scratched off, one of which was loaded, as well as physical files, laptop, laptops, mobile phones, and external storage devices in the form of pen drives and hard drives. Copies of the digital files were subsequently sent to the presiding judge, as well as Assange's Spanish lawyers who trawled through the evidence to compile a criminal case. And these are the, the guns, and there's the serial number scratched off. You can see there in the picture. Mm -hmm. However, in going through the files, exceeding a terabyte and a half of data, Assange's lawyers noted that a number of the files were corrupted in the copying process, making them inaccessible. They successfully petitioned the judge right. to have their own IT experts make new digital mirrors of the images uh, of the devices in January of this year. Huh, how about that? How about that? About it. Now, according to their recent interview with El Pais, the lawyers made a shocking discovery once the new data had been accessed. Almost over 250 gigabytes of material originally on the devices was never included in what the judge or lawyers had received. It includes a staggering total of 551,616 files and 973 emails previously unseen. Among them is a folder titled Operations and Projects, like projectiles, in which further directories are broken yep. down by region. Going to North America and then to USA, a folder is found within the title CIA, in there with the title CIA, in there are images and video footage from the secret surveillance undertaken in the Ecuadorian embassy. Hmm... There are also files labeled Ladies' Toilet, where UC Global plays hidden oh. microphones after learning that that's where Assange took his <laughs> lawyers in an attempt to evade other forms of surveillance. Also that his lawyers were women, Jen Robinson and Amal Clooney, or Amal, I don't know what her name was before, and then later on, Stella yeah. Morris. Others were labeled... Fidel, as in reference to Fidel Narvaez, the former Ecuadorian consul who attempted to help Assange escape the embassy by means of a diplomatic passport. The finding is hugely significant, although previously received files showed Morales texting his colleagues with multiple references to working with the American client, American intelligence, and the agency of Stars and Stripes, in addition to bank, phone, and flight records placing him in various American cities when key decisions were made, there never appeared to be an explicit reference to the CIA. That is now not the case, and it should be instrumental in proving the criminal case against Morales, as well as to the civil suit in the Southern District of New York filed against the CIA and its former director, Mike Pompeo, on behalf of Margaret Rat Ratner Kunstler, Deborah Herbeck, John Getz, and Charles Glass as the plaintiffs. <clears throat> Further still, this now becomes the second instance of Spanish police appearing to obstruct the Assange investigation. Everybody obstructed the Assange investigation under orders from the U.S. and CIA. That's my own addition. That's not Tariq's assessment. In a January meeting 
with Assange's lawyers in Spain, Aitor Martinez, told the author of this piece that following a December 2017 break-in at his firm's offices in Madrid, the ILOCAD practice set up by a former judge, Baltasar Garzón, the matter was investigated, but when Martinez followed up, police said there was no file in existence in relation to the break-in. What? Further follow-ups about this fact did not yield any additional information. But here's the cam footage of somebody breaking into these offices. These are screen grabs of CCTV right. footage from the law from nice. the law firm. We remember this. Like we covered this. Yeah. I think we covered this last yeah. year. Maybe. The break-in, which is believed to be carried out by professionals who use gloves and other means to avoid detection, is suspected of being linked to Morales and UC Global due to testimony provided by one of the two witnesses. Because in his statement to, to the Spanish court, which is too anonymized to protect him from potential reprisals from his former boss, said, I recall that at the end of November 2017, David Morales told the company workers that the Americans were very happy with the information that we'd supplied, but that they would need more. To this end, Morales spoke about the possibility of entering the legal offices of ILOCAD, which is the law firm which is headed by Baltasar Garzón in Madrid, given that Mr. Garzón coordinated the legal defense of Julian Assange. This would allow us to obtain information concerning Mr. Assange for the Americans. I believe we found that they had placed cameras in his office, too. Mm. Two weeks after this conversation, the national media reported that two men in Baklavas had entered his law offices. Remember, we reported on this. I recall that the, new, that the news was shared amongst the employees in the Jerez office. And we speculated whether this could have to do with what our boss, David Morales, had suggested. Morales is currently under house arrest while being investigated for breach of privacy, violation of confidentiality of attorney-client privilege, bribery, and money laundering. Nice guy. Spanish yep. case against him is continuing, and lawyers recently filed a request to extend the investigating period by an additional six months. And as we know, Assange, meanwhile, has now spent over four years in prison in Brit Bill Britain's HMP Belmarsh, Her Majesty's uh, HM is Her Majesty's Prison. That's what HMP stands for. Belmarsh. Yeah. Um, while well, U.S. attempts to extradite him to the country continue. He is wanted in connection with obtaining and publishing the infamous collateral murder video, as well as U.S. military logs from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Defenders argue that the publication of these files is no different from what journalists do every day, and the prosecution is an assault on press freedoms. Uh, but the U.S., of course, says it's a violation of the Espionage Act, except that he wasn't bound by the Espionage Act, and that Assange should spend decades, if not the rest of his life, in incarceration. Support Tariq Haddad, TariqHaddad.com. That was a good article. To me, this is the smoking gun. Like, literally, this is the smoking gun. Yeah, they now have yeah. the video footage. We now have the video footage off of this guy's computer in a folder labeled CIA that they never gave. And now we have it. Why isn't he out right now? Why isn't he out right now? And I think Misty would totally agree with me. Uh, here's the INN News episode where he purged the Assange files with special guest Misty Winston. Go check that out for sure. Okay. Yep. Um, I saw a question by Crab. Uh, where was it? Something, something. I Now I can't find it. Oh, here it is. He says... Do you guys even think that if Assange gets out now, he'll be able to live the rest of his life at ease or in his mental case gone for good? I would No, he's already mentally broken. I would say that he's he just had, just much had a gone, stroke. He needs he needs to he needs to get out. Just for his physical safety it, safety. Yes. It makes me sad too. Um they've they've already kinda um um Mouse SF, think of how much we lost with Julian out of commission. It is awful, and maybe one day. But even with him out, I don't think that we would get that Julian Assange. I don't think he would go back to doing WikiLeaks, and I would totally not fault him, blame him one bit for not doing that. Um, he's done more than enough, and he deserves to live his life in peace at this point and be out and free.
Presenza, which one was pretty good, why the release of Julian is crucial for our future. And I think this doesn't cover any new ground specifically. Um, it kind of rehashes, but I love that it was posted in Brazil, in Berlin, and in German, and it's available in six different languages, including English. And this is actually a speech delivered by Fabian Scheidler at, at the Brandenburg Gate, which is in Berlin on World Press okay. Freedom Day. That was back in May. So a minute I was going to, yeah. you know, so we, we can read this whole one. Uh, before we do that, what I wanted to do was show you guys what the slideshow thing was going to cover. Mm -hmm. I have the free Assange, and this is a great, beautiful picture. Beautiful, big, bold picture. Don't be rude. So, okay, Don't so it says the, ca the case has been much a topic of much debate and controversy in recent years, so very very high level. What's, what's Fabian saying in his, in his essay? One of the key arguments put forward is that the case of Assange is about more than just one man. It's about protecting fundamental rights to free speech, right? That's pretty good. Assange's work yep. as a journalist and publisher has been instrumental in exposing corruption, wrongdoing around the world, shining light on issues that would otherwise have remained hidden from public view, 100%. It never mentions the Iraq war logs or anything specific. It it stays very high level. It this makes kind of like businessy slideshows in a way. <clears throat> so by prosecuting Assange, governments are sending a message to journalists and publishers everywhere. If you reveal information that we don't want you to, we will come after you. This in turn threatens the foundation of our democracy, which relies on free and independent press. So this it's pretty good. You know, it's it's not too bad at a high level for a summary. Tell me what this is about. Oh God, Another key. What? What was All that? Right. Can, can I, can oh, I hear that? Oh, thank you. Nope. <laughs> He's curating still. I folks. didn't mean that. I'm not. Okay. I'm not. I just exited out of a thing and it was still, it automatically played. So, so. another key argument put forward by Scheidler is that the release of Assange is crucial for the future of our society because power, because of the power of information. And in today's world, information is more valuable than ever before, and those who control it hold immense power. That his work with WikiLeaks has shown us just how much information is being kept from the public and how important it is to have access to this information in order to make informed decisions about our world. By releasing so this is actually really good, right? So this is like five or six slides, a threat of authoritarianism, and here's our conclusion, right? Now <clears throat> I wanted to contrast that to exactly what he writes, because he does say they do say that this is not a, just about one man. It's about the very foundations of our society. And he does say all of those things. However, however, all right, if we actually go to the article, all right, it's a lot stronger in language. They really kind of clean it up and really Water try to down. soften it for the audience. So here is the speech. We live in an inverted, perverted, a perverted world. Julian Assange has uncovered war crimes as a journalist, but none of the criminals has ever been charged, let alone convicted. Instead, the man who revealed the crimes has been incarcerated for four years in inhumane conditions at Belmarsh High Security Prison in London. Nils Melzer, UN Special Rapporteur on Torture from 2016 to 2022, concluded that Assange has been tortured by this treatment. Julian yeah. has not been charged with any crime in the UK, elsewhere, or in Europe, or in his native Australia. He is in custody solely because the U.S. is demanding his extradition to face charges under a draconian World War I Espionage Act and imprison him for the rest of his life. War and lies are closely linked. Right? So these are, these are Fabian's words. But Assange Fabio? is not a spy, Fabian. He's not a spy. He's a journalist and has acted as such. If he were extradited and convicted, it would set a dangerous precedent. Every journalist on Earth in yes. the future would have to fear being imprisoned for life as a spy for revealing dirty secrets of government. That would be the end of freedom of the press as we know it. <clears throat> yep. What is he in prison for? Well, he's in prison for showing the truth about our wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, elsewhere. War and lies are very closely related. Uh, wars cannot be fought without lies because most populations reject these wars as soon as they know the truth about them. Of course they do. Governments never tr tell the truth about their wars because otherwise they lose the support of the population. Embedded journalists don't tell us the truth about wars. After the disaster of Vietnam, 
Various concepts have been developed to allow journalists to go to war theaters only embedded, accompanied by the respective military. We saw this in Iraq, we saw it in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Only a few journalists had the opportunity to look behind the scenes. This is why leaks, confidential sources, and journalists like Julian Assange are so important. Yeah. Reporting the dirty yep. truth about wars, no matter from which side they are waged, is crucial so that these wars can no longer be waged in the future. Let me give a few examples of this from history. In Vietnam, reporting by courageous journalists, often citing anonymous sources or using leaks, played a decisive role in ending the bloodshed. One of the most important steps in was the story revealed by Cy Hirsch in 1969 about war crimes in My Lai. At that time, mm. U.S. troops had murdered hundreds of civilians, mostly women and children in the village. This story and the images of it were instrumental in turning popular sentiment against this war. Another important revelation was the so-called Pentagon Papers published by whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg with the help of, the, of journalists, other journalists. They showed that the U.S., several U.S. government uh, had systematically lied to the population about Vietnam, about its motives, about its scale, about its methods. And it came out that not only Vietnam was bombed, but also Laos and Cambodia. And an estimated three to four million people died in that war. <laughs> Brutal. There's another thing about that Seymour Hirsch guy. He put something else out recently. Yeah, I, you yeah. Know, we get, well, he's, big nothing burger. He's going to come up again here because these reports and the largely mm. anonymous sources on which these were based were instrumental in bringing this war to an end. This was later followed by the revelations of the secret programs used by CIA to illegally spy on U.S. citizens. These revelations, again revealed by Cy Hirsch, led to the establishment of the so-called Church Commission in 1975 to provide paramilitary oversight of the intelligence agencies, an important step in defense of democracy. Quote-unquote democracy. Then we saw a new phase of wars with the so-called uh, start of the so-called War on Terror after September 11, 2001. Wait, in 2004, guess who again, Cy Hirsch, exposed U.S. torture practices at Iraq's Abu Ghraib prison, prison as we know. And enter WikiLeaks hmm? and Julian Assange. They are part of this long tradition that in 2010 and 11, based largely on information from Chelsea Manning, WikiLeaks, expo WikiLeaks exposed a whole new series of crimes committed by our governments that shocked the world. Among them was a document that showed how the CIA tried to mobilize sentiment in Germany and France for the war in Afghanistan. <laughs> well, didn't they just do that for the war yep. in Ukraine? A headline yep. from huh? this document, yeah. A headline from this document is telling, quote, why, why it is not enough to count on the apathy of the Germans, unquote. Right? The point was to mobilize people yep. for an expansion of operations in Afghanistan through manipulated information. And remember, this is a speech that's being given at the Brandenburg Gate. The so-called yep. collateral murder video that then, ca then caused a public stir. Of course it did. Audio and video footage from a U.S. helicopter in Iraq documented American soldiers shooting at civilians, including two Reuters journalists, as they talked about the best way to murder them. Sir, the survivors tried to retrieve one of the journalists who was badly injured, but the soldiers shot the wounded man again until he was dead. There were also yep, double tap. Two, small two small children in the car who were hit and survived and seriously wounded. Uh, this was just one small detail from that war, but the worldwide outrage over it shows what happens when the dirty truth about wars comes out. Support drops, the grand narratives about those wars shatter, that they're good wars, that they're just wars, that they're fought in the name of values. Again, That's an are you hearing me, moron. Ukraine? Right. Now, later, WikiLeaks released the Afghan war logs and the Iraq war logs, hundreds of thousands of documents chronicling war crimes committed by both Western powers and the warlords with whom they work closely. Finally, the Guantanamo Papers showed the world, the public, the world public, the brutality with which this torture prison was run. The horror of the so-called war on terror became public, not least through WikiLeaks. Now. So again, why is he in prison? Because he removed the mask from the hypocrisy of our so-called Western values and has shown how brutal the reality behind it is. That's why he's being persecuted. That's why he's been imprisoned. That's why he's been tortured, as Nils, Nils Meltzer says, and as we agree. 
The courage of Julian Assange and sources like Chelsea Manning was crucial to other whistleblowers and other journalists subsequently daring to expose dark practices of our governments like Edward Snowden, who exposed the spying practices of the NSA and other agencies. And Daniel Hale, I'll add, who exposed the drone yep. targeting program that it had 90% targeting to civilians. Julian Assange has come under massive attack following his revelations, not only from the governments involved, but also from some journalists. A host on the American TV channel Fox publicly called for him to be murdered. The U.S. Yep. government, with the help of U.K. and Sweden, eventually did everything it could to put him behind bars as quickly as possible under various pretexts. The release of Julian Assange is critical for the future of journalism, freedom of speech, democracy, and far beyond. Yep. To prevent future wars, free journalism is the indispensable. Yeah. Today we find ourselves in an extremely dangerous situation. A new cold and also hot war between the blocks is looming. The war in Ukraine threatens to escalate. I I think it already has. The USA and some allies are threatening war against China, which is crazy, suicidal in a way. This is a matter of survival for humankind because it could lead to a nuclear confrontation. The situation is critical for another reason. With climate change, species extinction, extinction, and other ecological catastrophes, we are at a dangerous tipping point in the Earth system. We must concentrate our social forces on setting in motion a socio-ecological transformation that will still prevent the climate catastrophe and enable us to live on this planet in dignity for generations to come. That would be nice. For this, we need resources. How dare you? For this, we need resources, money, and international cooperation for a peaceful transformation and not for war. We're currently experiencing a new arms race that brings us closer to nuclear confrontation and at the same time deprives us of the possibility to stop the ecological collapse. A brief review. The so-called wars on terror in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere have cost a combined total of at least $5 trillion. That's about the amount that would be needed, according to Noam Chomsky and How economists. Much? $5 trillion. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's about how much Noam Chomsky and economist uh, Robert Poland for a global Green New Deal to launch an ecological transition in agriculture, energy supply, transportation, and at the same time create more social justice. Kumbaya, social my justice. friend. Kumbaya. Yeah. Okay. Yep. This money has been channeled into wars over the last 20 years instead of the transformation. So we, wrong. we so desperately need. Yes, 100%. <clears throat> Not wrong. Okay. It's all about geometry. Right. So to prevent this from happening now, we need critical journalism. We need free journalism. We need courageous journalism. A recent Pentagon leak has shown that, according to the U.S. military's assessments, the war in Ukraine is not winnable for either side in the near future. It's a stalemate. <clears throat> yeah. Um. I don't know about that. Bakhmut I would, would probably disagree with that. Prolonging this yep. war further will result in tens or hundreds of thousands more deaths with no substantial gains for Ukraine. Only negotiations can end this war. In this situation, uh -huh. we need free and daring journalists more than ever to give us unvarnished accounts of reality, to look beyond the facades. There, been. there has been, yes, and they've been mostly ignored and dismissed and mocked and ridiculed. At the tipping point in human history yep. at which we stand, we need more than ever to defend the, feed the freedom of journalism and its sources. And again, this was published by Fabian Schindler in Berliner Zeitung. The corporate press and U.S. government go all out to gaslight the entire world um, about just yeah, how do. much they believe in press freedom. And 
Holy shit. So Chris Hedges wrote an article that I can actually read because it's not a mile long. Oh my God. Love you, Chris Hedges, but your what? articles are way too long to read on the, on the show usually. So I figured let's do that. Let's, let's read an article. And it is actually an exclusive article that he wrote for Sheer Post, which is an indie media award honoree. Go sign up and please support Sheer Post. Please support Chris Hedges at his Substack because he has been independent and he'd like to keep doing this. I have his little plea at the end. So, quote, the detention and persecution of Julian Assange eviscerates all pretense of the rule of law and the rights of a free press. The illegalities embraced by the Ecuadorian, British, Swedish, and U.S. governments are ominous. They presage a world where the internal workings, abuses, corruption, lies, and crimes, especially war crimes, carried out by corporate states and the global ruling elite will be masked from the public. They presage a world where those with the courage and, integ and integrity to, to expose the misuse of power will be hunted down, tortured, subjected to sham trials, and given lifetime prison terms in solitary confinement. They presage an Orwellian dystopia where news is replaced with propaganda, trivia, and entertainment. The legal lynching of Julian, I fear, marks the official beginning of the corporate totalitarianism that will define our lives. C.J. Hopkins, by the way, also talks a lot about totalitarianism. Under what law did Ecuadorian yep. President Lenin Moreno capriciously terminate Julian's rights of asylum as a political refugee? Under what law did Moreno authorize British police to enter the Ecuadorian embassy, diplomatically sanction sovereign territory, to arrest a naturalized citizen of Ecuador? Under what law did Donald Trump criminalize journalism? and demand the extradition of Julian, who's not a U.S. citizen, and whose news organization is not based in the United States? Under what law did the CIA violate attorney-client privilege, surveil and re record all of Julian's conversations, both digital and verbal, with his lawyers, and plot to kidnap him from the embassy and assassinate him? The corporate state eviscerates enshrined rights by judicial fiat. This is how we have the right to privacy with no privacy. This is how we have free elections funded by corporate money, covered by compliant corporate media under iron corporate control. Oh, God, I love this guy. This is how we have a legislative process in which corporate lobbyists write the legislation and corporate indentured politicians vote it into law. I don't think you've seen anything like that. Have you, Reeve? Mm -mm. No. No, we would never. No, this is how we have the right to due process with no due process. This is how we have a government whose fundamental responsibility is to protect citizens that orders and carries out the assassination of its own citizens, such as the Muslim cleric Anwar, Anwar al-Awlaki and his 16-year-old son. That was Obama, by the way, that did that. Not Trump, not Biden, not Republican. The hero, Joe, you know, Barack Obama. He ordered that drone bombing. This is how we have a free press. Yes, that's that guy. But this is how we have a free press, which is legally permitted to publish classified information and our generation's most important publisher sitting in solitary confinement in a high security prison awaiting extradition to the United States. Yep. The psychological torture of Julian, documented by the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Nils Melzer, and he wrote a book about it, Mirrors the breaking of the dissent, the dissident Winston Smith and George Orwell's novel 1984. The Gestapo broke bones. The East German Stasi broke souls. We too have refined the cruder forms of torture to destroy souls as well as bodies. It's more effective. This is what they're doing to Julian, steadily degrading his physical and psychological health. It is a slow motion execution, and this is by design. He's already had a stroke. We don't even know how many. Yeah. We haven't heard his voice in how many years? I mean, we don't even know. But, Indy, there was a letter. Well, we're going to get to that letter, too. We're going to read that, too, tonight. But Julian has yeah. spent much of his time in isolation, is often heavily sedated, and has been deemed medical treatment, uh, denied medical treatment for a variety of physical ailments. He's routinely denied access to his lawyers. 
He's lost a lot of weight, suffered a minor stroke, spent time in prison hospital wing, which prisoners, which prisoners call the hell wing because he is suicidal, been placed on prolonged solitary confinement, observed banging his head against the wall and hallucinating. Oh, God. Our version of Orwell's dreaded Room 101. Julian was marked for elimination by the CIA once he and WikiLeaks published the documents known as Vault 7, which exposed the CIA's cyber warfare arsenal, which dozens of viruses, Trojans, and malware remote control systems designed to exploit a wide range of U.S. and European company products, including Apple's iPhone, Google's Android, Microsoft's Windows, and even Samsung's smart TVs, which can be turned into covert microphones even when they appear to be switched off. Yes, this was in the Vault 7 leaks. I spent two decades as a foreign correspondent. Again, this is Chris Hedges. I saw how the brutal tools of repression are tested on those France and on called the wretched of the earth. From its inception, the CIA carried out assassinations, coup, torture, black propaganda campaigns, blackmail, and illegal spying and abuse, including of U.S. citizens. Activities exposed in, the 19, in 1975 by the Church Committee hearings in the Senate and the Pike Committee hearings in the House. All these crimes... <coughs> especially after the attacks of 9-11, <clears throat> have returned with a vengeance. The CIA have its own armed units and drone program, the death squads, and a vast archipelago of global black sites where kidnapped victims are tortured and disappear. They also own InQtel, which I'm <clears throat> guessing he's going to get to here. The U.S. allocates a secret yeah. black budget of about $50 billion a year to hide multiple types of clandestine projects carried out by the National Security Agency, the CIA, and other intelligence agencies, usually beyond the scrutiny of consorting... Wait, I missed that. You, scrutiny of mm -hmm. Congress. I don't know. You were I think right. I missed, of consorting with known scrutiny torturers of and... consorting with known oh, torturers. the scrutiny of uh, known torturers and international terrorists. It feels weird. But fear the puppet masters, yep. not... The puppets, they are the enemy within. This is the fight you for a fight. Song? Yeah, I'm, I just got all weird out there. Sorry. I had a brain freeze. This mm -hmm. is a fight for Julian, whom I know and admire. That's Chris again, but also I admire deeply. It's a fight for his family who are working tirelessly for his release. It's a fight for the rule of law. It's a fight for the freedom of the press. And it's a fight to save what's left of our diminishing democracy whatever that means. And it's a fight we must not lose. And Sheer Post is begging you that there is now no way left for me to continue to write a weekly column for Sheer Post, this is from Chris, and produce my weekly television show without your help. The walls are closing in, starting with rapidity on independent journalism, with the elites, including the Democratic Party elites, clamoring for more and more censorship. Bob Shear, who runs Shear Post on a shoestring budget, and I will not waver at our commitment to independent and honest journalism, and we will never put Shear Post behind a paywall, charge a subscription for it, sell your data, or accept advertising. So please, if you can, sign up at chrishedges.substack.com. That's one way to do it. So he can continue to post his weekly, now weekly Monday column on Shear Post and produce his weekly television show, The Chris, the Chris Hedges Report. He's a legend. He's one of the best we've got. He's incredibly doomerish, I know. And it's it's a grim way to start. Sorry for that, but get some merch, everybody. <laughs> um right. but we've got we got a bunch we, we got a bunch more Julian stories along this this track. Julian. Let me let me say for our trailer park boys fans, Julian. that we used to cover a lot and stopped covering because they went super shit libby and went completely kaflui mm. honestly on covid 
And that's World Socialist website, but they did write a good one this week. So I figured, let me throw them in there. Hmm. So Joe Biden saying journalism isn't a crime, right? Except for, of course, we know. Yep. That guy. Julian. The annual dinner of the White House Correspondents Association is an occasion for the media elite and top politicians in Washington to schmooze and declare their mutual solidarity. This is usually couched in the language of defense of the First Amendment, although that constitutional provision has been systemically trampled on by administration after administration in the interests of American imperialism. Yep. This is Patrick Martin, by the way. Illegal government hmm. spying, police violence and the violation of such basic democratic precepts as the separation of church and state are everyday practices in America, and the corporate media generally passes over them in silence as long as its own financial interests are not harmed. There was more than the usual measure of such hypocrisy at Saturday night's annual dinner of the White House Correspondents Association as President yeah. Joe, Biden, Joe Biden and the assembled members of the political and media elite pretended to defend freedom of the press, but only when it came to serving the foreign policy interests of American imperialism. Hmm. How about that? Most presidential appearances at the dinner, attended by every president in recent years, except, of course, Trump, have been characterized by scripted remarks making fun of the audience, the president's political opponents and critics, and then the president himself. But Biden devoted the bulk of his remarks to a lengthy declaration of his opposition to the repressive measures taken against journalists in Russia and China, China, Iran, Syria, Venezuela, and pledges to devote U.S. diplomatic efforts to winning the release of Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich, recently arrested on bogus spying charges in Russia and other American prisoners of the Putin regime. Hey, this is World Socialist website, guys. I, I, you know, hey. The coincidence between the list of countries guilty yeah. of violating press freedom and the list of countries targeted by American imperialism for subversion and overthrow was obvious. Biden made no reference, for example, to the murder of Washington Post commentator Jamal Khashoggi, killed and dismembered inside of the consulate of Saudi Arabia in the Turkish city of Istanbul. Of course, Khashoggi who was an advisor turned critic of the Saudi monarchy, uh, was targeted by the de facto Saudi ruler, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, that's bone saw to, to everyone else. His security chief sent out the hit bone squad and directed saw. its actions. Biden claimed during the 2020 election campaign that he would turn the Saudi leader into a pariah. Instead, in pursuit of, a great, of greater Saudi oil production, he went cap in hand to Riyadh for talks with the prince slash assassin. But, of course, the yep. most obvious case of a double standard was one that involves the Biden administration directly the persecution of Julian Assange. And this is why I picked this article. The WikiLeaks founder, WikiLeaks, we got to get that for the board, and publisher, most importantly to me, publisher, was trapped in the Ecuadorian embassy in London for nearly seven years after he sought political asylum there against a U.S. campaign to seize him and bring him to the United States for prosecution on espionage charges for exposing U.S. war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan and at the Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay Torture Prison. Since Assange was seized by British police, who raided the embassy four years ago, he's been held in solitary confinement in Belmarsh, a high-security prison for terrorists and violent criminals in London, awaiting extradition to the United States, where he would face 175 years in prison if convicted under the Espionage Act. He would be the first journalist prosecuted under the century-old law, passed amid the anti-communist hysteria whipped up as part of U.S. entry into World War I. Talking about a 100-year-old law. Three minutes into his remarks to the Saturday night festivities, it might as well have been SNL, Biden declared, journalism is not a crime. The formulation seemed a perverse restatement of a declaration issued by half a dozen major world newspapers, including the New York Times, last December, when they called on the Biden administration to drop the charges against Assange because publishing is not a crime. 
not a crime. Speaking as a publisher, that definitely means a lot to me, and I agree. It is noteworthy that in their coverage of the correspondence dinner, neither the Times nor the Washington Post nor any other mainstream publication, and I can't stand that word mainstream, made any mention of Assange or the contradiction between Biden's declaration of fidelity to the First Amendment and the continued drive of his administration to extradite and jail Assange. Nor did any media correspondents or management, the bulk of the audience at the dinner, seek to raise the issue there. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Seven Democratic right. members of Congress. That's... What was that? Did you hit that? I was going to say that's another good one for the soundboard. Yeah. Seven Democratic members of Congress, including all five members of the DSA, which, okay, recently sent a letter to, the, to Attorney General Merrick Garland uh, urging him to drop prosecution of Assange. None of these representatives sought to raise the issue at the Correspondents' White Dinner, which took place only four days before World Press Freedom Day, as, de as designated by the United Nations. Wow. Yep. Later in his remarks, Biden flattered the press, declaring, you make it possible for ordinary citizens to question authority. Now get over here, Jack. Come on, man. Ah, fuck off. Actually, the American corporate media has abandoned even a token commitment to such oppositional stance toward the U.S. government. The Times, which sets the agenda for the daily coverage in the American media, is little more than an adjunct to the CIA and Pentagon on national security issues, particularly the war in Ukraine. State Department, too. When National Guard airmen and IT specialist Jack Teixeira released top-secret Pentagon documents on the Internet, which he didn't, but okay, he published them to Discord, but that's another story. The Times cracked him down and published his name, enabling the FBI to swoop in and arrest a 21-year-old soldier only hours later. You think they didn't know who he was? Yep. Okay. Biden's iron peeing to the American media and his de declaration to the devotion of... Uh, his de declaration of devotion to the First Amendment were followed by a series of obvious and banal jokes, largely at the expense of Fox News, as well as a few references to his advanced age, as though that was the only issue standing in the way of his re-election campaign. Uh-huh. He right. made no mention of the war in Ukraine, which every day threatens to escalate into a nuclear exchange between the U.S. and Russia, or of the COVID pandemic, which remains a deadly threat to the world's population. Like I said, this is World Socialist website. It was notable that those who attended the correspondence dinner, like other large public figures in Washington and throughout the country, were entirely unmasked. There was no effort to shield anyone, including the 80-year-old Biden, from the danger of an infection that could have lethal consequences. I don't think they'd be all that yeah. upset, honestly. Nope. Come on, Jack. This is a picture of Joe, actually, at the correspondence dinner, before he soiled himself, of course. Make sure that looks like a mask. Yeah. Well, the looks whole like thing, the wax figure from the whole thing could be could be a mask, like a like a Mission Impossible kind of. which is another Joe Loria Consortium News, our friends over at Consortium News, outstanding publication. Subscribe, support them, please. Joe Loria is their managing editor. He wrote another banger. You know, we covered a Joe Loria story last week where there was a speech that he had given about Julian um, in front of Justice Department. And this week, uh, we've got Consortium News Indie Media Award honoree again. Talk about Albo. So their prime minister, right. Albanese, he spoke with ABC, which is the Australian broadcasting company, while in London for the coronation, and they asked him about Assange. So that's pretty interesting. Um, love that guy. Joe Laurie is great. 
Hi. And there he is meeting with Biden at the East Asia Summit. That was back in November. But Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albany said he has unequivocally stated his position to the United States that a diplomatic resolution to the case of Julian Assange must be made. That's nice. In his clearest statement yet about the fate of the imprisoned WikiLeaks publisher, Albany's told the Australian Broadcasting Corporation in an interview in London that he's told the U.S. Justice Department that Assange's case must come to an end. And I agree. I continue to say in private what I said publicly as labor leader and what I've said as prime minister, that enough is enough, Albanese told the ABC. This needs to be brought to a conclusion. It needs to be worked through. We're working through diplomatic channels. We're making very clear what our position is on Mr. Assange's case. But so far, the Justice Department, of course, has not yielded in its pursuit of Assange on espionage charges that could land him in U.S. prison for up to 175 years if he's extradited from Britain and convicted in the U.S. on all 17 or 18 charges that he's being charged with. So Albo says, I know it's frustrating. I share the frustration. I can't do more than make very clear what my position is, he said. And the U.S. administration is certainly very aware of what the Australian government's position is. Well, that's nice to know. But asked whether he would raise the Assange issue directly with Joe Biden when the president visits Australia later this month, Albo said, quote, the way that diplomacy works is probably not the forecast discussions that you will have or have had with leaders of other nations. He appears to not have looked deeply into the facts on the case uh, against Assange, surprise, surprise, when he asserted in the interview that he understood U.S. concerns that confidential information could lead to consequences for the people who were engaged in an activity. What? Assange's legal team laid out during extradition proceedings in London that he did not release unredacted versions of the U.S. diplomatic cables containing some of the names of U.S. informants until after two Guardian journalists provided the password to those files in a book that they wrote, and only after a German publication, Encryptome.com, published the unredacted files first. Additionally, upon cross-examination, of course, in the court martial trial of former U.S. Army intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning for leaking the cables to Assange, U.S. US General yep. Robert Carr admitted there was no evidence that any informant had been harmed by the disclosures. What are we talking about here? Albany cited Manning's case when discussing Assange's fate. I think that when Australians look at the circumstances, look at the fact that the person who released the information is walking freely now, having served some time in incarceration but is now released for a long period of time, then they'll see that there's a disconnect there. And that's what he said in his interview. But asked whether other leaders in the West were speaking out for the principles of free speech involved in Assange's case, Assange, Albanese, of course, told the ABC, we do value the freedom. We do value freedom of expression, but we also have, in today's uncertain world, legitimate concerns about our national security. So he's already hedging about censorship. "Quote: I'm not going to sit right. here as someone who chairs our national security committee and say it's fine if you publish all the details about our national security committee deliberations, because if you did that, Australian lives would be put in danger. There are real consequences for that." I'm a big supporter of freedom of the press, but with that also comes a responsibility to take into account the consequences of whether the information is not available to the public, uh, what the consequences would be if we just had a free-for-all. Well, in the extensive interview, this is really interesting, Albany said he was concerned for Assange's health. There was a court decision here in the UK that was then overturned on appeal that went to his health as well. And I'm concerned for him. Yeah, sure he is. I'm sure he's very concerned. Until now, he's kept largely quiet about his dealings with the U.S. regarding Assange. That he spoke so openly about it in this interview is an indication not only of his frustration, but that he's decided going public could bring more public pressure on the U.S. to act. It also shows that the public pressure Albanese has faced up to, uh, to up the ante may also have had an effect. And that's what I got on Julian and Julian's case and World Press Freedom Day and the gaslighting that's been happening. And 
Can't say enough for Julian Assange. Um, I really hope that the Australian government is working overtime, which I know they're not, but I, they should be to secure his freedom because he is an Australian citizen yeah. who did not commit a crime in the United States. Um, he published some, you know, he wasn't the one who committed the espionage at any time. He, pu he was the publisher, but it's Vault 7 that they really are going after him for using the excuse of the Iraq war logs and Gitmo torture to do that. John Pilger is working overtime, Desert Mantis, and love, do love, love to John Pilger. Love to all the journalists who are keeping this alive, like Joe Loria, like Caitlin Johnstone, and of course, big shout out to our sister Misty Winston, who she does action for Assange. She does. We're fucked. Yep. Yes, we are. She's organizing. I don't even know when the next one's going to be. Probably over the summer. But she organizes protests and direct actions in support of raising awareness and getting more people to. Yeah. No, Caitlin Johnson, don't see evil. Oh my God, Brad. Don't don't even get started. Don't don't get me started. Holy shit. Yeah, there were yep. there were some apparently Caitlin Johnstone derangement syndrome is real and Brad found someone who suffers from it and it was pretty damn sad to watch that meltdown happen. Um all it takes is for one bastard to drop the charges on Assange and then he can go home. That's absolutely right. CJDS, well, there's there's nice? already yep. PJDS, there's all different kinds of derangement syndromes. <clears throat> um So first story tonight is going to be that Julian kind of warned us all. And I found Julian. this story. Julian. Julian. All right. I found this story over in, uh, I don't even remember, uh, LA Progressive, which was picked up on mm -hmm. Monday of last week. And the headline says, censorship by proxy, how big tech is censoring even the global news platform. Wait, come on. Restrictions no. on, yep. Oh, but like. You're talking about the AP and Reuters even, like, getting censored and funneled, okay? Okay, restrictions on freedom of information oh. by corporations beyond government censorship serve corporate, government, or other interests. Hmm. And what's funny is Mickey Huff and Andy Lee Roth. I just thought that the, the name's just, you know, David Lee Roth, and and, and there's there's got to yep. be some uh, Mickey, Roth, uh, Mickey ha uh, Hart from the Grateful Dead. It just hit me funny. Anyway. So, despite the boundless access to info, Silicon Valley mirrors legacy media in its consolidated ownership and privileging of elite narratives. New class of billionaire or oligarchs owns or controls the most popular media platforms, including the companies often referred to as the Fangs, as we well know. But now it's not really Fangs because Meta and Alphabet, it's like man, <laughs> M A A A N, right? And uh, so that's mm -hmm. Meta, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, App, Alphabet, for those who are on the podcast. Their CEOs are routinely lionized in popular culture and the press as intrepid entrepreneurs, in inventors of today's must-have tools for work and play, and stewards of the public square. They include, but are not limited to, of course, we know Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos and all are deeply involved and invested in computer software, social media platforms, and the World Wide Web, web itself, right? So through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which we've covered extensively, Bill Gates has provided over $300 million to fund news outlets, journalism centers, and training programs, press associations, and specific media campaigns around the world. Hmm. Zuckerberg. Well, this is, um, not to derail no. too much, uh, Biden recently talked about um, during his me, – me and Colin covered it a little bit. Um, his, like, all the branch to Africa, the – he's given money to, like, connect Microsoft with, like, 
with African countries, essentially. It yes. It's like very Charles schwab sort of stuff. Hmm. So. Um, sure. I believe that. So, of, Zucker, of course, Mark, Bill Mark, Gates. Mark Robot Zuckerberg, and in the name of combating online misinformation, of course, we know he hired fact checkers from the Atlantic Council, which is a NATO lobby group, and he stifled and deplatformed countless independent news voices, mostly those critical U.S. foreign policy, official narratives of COVID, and other controversial issues, specifically, of course, around Israel as well. And they don't want to talk about Israel, Palestine. Thanks, Mark. Uh, let's get back to this. Resembling previous generations of billionaires who own legacy media outlets, today's digital tech titans blur the lines between journalism, entertainment, consumption of goods and information. They increasingly partner with the military-industrial complex, as we know, in service of national security and state surveillance. We know Bezos and Microsoft have got tons of government contracts. They also aim to collect and monetize any available information about the people who use their platforms. Yes, and as critics, including Shoshana Zuboff and Alan McLeod, Nolan Higdon, have noted, big tech billionaires harvest and exploit our online data for profit, political influence, social control, power dynamics, Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism. Again, I don't think I'm co covering anything from this article that we're not very familiar with in our realm. But I want to still lay this out because we still have to establish this for the people kind of as a baseline, that this still is happening. That in the process, mm. big tech giants and their oligarchic owners now engage in a new type of censorship, which we've called censorship by proxy. This is interesting. Censorship by proxy restrictions on freedom uh, describes restrictions on freedom of information undertaken by private corporations that exceed limits on governmental censorship and serve both corporate and government or third party interests. Censorship by proxy is not subject to venerable First Amendment prescriptions or, or, or on government interference with freedom of speech or freedom of the press. It's private, you know, again, terms of service type of shit. Censorship by proxy alerts us to the power of economic entities that are not normally recognized as gatekeepers. For example, in 2022, and we covered this too, the digital financial service PayPal, whose of course founders include Peter Thiel and Elon Musk, froze the accounts of consortium news and mint press. For, by the way, indie media award honorees, some of the best outlets out there that absolutely report on corruption and are uncorrupted themselves for unspecified offenses. Yeah, they do good stuff. For, quote, unspecified offenses and, quote, risks associated with their accounts, meaning they're affiliated with Palestine, and they report on Israel's crimes. Um, a ruling yep. that prevented both independent news outlets from using funds maintained by PayPal. Now, the thing with Consortium News was because Robert Parry had passed away and they hadn't filled out certain paperwork, they were holding, they're still holding, I believe, about $13,000 of, of Joe Loria's money. I mean, people have donated mm. over the years to Consortium News using PayPal. It's a terrible story. I don't believe they still have the money out. So, Consortium News and MinPress have each filed critical uh, news stories and commentary on the foreign policy objectives of the U.S. and NATO. Like I said, PayPal issued notices to each news outlet stating that in addition to suspending their accounts, it might also seize their assets for damages. I got it. Yeah, that's for real. Like I said, Joe Loria that he believed this was a case of ideological policing. Renar Adley, who I've also had emails with, she's terrific, head of MinPress News, warned, these, sanction, these sanctions regime, regime war is coming home to hit the bank accounts of watchdog journalists. Absolutely. Sadly. But yep. PayPal's freeze on the, the accounts of MinPress and consortium wasn't even the most glaring example of censorship by proxy in the past year. Instead, that dishonor goes to big tech platforms and media companies that launched a massive campaign of online censorship in the fateful aftermath of Russia's attack on Ukraine in early 2022. Now, this is where I start to diverge from this article in their take and the author's take on the special the, on the strategic military operation that's happening in Ukraine, that the provocation by the U.S. that led up to this, and I'm going to read some things that I don't agree with, but was written by the writer, by the authors, and I wanted it out there because I wanted to be able to A, challenge it and discuss it, but also to lay it out and not censor them because these are their words. So, of course, DirecTV, Roku, Sling, and Dish each dropped RT America from their platforms in protest against Russian invasion. In the name of fighting alleged Ru Russian propaganda and disinformation, and following the lead of the EU, 
YouTube disappeared the entire Russian channels, including RT, and, uh, RT America and Sputnik. And those channels archives the great applause from various sectors of the American public, especially liberals. I, I guess. I don't, I don't know how many people were celebrating that they took down Redacted Tonight's entire library and Chris Hedges, really. I mean, they laughed. I mean, definitely a few. I mean, it depends on the exact people he's mentioning there. You know what? I like guess not I, all liberals, but like a I did, select few, definitely. You know what? I did drop the rest of the article and what they're talking about, and and they they call Putin a dictator, and uh, you know everybody's. Uh, it, it's it's really everybody's bad. Hate everybody's everyone, bad. Don't trust anyone. Yep. Um. But but that that um he's also censoring, and that he is, yes, everyone's bad effectively. But I also wanted to in that vein, remind everyone that this came out of media lens and this, this is our, you know, Julian, free Julian, uh, nearly every war has been the result of media lies. Okay. Speaking of specifically corporate media and Ukraine. And I think that these authors of the prior article in their analysis or their breakdown, whatever you want to call it, you know, they were kind of spreading corporate media lies and they may, they may have knowingly or unknowingly done it. Now they did provide some receipts about the fact that, you know, independent media and some of these independent outlets have been thrown out that you can't say certain terms. You can't call it a war and you can't speak out against it in Russia. And, you know, from all things we're hearing, that seems to be kind of accurate. So I, I, I don't know, but you know, at the same time, I, I still think that that's well overblown and still part of a propaganda campaign. And from the people that I trust, I'm being told that. Um, so, hmm. Julian Assange once, once observed, of course, that nearly every war has been the result of media lies. For daring to publish evidence of war crimes, U.S. war crimes, Assange now sits in the high security Belmarsh prison in London at risk of being extra extradited to the U.S. within the next few weeks. Prospects for a fair trial range from minuscule to zero. That's generous. Mm -hmm. In a recent interview, WikiLeaks editor in chief Kristen Hernofson, that's he's the current uh, person running WikiLeaks, told U.S. journalist, of course, Glenn Greenwald, that legal avenues in London to challenge Assange's unlawful extradition were being exhausted. What's needed now uh, is not recourse to a legal system that is subservient to power, but a political fight, as he explained. Quote, in my perception, and I've been sitting on all the proceedings in London, all the extradition proceedings in London have exposed only one thing, and that's the fact that this is just not going to be won in a court. Okay, there's no justice to be had in courtrooms in London. That's obvious, and I don't have to mention the United States. That's one yeah. of the essences of the defense and fighting the extradition that he'll never be able to get a fair trial there. So we're running out of time. We need to push this on a different level. And so he decided that we needed to go on tour to shore up political support because the only way to fight a political persecution is through political means. The Guardian and recently joined with New York Times, Le Mans, and all the other shit, you know, mainstream media papers in publishing an open letter calling on President Biden to end Assange's persecution about three years too late and after they'd smeared him and dragged him through the mud and used his work in the process, but okay, we'll take it. It's been 10 years since Assange sought refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy in London after being dragged from the embassy by police in April 2019 in exchange for an IMF loan for, I believe it was $5.4 billion. Misty goes through the entire thing at the beginning of every action for Assange. Yep. Julian's been locked up in the harsh regime of Belmarsh Prison, suffering from, from failing physical mental health. Indeed, according to the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Nils Melser, Assange is literally a victim of torture. We know this. In 2020, the prestigious medical journal the Lancet published a letter from doctors for Assange with 216 signatories from 33 countries, drawing urgent attention to the ongoing torture and medical <clears throat> neglect. So he warned us about this, and this is what they're doing to him. Political writer Thomas Scripps noted that the open letter from five newspapers, of course, makes clear that he's been the victim of a monstrous campaign of state persecution, costing him years of his life, good health, revealing state criminality, 
designed to set a chilling example for others. And it has. Some do it in the face of that, but, some, you know, there's tons of people, I think, that would, and they're afraid to for family sake for all different kinds of job and extra, you know, being being kind of asked out from society for that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we, we're we kind of the misfits. We We don't really care about that stuff, but tons of people do. What took them so long mm -hmm. to speak out? The conduct of these newspapers, of course, over the past decade has been thoroughly reprehensible. Their efforts to poison public opinion against him, give credence to the false claims and accusations made against him, facilitated the American state's persecution of this principled and courageous journalist. On top of the fact that they never correct the lies, that they never print the updates, that they didn't properly follow and cover the, the, the Belmarsh trial um, <clears throat> and the old Bailey trial like Richard did. Holy moly. Um, Australian journalist John Pilger, legend, who's done so much to raise public awareness of Assange's plight, was scathing. And this is a much longer article, again, than I even broke up here. I had to grab a portion of it, but John Pilger just kills it. The editors of Guardian, Times, etc. finally speak up for Assange. Weasel words in 10 years late. I said three years late. He's 10, ten years after the Guardian made public WikiLeaks secret password and launched a campaign of vilification against the truth teller to cover their own ass. He added, The Guardian, which has played a major role in the persecution of Julian Assange, is now scurrying to cover with a call for him to be freed. But even its weasel statement repeats a line fiction about his failure to redact the files. Correct. Soldier was referring to the oft-repeated smear that the WikiLeaks co-founder recklessly endangered the lives of informants when publishing information that exposed U.S. war crimes. In fact, Assange was extremely careful in redacting names and he was effectively thrown to the wolves by both The Guardian and The New York Times and a guy by the name of David Lee, a writer by the name of David Lee. That's the guy that deserves to be rotting in Belmarsh right now. How do we know this? Award-winning Australian journalist Mark Davis was an eyewitness to the preparation of the Afghan war logs in 2010 for newspaper publication documented in Davis's film Inside WikiLeaks. Davis spoke at a public meeting in Sydney in 2019, said he was present alongside Assange at The Guardian's bunker where a team from Guardian New York Times, Der Spiegel, worked on the publication of articles based on, as New York Times put it, quote, a six-year archive of classified military documents that offers an unvarnished ground-level picture of the war in Afghanistan that is, in many respects, more grim than the official portrayal. Davis attested that far from being cavalier about releasing documents that might endanger lives, it was Guardian journalists who neglected and appeared to care little about redacting the documents. Again, a, a man by the name of David Lee. David Lee. Say his name. Put him in prison instead of the guy that's sitting there. Nobody should be in prison for journalism. Mm -hmm. But if anybody's going to do it, if anybody's going to do it for publishing the secret key, it shouldn't be Julian Assange. Because he took every step yeah. that there was to protect it. And this moron actually published it. Moreover, they had a graveyard humor about people being harmed. No one, he stated emphatically, expressed concern about civ civilian casualties, except Julian. On top of the fact that all of this, we know, is just a persecution to get to Julian in the first place. As Oscar Grenfell explained in a piece for the war for WSWS, shout out to Oscar and those guys. David Lee, like I said, and Nick Davies, senior guardian, senior guardian journal journalists who worked closely with Julian in the publication of the logs, have repeatedly claimed that Assange was indifferent to the consequences of the publication. That's a lie. These Guardian claims were pivotal in corporate media smears against Assange. They were also crucial in the U.S. government claims that publication aided the enemy, which, of course, it didn't. However, noted Grenfell, in reality, U.S. and Australian militaries have been compelled to admit that the release of the Afghan war logs did not result in a single individual coming to Physical harm. Yep. Not just killed, but any physical harm whatsoever. As Scripps points out, the open letter is evidence that even the five newspapers, including Gordian, were well aware from the start that Assange was functioning as a journalist, innocent of any crime. Yet, why well, speak out now, 10 years too late? The likely concern is that a U.S. show trial would expose the newspaper's own nefarious role 
in providing cover for U.S. war crimes, as well as enabling the persecution of Jews, which they already have. There's already another vital element in the timing, as he wrote. Both the exposure of U.S. war crimes would come at a time when the U.S. is expanding its proxy war against Russia and Ukraine, sold to the public on the grounds that the U.S. The US intervention is necessary to prevent Russian atrocities. And because the public despises the corporate media, is vital for state and corporate power, the public trust in the news media, a key conduit for carrying and amplifying Western propaganda, does not collapse entirely. So, bury the evidence. In the U.S., trust in the news has fallen to a historic low. Right? We know this. That's why we're doing what we're doing, and we're kicking the crap out of everybody. Amazingly enough. I mean, in in our world. I mean, we are reaching people that have completely unplugged from corporate media. And God bless you all. The percentage of Americans who say they have a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in newspapers has fallen to 16%. For TV news, it's even lower at 11 So in response to these findings, Glenn was blunt. Of course, pick, uh, check out uh, Nick, Socialist MMA, on Glenn this week. He was killer. But Glenn said, you know, the public despises the corporate media. There is almost nobody held in lower esteem or who's more distrusted and, uh, and abhorred than liberal employees of large media corporations. Nobody wants to hear from them. So in-group arrogance is all they have left. Kind of, yeah. Yep. So John Pilger also pointed out, uh, he pointed to the ongoing tsunami of propaganda about Ukraine, which is something he's never seen before, including even the lies told about Iraq in the run-up to the 2003 invasion, which is remarkable. But they have a conduit to go directly into your brain. You don't have to turn on the TV anymore. When it comes to opposing views or informed views on Ukraine, none of them have been allowed in by the, by the corporate media, he said. And as for Guardian and its coverage of foreign affairs, we have some people now who are in absolute disgrace, especially on the reporting of Ukraine and Russia. Yes, 100%. The Independent carried a rare dose of sanity last week, even though they're completely owned by the Saudi royal family and their propaganda rag. <clears throat> when it permitted a piece by Mary Dejewski, all right. She's formerly the newspaper's foreign correspondent in Moscow. She observed the informed view that Western provocations had played a major role in precipitating the Ukraine war is virtually absent from, no, from news coverage. Hmm, how about that? Specific factors that are routinely ignored by the BBC and other major news outlets include, here we go, post-Cold War triumphalism, the green light for former East Bloc states to join NATO despite what Russia understood to have been promises to the contrary. 2004 ousting of Ukraine's democratically elected president, which Russia saw as a U.S.-inspired coup, and the ways the West subsequently drew Ukraine into the Western bloc, with the EU Association Agreement on uh, and NATO military assistance, even as it abrogated Cold War arms control treaties one after one, or allowed them to lapse. You've got to look at it from the other perspective, and they just refuse to because it's inconvenient to them and to, and. To the defense contractor. Consideration of such facts matter, she noted, because without understanding why Russia invaded, there could be no understanding of what will be needed for a lasting peace. Because they don't want that. They want Afghanistan 2.0. They want a 20-year war. And then the legendary Jeffrey Sachs, an economist and, he, and foreign policy analyst, also the chair of the Lancet study on COVID. Did you see? Yes. Uh, I think it was Joe. Might have been turncoat, but his like <clears throat> Jeffrey Sachs reacts to Jimmy Dorf like Jimmy oh, starts yeah, yeah, going off, yes. and Jeffrey Sachs is like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, we'll have, <laughs> it's like maybe we'll have to show that. It's like in, a bit. Some stuff. It's, yeah, it's I good. think that was Joe STFU shitlib two on Twitter at STFU shitlib two. As long as Elon lets him stay on. But Jeffrey Sachs was telling Amy Goodman, yeah. Democracy Now!, who, of course, we're not huge fans of here, but she occasionally gets it right, though. She's even been a simp for the intel state. Quote, I think both sides see that there's no military way out. Speaking of NATO and Ukraine on one side and Russia on the other. He's the most honest man in news, honestly. This war, like von Clausewitz told us two centuries ago, is politics by other means or with other means, meaning that there are political issues at stake here 
and those are what need to be negotiated. He points out that the urgent need for war not to escalate, perhaps towards nuclear Armageddon, literally, demands that the issue of NATO expansion be negotiated immediately, adding, quote, There are other issues as well, but the point is this war needs to end because it's a disaster for everybody. It's a threat to the, to the whole world. According to EU President Ursula von der Leyen last week, 100,000 Ukrainian soldiers have died, 20,000 civilians, and then the war continues. And so this is an utter disaster. And we've not searched for the political solution because they don't want to give an inch to Putin whatsoever. To return to Julian, though, the need for independent media that serve the public and scrutinize power has thus never been greater. And that's why I brought this article up. It kind of dovetails nicely into what we do a little bit. Uh, the pattern of the media calling for one war after another as media analyst, uh, the legend, uh, um, Indy Media Award honoree Alan McLeod ha- highlighted in a recent tweet is persistent and abhorrent. Quote, quote, bombing Iraq isn't enough. Bomb North Korea before it's too late. Quote, bomb Syria, even if it's illegal. To stop Iran's bomb, bomb Iran. I mean, and so on it goes. This media promoted war fever, whose primary beneficiary is the Western military intelligence industrial complex, the Mickey Mat, as our friend Glory Jones likes to call him once in a while, must end for the sake of humanity. Yes. Let's go back to the legendary Julian. If we have a good media environment, then we will also have a peaceful environment. You're here to that. So, Julian Assange case. Talk to me about October eighth. Uh, are you planning on doing anything in Moscow? How how well versed are they over over there about what's happening? Uh, are they as supportive as we would expect they would be because they're calling out NATO and everything that's going on there? Talk to me about like that from a Russia perspective because that that that's fascinating. We never really hear that. Right. So I'm actually going to be in, um, in between Brazil and Florida during that time. So I will not be able to attend, but people should definitely follow uh, Misty, Sarcasm, Stardust, um, Comrade Misty is Putin's buddy uh-huh. on, on Twitter uh, for more information on the Washington one. I know there'll be others. So there's going to be one in London at the same time, which I would have liked to have gone to as well, but I won't be here. I'll be on my way back a few days later. But in terms of Julian Assange being um, something they talk about, yeah, I mean, he's he's definitely talked about, at least on RT, oftentimes. And he's he's definitely a name that people recognize here, um, specifically because of the persecution from the United States of an Australian citizen that has nothing to do um, with the United States. And of course, the fact that he is in British prison in Belmarsh, um, because of exposing, you know, U.S. war crimes and a lot of the lies in, of the empire. So he's often talked about, his case is often talked about, um, you know, I do get into se- several arguments is what people call him because he's not a, he's not a, um, a whistleblower. He's a publisher and a journalist. So I've had to correct a few people on that. Um, a whistleblower would be Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning. He is a publisher and a journalist. And so his crime, of course, is real journalism um, through the act of publishing via WikiLeaks. And so, yes, he's definitely somebody that, you know, from a Russian perspective, it just shows the hypocrisy of the United States uh, talking about freedom and democracy and uh, going after Putin for saying he, you know, censors uh, media while simultaneously censoring RT, censoring uh, you know, oppositional media, labeling people Russia state affiliated media, and really, really going after a journalist who isn't an American citizen with the uh, the most 
ridiculous uh, accusations, basically killing him, essentially. So yeah, I mean, definitely Russia, you know, um, talks about that. And of course, also Edward Snowden is somewhere in Russia. So um, that's also another part of it. And as a journalist right now, I feel safer here than I do, than I would living in DC. <laughs> I don't like going to DC. It gives me the creeps. Um, and um, I, you know, just living in the United States, the way things have been going for us, there's been a lot of weird things happening as well, um, you know, and how the police presence in the surveillance state is expanding so exponentially. Yeah. Uh, I don't think a lot of us are safe, especially with the Ukraine, uh, Russia, conflict and how people are being put on kill lists. And, you know, my, my good friend and, and colleague, uh, Eva Bartlett is putting her life on the line by going to Donbass and mm -hmm. reporting and, and doing this. I, I believe, I always say this all the time. I believe, uh, more people need to be on the ground, need to go on the ground, need to go to the, the places they, uh, are talking about. Uh, you can give uh, somewhat of a decent analysis from the information you have, but it's nothing compared to actually being on the ground. And this is one of the reasons why I took the uh, venture of coming here to really see what it's like. And what I see is completely different than what we're told. And I do plan on going to the Donbass as soon as I can. And I'm not working. Um, I will go there and I will, you know, I want to go to Syria. I want to go to these places because I don't believe in just sitting back in the comfort of my studio as a and then calling myself a journalist and saying, I'm just doing this. Um, I understand that some people can't do it because they have kids and they have this and they have that and whatever the case may be. But at some point, if you're going to be a voice of, of, you know, of knowledge for a specific region, you need to go to that region. And this is what Pasta and I tried to do, even though, you know, when we cover elections, it's not the most, um, profitable thing to cover it's more profitable for us to talk about tyt and how awful they are than it is to talk mm -hmm. about uh you know the elections in nicaragua the elections in honduras and then you know and all of that stuff so we do it because we believe in in the information we believe in getting this information out we believe in what we're doing um not because we want to make money and that's why we we never we didn't make a lot of money and why we're, we're suppressed and all of that stuff because it's that's not what what we're doing this for because we could have totally done it the other way uh as well and we yeah, wouldn't you, be having this conversation <laughs> you guys have never been the clout chasers as, as as is the is the uh the word of the week or whatever it is yeah you guys have never chased clout that i've seen yeah you've never gone for the big story you've definitely questioned narratives even when people didn't want to question those narratives and again that's that's what real journalists do, as as our uh, our friends over on Rockfin are saying in the Rockfin chat. Uh, uh, shout out to Rockfin chat. Um... Now, the Assange, again, you worked for RT. Now, he was already in the Ecuadorian embassy when you started working there. Did he have his RT show while you were working for RT? Was that after, beforehand? He was I don't already, think so. He was already I don't done think with so. that? I got yeah. hired in like late, I got hired in like late 2014. I think his show was like 2011. Hmm. And and then so. I'm wondering like, covering his his trial did you did you do much of that or you were watching i know obviously you were you were watching and and you know we're we've been advocating and doing all kinds of activism for it out speaking out but um, yeah i uh you know with assange um i haven't really i haven't really covered him so much and the reason for that is because where i wherever i've been working uh, at the time when there's something to really cover with him, there's been other people that that are have been on it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I never I never tried to work at like the Intercept or or like a place that uh, you know wasn't like really all about Assange. So, um, there were other people that were always on it. I, I I've written a handful of articles. Um, like one one thing that I really laid into while I was at Mint Press was. Uh, you know, they kept saying that, like, when he got arrested, 
um they said that like he had smeared feces like all over the embassy and like i i debunked that uh so that's like the one thing that i've done as far as journalism goes i have done things behind the scenes that i'm not really able to talk about um but you know working to help help him so Mm. um you know i i uh i've supported him on twitter as much as i could right Mm -hmm. but i have yeah i haven't i haven't really uh i haven't really exposed anything i mean like you know we had we had whitney webb while i was at mint press of course max runs the gray zone so you know what was i gonna do <laughs> right you know right. whitney's kind of the queen uh you know to a point you got, you got glenn out there or to a, there's so many good advocates out there mohammed el mazi uh we actually i got i got to right. talk to him a couple of weeks ago he he um he did a stream with tar reed and and i helped to organize that and he's just tremendous um again all all these guys that are carrying the torch because it's it's incredibly frightening again you're you're not located now in the, in the u.s um if you wrote something dissident you know look commander x got remanded uh, uh from 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 mexico they went and scooped him up brought him here and locked him up for x amount of time like i'm worried i don't i don't know how much journalism. of that was i don't i don't know too much about uh commander x so i don't want to speak uh about you know, if I'm wrong, I I encourage anyone to correct me. But my understanding is is that U.S. federal authorities uh, grabbed him in Mexico, mm-hmm. um, pretending to be Mexican authorities, yep. uh, in order to get into his gated area. So I've heard people blame AMLO for that happening, and I'm Ooh. not so sure that's the case. Ooh. I'm I'm Ooh. I'm pretty sure that's not the case, especially especially. What I know about AMLO, you know, I know people that work in his office. Um, I haven't asked them about that specifically. Uh, and also, you know, the the kind of um, defense that AMLO is giving for Julian right now. Well, you that, know, it makes me skeptical of this idea. Yeah, exactly. I was just going to say the half hour that he that he talked Biden's ear off about that and told him to take yeah. down the Statue of Liberty and... Um... If everyone can open their books to chat, chapter 15, verse 2, uh, once I put it in. Um, what? Is that, no, that's just the title. I'm dumb. Great. Uh, Australia. I actually grab. Sydney bus driver's strike over pay and conditions, but it's only a 24-hour strike in a couple of different regions, but up to 1,200 workers will be involved in the industrial act. So that was last week on December 5th. <clears throat> What's up, Panto? Previously on here. I spent, oh, killing it today. Previously on November 22nd, drivers refused to switch on their Opal card greeters, the contactless fare collection system, mm. okay, used across, and their employers was threatened by, responded by threatening to dock them by 31.5% shifts which they didn't accept payment damn that's a move right strikes are significant in a, in a sector where the trade unions along with the anti-worker nsw industrial work relations commission have largely maintained tight control on industrial action against both the state liberal national government and the private company employer okay this was written by martin scott World website one of the good ones um one of their better writers for sure. Just Coca-Cola bottlers are on strike as well. There's several different strikes across the country. Yep. This one's happening in Australia, and that's the point is that it's bleeding worldwide. You know, heard of stuff happening in Germany and everywhere else. The difference is they've all got health care. They can't nice. strike. <clears throat> it's a lot it's a lot more of a risk because now here your employer cuts your health care while you're while you're striking on top of the fact that you're striking. Yeah. 
So just don't get sick and while you're while you're on strike. But one day don't strikes, one you know, one day strikes are affected. These wildcat strikes, they yeah. are impacting them. Okay, September bus snap, snap bus strike over safety concerns shut down within 24 hours by the transport transport workers union. We definitely covered that one. Right, but the union made no attempt to broaden the strike beyond Smithfield. Didn't demand the testing be implemented at the other five depots operated by the company. Here, right. Yep. So the fact that two that two unions now feel compelled to carry out two 24-hour strikes is a reflection of mounting anger toward the deepening assault on jobs and conditions as the city's bus service approaches full privatization. And talks a little bit about I mean, if you cities. did, okay. if you did multiple days over, like, you know, like consistently, where you were just like, okay, like, how, like how much, how much is that, like, turning off those readers? How much does that hurt the company? You know, oh, apparently like, thirty-one and a half percent, or at least that's okay. what they want to dock the workers, which is probably right. You know, three times what it, what they're actually getting hit by and why not profit mm. off this too so and this is in australia right so that, this is there could australia. theoretically be could there theoretically be like um what are those called the uh parallel strikes or whatever the um yeah solidarity you know about? solidarity strikes. solidarity strikes yeah, it could be yeah theory yeah i thought they had health care how is it tied to their job here um, or is that for the Coca-Cola one? The Coca-Cola one. And okay. Anywhere in the United States. But this is, again, in Australia. So they gotcha. are also city workers in some way, even though there's, there's part, partial privatization. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but they work for this yeah. RB, this RTVU and trans, Transit Workers Union, which are only seeking a meter gotcha. 2.5% wage increase. Less than the CPI. Mm -hmm. Okay, and far short of the yeah. rapidly increasing cost of living in Sydney, where housing increases have increased by more than twenty five percent. And is yeah, yeah, fact, CPI is uh, inflation. CP something, right? Consumer price I index. What it is. Consumer price index. Jesus Christ! Right, it's it's the overall aggregate of like how much things cost. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So Same compounding the divisive effect of the two-tier system and that's that's what a lot of workers here i mean that's what the kellogg's workers were fighting about was the two-tier system which was that yeah. you needed to achieve a certain amount of seniority in order to be able to to get to a certain other level of pay to, for doing pay. the exact same job mm -hmm. when yep. the same job should pay the same so you know the tw they were talking about again this gets, seniority this gets, stuff with the Right, kind of Starbucks union as well. Granular and regional. And again, go to, if you're really interested in reading about this, uh, please go to World Social website. I know Reef dropped it in chat. Yeah. But award split shift, you know, by under that award split shifts can span slightly slight less than 12 hours with a maximum shift portion of five hours. Great shifts are limited to nine duty hours with a meal break. I mean, mm. that's. You're driving. I mean, you you got people's lives at risk when you're doing that. So I would hope you would want to take a little bit of care. Yep. <clears throat> oh, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to, I'm trying to get you to put that in description, but ah, I might have okay. missed the. I'll do that yeah. later. Uh, we'll watch it first. Um, yep. So, what do we hear? The you cannot have two bus drivers in the same yard driving the same bus on the same route under different rates of different pay and conditions. That's unacceptable. That's exactly For the sure. crux, of, crux of what I was trying to say. There. Right? Yep. So, in fact, that is precisely the situation both unions have enforced in Region Six since it was privatized in 2018. So this is what they're trying to fight against and what they're trying to correct. 
because just because you've been doing it longer doesn't mean that if you're doing the same job as someone who well especially when there's like there's like there's already categorized by route and whatever like you know like if they have the harder route they should probably be paid more and just pay both like whoever works that route the same well and there's something you know, to be if said one for person skill. deserves a raise yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. skill and and knowledge for and sure. experience but assuming all other things relatively equal well versus like what's what's happening in like the the Starbucks thing where it's like people who have been working the same job for like 9 years who haven't seen any increase in pay from being seniority you know what i mean like right you know that's frustrating for them but yeah. you know they also just need to be paid more anyway so but yeah everyone kind of needs to be paid oh it's like almost a no brainer at this point so like what? the union's <clears throat> labor party has publicly postured as a critic of the privatization of Sydney's buses okay however in reality the wave of bus privatization privatization was set off by the Unsworth Review commissioned by Car Labor State Government in 2004. Again, this mm. is not really up on Australia deep politics, but more about the fact that their that their bus drivers were doing a one-day strike over paying conditions after we yeah. saw that there was already a transport work strike a couple of, a couple of months. So, so do you think that this thing. might be solidarity strike itself? Just not mentioned as one? Well for the transport workers? Maybe, but they have their own um issues that they're trying to to get to, to get to. Sure. Yeah. Which is again pay and condition. It doesn't say anything about solidarity with anybody else, although I'm sure they do stand in solidarity yeah. with workers. Probably. Um, and and fellow union members um, I don't know if that's necessarily what what's behind this although again they just turned it off contact fair so everyone's okay. riding the bus for free nice yeah I mean that's uh, to me that's a smart move it's like it, it would just be that you it, it, it seems like I don't know if they're yeah. gonna like dock your pay for all that nonsense, and then who knows? But yeah. for like one day, you know. Well, I guess what they're saying is, is that the um, Opal Card readers, the contactless, are represent thirty one and a half percent of the amount of transactions essentially per day or number or... of fares that are paid, which yeah. is why they would dock these drivers by that amount, so they don't lose any money necessarily. Yeah. Yep. All right. All right. I ain't turned them on. <clears throat> solidarity with those workers. As solidarity with all workers that are not. Well, you better get hip to Indie Left. Indie Left. Indie Left. Dot News. We're going to talk about what happened, what's been happening with Julian Assange. You know, we got, mm. I got shocked last Friday night while we were doing the show and seeing that they had announced he had suffered a stroke, you know, on October 27th during the high court hearing. Right. And this is a legal question that Joe Loria for Consortium News asks, which is a completely valid question about whether they knew if they knew, would it have made a difference? Um, why it took so long for them to make any kind of an announcement about this is still something that I have. Uh, it's just, uh, I, I, I have, I, have, I struggle with this because it's just, they're torturing this guy and we all know it and we see what they're doing and read this man, get this man out of, out of jail. Um, he, he's a publisher. He, yeah. Whoa. What just happened? I hit the wrong button. Whoa. Ah, okay. Whoa. Button. 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 Hey now. Okay. Um, 
Well, I mean, I, I know I put a tweet out recently about, you know, like, look, like, look, the dude's fucking put out truth the last fucking, like, every time. Hasn't had to rescind shit over and over. So. When did the high the court know? Place. Yeah, here. It's not clear when the high court judges learned of his deterioration. Again, would it have mattered? Burnett's remark was on the high court in the Assange case. Okay. Also, when the court overturned Lori Love's extradition. And that was one of the cases that we were hoping. So the court ruled against extraditing Love and for, extra, and for extraditing Assange. Why? Yeah. Yeah. We are all Assange. And that's the problem. And again, here are, here is the Burnett ruling overturning that said. Jimmy Lewis, somebody said James Lewis QC, argued ironically on the day of the stroke that the Love case was not precedent for Assange because Love had suffered from physical ailments where Assange had not, and now suffering from a stroke that also is no longer the case or valid. Hmm. So at, yep. at, the point, at, at that point, Burnett interrupted QC Fitzgerald from the bench. It's a completely different case, according to SBS Mary Kostakidis who viewed the appeal hearing via video link. Burnett said love was different because he had physical ailment, namely eczema. I just, this is, yeah. Free Julian Assange. And, uh, you know, again, I just, I want to hear his voice. I want to hear it from him. I want to hear what he sounds like. I want, I want, you know, the world needs to, to hear directly from him yep. and, Hopefully one day we'll get to we'll get to see that um, another another story and another angle about the Assange story that I don't think a lot of people caught <clears throat> was that there actually has been movement in the Australian government. So you've got now somebody somewhat high up, at least whether it's a, a shadow or, you know, a, a, a misdirection or something where he's running for something and it's and it's politicizing it in order to, to win some points somewhere. But. This is this has got to be looked at some kind of a positive sign that the Australia's deputy par prime minister has come to the defense of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, calling on the UK not to extradite him. Barnaby Joyce, who's at least brave enough to stand up to everyone in his government to to know that what he's going to say is going to be unpopular in the five eyes of the world. Yep. Why not six that, eyes? Well, because we don't want a sixth eye. Believe me, five eyes is enough. To, to <laughs> five deal eyes with. is enough. Five eyes is enough. Okay, um, and and that is the I mean, the treaty. The, you probably you know, got four eyed. Well, got it's four the, eyes I, I've been called four eyes plenty, but this this is the unilateral spying agreement that we have yeah, among yeah, yeah. all the Engli the all the the major English speaking countries, but. Yeah. So again, this is from the Independent. As an individual, whether you like him or despise him, it is beyond him, given his circumstances, to protect his rights by himself. So we must hope for the British courts to do so, God willing, which we know they're not going to do, and we will judge its society accordingly. And that means fuck all to the people, the prosecutors, and to yeah. and, and and to the judges for sure, because we now know that one of the judges. Yeah. Had, I would not like him. He's that asshole. Yeah. Yeah. So to look at it clearly, you must leave your uninformed preconceptions at the door of this high color sideshow. You must also set aside the grave issues. Right. I mean, that's. And he spent the last two years in Belmarsh. Which is them just trying to fucking prep everyone in that sentence. Right. And. Stella, over the weekend, accused UK authorities of playing the role of executioner uh, after Mr. Assange suffered a mini stroke in prison. And that's what they're announcing it as. And again, it was it was Stella that made that announcement. I I didn't see it, hear it confirmed by any prison doctors or any prison officials or his anyone else on his team. Not again. It's it's again, not that there's any doubt about it or anything, but just wow. And then. Of course, Chris Hedges, and I know this this was covered by a few people in sheer posts, and let me blow this up so that people can read it a little bit better. Okay, and I just wanted to go to the very first 
paragraph, which is so powerful, where he actually says, let us name Assange's executioners. And I believe he, he did this in the streets yeah, also. On and the streets, yeah. So powerful, and I love this man so yeah. much. Joe Biden, Boris Johnson, Scott Morrison, Theresa May, Lenin Moreno, Donald Trump, Barack Obama, Mike Pompeo, Hillary Clinton, Lord Chief Justice Ian Burnett, and, T and Justice Timothy Victor Holyroyd. Holroyd, um, Crown Prosecutors James Lewis, Claire Dobbin, and Joel Smith, Vis District Judge Vanessa Baritzer, Assistant U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia, Gordon Cromberg, William Burns, the Director of the CIA, Ken McCallum, the Director of the U.K. Security Service, or MI5. But also, let's not leave out Merrick Garland, Attorney General of the United States, that is continuing to pursue this as well. Yep. And all the congressional assholes who will say nothing. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is again Physical Chris Hedges. When did he write? When did he write this? Is this before or after? Uh, this was story? written on December thirteenth. So this was after we knew that that he had suffered. Yeah, again, who suffered a stroke during court proceedings, and I know he had done a stream with um, Richard Wolf, I believe, <laughs> just beforehand. So. What they recorded yeah. was was before he had that knowledge. Um, uh, he committed empire's greatest sin. He exposed it as a criminal enterprise. He documented its law again. I I can't I can't do justice to to Chris Hedges. Yeah. All I can say is go read this article. It's it's lengthy, and it's worth reading. And he's just a friggin' treasure. What's a prize winning? Yep. He's just a friggin' treasure, and I adore this man, and maybe one of these days we'll actually and get a chance to... Personal cost warned us. He gave us the truth. The ruling caste is crucifying him for this truth. With his crucifixion, the dim lights of our democracy go dark. Hopefully, he comes back after three days, but, you know, that's just mm, me. Yeah, that's just... That's all of yeah. us. And then, and then I also wanted to give a shout-out to Loki. Okay, for the Watchdog <clears throat> podcast on Mint Press News. Again, this is this is the kind of coverage that we should be getting from corporate media about Assange, where you've got different outlets covering different angles, and this is about specifically how the how, how the corporate media has manufactured contempt in, in in general public sentiment, at least in the United States and globally. I again recommend everyone listen to this 48 minute podcast from Low Key, okay? Who who, who uh, recounts? Uh, he's got two individuals who've been closely monitoring Pablo Navarrete and uh, and John McAvoy, John McAvoy, and you can read their credentials here. Founder of Alborada Magazine, an outlet concentrating on Latin American politics. John's investi an investigative okay. journalist, right? Thank you. Thank you, yeah. sir. Okay. And then and then in November, uh John and Pablo uh were publishing a lot of mistakes uh about the Guardian and Assange, which can be read on Mint Press as well. So they're being interviewed now about that research by Low Key for his podcast. Okay, he th they recount that it's now known that UC Global, of course, spied on on Julian. They even scavenged the embassy's garbage, stealing his kids diapers to verify the dna we know that happened mm. again we are all assange when you when you have security like the president has to guard his poop there has to be a guy that goes in and unreal know. unreal yeah luke harding published a viral story that claimed that assange had secretly met with paul manafort which was told to be a lie it found out to be a complete fabrication, and I believe somebody's going to prison for that. Gaping holes in the accusation, even though, and, and there was not the least of that, there was no record of him ever visiting the embassy. Right. Police reporters, activists, intelligence agents were outside 24 hours a day, yet he was reportedly able to enter without anyone noticing. Come on. So, again, listen to this. Loki does a great job, and I know that... Uh, Shout out to Steve uh, from Slow News Day. We were talking earlier this week, and I know he, he was cracking up on his stream talking about 
the possibility of Donald Trump doing a podcast with Loki about Palestine oh. because the evangelicals were turning on him and seeing this just made me seeing Loki's name just brought that back to mind and shout out to Steve say hi hi to Steve and give slow news day a follow we retweet and amplify all of their all of their stuff um the only other thing and Warren this is all going to be one segment uh, just a long assange segment and uh the other thing we can talk about is the other angle from our INN brother, uh, the dissident, revisiting the Russian hacking claim and debunking the smears against Assange, which which they've been doing tr tremendous work. I sound like Trump now. It's tremendous work. It's big, bigly, tremendous. hugely tremendous. Big. It's so big. It's so huge. Okay. So huge. Mueller's timeline not not lining up. And, and Mueller's sketchy source and forensics showing that his source couldn't have been a hack, okay? And then, of course, the Ziggy Thordeson thing showing that he didn't do a hack and that it was completely a lie. Okay. You, you know what's funny to me? On on Reddit, whenever, whenever they do, whenever people put text posts, they always have a too long didn't read section at the bottom. <laughs> like... Mm -hmm. I want one of those for like every news article. I just want to be able to scroll down. Yep. You know. Too long, didn't read. Yep. Well, you better get hip to Indie Left. Indie Left. Indie Left dot news. Publication is the LA Progressive Newsletter. And I picked up this article because probably of the name Julian Assange. Why is the plot, the CIA plot to kidnap or kill Julian Assange routinely ignored? Hmm. I hmm. wonder. Let's read further. So. Which, by the way, you know, send your files to, you know, like what's, what's that address in Scotland? Like to send them all there. WikiLeaks. You know. Right. So three years ago, on October 2nd, 2018, a team of Saudi officials murdered Jamal Khashoggi, rest in peace, in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. We know about this. The purpose of the killing was to silence him and to frighten critics of the regime by showing that it would pursue and punish them as though they were agents of a foreign power. Mockingbird. Yeah. Operation Mockingbird. How about that? It was revealed this year, this week, that a year before the Khashoggi killing in 2017, CIA had plotted to kidnap or assassinate Julian Assange, which, which we know who had taken refuge five years earlier in the, in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Senior counter, U.S. counterintelligence officials said that plans for the forcible rendition of Assange to the U.S. were discussed at the highest levels of the Trump administration. The informant was mo one of more than 30 U.S. officials eight of whom confirmed details of the abduction proposal quoted in that Michael Isakoff piece in Yahoo News that also Russiagated, tried to Russiagate and tie to Russia, which was wrong. But <clears throat> plan was to break into the embassy, drag Assange in, out, and bring him to where we want, except that that really wasn't the, the case either because now we know, thanks, thanks to Max Blumenthal, and thanks to the UC Global case, all about what David Morales was doing and, and that UC Global was in charge of security in the Ecuadorian embassy, that they planted cameras, cameras on behalf of the CIA all over the place, and that they were going to handle any rendition and extradition that would have happened um, during that time. But they got exposed and, and they were brought up on charges because they were brought in on this. And again, watch Max Blumenthal's stream. Um, it's it's on Rockfin. He has a, a show on Rockfin called Foreign Agents. You have to be a premium subscriber. I think he does eventually put it on the Moderate Rebels or on the Gray Zone channel. Um, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Jank and Anna, yeah. Apparently, Jenk and Anna are concerned that they think that, that Indy Left is a major power in this space and is a threat and is funded by Jimmy Dore and Kyle Kalinske and Joe Rogan, which is hilarious because none of them would even talk to me. And um, I'd love to. Joe, hit me up. 
Seriously, like, like, hours, like Jimmy, Jimmy, love you, but love you, brother. Um, but no, I'm good. Like yep. I'm, I'm, we're self-funded right now, and that's happy to do that. Yeah, I mean, I still user gotta, funded. I still and... gotta cash those checks from Putin, so you know we're, uh, yeah. you know, it takes a minute. But, right. Uh, so uh, again, getting back to our our um our our story about Mr. Assange. God, free that man, free Julian Assange, please free Julian Assange. We've got to let that. Sure. I mean, after, especially after what we see here, that the CIA actively was plotting to to drag him out of an embassy where he had political asylum. All the stuff and that they that they pulled. The him. fact I mean, the this, fact that this continues. No it's, yeah. It's it's beyond disgraceful that that we continue to pursue this that our our country continues to pursue this case. It's a persecution, um, just to essentially. And Ray McGovern said it was essentially to move him from place to place to place, prison to prison, and never let him out for life. Free free, free Julian yeah. Assange, please, please Almighty, free Julian Assange. Um, Stop making us fucking beg before we start breaking kneecaps, please. It's it's unreal. Please. Apologists for the right. CIA say it was freedom. It was freedom of the freedom of the press was not under threat because they're not real journalists. Except no, that information. No, no, they're they're publishers. Okay, but they yeah. also were looking at real journalists. So what do you mean? So there's Glenn Greenwald and Laura yeah. Poitras. Okay, yeah. and winning Glenn Greenwald. Right, and they were similar to those employed by the Chinese government for suppressing dissident in Hong Kong, which has been much criticized. Yeah. Okay. Again, the extraordinary story by exposed by Yahoo News, but the journalist who wrote it. It's possible to only give a brief, brief piece. Is, okay, their disclosure should be of particular interest in Britain. Because it was in the streets of central London, the CIA was planning the extrajudicial assault on an embassy, the abduction of a foreign national, and his secret rendition to the U.S. with the alternative option of killing him. But apparently, they had contacted the British also about shooting out tires somewhere in an airport because they did not want to ca gonna shoot on British soil. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Um, it's like a, it's like a Tom Clancy novel, but sad and depressing. Yeah. So in the event, in any event, the embassy attack never took place, despite the advance planning. There was a discussion, a discussion with the Brits, like yeah, about turning the other cheek, or right, and former senior counterintelligence official. But they're all liars, also. But this was confirmed by a lot of people. This definitely happened, but it was already reported in 2020 by Max Blumenthal. We didn't really learn much here. But what we learned was that they also had looked into um, spying on Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras. And that journalism doesn't really matter to them. Right, if we were to be extradited 175 years in prison, as we well know from Richard Medhurst, from Kevin Gostola, and from Randy Credico, and all the other outstanding journalists that have covered this case extensively over the years, Especially over this past yeah. year. For sure. Did Greg Only... Powell do anything on it? Uh, I have not seen Greg yeah, cover him. it. He was covering the Donziger stuff this week. Donziger. Yeah, yeah, and and he was focused on on the Georgia um, uh, voter roll purges and, and nationwide voter roll purges. Well, and before that, he was doing the Florida stuff with. Um... Al Gore and, and that's what I remember him from. Right? He's been around a long oh, time. He's been doing yeah, this a long time. He gets to wear the hat. He gets to wear the hat and not he, make fun of for it. He sure does. Um, so Pompeo's determination to conflate journalistic inquiry with espionage has particular relevance in Britain because the Home Secretary, Pretty Patel, wants to pretty much do the same thing. Yeah. She proposes updating the Official Secrets Act so the journalists, whistleblowers, and leakers could face sentences in prison. Unbelievable. Donziger is a definite BS thing. 
that is just again he's got to serve six months contempt i mean the time served is nothing to them i mean it's, and and it was appointed by a corporate judge corporate for the first time in history prosecuted by a, a chevron appointed corporate judge it's unreal so the true reason the scoop about the cia's plot to kidnap or kill assange has largely been ignored or downplayed is rather that he is unfairly shunned as a pariah by all the political persuasions, left, right, and center. <clears throat> well, not all. There is a very loud example, but to give two examples here, U.S. government has gone on claiming that this, the disclosures put lives in danger, yet the Army admitted in court, right, that they failed to find a single person in Iraq and Afghanistan who had died because of the, the disclosures by WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. As regards to the rape allegations in Sweden, many feel that these alone should deny him the claim, yet the Swedish prosecutor only carried out a preliminary investigation and no charges were brought. He's a, he's a classic victim of cancel culture, so demonized that he can no longer get a hearing even when government plots to kidnap or murder him. It's unreal. Like, Patrick Cockburn Counterpunch. Great, great publication. Oh, that... Interesting. Yeah. Used to have a lot more yeah. Counterpunch, yeah. but but the St. Clairs um, have been doing a lot, you know, leaning a lot more towards uh, squad defending, TYT type of... Not the type of reporting that we're looking for and apology apologists and it's they've been around a long time they they've been in this game for for a very long time a lot longer than i have i can tell you right now but they've been disappointing and this is from somebody that used to used to really enjoy their stuff It's a Julian Assange story. This is, again, not going to be a surprise to anyone here. This is over at the Dissenter. That's Kevin Gostola's outlet. But he also has Chip Gibbons working with him. Chip is a, another good independent writer. I'm also a paid subscriber to the, the, the Dissenter. They cover prison stuff, and they cover a lot of press freedom, and they're very close on the WikiLeaks story and Julian Assange trial. In hunting WikiLeaks, how wide was the national security state's net? And I think the we all know the answer. Yes, E. Heller, it is playing on a loop. Just, the, I don't know what happened. Uh, what we'll end up doing is probably screaming it there afterwards. Um, I don't know. Rumble, we'll deal with Rumble later. Rockfin.com slash indie. You know what? I never, I just realized I never turned Rockfin on. Rookie moves. Rookie, rookie moves. I never hit the red button, Dude. did I? Wow, terrible. Anyway, I'm not having a good day. In hunting WikiLeaks, how we're wide not. was... No, we're not even gonna. I'm just... I quit. How wide was the national security state's net? When it comes to their war on WikiLeaks... There is a strong suspicion to believe that the three-letter agencies didn't stop at its founder, right? We know this. The question is, how far beyond Assange did they go? Nobody's really going to be surprised by anything we're hearing here because this is just an, a compilation of a lot of the same information that we kind of already know. But who they're going after and where and the fact that their tentacles are reaching worldwide... Ever since WikiLeaks began exposing its crimes, the U.S. national security state has pursued a ruthless vendetta against it. Justice Department, of course, is currently seeking to have Julian Assange extradited to the U.S. to stand trial under the Espionage Act. Free Julian Assange right now. Drop those charges. The source of the revelations, Chelsea Manning, was already convicted by a military court under the Espionage Act. He was also tortured in pretrial detention. In addition to this abuse to, of the legal process to destroy WikiLeaks, the intelligence community has waged ex an extra-legal war 
The Intel, the CIA, FBI, and National Security Agency have all participated in this extra legal, extra legal war. Among the most notorious are the serious allegations that the CIA, working with the Spanish security f contractor UC Global, David Morales is the head guy there, spied on Julian Assange's legal meetings, seriously contemplated kidnapping the journalist, and discussed killing him in a London shootout and whether the U.S. or the U.K. was actually going to carry out that murder, which, of course, did not happen. When it comes to their war on WikiLeaks, there is strong reason to believe that the three-letter agencies didn't stop at its founder. The question is, how far beyond Assange did they go? Again, I don't think that we're going to be surprised by this, but a February 2023 investigation published by Der Spiegel posed the question, is the CIA hunting WikiLeaks supporters? It looks at the series of strange break-ins, unexplained surveillance, and even prosecutions WikiLeaks supporters have faced globally. I think we even covered a Tariq Haddad article that talked specifically about those break-ins here on How Do We Miss That? The article zooms in on the cases of Andy Mueller Magoon, a friend of Assange and vice president of the Wow Holland Foundation, which processes donations for WikiLeaks, Aitor Martinez, which is one of our Assange's Spanish lawyers, and Ola Bini, who is a Swedish Ola programmer and a, fan of, and a friend of Assange, who recently was released from prison and is free in, in Panama, somewhere in Central America, but he's not really free from what I hear. But as one of Julian's regular visitors, when he was closely monitored in the Ecuadorian embassy, Mueller Magoon has reported a number of encounters with obvious surveillance. Okay, he was regularly questioned at the London airport. Cars followed him to and from the embassy, but he began experiencing a number of more intrusive forms of surveillance. He was photographed by a stranger with a tele telephonic lens in Milan. His Berlin home was a subject of an attempted break-in, and he discovered a surveillance device implanted in his apartment in Southeast Asia. I think that's the one that we covered was the bug. Aitor Martinez and Assange's Spanish team had similar experiences, and we definitely had the video footage of this on December 17, 2017. Three masked men broke into the team's legal office. Security footage, camera footage shows them ignoring valuables and cash but rifling through drawers and filing cabinets, clearly looking for something, they ultimately left stealing a Christmas ham. Yes, a Christmas ham. <clears throat> Ola Benny's case is perhaps the most distressing. Isn't that a Phil It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia thing, Christmas ham? Um, I, I would call ham? I would equate it more to the to the Grinch where they stole the roast beast. But <laughs> Now what's the one in in uh the Santa Cla the Santa Claus where it's like what's her name is having a fight in the shopping center with like canned ham? You no. Know? Um, you mean spam? Rum ham says Hembo. Yeah. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, so, no, oh. it was like it was like a can ha ham in a can. Like it's a, it's a thing. Um. So Ola Benny has lived in Ecuador since 2013. So, Although he was friends with Julian and visited him over 15 times in the London Embassy, Benny maintains that he never worked for WikiLeaks or Assange. Hours after Julian's arrest, Benny was arrested in Ecuador. He was accused of attempting to destabilize the government and attacking its computer systems. I think we covered this when he got out. Because <laughs> we would never try to destabilize the government. Prosecutors explicitly um. alleged that he had conspired with Ricardo Patino the former foreign minister of Ecuador who granted Assange asylum. The arrest was internationally condemned and viewed as politically motivated, which of course it was. It wasn't just viewed, it was politically motivated. Critics maintained that not only was Binney targeted for his relationship with Julian, but that his prosecution meant to demonize supporters of the former left-wing government of Rafael Correo. Correa. Yes, Binney was eventually acquitted, but his ordeal continues. And there's a whole link to the EFF and talking about the Ecuador judicial judicial system still surveilling him. And I think he has a ankle brace. Ten more years, Julian. Oh, man. 
Mr. Leahy, shout out R.I.P. Leahy. As the Der Spiegel piece you makes know, clear, yeah. yeah, there is no smoking gun linking the experiences of Mueller, McGoon, Martinez, and Benny to any U.S. intelligence agency yet. It is not paranoid for supporters of Assange to wonder if strange break-ins, surveillance, and open lawfare have their origins with the U.S. national security state, which is why, because Der Spiegel is not the first publication to document the strange occurrences Assange supporters and visitors have encountered. In 2020, journalist Charlie's Glass wrote a piece for The Intercept uh, entitled The Unprecedented and Illegal Campaign to Eliminate Julian Assange. In it, he, in it, he described his own strange encounters two days after visiting Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy, an office he shared in London was broken into. Hmm. His computer was stolen. His office mate's computers were left untouched. Glass wrote, it's impossible to prove who did it, but it's not impossible to guess. And then we talk about an Italian journalist, Stefania Marizzi, or Reed lookalike, you know her. and uh, potentially yep. also an honorary recipient for 2023 of the of an Indie Media Award. Um, yeah, she also had a bizarre run-in. Stefania visited Assange multiple times and has served as media partner for every major WikiLeaks release as well as the Italian media partner for the Snowden disclosure. While Stefania was working with WikiLeaks concerning the NSA surveillance of world leaders, someone stole her backpack at a train station. Hmm. After reporting the incident to police, police then dubbed it as an atypical robbery. Huh? Maurizi also experienced surveillance while, atypical. while visiting Assange at the embassy. And again, we had this. You see global security contractors took her electronic devices from her visits they removed the device's SIM cards and photographed them. Other visitors to the embassy were similarly spied upon. This surveillance prompted a lawsuit against the CIA from four U.S. citizens, including Glass, which is still ongoing. The CIA and others are trying, of course, to have the case thrown out. Sure. Because yeah. the perpetrators must never be prosecuted. That's called a coup d'etat. Uh, revelations from the Snowden disclosures is also... That's French for something, right? Yeah, something like... No, that's menage a trois, but that's another story. Uh, revelations for the uh -huh. Snowden disclosures also shed disturbing light on the potential breadth of the U.S. national security state's war on WikiLeaks. The government backbone... Uh, the government communications headquarters, which is the British equivalent to the NSA, tapped into the backbone of the internet to gather the IP addresses of those who visited the WikiLeaks website. Ah, no problems there. Additionally, inside the NSA, officials discussed declaring WikiLeaks a malicious foreign actor. I don't think that they discussed it. I think they actually did it. And that's why I think they're treating Julian the way they have. Legal designations like this have been key to the three-letter agency's war on the organization. CIA and FBI tried to get it designated as information brokers to get around the rules on targeting journalists. CIA did declare WikiLeaks a hostile non-state intelligence agency, which is a maneuver that allowed them to engage in offensive counterintelligence against the organization, something that has previously only been allowed for targeting state intelligence services. <laughs> Russian but, scum! Yep. But the NSA designation would be particularly pernicious by labeling WikiLeaks a malicious foreign actor for targeting purposes. The NSA would be able to electronically target WikiLeaks for surveillance without excluding information about U.S. persons. That's the crux right there. Number one, the Russian hacker. Wait, what? Try that again. Number one, the Russian hacker. Yes, that too. But like I said. Number one, Russian hacker. By labeling WikiLeaks a malicious foreign actor, they are essentially a terrorist organization, they're calling them. I said that a while ago. It feels like they changed the classification yep. and the designation and the way that they look at WikiLeaks and the way they treat Julian and the way they treat this case. And everything that you their mean behavior... the Patriot Act might have precedent? Everything you that mean their that behavior... might be a thing? Everything that their behavior has done over the last three years 
has indicated that because they still won't drop the case in spite of all of the mountains of evidence that are showing that they were Ill that they illegally obtained evidence, that they illegally bought off witnesses, that those witnesses are absolute fucking pedophiles. Yes, Siggy Thordasson was an absolute pedophile. That's their star witness. Doesn't matter. Because they're really just going out for a persecution. Doesn't this matter. is not even a trial. But they're not on just balance, going to limit it. Now, the thing that scares the hell out of me and, and should scare the hell out of all of us, including our friend Misty Winston, which is that NSA is probably hot. Hi, Fred. Is, is recording and listening to this right now because we are talking shit about the NSA. <laughs> the Electronic Privacy mm. Information Center deemed epic because every nightmarish organization has a name that means the exact opposite in 2011 filed a FOIA request with the department of justice and the FBI for files about an investigation into WikiLeaks, including all records regarding lists and names of individuals who have demonstrated support for, or in interest in WikiLeaks. We're yes. The empire, the FBI withheld the documents by arguing an investigation was ongoing, which a district court, Upheld. Yep. Historically, the FBI targeted groups it dubbed subversive, such as the Communist Party and the Socialist Workers Party. Wouldn't know anybody a member of those organizations. Um, an explicit goal of this targeting was the fear that American that the American people might view these organizations as legitimate political parties. The FBI spying did not stop there. They claimed the power to track subversives. They claimed that the power to track subversives also meant they could spy on and destroy those who might be influenced or infiltrated by the, those subversives. They, of course, infamously, uh -huh. infamously launched communist infiltration investigations into the NAACP, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and Martin Luther King. Attorney General RFK, Fine. that's that's Booby's daddy, signed, signed J. Edgar Hoover's yep. request to wiretap King to essentially learn if the civil rights icon was talking to communists on the telephone. And if, if he was cheating on his wife. That too. Yeah. 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 They, well, they, they, of course, nice, well, nice people. While, while he was hanging out in a dress and doing cross-dressing and doing whatever he was doing, J. Edgar. In the 1980s, yeah. activists opposed to Ronald Reagan's Central America policy experienced break-ins and death threats not dissimilar from those experienced by WikiLeaks supporters. I will say that there's a man by the name of Roger Stone that, has, that is directly linked to both, as well as Oliver North. Not saying, just saying. Oh, yeah, Ollie North. This prompted civil liberties groups um, to file FOIA requests. Although the break-ins remained unsolved, the subsequent FOIA requests revealed that the FBI, citing its foreign counterintelligence authorities, had investigated the committee in solidarity with the people of El Salvador and other Central American solidarity groups. <laughs> Can we defund the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA, please? Can we just get be done with that? Because... We need to. Ain't nobody got time for that. No one has yet been able to definitively tie the break-ins, atypical robberies, and intrusive surveillance of WikiLeaks to any of the Amer American intelligence agencies. Nor will they ever be able to because they're set up and they do this really well. There's also the help of foreign intelligence agencies that they don't even necessarily want to talk about, whether that's MI6, Mossad, or anyone else. Uh, yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Perhaps they're all just a series of traveling coincidences, but of course, one doesn't need to be paranoid to suspect the hand of the U.S. national security state, given the history of its abusive surveillance and its obsessive vendetta against WikiLeaks. It's impossible not to suspect involvement by one or more of the U.S. intelligence agencies, likely CIA, targeting WikiLeaks. Dependent... And the best part of this plan is. No one can stop me. Right? John Miller. Dude. <laughs> Trying to keep it clean, man. Yes, I see the small D in the right corner. Damn it. 
Small D, man. Small D. Got you. Small D energy. Is that what you're saying? No. This is big D energy. Targeting WikiLeaks, depending on how broad the intelligence agencies cast their nets, opens up a range of activists and journalists to surveillance. Again, no surprise to anybody listening, watching, paying attention in support of the greatest journalists alive and maybe to ever live. Free Julian Assange. Free him now. Drop those charges. Get him the fuck Julian. out. Um, yeah. Julian. Julian, 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 Julian. Um, Julian, Julian come here. Are these people like you've been doing action for assange you did the billboards for assange okay so mm -hmm. uh for people who don't know t tell everybody about like that whole campaign and and are you still doing that is that still going on so that... daniel's been doing it in um north carolina daniel de my dear friend who is an amazing org organizer and activist who doesn't get near the credit that he deserves or recognition that he deserves he's very kind of quiet behind the scenes um but he's been doing it in north carolina i did it here in columbus for i don't know probably about six months or so mm -hmm. um it was hugely successful um it was last summer ish uh, spring summer ish um, I'm gonna pick it up again I think uh, moving into this fall uh, I, I really 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 want to get some uh, at least one billboard up around the Ohio State football stadium uh, the shoe um, that's a mass like just massive oh like yeah right by Ohio State of thousands of people yes mm -hmm. oh, I know where I know yeah. where so yeah, I would as, love as to get a billboard sports. Up. Yes, I used to be a yeah. sports junkie at one point before I got into really into politics. <laughs> yeah, I'm still I'm not, I'm not really a sports junkie. I'm a college football junkie kind of. I've always kind of been since I turned 18. So my dad died and my dad loved Ohio State. Mm. Um and so I had never I didn't really care about football and but then when he died it was like it was like that weird thing that it kind of makes you it's, I know it sounds dumb but it makes you feel close to that person. It's your link. Sure. Um so yeah, I mean it was just something that I kind of picked up on it just made me feel close to my dad and I got like really obsessive about it i've cooled out a lot since i had kids uh there for a while i mean i was a walking talking like espn episode you know what i mean like i knew all of the statistics i knew every i knew the score to every game and i knew who played what position and I, I mean i knew it all um and i can't really my kids won't allow that kind of time plus my i mean what i do now I, <laughs> there's no way i'd have enough time uh to you know put that much energy into it um, but i still do love watching college football it's a lot of fun um, and it's, you know, it's kind of one of those, I think we all have our vices, those things that we need to like distract us away from this because it gets very dark and depressing. And that's just one of mine. Yeah. Reef, Reef but keeps yeah, yelling I at me. I want to pick the billboards back up. Reef keeps yelling at me that I need to find something away from this. And I, I, I can't oh. figure that out because I keep running back to this and it's just, I know, I, I know. And, and it's like, Hey, let's do it. Let's do another show. Hey, Jesse jet. What you want to, you want to do a new show? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I have to start saying like, Hey guys, uh, plates a little bit full right now. Like, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I it's just so hard because you want to, you want to, you want to help everybody. You want to, you want to do it all. You, you feel terrible when, you know, it's, it's hard, but you know, the, there's only so much we I can know. all do. And it's, it's, it is. My kid it's... just yelled at me because today I had, obviously I had my show today from three to six. And then at right. 30, I was on with Compton J and mm -hmm. Nick from RBN. And then I'm doing this and my kid's like, dude, you have a lot of shows. <laughs> like, yeah, dude, I know do. my kids do. I, I can't help it. I mean, I can, but I can't, it's, I know. you know, it's when people ask me to do things, I have a really difficult time saying no. You know what I'm saying? Especially if it's somebody that wants to talk to me about Julian Assange, forget it. I can't, there's, I won't say no. I won't say no. If somebody wants to talk about Julian Assange and give it coverage, I'm there. Show me right. when do I, where, when, when, <laughs> tell me when, you know what I mean? Well, so that's hard well, for me. Now, now we know that. you're hooked, but you better, you, you better <laughs> actually do it or you, you're going to be, you're going to have to deal with Misty and you don't want to have to deal with that. Cause, cause yeah. we see, we see the rough side of Misty and we don't, 
Yeah, I don't like. I, I've never really seen the rough side of Missy. I just hear about the rough side of Missy because I know better, and and there's no People reason think to. I'm super mean. I'm and, not. Like we were just talking about. Uh, this that's in funny. DC, you have this Fiorella. reputation, right? You have this reputation for oh my, oh my god, but. Uh, I'm not mean. I mean, no. I am kind of so, to pe certain people. Yeah, I can no, be. you 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 have you have an edge, and you 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 smell bullshit like immediately, and it's it and it's genuine. And if you're not bringing genuine to the table, you're not gonna last very long in Misty Circle, and she's gonna sniff that out fast. No. That's just been what I've seen. Um, yeah. But, I'm but not, I like, also unreasonable, see... I don't think. No, but again, not you know... This raging bitch, you know what I mean? So again, ha I'm sure, you know, ha having a daughter on the spectrum, March for Medicare for All and, and, and you know, Medicare for All, Healthcare for All is is a is a thing that's near and dear to your heart. Uh, again, for all, not just for people who have children right. on the spectrum, but services available to all, including uh, special needs, including disabled, including services that aren't being made available right now, exclusionary stuff that's happening. And again, I see you out there fighting for parents. I see you fighting out there fighting for uh, for everyone, for for kids, for disabled people, for anyone that you know. Uh, that it's it's just amazing to to see you line up again, kind of like me. It's like where where do you want me you know like okay there's a thing is a stream is a we're gonna do an, an event we're gonna do a a three-day online summit okay what do i need to do this it, it's awesome uh and, and again I, I love it that you're there in game for all of that in spite of everything and and like do you do you get the kids involved in this at all like how how involved how much do they know about like what you do and um they know a lot yeah <laughs> I, I mean i don't know if you saw my tweet the other day my kid blew me away this past week um she had a like a social studies project where they're doing like cultural like you know what i mean just like pick a country and then you have to like uh, do a little presentation about the culture or whatever and she chose russia um and she was telling me this after mm. school and and she was like yeah we have this project i had to choose a country and i'm like well what country did you choose and she's like russia and i instantly was kind of like oh <laughs> oh no and she was like yeah and the other kids in the class were like why would you choose russia and right. i just told them listen you don't know anything about russia you just know what the media wants you to know and i was like yes this is my kid and then she goes on to explain to me i was blown away i mean in 11 year old words like she didn't know what the donbass region was called she didn't know what the minanku was called um you know but she was sitting there like describing to me yeah but eight years ago you know we uh, overthrew their government and then they've been killing a bunch of people like she like rattling off all these things that i had no idea that she knew um <laughs> but then i was like how do i'm like mind blown i my husband was down like where i am now we were upstairs um and he was playing video games down here and i'm like yeah i'm like did you just hear her and he's like yes and i'm like how do you know all this stuff and she tells me because we live in a split level so i'm on like the ground ground level i guess right and there's stairs right there that go up to my living room and so it's like around a corner but she said um sometimes when you're on your shows i'll come and i'll sit on the stairs and listen and i had no idea she did that um so <sighs> i mean she she's listening to me um but they're i mean they know um I, I mean, I don't talk to them about stuff too much because that's a lot for kids. It's heavy stuff. I um, mean, like, yeah, it's, yeah. How, how much do you, do you say and how, what do you, it's, I it's mean, I don't lie to, to them. figure out. Yeah. I don't lie. I'm very open. If they ask questions, I'm very, I mean, my oldest is kind of, I mean, she doesn't really care. <laughs> you know what I mean, it's not her thing. Uh, so uh, she doesn't know probably as much. Um, she might surprise me. I don't know. But my youngest is very in tune. Like she's very um she's pretty aware she knows who julian assange is she knows why he's in jail um she knows who chelsea manning is she we uh when i got my jeep a couple years ago uh she's the one that uh, decided we should my jeep's name is chelsea after chelsea manning <laughs> that was because my kids said we should name her chelsea um so yeah i mean my, my 11 year old especially is uh very aware um i don't take them to protests or anything like that um you know especially my oldest she has a lot of sensory issues she can't handle that kind of noise and the crowd and all of that stuff um mm. i mean glory jones on a megaphone would not be a good time for her uh, <laughs> <laughs> that would not be a good time yeah for her. Um, yeah ha but yeah NATO, my, my youngest right? is pretty aware how, yeah. do you how do you spell terrorist n-a-t-o n-a-t-o uh, how do you spell terrorist 
Shout, shout out to Glory Jones. And you know what? I I have to apologize to to Glory in in advance because in all the descriptions and everything I wrote, I completely left out free the truth. Holy crap! Oh. That's yet another well, we're kind of show not really that you doing do. That. Holy shit! Well, no, because we're not really, well, we're, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's well, think right. about this. Well, We've right. got action for Assange. Okay, we've got facts on the ground. We've got MCSC. We got bitch with comrade Misty. We've got TNT Radio. Okay, and yeah. So I think I think that truth. covers all of it. And then also, of course, free the truth whenever it decides to come back. Um, I, we I never get back. We may Saturdays. we may move it to MCSC though. I think we're gonna move it to MCSC. Um, and keep it in house. I think that's, uh, I, I, I think just that it, like it just, sense. yeah. Well, I mean, just starting the TNT thing, I mean, that's 15 hours a week, and that's not including all the time it takes to book and prep and research and all of that stuff. So, I was just trying to get, and honestly, I was worried mm -hmm. about my voice first starting off because talking for 15 hours a week um, may not seem like a lot, but it's a lot. Uh, so I was kind of worried about my voice and stuff, but now that I got through DC, um, uh, and I can kind of get my schedule you know kind of calm down a little bit uh we'll probably start picking up some of those shows again well it's not just 15 hours a week okay it's 15 hours a week plus like six hours a week of vigils and uh three hours a week of bitch and and two and a half hours a week of facts on the ground all right or facts on friday <laughs> yeah if you do facts yeah, on friday some of these shows are technically technically facts on friday is part of facts on the ground like i don't even know the FOTG yeah. like is like a channel of different shows of you and Jesse. Sometimes it's you, sometimes yeah. it's Jesse. For people who don't know, go sign up for those show for those channels. Amazing. Okay. They're on Rockfin. They're on YouTube. I've got all their links in the description uh on all the different channels. Uh they do post on you on Twitter, but only I think like when they go live or when there's a video. I think that's about the only time We're that I really see bad them. about that. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> uh and, and that's something I, I definitely want to get talk talk to you about at some point is how to how do we help organize your digital life a little bit better um and, and we'll we'll work on that because I, I you know again your bitch channel like when i go to the home page of your bitch channel it says there's no content i know there's no i don't know content. what happened like no content everybody keeps telling me i need to fix it ah, and i no just content. don't care and then, and then I have if to, you like, go to videos though yes if you go videos to videos you can find all the stuff you have to switch tabs but for the for the average layperson that doesn't necessarily go to the second tab, we got to make sure that they see what what they're supposed to see. There can be a trailer. It's and been that we, way for ages. We got to hype up. We got to hype up Misty. Come on. We this, this, oh, this is this, this I don't know about all that. This is this is my this is my area of expertise. You know that. And 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 Nico's too to his to his credit. And shout out I know to Nico. Nico gets and, really mad. <laughs> I see. He gets mad because I don't like, like my titles are a shit, and I don't. I'm terrible at self promotion. Like if you want me to promote like something you're doing or something Reef's doing or something that Nico's doing, I'm the best hype guy ever. But if you want me to hype my own stuff, I don't do that. Or Robbie do Yeager. That. It's it's very yeah. I'll, I'll hype Robbie all day long. We got I need to get Robbie. Up. I'm trying to get him on TNT, and he's uh he's been kind of uh, off the grid for a while. So Little I MIA. Yep. But, yep. Yeah. We've been, yeah, uh, we've been shout, out, shout out to Robbie if you're watching. I sent him a link to the stream. Much love. We love you, Robbie Receipts. Yes, Robbie Receipts, one of the best, one of the best out there. Lo love that dude. Yes. But uh, so, so bitch just started. Like, like literally, I remember you were like, I just want to have a show <laughs> where I can just have an outlet to complain and talk about whatever I want to talk about, and it's just my show, and that's it, <laughs> and that's bitch. I was yeah. like, that is the perfect perfect name for for what you want to do and yeah that, that could not be better so uh and that started what about about a year ago uh ish i don't remember um but yeah that came about really fast like that was like within 36 hours of me mentioning it there was a show wow. um uh, and that was i mean i had been we had joked about it for a long time because um you know like the mcsc crew always jokes because i'm really good at making friends <laughs> because i mean you know like everything's i mean so it, you know it was a what? thing and then so then i, I was like i'm gonna because i criticize everybody's favorite politicians and they were like you should do a show called fuck your faves with comrade misty oh, um I because that. i was just 
yeah, I was tearing down everybody's favorite politicians and everybody hated me for it for years. Like those, those same people are now also criticizing those politicians, but for years people hated me for doing it. Um, so that was like a whole thing within, it was like an inside joke on in the MCSC crew. Um, and then, uh, I forget what it was. I was just on Twitter one day joking about it. Um, and then sleepy Josh was like, who's our tech ninja. Who's an amazing tech ninja. Um, I could not do any of the things I've done so far without sleepy Josh. He's my hero. Um, he's awesome. Uh, and he was like, yeah, I can do that on Wednesdays at seven. And I'm like, really, you can do it. And this is like on a Monday and I'm like, okay. And, and it, then it was like, uh, you know, well, we, here's the name and they'll, here's a logo and oh, okay, we have a show. It was like, boom, 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 36 hours. Here's a show. It was very, uh, organic and fast and, um, it's a lot of fun. It's therapy. <laughs> But Ray yeah, McGovern, how he specifically was targeted. Ray McGovern yeah. nailed and talks specifically about the Isakoff story, and of course, the Isakoff story that 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 broke talked about how the Trump administration and Mike Pompeo had conspired potentially and plotted and drawn up plans to either extradite him, kidnap him have some type of a potential shootout on a London street. Um, There were all kinds of wild scenarios that were thrown out because that's what the CIA does when they're briefing a president, of course, when they're giving him scenarios. There's questions as to whether this was brought by Pompeo or by Trump himself. Lots of people seem to believe this was a vendetta that Pompeo had over Vault 7. And that's one of the things that that Ray McGovern had pointed out just the day after this whole thing broke and before everybody really had time to analyze and talk to anybody. He says, Michael Isikoff is at it again, this time with co-author Zach Dorfan and Sean Naylor in a long pothole piece posted on Sunday on Yahoo where Isikoff is chief investigative correspondent. (laughs) Seeing the title, Wouldn't You Dip In? Kidnapping, assassination, and a London shootout inside the CIA's secret war plans against WikiLeaks. Yeah, Pompeo's scary. You would know, Darlene. You live in you live in his state, or right, right nearby. Um, she's in Missouri. He's in Kansas, I believe. I sent out a quick tweet to alert those to me, to alert those many readers who are malnourished by the corporate media. To the, to the subliminal but clear subtext, the big lie that Assange was a Russian agent, which he clearly was not. After all, he published DNC emails hacked by the Russians, quote unquote, to hurt Canada Clinton and throw the 2016 election to Trump, right? Hacked. Wrong. Okay. Um, the Yahoo email, this is this is so good. The Yahoo article has a wealth of shoot 'em up detail the most plausible of which were long since revealed. This is where um, Max Blumenthal, even a year plus ago, this came out in the UC Global trial with David Morales. What what really happened? But sense is, even if those, if only those wimpish lawyers had not stood in the way, we'd have gotten our man, shoot up any Russians trying to steal him and bring him to Russia. No problem. First Amendment for Assange, no problem. So we are told, for example, the CIA and White House began preparing for a number of scenarios to foil Assange's Russian departure plans, according to three former officials. They have no evidence for this. Those those included yeah, potential gun ridiculous. battles with Kremlin. Yeah, this is what, what we talked about, right? Yeah. Isikoff yeah. et al. So this this is quoting the, the article more. Okay. And there was zero debate on the issue of whether the CIA would increase its spying on WikiLeaks said a former intelligence official. Right? So no stake in yep. Russiagate vampire. So well, good. And, and uh, Megan Kelly asked about uh, uh, asked Pompeo about this today. His aunt, or not today, but 
like this week, I think. Yep. Um, because I know I pulled that story for for our show. Uh, him and I called into Glenn Beck. Oh yeah. As well. Yep. And, oh, he had know, the most like think, uncomfortable think... giggle. Like, <laughs> yeah, of course we yeah. did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there was the the quote with Megan Kelly was that they were a like, well, uh, like anti national something something like. A non a non state hostile intelligence yeah. a non state hostile intelligence service yeah. I believe was was the terminology that was that was that used was to it. describe them or a non state Fucking actor gross. as well that's another way to describe it yeah so Ray McGovern uh, I certainly he was a 27 year career CIA analyst uh, including serving as chief of foreign policy branch chief of the Soviet foreign policy branch brilliant yep fault seven. Mm. Exactly, Valerie. Yeah, that is but Russia. But Russia, Russia, Russia. Russia the embarrassment of the Vault Seven leaks is why the CIA is determined to ensure that. Unfortunately, I don't. I, they have to. They have to get him out. He's got to be released. I mean, story after story after story highlights the persecution that this man is being underwrought right now. The torture yeah, that that he's I already. I told Misty we should just. Yeah. I told Misty we should just start sending cakes. <laughs> you know. Right. One might get through with something, you know. I'm, I'm like at this point, the cowboy breakout posse needs to, you know. Like. It's ridiculous. It is but, beyond ridiculous and really. Upsetting. Like, what are they holding him for? What are they? Well, he's already uh, won his extradition trial and they've already said that they're not going trial. to extradite him but they're still holding him which is still really weird um because he's a flight risk and he mm. fled he fled to the ecuadorian embassy prior prior um well but okay i don't want to try that whole part of the case but the other angle that i wanted to show and the other article that i thought brought a different a spin to the story in a different flair was from Kevin Gostola from the dissenter, another amazing writer. He was on the ground in England a couple of years ago or in February before COVID for the last trial. He was on the Zoom feed for the last two, uh, for the extradition trial itself in September and the appeal that happened in uh in july and uh he's been one of the most tenacious writers and and um he also covers uh prison mal malfeasance he covers um all kinds of corporate wrongdoing big fan of his work the dissenter is one of his newsletters he's also one of the co-founders of shadow proof and Right. So his article from September 29th was the report on the CIA plans to kidnap to Assange shows that the clearest evidence yet of improper pressure on prosecutors, right? That the district judge yeah. who denied the extradition request previously dismissed evidence of improper pressure from the CIA to charge the WikiLeaks founder. This is, again, an unbelievable story here. Though she ruled against the U.S.'s extradition request, she rejected the argument from the legal team for WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange that hostility within U.S. intelligence agencies translated into, pro into improper pressure on federal prosecutors to bring charges. However, the Isakov story on the CIA's plans yep. right, is some of the strongest evidence yet that the that, that he was only charged with crimes because of their thirst for vengeance. He was charged with by the and U.S. If Justice. they had killed him, I mean, if they had, if they had killed him while he was being like, isn't that not like witness? Uh, what do they call that? You know, where it's like tampering with witnesses or whatever. Well, you know, that that would just be. Uh, worse than than that that again what they're trying to do is send an ex, you know send a message to anybody that wants to report on the crimes yep. of the national security state of the cia of the united states of the u.s military the u.s government 
So the charges criminalize the act of merely receiving classified information as well as publication of the state secrets from the U.S. government targets common practices in journalism, which is why the case is widely opposed by press freedom organizations throughout the world. And there's been letters. Okay, again, here here's more about Vault 7. All right, and Gina Haspel shared his zeal for retaliation. All right, he sought revenge after the publication. Pompeo, Pompeo, proposed kidnapping Assange in the summer of 2017. His obsession led several CIA officials to draw up plans for assassinating the publisher. All right, some national security, yeah. this is, again, this is really more of what the Isakov story should have been, but it he's taking right. the parts of the Isakov story that are actually real, not mixed in with the Russiagate stuff. Now, the other question is, is if the Russiagate stuff's in there, how much do you take this? But again, Pompeo didn't deny that he set this up. Yeah. Um, representatives of the Assange legal team were asked to comment, but declined. They don't want to impact this case. If anybody has the wherewithal to support Kevin Gastol's work, please do at the both the dissenter newsletter, which of which I am a subscriber, as well as at Shadowproof. Again, this is another long one. And this gives a real breakdown of the Isakov story and again, CIA is a disgrace. The fact that it contemplated and engaged in so many illegal acts against WikiLeaks, its associates, and even other award-winning journalists is an outright scandal. And again, this is what Freedom of the Press Foundation executive director said. And that's um, what you were to – that's, I believe, the organization that Glenn Greenwald founded, Fred, Freedom of the Press Foundation. Yeah. Yeah. That's where you ta – we're talking about how it dovetailed into Glenn. Yeah, how Greenwald got personally, you know – Right, that so, Greenwald and Laura Poitras and were had also to leave the country, and that he couldn't get back into the country by what his, you know his lawyers recommended not, you know. So, yep, super fun for them. <sighs> free this man, please free this man. Oh yeah, this 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 Assange thing. Yeah, just like uh, how many times do we have to like? Why do we have to beg for this? You know. I don't get it. God, get that guy off my face. Get that guy off my screen. <clears throat> Again, the yeah. dissenter newsletter. I get a couple a week, I would say, from Kevin. Recent posts. Here's a couple of other ones. Report on the CIA plans. Shows that, okay, that's the one we just looked through. Here, he was reportedly obsessed with killing Assange. That's another article that he wrote for the dissenter. This is 9-11 cinema and all about Daniel Hale. <clears throat> These are more in-depth. And again, he's got tons of different uh, articles at the dissenter. Also, again, recommend. This is a separate newsletter, I guess, from um, Shadowproof, which is the other organization that he is the co-founder of with Brian Sonnenstein. Right. We finally get to Caitlin's Corner. So this means that we're at our last story of the night, and then we're going to get to boats crashing into other boats for Reef. Um, oh, this love is really, boats crashing into other boats. This is really the story that really gets me angrier than most. Yeah, this one's bad. This one pissed me off when I heard about it, too. Um, Barack Obama's on the board of Netflix. And Netflix decides case, three days before, on October 24th, before his court date, to release a smear yeah. piece, a smear movie about WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. Hmm. Yeah. Nothing suspicious there. Yeah, we're going to definitely crash those, those those boats into trolls. Yeah. I hope that's prop server. I hope. 
Netflix will begin streaming a brazen hatchet job on Julian Assange and WikiLeaks for its American subscribers on October 24th, just three days prior to a significant court date in Assange's fight against extradition from the UK to the United States on October 27th. Right. Gross. We Steal Secrets is the name of it, except that they don't steal secrets. They are provided leaks. They are an outlet that provide that, that provides a receptacle for people to anonymously post leaks and expose crimes to which they have never had to once print a retraction. Yeah. Jonathan Cook had it nailed. Oh, of course, it's Alex Gibney. Propagandist extraordinaire. So it was so egregious and it's been the money on. that not only did WikiLeaks supporters like World Socialist website and Jonathan Cook pan it as a smear at the time, but WikiLeaks itself went to the trouble of publishing a line-by-line -line refutation of the mountains of propaganda distortion heaped on the narrative by filmmaker Alex Gibney. Gross. Yeah. I'd say 14. This Eric. also reminds me of the... This also reminds me of the, um, like, the, the, the Netflix thing with, with Musk, right? Where they're sending, you know, three normal folks into space, right? You know, it, it's just showing how tied Netflix is into, you know, propaganda now and all that stuff. It was super fun. I love how they, um, they're quoting Jonathan Cook because he's fantastic. Everybody, please subscribe and support yeah. to Jonathan K. Cook or Jonathan C. Cook. Um, this would not be the first time Netflix has helped circulate the na narratives. And, of course, we know that Caitlin is always focused on narratives that advance the interests of U.S. Empire second or the third having already run blatantly propagandistic documentaries, quote-unquote, advancing imperial interests in nations like Ukraine, Russia, Egypt, multiple ones about Syria, right? And, of course, Netflix also has signed a deal with, with the Obamas and the British royals. No, nothing suspicious there. No. No, everything's perfectly fine. So they're not exactly company, looking out for the little guy, which from a company worth an estimated two hundred twenty nine billion should come as no surprise. Billion. Oh, and that's growing. Billion. Like two hundred yeah. billion dollars. Yes, Alex Gibney is a documentary filmmaker. Um I mean, what what was the last thing he did? Um, yeah, you can look that up. Um uh, still such a an open facilitation of the world's most powerful government in its campaign to imprison a journalist for inconvenient journalistic activity is a special kind of reprehensible. If there is a healthy humanity in the future, it will look back on the worldwide smear campaign against Assange and WikiLeaks with horror. I love her so eloquent, so wonderful. Free Julian Assange, get that man out of prison. He's there. He's being persecuted. We'll say that every week, hopefully. Uh, if I forget, I don't ever really want to forget but also wanted to mention tonight that there was a live stream that randy credico did on his channel that um, max, did, max give me did, what's that give me did going clear oh and, about and about okay the the smartest guys in the room and stuff. okay yeah those are decent Steve jobs mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. This one really, uh, yeah. I don't know. We'll, we'll see, but clearly it's an, a propagandizing smear piece. Um, yeah. It and, like. and it's the, the timing of its release date is especially curious because it's three days prior to they're trying to drum up U S sentiment against him and say, Oh, that was really a bad guy. And, and they, they should be extraditing. Him. Absolutely not. Absolutely not could not be more false and they can't they're not even exposing the persecution and the depths to which the u.s government went to try to get this guy and that alone should be grounds for his release if they if they extradite him to my house that he can see them you know right yeah. 
Okay. So, Caitlin's amazing. To, Please support Caitlin. Here's the QR code. If you can. Yeah, she even wrote, let's let's argue about bisexual Superman. Great one. Uh, again, I wanted to, to call attention to the fact that there was a live stream tonight on Randy Credico's channel, which is live on the fly with Randy Credico. It was a live stream of uh, a night of comedy for Assange. Naomi Caravani and Lee Camp from Redacted Tonight were there. And Max Blumenthal was there. Max did a an incredible set. I honestly like he's he's just So the court the, getting great. The, was the court thing today? Or is that No, the court thing know. is on the twenty seventh. Okay. And this is set for okay. release on the twenty fourth. Gotcha. these people so our first story of the evening but i wanted to get into this a little bit i didn't see a lot of people talking about this um especially among the breaking points team um but spain's high court demands pompeo testify on alleged plot to kidnap or kill assange which we know isn't alleged they definitely did that um yeah. so that was definitely that was definitely a thing um, like, it's been proven to be a thing, I'm pretty sure. Um, the former U.S. Secretary of State and CIA director was summoned to give testimony related to alleged spying on the jailed WikiLeaks founder by a Spanish security firm. So, a judge on Spain's highest court is summoned, uh, uh, Pompeo, right, to testify under an alleged Trump administration plot to kill or kidnap jailed WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, according to a report published on Friday. Spain's ABC reports National High Court Judge Santiago Pedraz issued the summons, which compels Pompeo to testify as part of an investigation of alleged illicit spying on Assange by Spanish security firm UC Global while the Australian was exiled in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Pompeo and former U.S. National Counterintelligence and Security Center Director William Ivanina are also being called to testify in about alleged plot revealed last year by Yahoo um, to abduct or possibly murder Assange to avenge WikiLeaks publication of the Vault 7 documents exposing CIA electronic warfare and surveillance activities. So, thoughts so far, Yeti? It'll be interesting. I believe Spain is part of NATO, aren't they? Um, so it'll be kind of interesting yeah. to see what happens. Because technically, they're supposed to um, work together on any of right. um, these kind of stuff. So we'll see how helpful the states are to this. Puppers demanded to be let into the other part of the studio. Um, so, but anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, this is, it, yeah. I'll be interested I, to see the extradition stuff you were saying, right? Like, yeah. How I that works this I way? I don't see it happening. No, I mean, I'd love this to happen. I'd love something to happen that gives Assange any like mm -hmm. respite. Um, so yeah, but yeah, I mean, I like. Well, he shouldn't be in jail for the first place, so it's uh, yes, stupid. right. But I mean, and and this is on the alleged. I'm pretty sure we know this happened. Um, so WikiLeaks, yeah. um you know, published ABC's article, which is in Spanish, if people want to go and find that. Um, you know, you can translate that, I'm sure. Um, so Spanish court summons ex-CIA director Mike Pompeo to testify uh, about the plans to assassinate Julian Assange, right? So according to Yahoo News, Zach Dorfman, uh, Sean Denaler, and Michael Isikoff, uh, discussions over kidnapping or, or killing Assange occurred at the highest level of the Trump administration, with senior officials requesting sketches or options for assassinating him. They were seeing blood, one former Trump security official told the reporters. Um, they seemed to be no barriers, said another. A UC Global whistleblower's alleged company founder, David Morales, worked with the CIA to surveil Assange and Ecuadorian diplomats who worked at the London Embassy. Former Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa 
had angered the Obama and Trump administrations by granting Assange asylum as he resisted going to Sweden to face sex crime allegations over fears he would be extradited to the United States, which that ended up being their biggest witness said he was lying. Like that the yeah. witness said the witness was lying yeah, so the, himself. Yep. He said he was coerced, coerced to do it. Yes. In a way as well. Right. Which just goes like flies so, uh, under the radar, right? Um, you know, of course. Um, did you see, I know, uh, Ian and brother Warren was on Misty's TNT radio show. Did have you, have you heard anything about Misty talking about this? I know they, they had a for a recently, which might've been mentioned this. So uh, if people haven't, they should go find both action for Assange and TNT radio with Misty Winston. Um, specifically. So I'm sure she'll talk about this at some point if she hasn't already. Um, but yeah, I mean, so Assange is charged in the U S with violating the 1917 espionage act, right. And the computer fraud and abuse act for conspiring with Chelsea Manning to publish classified documents, which reveal U S and allied war crimes and other misdeeds in Afghanistan, Iraq, and around the world on WikiLeaks over a decade ago. And they're talking about mainly the Vault 7 stuff, right? So that's like Double Tap and... Um, yeah. I forget what else. Was he was he involved in the... Um, the prisoner mistreatment stuff too? Was that also Julian? Um, I'm not 100% sure, but um, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. So according to the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, Assange has been... Uh, arbitrarily deprived of his freedom since he was first arrested in London on December 7th, 2010. Since then, he's been held under house arrest, confined for seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy, and jailed in London's Belmarsh prison, where he currently awaits his fate under a judge recently approved a U.S. extradition request. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, just generally talking I about I can't Assange, wait till these people get to... I can't wait till these people get to be uh, held in court. Yeah. I mean, I'd love it to be like, I mean, the Australians have been sitting on their ass on all this. So, yeah. Um, and we know, I, I don't know if, did, did we talk about it last time you were here? Or we talked about um, Assange and like, particularly the, the uh, PM of Australia, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, something like that. Albanazi, but you know, Albus Dumbledoreans, um, something. But like, yeah, about he hasn't really done anything. He, he's essentially told him he was gonna sell him every everything for nothing. Like when he went to go meet with like Biden and, and stuff. Like, no, you just get everything. You don't have to give me anything. I'll I'll just cup them and rub them the right way for you. Um. So, but anyway. these people there's a lot of things happening in the assange extradition case um he's on his last leg like you 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 can't get any farther than this like the, once he sends this appeal i think his lawyers can send maybe one we'll get into it but he can think he send one more appeal but not after like that me, yeah. i'm not sure it's gonna take it's gonna after that it's gonna take public pressure i mean so in uh traditional tone deaf american fashion we have uh, Secretary Blinken uh, just on September 15th, two days ago. Uh, oh, my God. Three days ago, where democracy depends on the free and open exchange of ideas, including online. On this International Day of Democracy, which I didn't even know. It's just, a, day just a made up day. We, just a fucking made up day to like promote this word that like basically doesn't exist. Okay. But like I call on a governments around the world to protect citizens' access to information that allows them to make informed decisions. Uh, so it sounds great. You know, everyone everyone called out this guy appropriately. <laughs> I see for... Fisher right there. Yeah, he's like, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's completely cynical, tone-deaf 
and absolutely ridiculous. Um, so here's an article. Um, you, you might have saw this coming up from a couple other analysts. This is just, this is just this insane. Is this is just insane. This is, uh, yeah. So Craig Murray, the former British ambassador and close associate of imprisoned leaking, leaking, make it a little bigger. Bigger. Sorry, just yeah, 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 I got you said he was prevented by a U.S. Marshal from entering the courthouse in Alexandria, Virginia, where Assange would be put on trial if he loses his extradition case in Britain. Sounds pretty close to Langley. So uh, in Washington, on a, well, it's also Washington, but like in Washington on a U.S. tour, Murray told a gathering on a Wednesday that with some time to kill, he decided earlier that day he'd to visit the federal courthouse in Alexandria just to see what it was like. So I found the federal court and I went to enter, as any member of the public is entitled to do. Murray said, according to video recording of his remarks, they asked me for ID, as they ask everybody, I believe, and I handed my passport. They made a phone call. Somebody came down and he had a badge that said U.S. Marshals. Murray said, he said, sorry, sir, but you can't enter the courtroom. There, there is no reason why he would no, not. Be anybody, alive. anybody can go to. You could go to court. Everybody knows you can just like walk into courtrooms and you. If you wanted to spend There's all day no sitting way. in a courtroom yeah. just looking at people pleading their cases and whatever, like, you're allowed you to do sitting, that. You sit, in, you sit in court to watch other people's like you know get slammed on their traffic tickets. Yeah, all the time. All the time. This is not like this is not like 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 uh, it's a public. This is a public courtroom. He says it right here. Is this not a public courtroom? Is there not public right of access? And he recognizes, yes, sir, but you're you're not the public. And I said, but there's trials, and trials by law are open to the public generally. And he said, yeah, but you can't come in, Ambassador Murray. Hmm. He said, this is really interesting because nowhere in my passport does it give my title, nor had I mentioned it. So how do they know who I am? Hmm. Have a blacklist or something. There's a level of surveillance. Mary went on. Remember, they, uh, I mean, I know Indy uh, covered a story about how they were recording, uh, they, they, were, they were taping Assange. And, uh, yeah. They, yep. 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 And yeah. Mm -hmm. The level of surveillance, Mary went on. I don't know if that is facial recognition technology. I don't know what it is that brought that up. I don't know whether they had a memo sitting at a desk, uh, but. It's got to be something saying that says Craig. If Craig Murray comes, don't let him in. And you know what does this mean for the open access of Julian here? There's you know a lot of like different accounts on this, but like it's that that this is an insane account of what's going on. So, You're now there's now it's now a completely like shh, like quiet. There's you there's no talking about this. So ostensibly what's going to happen is they're going to claim that it's going to be a public public trial and extradition but yet you know msm wants to bury it and wants to pretend that julian assange doesn't exist and they would be the only ones who would be invited to this courtroom so they're not going to go and ostensibly they're going to kit nobody with any sort of uh diplomatic privilege is going to be allowed to be there so this and like, like so like, like that's actually well he has dip Craig Berry is a has right a and that's the thing he's is like former he's a fucking former British ambassador and like you know Craig Murray actually does really great work because the only reason why we know a lot about like a lot of these court cases is because of because Craig Murray is a you know human rights advocate and he attends the the, the trials right um. So this is Craig Murray on the Chris Hedges report. He was explaining this a little bit more. Well, he's more so explaining the case a little bit more, but um, just to show you, like, um, it, it, it's just uh, he's just describing a little bit more further details from about three days ago about uh, the current case on Assange. Security services were his favorite clients uh, because they are, you know, organized and brilliant and cogent, and he's entirely a tool of the security services uh, and that that's why he was given this uh, particular job um so uh, uh, there's a right of appeal 
normally. Uh, let, let me just interrupt because it's a little yeah. different from the American system. Yeah. And I, I have tried to get my head around the UK legal system. It's an appeal to a two-judge panel, yep. uh, a, a bit like our appellate court. Yep. And essentially, the appeal states that uh, there wasn't sufficient grounds for the judge to make this ruling. Is that correct, basically? That's right. Um, there's now, if you like, you were already at an appeal stage, uh, and now you're an appeal to the High Court. Now you're making an appeal to the Appeal Court, which is actually the same court. It's physically the same place, uh -huh. and it's the same panel of judges. Um, it's all the same people. It's all the same. So they're just going to be like, no, again, get the fuck out of here. You know, it's a, it, it, that's exactly what it is. So you you tell me does this sound does this sound like a public this is kangaroo would, would court any, shit. would any would any lawyer in the world would any judge in the world look at this case and like any normal judge look at this case and like say that this is normal oh yeah it's like, fine like listen this is the they're look okay, at this is really the last leg yeah so he's he's about to get extradited judge, to judge swift um and the appeal now is to a two judge panel and it's saying that um it's it's an appeal for a right to further make the appeal it's not an appeal for the entire judgment to be overturned um and judge swift in bullshit. his uh, you know judgment dismissing with contempt the entire case and not bothering really to answer any of the arguments uh he said that the uh this appeal has to be limited to 20 pages of a4 and that the, uh, it will be timetabled as a as a thirty minute appeal. No, it's exactly like you said. It's all bureaucratic. It's all. This is exactly like how they you know how they rush defense bills in Congress. Like last yeah, minute. yeah, like in like the middle of the night, like freaking yeah, just trying to shuffle yeah. things through. Like that's how a lot of this that's works. Thirty minutes. It's not thirty minutes for the defense. That's thirty minutes for the entire mm -hmm. hearing. So so plainly. You know, that's a, a kind of summary process to just right. try and close off the final avenue of appeal. Um, and, and, and this is, you know, this is all quite extraordinary. Uh, it, 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 there's almost no pretense of due process in, in, involved here, but that's Not been true. Nothing. Throughout, Nothing. The, um, throughout the proceedings. One of the things um, I witnessed uh, during the initial extradition hearings was that when procedural motions were made, for example, on whether certain evidence was admissible, the defense would stand up and argue why the evidence should be admissible. And then the prosecution would stand up and argue why the evidence should not be admissible. And then the judge would give her ruling. But the judge came into court and it, it, the public gallery is seated above the judge you're higher than the judge you can look down on the judge and i saw a hundred percent for certain the judge came into court with her ru ruling already typed out before she heard the arguments it was probably typed up by a u.s fucking it was probably a u.s marshal just typing into like this is like, what you're gonna say no. this is exactly <laughs> this is run by the mic the whole court this is the this whole is court incredible. is run by the MIC. Listen to this again. This is crazy. Things um, I witnessed uh, during the initial extradition hearings was that when procedural motions were made, for example, on whether certain evidence was admissible, the defense would stand up and argue why the evidence should be admissible and then the prosecution would stand up and argue why the evidence should not be admissible and then the judge would give her ruling but the judge came into court and it, it, the public gallery is seated above the judge you're higher than the judge you can look down on the judge and i saw a hundred percent for certain the judge came into court with her ru ruling already typed out before she heard the arguments uh, and she sat there almost pretending to listen to what the defense was saying for an hour and what the prosecution was saying for an hour. Then she simply read out the ruling. She's like the queen of hearts It was in Alice in Wonderland, you right. know, giving the, the verdict head. before she hears the sentence. Precisely that.
and but exactly it's much more convenient and the um, uh, my own strong suspicion <coughs> is it's not the judge who wrote that ruling right yeah you and that's exactly what we said that's what she was given uh <laughs> you know as this is what we want as a ruling and, on yeah, and just before we go on i mean you and i have covered you've covered it more extensively than i have but i've covered it and have been in london for some of the hearings mm -hmm. Uh, on the most basic level, the evisceration of attorney-client privilege, because UC Global recorded the meetings between Julian and his lawyers, that in a UK court, as in a US court alone, should get the trial invalidated. Right. Yeah, in, in right. Democracy. Right. That should have put an end to it right there. Oh, we were spying on you while you were living at the embassy. Like, that should have been, like, any lawyer in the world. In the world. If, if your intelligence services have been recording the the client's uh, attorney consultations, um, that would get the case to a net. 100%. I remember that. You, any, any fucking lawyer in the world, ask any lawyer and or any judge about this case, about attorney, uh, attorney client privilege. Some of the most corrupt countries in the world have, have attorney privilege. Uh, <laughs> Client privilege. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of like it's kind of like it's kind of like the like first it's like amendment. one of the most basic things you can offer to like you know like for for a, for an actually fair trial, and he's not getting that. So this is not this is very obviously no signs of any it's sort kangaroo of kangaroo shit. This is just completely. We know we we know that the 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 guy that the witness that they bought off because the key witness admits to. He, not only does the FBI oh, admit guy, to, I like, remember this. Yeah, they admit to lies in the indictment, but also the key witness that they have is, uh, you know, turns out to be a huge pedo. So that this is they the pick guy, the best guy. people, the best people, and it's ridiculous because like this, the, they paid for they paid everything. They paid for the evidence. They paid for the guy, and it's all it's all set up. It's all perfectly set up. For the MIC, how strange is that? It's fine. It's just that, like, that, like Julian Assange didn't stand a chance, and it's really sad to see. It'll be really, we got, we got a lot of work to do when he gets extradited to the states when that date gets set, because indie media is really going to have to freaking coalesce around Assange when, when he gets extradited. It's going to be really. A... No, we, it, he's going. to... That's exactly what. I'm about to bring up right now. Okay, cool. <laughs> he talks about like the, the, like this is like when we say this is like this is Julian's last leg. This is literally Julian. Yeah, he's leg. about to be extradited. He's gonna get extradited, and we're we're we need we need we need to be sounding the alarms. We've seen like uh, I'm gonna. I'll it's like, like we've been see. we've been covering Lahaina, and we got a little bit more to do on Lahaina tonight. Like, but like when Assange gets extradited or when it's known that he's going to be extradited to the states you can guarantee that like we're going to have something to say about it on every single one of our shows yeah you know, and facade. probably it's among most of the people on in are going to have something to say about it you know i hope i just i hope that's one thing that we can all agree on and you know what that's going to be when you see like all the phonies come out like you know like when they're not talking all the about all it. the bad faith people talking about the freaking yeah. allegations and shit <sighs> Product anymore, yeah. like the late Roman Republic. Oh, but he's a rapist. I want to talk about so once this two panel uh, hearing is over, and I think the it's a pretty safe assumption that they will uh, reject uh, the appeal. What yeah, happens then? Safe assumption. The immediate thing that will happen is that Julian's lawyers will try to go to the European Court in, in Strasbourg. To the European Court of Human Rights. European Court of Human Rights to uh, to submit uh, an appeal and get the extradition stopped pending an appeal. The worry is that um, Julian would instantly be extradited. You know that they that the government wouldn't wait uh, to hear from the European Court. Uh, Explain or, to Americans hmm. what it is and what jurisdiction it has in the UK, the European Court. Yeah, the European Court of Human Rights is not a European Union body. It's a body of the Council of Europe. Um, and it has... It's not it citizens. has jurisdiction over the European Convention of Human Rights, which um, guarantees basic 
human rights, and, that, and therefore it has legally binding jurisdiction over human rights violations in, in any member state of the treaty. Um, so it does have a legally binding jurisdiction and is acknowledged as such normally by the UK government. They're very powerful voices within the current Conservative government in the UK, which wants to exit the, uh, uh, the of course they do. Uh, Convention on Human Rights. Of course they do. But at present, that's not, that's not the case. The UK is still a part of this system. And so the European Court of Human Rights has legally binding authority over the government of the United Kingdom purely on matters that contravene human rights. Yeah. And if they do extradite him, I mean, they've essentially nullified that process. I mean, the fear is that, of course, the security services would know about the ruling in advance. He'd be on the tarmac and yeah. shuttled it, you know, sedated and put in a diaper and hooded or something and put out a CIA flight to Washington. I want to talk about if that happens. I think it's certainly very possible what we need to do here. And I know part of the reason you're in the United States is to prepare for that should it take place. I think you will try and cover the hearings trial here as you did in the UK. But let, let's talk about where we go if that event occurs. Yeah. Well, I think the first thing to say is that if that happens, on the day it happens, it will be the biggest news story in the world. It will be a massive yeah, news story. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Um, so we have to be uh, prepared. We have to know um, who from the Assange movement or who from his defense team who's going to be the spokesman who are going to be the spokespeople who are going to be offered up to all the major news agencies because we have to affect the story on day one because if you get behind the story and we know what their line will be they'll put out all these lies about uh, people being killed because of weaker leaks about american security being endangered we know all the propaganda that they will try to flood mm -hmm. the airwaves with so we we need to be ready and ahead of the game uh, to know who our people are who are going to be offered up to interview who are going to proactively get onto the media and, and not just the alternative media like this media, but onto the mainstream media as well, uh, so-called mainstream, um, and, uh, and and get out the story. So, so those things have to be taken. And then there are all the um, the, the practical things. You know, the, the many on uh, Julian's family, which will need to come over to support him. We'll need to know immediately how to uh, how to get them, where to get them to, what their accommodation is going to be. We on that day uh, to be ready to go out and start demonstrating all over the United States. Uh, and one thing. Um, that I, I really believe. I've been very, uh, uh, on this tour I'm on in, in the States at the moment, I've been meeting activists, and there's a huge base of very experienced and extremely impressive activists who are interested in the Assange case, but there's no real spark to it yet. Mm -hmm. I think the day he arrives, uh, and you will have uh, the Deadwood Press, like the Washington Post and the New York Times, will be running editorial saying this shouldn't be happening. Uh, right. So there will be uh, much more public awareness of what's happening and what's behind it. And I think that day there are a lot of people ready to jump into action. Well, they have to know what to do. No, we have to have we have to know in each city and town in the United States where there's going to be a demonstration the day he arrives, where people should go, what time they should get there. You know, all, we need to start preparing that kind of base level of uh, of, of activism. I used to I visited Julian with. He's. I mean, he's got a he's got a good point. It's just what what are what's the time like. I'm assuming you watched the whole interview. Did 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 Murray uh, allude to any sort of timeline? No, no. It's really up to the like they can keep pushing this back as long as they can. Like this well, is why it's this is why it's the slow as well. It's be, of yeah, time. because they want him to die in a cell instead of having a freaking huge case. They don't want they don't want this to happen. They would rather him die in a cell. You're you're correct. Yes. Yeah. They would much, much rather he die in a cell because they don't want the pushback from this. I maybe push, but maybe, let me just play. I'll just play with me the last minute of this. He asked him about uh, Michael Ratner. My friend Michael Ratner, who was Julian's lawyer since we've lost Michael a couple of years ago. But I remember my great civil rights attorney founded the Center for Constitutional Rights. But I remember Michael uh, telling me that in order to prosecute these cases, and he got legal representation, for instance, for the prisoners in Guantanamo, you need people in the streets that it's uh, extremely important, and he's talking about his work in the courtroom, yeah. that there are people outside the courtroom, and you may have been in the courtroom when I was in London, yeah. with Baritza complaining at one point, the judge, yeah. about the noise yeah. in, outside the courtroom. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. We're, uh, we're going to need to um, have uh, people at the actual court itself. And of course, we don't know exactly, there'll be all kinds of procedural 
steps of Julian being produced and not produced and and, uh, and, and all kinds of motions filed and things before the court itself gets uh, right. the trial proper gets going. Um, but at each stage, it's very important to have people uh, available and, and at the courtroom and able to go outside. How old, how old is Julian Assange now? 50s, Dude, 60s? It, it, no matter what, I mean, yeah, he is old. Um, no, but I mean, older. I mean, like he's, is he, is he old enough he's mentally, where like, he's not, he's not just mentally debilitated. He's physically not well. I know. They, Craig Murray himself, he spent, he spent some, he spent a couple months in a, in a solitary confinement. I he know knows. That. Shit. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he has, he definitely has a really good point that, you know, knock on glass saves your ass. Assange gets extradited and he's still alive that there is like a huge public outcry and like there has to like be. like like, has like you said like you said that's like the biggest thing that the American government fears is that like people are going to be outraged across the world and like let's remember who who like what's what's Assange's country of origin well, public pressure works we've seen this in, in other court cases before yeah that's true it's just it's and it's completely unprecedented that a man from Australia can be extradited for to be tried for an American crime. Oh no, it's absolutely ridiculous. Completely 100% ridiculous, ludicrous, doesn't make any sense. So. It's a really scary time, man. Like I would freaking it I it's it's at the very least it's good to hear somebody like Murray saying like we need to be able to be mobilized and you know start speaking and protesting and being on the streets and rallying behind Assange like before day one like like the minute we know what's going on we need to know how to mobilize and how to freaking round up the troops and get people active about this you know this like if Assange makes it to the states it's going to be something that we're going to remember for the rest of our lives you know it's something that people are going to tell their kids about you know, it's going to be. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I'll be. I'll. Be, I'll remember this for the rest of my life. It's hundred percent impactful. This is. This is our. This is. This is a history unfolding because it is. Un, it is a hundred percent completely unprecedented. Yeah, com I mean. it's just. It's. It's going to be fucking. It's going to be fucking. Because massive. you can't. You can't just grab people from other countries and then just claim them as yours. Like this, I mean, this is the U.S. operating on some different level of corruption. Where it's how like, many years has it been since Assange got? Put in he, what was it? It was the what embassy was it? Venezuela? What embassy did he spend years in? I forget. But like, how many years has a son has all that oh, song yeah. stuff been taking place? Like freaking, has it been over ten years yet? Like, yeah, yeah. But no, no, maybe like eight, eight, eight years, eight or something. Yeah. So like, you know, it's been it's been in our consciousness for quite a long time. Um. So the 52 years old man, he looks way older than that. So unfortunate. Ecuador embassy, yeah. yes, correct, Desert Mandis. Yes, it's it's Ecuador. That was the embassy that he was at. Yeah, sorry, it's getting it's getting late over here. We're 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 roughing this. <laughs> we're gonna touch on the last story real quick, but before I do, um, I do want to shout out uh, Misty's thing, uh, because this is something that people can do, is that they can go and call their uh good shout out the, the capital the justice department uh guess who made this graphic it may or may not be your favorite uh indie crab <laughs> uh, you know this is uh important uh free julian assange and you know indian news network is all for the fight you know that she's we're, gonna get and you know you we're just you just just know that you know when you know, God willing, when when uh, when it does happen, we're we're ready at the gates. We're ready at the gates for when. Well, yeah, when like, happens. and we're so we're hoping I, it doesn't. We're hoping it doesn't. But and I and I mean, I I just hope I just hope that every other indie station has has that commitment, whether they voiced it out here yet or not. Like, already knows that if Assange gets extradited, everybody's fucking covering that shit. You know, I can't, I can't imagine any, can you imagine like 
like the vanguard being on the side of Assange, what that's gonna fucking look like. Oh, they might, like, they might. Like, they'll like, they'll find they'll find some. I mean, the TYT TYT did it. So yeah, like we're gonna them. see. Oh my god, people are going to show their true colors when Assange gets extradited. That's that's gonna, gonna be the be awakening. The most this is gonna disgusting be the awakening. people are going to say the most disgusting things about one of the greatest journalists to ever fucking live if he gets extradited to the U.S. Oh, it's so it's so sad, man. It's just it's it's such a sad story, and like absolutely criminal, absolutely criminal. these people so uh, that's because I someone this who story. deserves more yes attention. very much so um, there's lots of people who are way better people to talk to than Val. so you're probably wondering assange files purged what what assange files would have been purged oh well let's get we into go. it um so assange visitors renew their request for CIA to purge and destroy the files on them. Um, so this is from Sheer Post, right? Kevin Gustolo, friend of the show. Um, attorneys and journalists who visited WikiLeaks found has a new Julian book out, Assange. by the way. Kevin yeah, Gustolo, how's the book out? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Book. I'll take yeah. a copy. Um, so WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, while he was living under political asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy, as we know, amended their lawsuit against the CIA for allegedly spying on them. The complaint filed in the Southern District of New York now even more explicitly seeks an injunction against the CIA to prevent the agency from utilizing in any way or revealing to any third party the content of material seized from the plaintiffs who are all U.S. citizens. It also asked the court to order the CIA to purge and destroy all such materials from their files. Do you in want some backstory on this or does it sure. go into backstory? It, I actually think it's pretty... Uh, pretty concise. So if you want to interject a little. Okay. So really um, quickly, this is, this won't take long. Um, what this lawsuit is about is while Julian Assange was uh, being held in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, illegally and arbitrarily detained, according to the UN, um, in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, all of his visitors were spied upon. And the way that they were, the way that that took place was, um, a company called UC Global was UC Global, which is a Spanish security firm was initially hired stored on the devices, right? Huh? supposedly copy the information stored on all devices well there's a whole hold on so uc global is a spanish security firm that was initially hired by the government of ecuador uh to do security for the embassy and for the president's children and things like that um very yeah. soon after trump was elected they were co-opted by mike pompeo and the cia and essentially yeah. turned into a spying operation against julian assange which means that all of his visitors journalists friends doctors lawyers all of those people who came to visit him during his time in the ecuadorian embassy were spied upon in many different ways they had their election electronic devices taken and copied they had their yep. paperwork taken and copied their ids were copied their conversations were spied on um, they went as far as to have microphones in the women's restrooms um so a, a group of them have gotten together and are now suing the cia um and uh there's a whole there's a couple different cases going on there's also a case going on in spain mike pompeo has been subpoenaed to testify in that he's um, uh, trying to uh, dodge that subpoena. He still hasn't gone to testify in that because um, he also had plans to either kidnap or assassinate Julian Assange. So it's uh, this is a whole thing. And so there so, are a couple different people in the U.S. who are suing the CIA, and that's what this article is talking about. So on January 20th, John uh, Colf, I want to say, um, held a proceeding where Richard Roth, attorney for the plaintiffs, was urged to change the complaint so it separated the, quote, cause of action sought against the CIA from the action sought against Pompeo, UC Global, and Morales. Much of the reasoning has to do with the Bivens Doctrine that allows citizens to pursue monetary damages against former U.S. government officials when their constitutional rights are validated. The updated complaint spells out more concretely that they are confident if the court allows the lawsuit to proceed, they believe they will succeed against the CIA in establishing that Fourth Amendment rights violations occurred, right? So, yeah, uh, imparable harm uh, against the CIA, the lawsuit contends, um, privileged communications. Uh, yeah, they, it's essentially 
um, unlawful. They illegally of spied on yeah. American citizens. <laughs> yeah, w yeah, warrantless. Gotcha. Yeah. Um. Okay. I mean, in a multitude of ways, like I said, their electronic devices were taken and cloned. Um, paperwork was taken and copied. All of that stuff. Uh, his co like, and this is something that always brings me back to the fact that, um, people will say, oh, well, he should just come to the United States and face a trial. Please tell me how this man gets a fair trial when the CIA was literally spying on the conversations with his legal team. I would like somebody to so, explain that to me. Attorney Damian Williams and Assistant U.S. Attorney Jean David Barnea have until February 17th to respond to the injunction the plaintiffs are explicitly seeking against the CIA. So stay tuned on those dates. Um, you brought some stuff for me this evening. Um, Stefania! That, yeah, um, so from Ifato Quattigliano. Hope my Italian's doing well there. Um, I have no idea. Yeah, I know, right? So better than I would do. I'll try to cliff note this because the article went in depth. We'll put links to the descriptions for all the articles in the. Uh, and um, also, if you're not following Stefania Maruzzi, you need to be. She is one of the most. I think, in my opinion, and that's that's just my opinion, but I think she's one of the best journalists working today. Period. End of story. Mm. Okay. Um. So Sweden destroyed a substantial part of its documents on Julian Assange. Almost six years after we unearthed, the British authorities at the Crown Prosecution Service destroyed key emails on the WikiLeaks founder. We can now report that the Swedish Prosecution Authority also destroyed a large part of the documentation as Assange's life hangs in the balance. Well, Britain and Sweden finally opened an investigation into the destruction of documents. But it took them long enough to end the investigation on the bogus rape charges that People lied there were about, no charges. But... Okay. No charges. Just allegations. Gotcha. There were never any charges ever. Never cool. charges. Glad, People glad always to say be that. Corrected. Glad to be yes. corrected. I also love how every article has to put in like the entire life story of Julian Assange every time. You know, because just so they've made it so know. convoluted that you can't yeah. just explain one thing because that leads back to another thing, which leads back to another thing. And it's, you know. Yeah. So. Um, what was destroyed? A substantial portion of the documents on Assange were destroyed by the Swedish Prosecution Authority, which investigated him for rape in a criminal investigation, opened and closed three times between 2010 and 2019. Um, so the, the destroyed materials were correspondence between the SPA um, and the Crown Prosecution Service, um, which was providing the SPA with support on the case since Assange was under investigation in Sweden, but had been in London since 2010. So... You know, little little international the Sweden, correspondence. The Sweden stuff um, has been thoroughly debunked by Professor Nils Melzer, who is the former UN Special Rapporteur on torture. He investigated it quite thoroughly. He's fluent in Sweden and Swedish, um, so he was able to look at all of the original documentation, go through all of the uh, all the stuff, um, and it's it was an obvious stitch up. It was an obvious attempt uh, uh, for Sweden to help the United States. Uh, in their extradition attempts. And there's um, actually emails that had been released from the U.S. to Sweden where we're telling them basically, don't you dare get cold feet. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the highly anomalous handling of the Swedish case by prosecutor Marianne, got another Marianne, I'm starting to not like these. Um, <laughs> and it's going to go on my list of gins as well, you know. Um, <laughs> resulted in justice for no one, contributed to the devastation of Assange's health, cost British taxpayers at least 13.2 13 .2 million pounds to keep the Ecuadorian embassy under siege by Scotland Yard from 2012 to 2015, right? Um, so that's that's apparently... That's right. so just 2012 to 2015, y'all. Yep. So she's Seriously. implicated... Holy shit! Um, the fact that documents are destroyed by the SPA authority has just surfaced thanks to our lengthy FOIA litigation and comes almost six years after the same FOIA litigation unearthed that key documents were destroyed by the CPS. It is now clear that both of the authorities handling the Swedish case, the SPA and the CPS, destroyed a large part of their email exchanges. But why? Weird. Why what would they do that? What do these documents contain? And on hmm. whose instructions were these materials destroyed? Now more than ever, some sort of explanation is urgently needed, considering that the U.S. is currently acting through the CPS itself in the extradition of proceeding against Julian Assange. So, um, next, um, the investigation work has allowed us to find the answer to one of the key questions around the Swedish case. 
Why did prosecutor Marianne Nye, who reopened the rape case in 2010 after Stockholm's chief prosecutor, Eva Finn, had immediately dismissed it because in her judgment, the suspect con uh, conduct disclosed no crime at all, refused to question Assange in London for six years. So documents obtained in 2015 by the author of the article from the SPA under FOIA revealed that it was the CPS service specifically, Mr. Paul Close, lawyer with the CPS Special Crime Division, division responsible for prosecuting high-profile cases, which advised the uh, Swedish prosecution authority against the only legal strategy that could have brought the case to a rapid resolution, namely questioning Julian Assange in London rather than insisting on extradition to Sweden simply to question him, right? So like, no, we're keeping them here. And this is also funny because uh, not only did they uh, neglect or refuse to question him on this, but the, he, yeah. they also re re refused to question him about the Russiagate stuff, which he openly said, listen, if you want to come talk to me, I will absolutely cooperate. I will 100% yep. talk to you about, you know, what's going on with the Russia stuff. And it's weird. They never did that. It's very strange. So um, Estelle Dehan, right? Um specialist representing us together with Jennifer Robinson um, asks this for the FOIA specialist, right? Um, and the FOIA special uh, replied from the CPS, they claim to have no way of knowing what was lost when they destroyed the documentation and have never produced yeah. a written policy justifying the destruction of documents. So just bye-bye. And they're gone. Yeah. Whoopsie. Whoopsie daisy. Whoopsie, whoopsie, whoopsie. Hate it when that happens. Yeah. Um... At least it wasn't a camera that went out on this one. Um, <laughs> so, been trying to obtain documents since 2015. Um, the Swedish Prosecution Authority exchanged between 7,200 7, and 9,600 pages of correspondence. Over the last eight years of our four-year battle, we obtained just 551 pages from the CPS and 1,373 pages from the SPA. So what is that, like 1,900 pages? Yeah, like what's that? That's not Out even of 9,600? Less than a percent in like, right? Is my math right? I don't know. I'm terrible at math. but Me too. Um, this is um, ridiculous. Like... And so, like as Stefania says, they've been trying to get this these documentation. This is why I say she's one of the best journalists working today. She has literally been in the trenches of this, not just with Sweden, not just with UK, but also with like Ecuador and the United States. And I mean, she's been trying to get information through FOIA requests from multiple different governments for like a decade. I mean, she's relentless. So and she has a she has a book out too, everybody. Check out her book. One. Her book. Um Marianne wrote, we would have been able to handle this matter in a better way if we had been informed when SIC, <laughs> the decision to give TV4 the correspondence, even better if it had been de deleted immediately after reading. Um, like it's yeah, that was from a very embarrassing impossible. email. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Um, in discussing this matter, her associate wrote, uh, Marianne and I file all A-related emails in special folders not available to or traceable for anybody but ourselves. God, that Such sounds secrecy. real ethical. Mm -hmm. God. Um, so, in March 2017, Marianne did, did, did delete at least one email received from the FBI. Those were the months in which the CIA was so furious with WikiLeaks for publi publishing the CIA files, a.k.a. Vault 7, that they would later devise plans to kill Assange. Was that was was that in that email? What was in the Probably. email? Probably. Like, I, I why mean, did I'm, she I'm, I'm left to I'm left to suspect that probably yes. Oh, you know what I mean? God. Like, I mean, luckily I have stuff on the soundboard for this. We're fucked. <laughs> um, it works there. So luckily you there. also brought us some good news. Um, I did bring a little bit of good news, yes. Yeah, yes, you yes, want to yes. take this one? Yeah, so Ola Benny um, is a friend and colleague. Um, he's kind of a um, digital rights activist guy. I mean, he's like a computer... I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to use the word hacker, um, but, you know, he's just... He's really into, like, the digital... Uh, the, the the digital rights stuff. So, uh, also a friend and associate of Julian Assange's and was conveniently 
uh, also arrested, which we don't hear about this very often because he's obviously not as high profile as Julian is. I mean, I've been talking about it for years, but most people don't know who he is. But um, he was arrested in Ecuador on April 11th, 2019, same day as Julian Assange was pulled from the uh, Ecuadorian embassy in London. Um, and he has been in an ongoing ridiculous, I mean, honestly, you guys, <laughs> this stuff in Ecuador, the Ecuadorian court system is a fucking joke. The way that this has been handled and just the numerous I mean, the delays and the like them coming completely unprepared, the prosecution coming completely unprepared for court and the questions that they would ask. And just seriously, you can go back through. Uh, you can follow Ola Benny on Twitter. It's at O-L-A-B-I-N-I. -I. It's just at his name. Um, and he has documented the most of it uh, throughout the, the years. But it's, it's seriously been a complete shit show. But he has now we got to win, you guys. He has now been found not guilty um, and it's done. It's over. He's. I, I mean, at least this part of it is over. That's not to say that they won't come back for him for something else. But I think that um, he has been, unfortunately, uh, the way that they wanted to use him, they were effective in doing so. They destroyed his life for nearly four years. Um, and this was part of, I mean, we know that this was part of the way that they intended to deal with Julian Assange was to also go after people close to him. And that's exactly what this was. Um, and they destroyed his life for nearly four years, but it seems to be, at least for now, this particular court case is over and he won. Okay. So a little bit of good news for once, you guys. Fantastic. We got one. I know. <laughs> we got one. We got a win. Please clap. I'll take it, you guys. Like, I tell people all the time. I tell people all the time, sometimes you have to even invent your own wins, like just make them up to make yourself feel better. We didn't even have to invent this one. It's a real Yay. one. It's been, His case has been dismissed. It's done. So it's a win. I'm very happy for him. He shouldn't have had to go through what he's gone through. Uh, but it seems that it's over, at least this part of so, it. Hopefully they don't fuck with him again. Anthony Molecule, Jesus, Anthony Malecki with $2. Like and share the stream, peasants. Yeah. Um, yes. Fuck. With his $2. That's that's not very a royal decree for $2, but, you know, I'll <laughs> give it to you. Um <laughs> So I think that's all of them so far. Hopefully I didn't miss one. Yes, John, I know that hacker is a loose term. I'm just reluctant to use it because it's used as a pejorative against Julian Assange very Kate often. Cabello with Hardlands, of crocodiles in the my chat. friends. I love Hardlands. Go um, support them, subscribe, share all their stuff. Yeah, Good they people. had on Supreme recently. Yeah, they also, I think yeah, they decided, yes, I think it was David yesterday. Swanson, maybe okay. today or yesterday. Was it David yeah, Swanson? Yeah, yeah. Maybe. They've been having, like, they've been doing a really good job of trying to get all the speakers for the Rage Rally. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, all right. people um so you had a big event this week that most of the mainstream press uh probably avoided i would imagine yeah um Except... but there's there's one and and i it's a course of course they'd let this outlet talk about it you know fox news everybody yes me um fox See news what I, earlier Earlier when I said that I have better luck with the right than I do with the left on issues of free speech, this is what I'm talking about. Fox News had Andrew Smith on to talk about Julian Assange. Fox uh, News has Glenn Greenwald and uh, Jimmy Dore and Pamela Harry. Anderson and a whole bunch of other people yep. to talk about Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. uh, MSNBC, the, they're not having anybody on to talk about Julian Assange. Mm -mm. No. No, 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 no. No. And when they do cover it, it's Mehdi Hassan giving his little like minute and a half uh, monologue where he gets some stuff right, but then also manages to throw in some like Russia gate weird smears and, um, yeah. you know, some other stuff about how he's a hacker or something. So he managed to get it in some of the propaganda while he uh, kind of uh, lends kind of a, a sort of sympathetic tone to what he's saying. Um, so he's trying to get best of both worlds and it's all just bullshit propaganda. Did you? So yeah, Fox fucking news. Did you read this article from Landon? Yes. Of course. Yeah. yeah, I figured, figured you did. Um, but, you know, as always, they have to go through exactly what they have to teach people about Assange every time with the standard paragraphs of like, which they he's still wouldn't in have Belmarsh, to do if they did their job, you know, on a regular basis um, and had been informing people from jump. Publishing information, dealing with crimes committed by the U.S. government in the Guantanamo Bay, 
Iraq, Afghanistan. I mean, uh, go, there's an insane list, you know. Um, it is an insane list. So Britain's high court ruled over the summer. The songs can be extradited to the U.S. Um, supporters in London on Saturday formed a human chain outside Britain's parliament that stretched from the perimeter railings and across nearby Westminster Bridge to the other side of the River Thames. Um, Which, pause for a second, historic yes. event. First time that's ever happened in the history of ever, in the history of England. Old yeah. ass country. Nobody's ever tried to surround Parliament before. Not only did they try it, they succeeded, and mainstream media When's, isn't really touching it. Fifth of November would be another good day for an event. Just thinking, mm -hmm. um, you know, gunpowder, treason, plot. Um, right. But Assange's wife. Election ish wife, time. Yes. Yeah. Assange's wife Stella said the British government could speak to the U.S. to U.S. authorities to stop the extradition attempts. It's already gone on for three and a half years. It is a stain on the United Kingdom and is a stain on the Biden's administration. Now, that's just the uh, his like judicial part, right? Not when he was stuck in Ecuadorian embassy for however long. So he was long. in there for seven, seven years ish. Seven years. Yeah. Seven, eight years, something like that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. He also it's now been has over COVID, a decade. You know. Yes. And has an underlying lung condition, suffered a mini stroke in, uh, on last uh, October 29th, I think it was. Um, so his health has been steadily declining for, I mean, he's been. Uh, subjected to psychological torture for over a decade. He was inside the Ecuadorian embassy without access to direct sunlight or proper medical care for seven years. Uh, he's been inside a supermax prison for three and a half years under the most horrendous conditions where it's cold. They don't give him his winter clothes. He has to insulate his book with wind or his windows with books. Um, it, it's it's a whole fucking thing. And obviously his health would decline under those circumstances. He's essentially being held in solitary confinement. Um, he's being murdered in slow motion. Uh, and it's bullshit. Yeah. In the U.S., uh, a little lady we know put on an event um, in D.C., and we also have Oz in chat, who I know did a ton of work streaming it. Oz, um, yes. Shout out yeah. to War Media. King of Kings, Ozymandias, they're in the chat. Love them. Um, so supporters of the Australian-born activists gathered outside the Justice Department to call on the federal government to drop its extradition bid. The protesters said they hope Assange never steps foot on U.S. soil and that he would not be treated fairly by the judicial system. Julian wasn't trying to help dictatorships. He was trying to stop the United States from becoming one, and that's why they want him in jail, and that is why it is crucial that we free, uh, fight to set Julian free. 2020 ter uh, Libertarian Vice Presidential Candidate Spike Cohen said at the rally. Shout out to um, Spike. Yep, Thank I you, agree. Thank you, Spike. Um, so, you remember this. Um, I thought this was pretty incredible when I saw it. Um, Shout out to a lot of people, actually, for this idea. So, it really started with um, our friend Truman in London. He started the uh, Yellow Ribbons for Assange campaign uh, in like yeah. 2020, I think it was. Um, and that has kind of blossomed. He ties ribbons all over the place every time they have an action. Um, so obviously that's where we got the idea for the yellow ribbon, the giant yellow ribbon. Um, but also our friend Kendra in Denver did an event, I think it was last summer maybe, where she did um, a, a bunch of giant ribbons and she also used those, um, those kind of like uh, uh we are millions photographs of like people yeah. doing the signs like assange's freedom is my freedom or whatever um and she so her campaign had used both the yellow ribbons and the we are millions pictures so we combined them our backdrop was the we are millions pictures which we then framed with the yellow ribbon and then paula my dear friend paula from boston had the idea to do a massive i think this was 240 feet 250 feet maybe of yellow ribbon and yeah. she my friend paula hand stenciled all of those free assange's oh, on that really? ribbon Yes, That's she dope. did. Um, you guys, I, people don't understand how much work legitimately goes into this shit. Um, and uh, like, I, I want, like, I wish, I wish I was, I should write like everybody down because the people who did work on this, because everybody keeps trying to say it was Misty's event. Oh, didn't Misty do a great? No, it was, I'm like yeah, just tons one of people person. I'm the work. loudest one. Yes, like I'm the most, most visible. Like, I'm the most obnoxious and public. But there were a Ford lot of Fisher, people. Paula, news to share. Patricia, Marty yep. from New York. Um, I'm gonna forget people. Bernadette. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Mar uh, Martha. Um, uh, lots of people. Lots of people put in a shit ton of work on this thing. So, Missy, uh, would you say that what you did was organizing? Yes. I'm only saying <laughs> that because it's like, it's it's just exactly what you might be the face, but you acknowledge the fact that there are people who helped you and support you that may or may not want the spotlight, but a lot of them don't. You in this. Yeah. And like. 
and I think that's something I think when it comes to organizing that like, people need to understand like it's a team effort. Yes. Like and that's what it, Colin everybody kept trying like our speakers would get up and say I want to thank Misty for organizing and I'm like stop please stop doing that and people are like yeah but you were the you led them and okay okay yes I like took the reins and I was like okay we're going to organize this event or whatever um so yes I was the first person to speak on it I'm obviously also uh, the loudest the but most you visible, delegate well but I yeah well right. I mean sure if you want to say that we did <laughs> we did work oh, no. No, well, we no. did work <laughs> extremely well together as a team. Yes. For the most part, we had obviously we had a couple of times where there was like some miscommunications and misunderstandings and stuff. But for the most part, we all worked incredibly well together. Everybody did a great job. I could not have done this alone. There's absolutely no way. Like so many people brought different, whether it was, um, you know, connections to different speakers. Like I don't have Ben Cohen's phone number. You know what I mean? But somebody I was yeah. organizing with did. So we were able to get a hold of these people and ask them to be speakers at our event. So it, it was not just my event. That needs to be made abundantly clear. Um, yeah. I, I am in, in no way uh, uh, solely responsible for what happened on Saturday. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it took a lot from everybody. Every, so, every time I do a thumbnail yeah. for Misty, I make sure Misty's like medium sized. She's like, she can't yeah, be. Yeah, it's not about me. Assange has always got to be bigger than Misty in, in the thumbnails. Yeah. I know? would prefer if you didn't just didn't use my photo at all. I was right? on with, who, who was it? Yep. Um, uh, I was on with somebody and they asked for a picture of me. I'm like, does it have to be a picture of me? Can you just use like the flyer from the event? That's what I did last time. Of me? Yeah. You know? I mean, that's it's I would much rather it be yeah. that. So, um, yeah. But a lot of people. That no, ribbon it, was something else, you guys. That was beautiful think, to watch. I think a lot of people look at marches in general and actions like this, and they wonder like what it does. I think I think the big thing it's it's a demand ask. You have a demand. The demand well, is to free it's Assange. A, it's also like, an opportunity to bring people together. Yes. Um, who understand and who have common cause. It's a great morale booster. Like I left um, yeah. energized. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I kind of need the, to be in those. Cause when, you know, I'm in small town, Ohio, like, you know, my husband listens to me rant all the time and all that stuff. But for the most part, I think a lot of us feel isolated. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, regardless of what your cause is, I think that it can be very isolating if you don't, uh, you know, like I'm surrounded by Trump voters. <laughs> Yeah. You know I mean? So, um, but yeah, it's, it's like going to this event and having people there who I know get it and being able to speak on it, raise awareness about it. Um, we did get like Fox News did cover the event. So that's great. That's, and I think it's also great because it shows that support is building. Um, I mean, they had, they surrounded Parliament in London. Yeah, you know how amazing incredible. that is like that's if you if and well, people I know they always had say oh in like Australia people were riding too, right? on my rally saying oh there's not very many people i'm like are you kidding me have you seen our other rallies this is an incredible yeah, this is turnout huge and you can like laugh and be like oh well that's just because you can't get anybody out we're but we're building and every yes. movement starts somewhere and while I was putting in the work on the ground to try to build something like this, you were sitting at home making fun of me actually doing something. You know? Yes, as always, <laughs> you know those saying? are the people making fun of the. Yeah. Uh, how many yeah, people Olivia's do you think? There. Yeah, how many people do you think uh, you reached if you were to take an estimate of like people that what just do you mean reached? Well, that like that saw that stuff? saw these events that might have like. Oh God, I have no idea. Okay. I have no idea. I know it was on a shit ton of platforms. Um, obviously the Fox news audience got it, obviously, um, in the lead up to it, a lot of people, uh, caught onto it through like my appearance on Jimmy door. I can't tell you the number of people who came up to me and said, Hey, I saw you on Jimmy door and that's why I'm here. Yeah. And I was like, again, I, like, I, I, I thank you, Jimmy. Um, well, so famously, yeah, he was, got um, Tucker to see the light on, on Julian yeah. too, which like, yeah. you know. And he covered I mean, your just, event and a big shout yes, out to multiple times. everyone who covered and that he event. he always does. And because of him, we also raised a shit ton of money, which by the way, just so everybody knows, because we, I learned a lesson. Um, next time I organize something, I need to go on Jimmy earlier. I had yes. no idea we were going to raise that much money from that appearance. I had no idea. And I yeah. went on, on like, what was it? Monday, the Monday before our event. And then all of a sudden we had thousands of dollars coming in and I couldn't possibly spend it on something useful for our rally on Saturday. There was no time I had, yeah. what was I supposed to, you know what I mean? So now I was like, I was talking to the other organizers and I, um, uh, I think that maybe we're just going, I think for sure I'm going to donate some towards the billboard truck. Um, yeah. because I get double my money there because Ben Cohen is matching all donations for the billboard truck that Randy, uh, Credico has been doing in DC. So I feel like that's a really good investment. 
Yeah. We're going to get double our money from that. Um, and then I think that I may just like get ready for it because he's probably going to be extradited soon if we're being realistic. Um, so, and we need to be ready to go. If he's brought to the United States, like we need to, a presence needs to be on the ground in the Eastern district of Virginia and it needs to be big and it needs to be consistent period period like that needs to happen um, i don't know how the, we make that happen but it <clears throat> needs to happen i agree one of the people you had you had there um who i think is just a real gem of a person um human trafficking survivor eliza blue or the global elites the ruling class and employers of the cia and fbi to be a hero quit your job and become a whistleblower one of if my the, favorite moments so good if it's a choice between free speech and the united states government trust and know one's got to go if one has to go it ain't going to be free speech she said adding that she is so passionate about freedom because she knows what it is like to lose it blue said that despite being a female trafficking survivor she skipped out on the women's march that also took place on saturday because without a free press there would be nobody to cover women's issues or survivor issues and to let her and that's why i love herself. eliza blue She's so good. Also, no, but this seriously, outfit. Reef, that's you know that that's like I try to make people understand how what's happening to Assange impacts literally everything else. Yes. And she gets it. Like she sees how what's happening to him impacts her ability to do the work that she's doing. And well, even more important argue, than that, it impacts uh, survivors' ability to come forward. Right. Yeah. So it, 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 it's just so it, you, you just made a good point that I actually just now made the connection to abortion rights. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like women's rights. Period. Everything. Like, and, uh, so, and I think I think I was talking to I think I was talking to you in a DM the other day about like his story is connected to almost all the problems everything. our country is having right now. Like between all our military industrial complex, our yes, like our terrible justice rights, systems, our, our loss of rights, the issues, problem with the deep state, the problem everything. with politicians, the problem everything. with like corruption, perform performative politician, corruption, money laundering, a, a, a free and open internet. Like you can't everything. Everything is connected to it, including. People say I'm being dramatic when I say that. I'm not being fucking dramatic. It impacts mainstream literally media, all the things. Mainstream yeah. media. They they published his story first. Pe do people understand this? That the Washington Post put out the information without his permission. The Washington Post, Der Spiegel, the New York Times, El Pais. There's a ton oh, of God. outlets that put out the exact same information. That's why Obama threw him Obama under the, the bus. New York Times problem. Right. It, yes. It, I don't know why I have to have this conversation, honestly. Still, you don't. Here I am. Having to stop. But I, I do, mean, do, obviously, because there's not. A, but frankly, it's not even because people don't get it. It's because they don't know. That's I think that's the biggest thing. Yes, right. there are people who should know better and who are anti-Assange for whatever weird, ridiculous bullshit reason that they've been yep. force fed to dislike Julian Assange. Um, but there are even there are tons more. People so many who people have never don't even know heard of him or right, vaguely yeah. know who he is, but they have no idea what's happening to him or how it impacts their life. Uh, that's what we're up against is just a complete media blackout and just a ton of. Uh, and I don't mean um, this in like a disparaging way, but ignorance on what's happening. I agree. No, I mean, for me, I didn't know about Assange until the Richie Metro was reporting on him back in 2020, you know, so. And there's a yeah. lot of people like you. Right? I mean, I, I remember John Stewart know. talking about like when that was when he was covering Bush stuff and weapons of mass destruction. And that was a big deal. Like, you know, um, but anyway, yes. I wanted to. I wanted to let Eliza speak for herself a little bit. If people didn't get to oh, see good. it, I'm glad you have. This. Um, you know, she's a, I, we, she's been on Tar Reed before as well. You should go I check out her. that. Um, as well as that full stream with Vanessa Beely and Wyatt Reed. I have in the description below. Um, which is that whole whole thing was great. Vanessa's kills, um, Wyatt kills. Always. But anyway, here's Eliza Blue. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Eliza. I'm a survivor advocate for those affected by human trafficking. First and foremost, thank you so much to everybody that's made this beautiful event possible. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone that has attended today. Um, no thank you to the corporate press because they're not here. Um, you're probably thinking to yourself, what on earth is a female survivor of human trafficking doing here and not over at the Women's March? See, that would, I guess to a logical mind, that would seem like it would make more sense. But the truth is, 
Without a free press, we will have no one to cover women's issues. We will have no one to cover survivors' issues. That's why I'm here today. That's why I'm here today to advocate for the freedom of Julian Assange. See, I, when I made the decision to advocate for others' freedom, I didn't want to stop with survivors of human trafficking or even just my own freedom. I want to advocate for all those who need to be free. Julian Assange is one of those people. But if we don't advocate for Julian Assange now, it will inevitably affect all of our freedom, especially press freedom. When it comes to survivors of human trafficking, we need an opportunity to speak out to a free press. We need whistleblower protection, and we definitely need free speech. We just do. Survivors need it. That's why I'm here today. Yeah. I couldn't look my fellow survivors in the face, the survivors that are going to walk after me, I couldn't look them in the face and say I did everything that I could do to serve them and know that I did not advocate for Julian Assange when it mattered. This is the beginning, but I'm telling you, it's coming for all of us. It's coming for all of us. We have to fight for our freedom. We have to fight for our right to speak freely. Thank God I'm an American. Oh, woo! It's all we got left. It's all we got left. Are you ready to fight for it? I am. Um, I have a message uh, for the ruling class the global elites, the CIA, the FBI, be a hero, quit your job, become a whistleblower. Yeah. But if you do not, but if you do not, <laughs> if you do not, I'm hyped today. <laughs> if you do not, you can tell I get hyped when I walk, when I walk around. Uh, if you do not, if it's a choice between free speech and the United States government trust and know one's got to go. If one has to go, it ain't going to be free speech. I can bet you on that. I can bet you on that one. Yeah. We aren't going to lose our free speech. God. I, I think I get so passionate about freedom because I know what it's like to lose it. And once you lose it, uh, once you lose it and get it back, you don't ever want to lose it again. Yeah. It's, a, it's really hard to get it back. Um, I was thinking yesterday, and I wasn't going to add this in originally, but I know there's a lot of folks here that have been fighting this fight for a very long time. There are a lot of people that have been fighting for Assange for a very long time. Uh, anyone that's been keeping up with what's been going on, um, you know, it's, there's been things going on, you know, worldwide today, which have been really incredible to watch. And... Um, I had a message for you, you know, as a survivor advocate, the days get long, you grow weary, you get tired, you get worn out, it's stressful, it's like, you feel like no one's listening, you feel like there's nothing you can do, you keep going, you keep going, you keep going, every day you wake up, you're like, what the hell, I gotta keep, I gotta keep fighting for this, I see, I see the Assange people as the same way, thank you, thank you, um, and then on top of all of it, you'll have like, Karen973065 on Twitter tell you, oh, Julian Assange wasn't, you know, he was not a journalist. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> keep going. Please keep going. Because not only are you fighting for Assange, you're fighting for yourself, you're fighting for me, and you're fighting for survivors of human trafficking, some of our world's most vulnerable who need to have a free press yes. and free speech. Yeah. Thank you so much for letting me come today. Thank you so much for letting me speak. And thank you all for being here so much. Thank you. Great speech from Eliza. Um, That's why I love her. She's amazing. That's why I love her. <clears throat> I Survivors, to, like, she's right. Survivors need the ability to speak. I wanted to showcase this we little interaction do. too. Um, pause. The next. That was on Twitter. I felt like... Happy and sad at the same time. Um, yeah. She's like, been through it, dude. Oh, yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> Eliza writes, I was watching this clip and laughing. I never wanted to talk much because I thought that I was too stupid. I can't read very well, and I never received a GED. My former abuser played on my vulnerabilities. I never thought that I had anything important to say. And I'll let you reply with what you said. 
Um, oh, I can't. I don't know if I can <clears throat> read it. On, it's not very big. There you go. Um, silly you. You have so many important things to say, and I'm happy I'm around to hear you say them. Oh. Um, and but she does, Reef. She does. Yep. If you all don't follow Absolutely. her, you should go follow her. She is, and she deals with some of the darkest shit on earth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the sexual exploitation of a lot of children, but just humans in general, and human trafficking, and I mean that is genuinely some of the darkest shit I can think of. Um, yeah. And she deals with that every single day. Um, some of the stories that she posts <clears throat> on Twitter are. I mean, haunt me. And she has to deal with that times a thousand on a daily basis. And she still remains so positive and she really thinks that we can win. And she is, um, uh, super supportive, um, just as like a person, as a friend, I consider her a friend now. Like she's very supportive of what I do. She, um, even if she didn't get how it connected to her, she would still like, she's just a really good person. Absolutely. Um, and she does some of the most important work that I can think of. So I was I'd love super to ask pumped her, to have her there. If I ever get a chance about um, the Gotham Foundation, do you heard of this? Mm, um, yeah. With Kevin Smith, I think, funded it mostly, which it's a weird connection because his funding comes from mainly Weinstein, right? Yeah. So like, you know, and there's, there's that whole so much like dogma you still can't find because like he's holding it hostage essentially Weinstein so but the Gotham Foundation uh is is a foundation for human trafficking if I'm not mistaken um you I'd love totally, to know what she like, thinks about that yeah and yes. if she knows anyone there's over so, there there's so much like the stuff that she like just what I've learned from her since I've known her there's so much that like people aren't even ready for those conversations it's heavy it's, it's yeah. a lot um you also had uh Jill Stein show up which I found interesting um, so Assange sought asylum at the Ecuadorian embassy in London years ago because he faced extradition to Sweden after two women accused him of rape. The investigations were eventually dropped, right? Which was the whole reason he got snagged in UK, right? Shout out to Fox News for getting that right. They did yep. not call it charges. Um, and almost all the time when mainstream media reports on this, they say that there were rape charges. There were never any charges. So shout out to what's his name? Landon. Uh, yeah, I think um, the I'll guy look that wrote at, this. Yes, um, I followed him on Twitter. I told him thank you on Twitter. I'm grateful Landon, to anybody who's covering that shit. Yeah, Landon, Landon Mion. Mion, Mion, Mion. Yeah, I don't know. I think. But shout out to him. He got that right. He did not call it charges, and that never happens. It's so rare for mainstream media to get that part of it right. So multiple so, multiple seekers at the rally in D.C. rallied against the corporate press for their lack of journalists at the event, particularly calling out the New York Times and the Guardian for being amongst the outlets. To also publish the contents of the documents Assange had obtained, we need watchdog journalist, not lapdog, uh, lapdog journalist, two-time Green Party presidential candidate Jill Stein said. Um, in addition to publishing war logs leaked to him by former U.S. Army soldier Chelsea Manning, who was um, convicted in 2013 of violations of the Espionage Act and other offenses, Assange's site published internal communications taken from the Democratic National Committee and then presidential candidate Hillary Clinton's campaign that shed light on the DNC's attempts to boost Clinton in the 2016 Democratic primary. Assange has been blamed for impacting Clinton's chances of winning the presidency in 2016. Yeah, that's somehow illegal. Um, the WikiLeaks founder is wanted by U.S. authorities on 18 counts over the publication of classified documents that mention no one's name, right? Doesn't hurt anyone. Or like give their location. They've admitted in court that they cannot find a single example of anybody facing any harm due to any of the leaks that came out. Yeah. The leaks. Um, Jade Star They've admitted that several times. In court, uh, repeat, Earth. repeat about Kevin Smith. He he um funds or is part of or connected to a um uh charity called the Gotham Foundation that's about um human trafficking. I was just wondering if Eliza Blue knew about it. Um, we can ask her. Yeah, and like, and the fact that he's connected to Weinstein along with that is weird. And I think he made the foundation before that stuff all took off too. Um, not not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken. But um, anyway, we have um another member of the CIA or ex member of the CIA, I should say, um John Kiriakou, who became a whistleblower which exactly what Eliza Blue asked people to do. So we'll let him speak. Who's emceeing? So, 
me and Amber. Okay. We took turns. And I came in like my like my uh chill leggings and my I am Julian Assange shirt and Amber came in this like cute adorable sundress dress and her yeah, hair like, done and she's like, got pearls really? to clutch. <laughs> yeah. You know. Um <laughs> But that's like my Eli entire wardrobe. Eliza's in like time. Eddie Murphy's raw outfit. You know, <laughs> yeah. we were very oddly dressed. Also, it annoys me so much. Someone could have fixed this rubber grommet on the thing. You could just pop that back on. You know, like I don't know why my OCD just kills me on that. I didn't even notice it. <laughs> It's not like I look at the front of it. Sound reef. Right? Yeah, I don't have sound. I don't have sound on it. No sound? No, here. Mm -mm. Let's hear. fix that. See, this is what I get for trying to be slick but and turning off other other times. Under the espionage. Thanks, everybody. Believe it or not, this is the first time in my life I've ever used a megaphone. This cherry. 58 nice. years. So, I was on my way over here today, and I was driving, and... I, Okay, I was on my way over here today and I saw a sign that said talking dog for sale $20 I was intrigued So I pulled over and uh, Went and knocked on the guy's uh, door. I said I saw your sign. You have a talking dog for 20 bucks. Can I see it? He said sure He takes me in to the house. and There's a dog there. I said hello The dog says hello. I said my god the dog actually talks I said, well, tell me about yourself. The doc says, I used to work for the CIA. <laughs> they would send me into, uh, into meetings, like with <laughs> bin Laden and stuff. I said, I used to work for the CIA, too. I said, I never came close to bin Laden. <laughs> tell me more. He said, I would go into these meetings, bin Laden, Putin, Kim Jong-un, and then I would go back to CIA, and I would, I would report... I would report what uh, what they told me. I said, that's amazing. i got to buy this dog. I said to the guy, I'd like to buy the dog. He says, well, it's $20. I said, well, why is it so cheap? And he says, that dog's a liar. He's never done any of that stuff. But this is a theme. Because everybody at the CIA is a liar. Everybody. The CIA told us that there was no torture program. That was a lie. The CIA told us that there was no archipelago of secret prisons all around the world. That was a lie. They told us that there was no international rendition, kidnapping program, where we go overseas and just snatch people off the streets or out of their homes. That was a lie. The CIA tells us today, in 2022, that they cannot even confirm the existence of a drone program. They're lying. Now, Mike Pompeo said on the campaign trail a couple of weeks ago that if and when Julian Assange is extradited to the Eastern District of Virginia, he will receive a fair trial. That's a lie. A fair trial is impossible for a bunch of reasons. Now, what Mike Pompeo didn't talk about is that he actively sought to murder Julian Assange, that he actively sought to kidnap Julian Assange and bring him surreptitiously back to the United States, probably to be killed. He didn't tell us that the CIA bugged the Ecuadorian embassy for audio and video so that they could spy on Julian Assange meeting with his attorneys and use the information against him in the United States. We can't believe anything that they say because they lie about everything. And they're clear about it. Again, Mike Pompeo was happy to go on TV and with a chuckle said, we lie, we steal, we cheat. <laughs> Isn't it great to be an American? So it's up to us to be there for Julian Assange. God forbid that he is indeed extradited to the United States, a crowd like this has to be in front of that courthouse in Alexandria, Virginia. We have to be there every day 
doing our part. Thank you all for coming. I'm so happy to see so many friends and new friends. Hello and welcome to the FBI agents in the crowd today. Maybe you'll learn something from us, but we hope to see you there. Thank you. Oh, good stuff from Yaku there. Yeah. Um, at least, at least the too. feds watching me find me funny. That's about all I got left for them, you know. So I hope they continue to find me funny. Um, but can I just also complain quickly that when yes. somebody is in the middle of a speech and they've been forced to switch methods of audio options yeah, from a microphone to a megaphone, just let them in. finish their speech. Yeah. Uh, don't jump in because the microphone suddenly started working. Don't interrupt. Don't some that person is um uh on a they're they're trying to build to something. They're trying to give a speech. Just leave it alone. Let him finish his speech. Yeah. <laughs> it bothered me tremendously. Twice. I feel you. In the middle of it, people are like yelling at him. The microphone works now. And it's like just let him fucking finish. And then there was another time a guy like literally came up in front of him and like put the microphone in the thingy as John was still <laughs> trying to give a speech. Like yep. just. It, it was just frustrating like let him stop interrupting his speech that's rude don't do it don't like approach him um you just walked in front of a bunch of cameras and interrupted a man's speech at an event it's just it's don't do it don't do yep. those things please well and yeah. and Rant no, no you're good um i mean kiaraku was was kind of and and this uh fox um article kind of brings it back together with that that you know assange um they were, they were going to kill Assange, essentially. Mm -hmm. They definitely had plans, the UK and us. Um, and he now has COVID. Right. Um, so the CIA has reportedly, previously had plans to kill Assange over the publication of sensitive CIA hacking tools known as Vault 7. The agency said it suffered the largest data loss in CIA history after WikiLeaks published the materials. According to a September 2021 Yahoo report, the CIA during the Trump era had discussions at the highest level of the administration about plans to assassinate Assange in London. Following orders, then CIA Director Mike Pompeo, who also conveniently was taking pictures with, um, what is it, the MEC, -E -E -K, the thing in um, Iran, right? And the lady that led that, leading the protest in Iran, Mike Pompeo also met with, FYI. Um... The agency had drawn up kill sketches and options. The report further noted advanced plans to kidnap and rendition Assange. I don't know what they mean there, if that's a typo. Um, rendition? Yeah. Rendition's um, when you're like just yanked out, basically mm, kidnapped and taken to a black site. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> you know, Hillary Clinton styled, essentially. Um, and the CIA made a political decision to charge him. Assange's legal team uh, has appealed Britain's high court ruling to authorize his extradition. Um, so this also happened, Misty. I know you had some fun, <laughs> some fun under this, and I figured I'd let you, let you get some more bits. Yeah, in anybody in. got clips? Uh, I would love no to see clips? some clips. Still no, no clips, still no right? Clips. I'm okay. still asking. Um, That's what I'm I was sure going to ask. Seen my request for a clip. You're gonna like, wait. You're gonna wait for the rest of your damn life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I mean, listen, it it at I I if you mention it in passing, even in passing, even if it's just like a quick like, hey, there's a rally happening. Even if it was the after flyer, the event, I don't, Missy I don't, will yeah, still take even if it. Just covered it. I I yes, I'm I'm a, I'm not like trying to be an asshole here. I'm genuinely thankful for that. Like I, yeah. and if you did, like I would love to see those clips. I would love to retweet them. I would love to give you credit for doing it. Like I'm not trying to be an asshole here. I genuinely appreciate literally everybody who helps us raise awareness for this, whether it's for our rallies or the rallies in London or just the case in general or whatever it is. Like I, I am genuinely even people that I, I mean, I don't know why that's not clear. I've given Ryan Grimm credit numerous times. He hates me. I mean, yeah. we don't we don't get along, but he does do decent Assange coverage from time to time, and I yep. always try to thank him for doing that every Same single thing time. With his like, stuff I'm with Tara too. Same thing for me. Legitimately asking, yep. seriously, if if somebody has the clips, I'm not gonna go back. I don't have the time to go back and watch hours of Majority Report from the past right. month, trying to find them. Maybe covering this for three to five At seconds least, or whatever it was. That they we did. don't I mean, we don't need an isolated clip either. Give us the clip that it's in. You just tell me the show it's in, and then I can like fast forward through some shit. Yeah, transcript it. search. 
Yeah, yeah like, like Missy, you said something that I think was very key, and I think this is kind of my frustration with well, people in general, but I think, <clears throat> you know, not everyone on the left, but I think a lot of people on the left is that you have to be so pure as far as, you know, have to be aligned on every single issue. That's and then like, yeah. like you can hate people and acknowledge the good work that they're done. Two can yeah. happen at the same time. Yep. Like, you know, like we can shit on Ryan or anybody you know, in the space, especially if they have shit takes. But if they have a good take, you know, it's okay to say they have a good take. You know, or if they help me hype a, a rally that I've helped organize, yeah, and they are then hey, thank you, like thanks for doing that. I know we don't get along, and I'm sure that it was a lot for you to do that right. and just like forget our beef and do what's right for the cause. I am legitimately appreciative. Yeah. I would glad like you to have one ideal. You. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm like, I'm I, like, you guys know, I am an asshole. Like, I am, I'm very upfront about that. I can be an asshole. I'm very abrasive. I'm blunt. I get all of. It. I'm very loud. I understand. Um, but if you, uh, genuinely try to help us raise awareness for this, help us boost our rally. Um, you know, I, I don't have the access to like Russell Brand or you know mainstream press or like the BBC or uh, you know, I Jimmy Dore. Like I can Jimmy Dore is amazing and loyal and will always help. He's always helped us hype our events. But like I need, yeah. we need lots of help. And so if you're willing to hype our event, then I would like to say like. I don't care, regardless of anything else. I don't care what you've called me. I don't care what you, can, you have said about me. I don't. You can find our you. clip hyping the event on the channel. Just Multiple scroll back clips. there. Yeah, like you it know, just in case, just in case you needed to look for those. You know, like no, those are easy I, for I people to send you. Clips. You and know, I retweeted them. Andy would yep. send them to me. I would retweet them. I try, and I, you guys saw. I like his uh, Sam Cedar supporters are mad at me. For asking for clips and i'm like you guys they're Aww. like nobody owes you clips i'm not saying anybody owes me clips i'm just saying i don't have time to go back and watch hours of majority report and for like weeks now i have been publicly saying if you see somebody covering our rally please send it to me i would like to thank those people i have said that numerous times i don't have time to watch all the shows you guys i just don't i don't i barely have time to like i don't even get to watch all of the people that i like because I just don't have that kind of time. I yeah. certainly don't have time to go back to watch through hours upon yogurt. hours of yeah of TYT or Majority Report. I just don't. It's yeah. not shows I would watch anyways. And I'm not going to go back and watch hours of it to find, like I said, like a very short clip that they, you know, maybe talked about the rally or maybe they didn't. I don't know. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not. You don't owe me any clips. I would just like one. So if it, I can say, hey, yeah. thank you. I don't know why that's. And, <laughs> and Jink, if you got a problem, I can get a ref and we can solve the problem. Oh my god, his thing with Jimmy like, Dore is so 30 minutes in a cage will fix this, I guarantee. Unhinged. Like, Guys, it's, it's so it's, he's a grown it's so ass fun, man. isn't it? So oh, he's a grown He replies, man. so did we. These jackasses don't watch the shows, they just take their talking points for morons like Jimmy Dore. If you can't tell Dore's a fraud, I feel terrible for you. Jimmy Dore fucking covered it numerous covered times, it. and he helped us raise money. And he easy got people clips to, come to, out to the event. Yeah. yeah, very easy. And 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 he had told me, and has told me on numerous occasions. Anytime you organize something, let me know, and I'll help you out. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it, that's the fraud. Right. I don't think so, buddy. Speak, I don't think speaking so. of Jim Jimmy Jim. Dore, never called Julian Assange untrustworthy and uh, alluded to the fact that he was probably uh, working with the Russians. Jimmy Dore no. never did that. Jake, no. that was you. In this video, Jink Uger, the pro-war union buster who took 24 million from right-wingers and DNC donors and featured revenge porn and upskirt pics of celebrities for money on his show, is smearing Julian Assange as a Trumper who cannot be trusted. A um, reminder, brief reminder, WikiLeaks has a 100% record of accuracy. Jink Uger is a known paid propagandist. Who's isn't it crazy? Isn't it crazy? Um, Weird, let's see if it? people uh, remember well, this video. Obviously, it's hard to tell who's uh, telling the truth here. Uh, but lately, uh, I have to confess that uh, WikiLeaks has not had an astounding record. False. Okay, go 100%. on. 100% uh, record you know, of accuracy. Th the way that Assange seems to be backing Donald Trump uh, over and over and over again, oh. uh, it it makes Completely me very seriously question oh. are Assange's... Your, are your leaders that you put on a pedestal also terrible? That sucks. Assange's efforts to actually be a journalist 
and not to be a partisan. And I get it. I get why he hates the not Democrats. to be partisan. They're trying to put him in prison as he's partisan. Okay. Okay. Yeah, right. But but so at the same also, time, so Republicans. Let's be not, clear about and that. And now the Republicans. Anna, you got to Anna. Kudos we to told Anna. you. We told you, Anna. Yeah. Not yeah. again. You're going to get us in trouble again, Anna. Are too, and they have been in the past. But it seems like Assange just picked a side. And 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 look, I, it makes me question uh, his reporting. And so he can't it? even say it and, without and so like. That's the situation we're in it. now. I know. Uh, so what an idiot he now like is he right just now. leaking things uh, that he gets, and no matter what, in which case I would respect that, or is he selectively leaking based on his political motives? Now that that I don't know is. Is there's Jinx selectively reporting? Yes. Or is he fully there's reporting? Zero evidence. People say that. Oh, he didn't leak anything. There was nothing on Trump. He can only leak what he gets, y'all. Yeah. He can only leak what's given to him. Find some shit on Trump and send it to him. He'll leak it. Trust me. Are you kidding? You think Julian Assange is going to turn that down? No. Nope. No. no. He's not going to turn that down. He's going to love that shit. In uh, fact, well, they, like they have DMs with him and Trump Jr. where Julian Assange is like, "Hey, you should give me your dad's taxes." You know what I mean? Like he's trying to get information. It's just fucking like, absurd. Jake's an idiot. He's a turd. He well, he's not an idiot. He knows exactly what he's doing. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's fuck that guy. I mean, seriously. I agree. Normally, I wouldn't cover, but I figured we would only spend so long on it anyway. Um, yeah. But your event was great. Um, so it proud of you hard. for pulling that together. Uh, as among proud of all the people. Already. Yes, I was about yeah, to <laughs> preface. Um, you know, and, and Paula, uh, Suzanne, Randy, Marty, Patricia, Bernadette, um, Chuck. Uh, I'm forgetting people. I knew I was going to forget, but you guys know who you are. Daniel, my good friend, Daniel, Jonathan from D.C. Um, yeah, lots of amazing people and lots of amazing people put in many, 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 many hours of work. It was um, uh, a lot of moving parts, very stressful, and it turned out really good. Best turnout we've ever had. Um, and I'm really proud of it. Well, keep us informed on what the next move is, as always. Um, Marty brainstorming. Yeah. Um, don't work yourself to death. Um, and you always got a no, spot over here. No, this week chilling. If you need to plug anything, if you just want to come on, whatever, it's available to you. Just let us know. Um, I know. So, you know, we're, we also got the Rockfin and Rumbles. you guys give me a behind and, my back. I know, right? Assholes. Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun? It'll get mailed to you. No. You deserve it. You straight up deserve it. Like <laughs> Suzanne, by the way, Colin was there. Suzanne decided that when we went to the little after party thing where we did the Dan Cohen movie and all that stuff, mm. uh, that she was going to announce both Sabby's award, which shout out to Sabby. Uh, yes. She's fantastic. also has an indie media award. Yeah. Herself. And then Suzanne announced the activism of the year or whatever award. Yeah. Like, so but seriously, you, you I'm going to put it back it. there though. I I'm always put it back there so everybody can see it. No, but I think Misty, like I think you to me are a great. I, I know I'm gonna embarrass you, but yeah, like, I hate this shit. Mm -hmm. but, no, but I think you know, like I get frustrated with people who you know say they're gonna do things, but they don't have you know like the discipline in order to and I like in order to kind of commit to something long term until something well. The hope of something happening, even you may not see in your lifetime. And I think, and I get it. People do get frustrated with that. Um, you know, because obviously organizing is like, you put in all this effort and you may not even get to see the payoff in your lifetime. But yeah. I think you've proved, and I think the argument that people are like, I know of you are like, oh, you talk about one thing and that's it. Well, I'd rather you talk about one thing and be consistent on it then talk about multiple things and be like shitty on all of them. And I think I do talk about multiple things, right? Yes. That's yeah, exactly. A ridiculous yeah. creditism. Anyway, that's what you're kind of known for is Assange. And I for think, sure. Yeah, you know, that's my but focus. But I think, I think don't you want like you like you just said, don't you want your activists to be like focused and passionate? Yes. To me, that that's like a prerequisite, isn't it? Right. Right. Uh, right. You I think, think so that too. that'd be like the two <clears throat> top two things you need. Right. And so I think, you know, you are definitely a deserving of that award of a, yeah. that award because you've been very as long as I've known you, uh, you've been very consistent, you know, I try. on this. You know, and I know it's hard, you know, but I think, you know, like doing this work, you know, you don't get any praise at all. You know, like it's lifeless and oftentimes like people take advantage of you on that. But I think it's just 
I think if India was here, he would just kind of say, look, we recognize what you're doing. It's hard what you're doing. But yeah. I think also it should be an encouragement to others, you know, that you're capable of doing the same thing and we need more of it, you know. Absolutely. But we have yeah. So I think you're a great example of that. So I think you're definitely a well deserved well, your, of it. And your attitude about it is fucking like a fresh air. It's so lovely. Right. Like, like it's and, like it, talked, it's you give yeah. if if someone is for Assange, that's it. Great, you're good. Like right. board. everything else, right. you can still criticize, but for that, cool. Like right. it allows you to like bridge divides that everyone shits on us for doing. You know, right. like yeah. like I don't care if you like if you genuine like you trash talk me, you hate me. I don't care. I mean, you could be like Geoff or uh, Ryan Grant, people who have trashed my character publicly mm -hmm. for no reason uh, for years. For you, uh, you show up to an Assange rally, I will like no joke, wa like walk up to you and then thank you for being there. I have no beef with you for that time period when we're at that when we're at that event. Um, th this it's not about me. It's not about my ego. It's not about you or your dumb beef or however you see me or what. Like that's completely not important. Um, and that's to me that seems like a no brainer. I'm selfish, y'all. I would like to get Julian Assange out of prison. Um, and if that means that I have to work with people that I don't uh, otherwise enjoy, okay. Like, and I don't mean work with like people will say, oh, you want to allow like, like fascists no. into your organizing space. Well, first of all, fascists aren't going to stand for Julian Assange. So I don't really have to worry about that. Um, second yeah. of all, no, I'm very picky about who I organize with. I'm incredibly picky about who I allow into my organizing spaces. And even those that I organize with, um, I, I like there's a uh, there's different levels of <laughs> like how much I trust you. You know what I mean? Like you have to be very wary of people when you're in this space. Um, so, no, I'm not organizing with everybody, but if if you want to show up to an event, if you want to help raise awareness for this, if you want to like genuinely fight for the future of press freedom and free speech, then okay, let's do that together. Let's put everything else. Let's do that. Let's do yeah. that. I would like to get that shit done, please. I agree. I, but yeah, I, I think it's, you're also, I, I know you called yourself an asshole. You're like one of the nicest people I've met in the space. Well, I mean, I, like, I'm perceived up. as kind of an asshole and I understand Which, that. I am very blunt. You fight for the right like, reasons. Brash. So like... You're nice yeah, to but me. I understand so, why I would be personal. You know? Yes, I'm nice to you. Yeah. Your experience is not everybody's. You know yes. what I mean? Like I understand I'm fully self aware. Reef. I understand. I'd hate to be an enemy of Misty. That's an... that's what I've realized. Yes. And they should all fear it. you and be afraid. No, um, I don't think I don't want people to fear me, but I mean no, it's but not it's not really about that. But uh, the particular I get that ones. I am yeah, you know? I get that I am perceived in in a certain way by certain people. I yeah. am very blunt um and upfront. And I'm not for I, everybody. I'm here and that's for okay. it. So you know, nobody is for everybody, and I'm not for everybody. I'm and okay if anyone else is here for it, how do they find you? I know you got your most Leaders. of your links in the description at Starcasm Stardust, right? I think you got that yeah, right. Yeah, at Starcasm you. Stardust on the tweeters. I'm a prolific tweeter. I'm there all the time. I tweet about Julian Assange all the time. So if you would like to follow the case, it's a good place to do it. Um, uh, I'm already brainstorming for next ideas. Uh, you have a couple of YouTube channels too, Assange. right? Um, um, yeah, but I don't really use them anymore. I really am taking like I, once I I uh, walked away from TNT a couple months ago. I was going through like a hellish couple of months, um, and I really just backed off of doing my own shows. Other than we've done, I've done some vigils and stuff, mostly just to like update on the event though. Really, um, yeah. but I really just backed away from doing like I'll do appearances. Like I did a shit ton of appearances to promote the rally and stuff. So yeah. I'll be on other people's shows, but I've really backed off of doing my own, and I may go back to it at some point. Um, but it's been nice not having that um, additional workload. Do you workload? know what I'm saying? Like, absolutely. Yeah. Dude, I mean, you're killing it at school. TNT. So, like, uh, I mean, I know. worked. I I went too hard for too long. Yeah, so, <laughs> I went too hard for too long. You guys, I really did. I never yeah. had like there were rare days off um, between no. all of my stuff. So, if you ever need help, you know what to ask. We're over here. CIA whistleblower. Um, he is also um, the co-host of Political Misfits. He's an award-winning author, a journalist. He's an amazing person. 
all around. Um, John Karyaki, thank you for coming to the show. So happy to have you here. Thanks so much for that kind introduction. Happy to see you. So here we are um, in this political point in history where we're on the verge of nuclear war. Um, our freedom of speech and freedom of press is at, you know, the greatest threat it's ever been with the imprisonment of Julian Assange. And one of the things I wanted to mention in your intro was that you are a tireless and loud advocate of Julian Assange. So let's start there. Um, and if you could lead in kind of with your whistleblowing and then what led you to um, being such a strong voice for Julian. Well, thanks for that. You know, nobody has ever asked me why I'm a supporter of Julian Assange. And there's actually some background to it. Uh, so my own whistleblowing was, uh, came as a result of my service in the CIA. I spent 15 years in the CIA, uh, rose up quickly through the ranks. I was the chief of CIA counterterrorism operations in Pakistan after 9-11. Um, I led the capture of Abu Zubaydah, who we believed at the time to be the number three in Al Qaeda. That turned out to not be true. Um, I, I'm sad to say that I stood alone in my opposition to his torture and uh, went public with that information in December of 2007. Uh, as you might imagine, the entire weight of the U.S. government fell on my head, and um, and to make a very long story short, I ended up serving 23 months in a federal prison as a result of my whistleblowing. I have zero regrets, like literally zero regrets, and um, have um, advised other whistleblowers and would-be whistleblowers, especially involved in the national security, uh, in what to do or not do. Um, I urge them to not make the mistake that I made by waiting to hire an attorney I tell whistleblowers that they should hire an attorney first, uh, an attorney who is skilled in whistleblower defense, uh, so that they have somebody sitting next to them, literally, when they decide to blow the whistle. You know, in the beginning, Tara, I, I wasn't so much interested in Julian Assange. I, I had a little bit of a personal problem with Julian in that the initial the initial cache of, uh, of documents released to WikiLeaks by... Uh, by Chelsea Manning happened to include my social security number. Uh, there was a, an obscure cable in there about uh, a trip that I was taking to the Middle East when I was working on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee staff. Mm -hmm. And um, as just part of the normal, you know, travel standard operating procedure, I included my social security number and that was leaked to WikiLeaks. Now, thank goodness nothing ever happened, but it kind of made me angry. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up going to prison a year later, or a couple of years later anyway. And uh, when I got out, I got hired by the Greek government to help them write a new whistleblower protection law. So I connected with a woman by the name of Dr. Sulet Dreyfus, who uh, is the founder of an NGO based in Australia called Blueprint for Free Speech. Well, Sulet, it turns out, was also the co-founder of WikiLeaks with Julian. Um, they went back decades together in Australia. And um, we were out for a walk in Athens one day uh, after having spent the day with the, the Ministry of Justice. And she said to me, why is it that you're not one of the big Julian Assange supporters. I, I never see you ever associated with Julian Assange. Again, this is 2015. And I said, well, to tell you the truth, I'm kind of mad that that my social security number was leaked in that in that tranche of information. And I've heard from other people for whom I have great respect that Julian's got kind of a problem with women. And, uh, you know, I'm the father of a daughter. I wouldn't want anybody treating my daughter that way. And she said, well, you know, I think that a lot of that just is simply not true. I think the police put these women up to that and blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So the more I looked into it, the more I thought, now th this is far more complicated than I had realized that it was. And then talking to yet more people that I respect uh, here in the Washington area, especially people involved in the issues of transparency and freedom of speech and freedom of the press, frankly, I came to realize that um, 
that in a way we're all, I don't mean to sound like a cliche, but in a way we're all Julian Assange. That if we don't stand up for Julian Assange, there's just not going to be anybody to stand up for us. And right. if, if the government successfully prosecutes Julian Assange, who's not even an American citizen, by the way, right. on, on charges under the Espionage Act, well, then certainly the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, any journalist involved in the national security is next. And once that precedent is set, the government can do anything it wants. So whatever differences I may have had with Julian Assange, I put behind me years ago. And, uh, and I stand up for him just the same way that I know that he would stand up for me. That's, that's really interesting to hear. And um, as you're watching our, um, the, the attacks under the Biden administration of our free speech, I'm sure you're well aware of how DOJ and CIA and FBI are all being pretty weaponized with this administration um, to suppress truth, like, for instance, with the Hunter Biden laptop. Yeah. And so I think WikiLeaks and Julian Assange's presence is greatly missed because, you know, um, when the New York T Post tried to uh, raise it up, of course, they were censored. And mm -hmm. and I guess last Monday were disinvited to a Biden administration event. So they're, they're even just excluding media. Well, there's, um, there's talk yeah. now that they're going to be excluded from the White House newsroom which I think is even more dangerous. Right. Uh, I mean, the New York Post, you can agree or disagree with their editorial line, but the New York Post is a serious journalistic outlet. Yeah, it is. You know, you've been an activist for such a long time, and one of the biggest um, recent activism pieces that you've done that dedicated your life is to Assange and freeing Julian Assange, who is being held at Belmarsh Prison now um, for years and about to be extradited and facing 175 years in U.S. prison, which is abhorrent. Um, and you've been such a, a great voice. Could you could you give the audience your website? Um, just really quickly, and we'll have it on the lower um, as well. It, it's there too. Assange Countdown to Freedom, spell it out, dot com, or randycredico.com. That leads to Assange Countdown to Freedom, dot com. And it's six years of uh, programs that I've done uh, in support of Julian Assange, including interviews with him, his mother, his father, uh, his uh, lawyers. Uh, and uh, so many others. He actually helped launch that uh, that uh, program back in 2017. On April 11th, two years later, on April 11th, he was he was renditioned into a uh, what would be the uh, ground floor version of the Tower of London uh, in uh, London. So uh, that's uh, where you can reach me on at least on that program. Also, you can uh, look at all of my stuff at. Uh, uh, Randy Critical Live on the Fly dot com or uh, at WBAI dot org archives. Great, great. So to get back to when you're talking about solitary confinement. I don't, I, I don't know. I know that you've been following the Assange case and yeah. tomorrow oh there's going to be a worldwide event. Um, they're going to have a human chain around, you know, Belmarsh where he is um, and other places in the world. And then in Washington, DC, Misty Winston put together a big demonstration in front of the DOJ and FBI to drop the case. You know, as you know, he's an Australian citizen being yep. extradited to the United States under, under the Espionage Act. And, um, and it's ridiculous. Um, and the charges should be dropped. And that's my opinion. And um, I have that opinion because, um, you know, he published war crimes and, 
and other media outlets published them as well. And yet he was targeted and imprisoned in Belmarsh, which is one of the harshest prisons in the world. And right. I guess I wanted to ask if you could talk to people that are at that demonstration, what would you say about Julian Assange's case, what he's facing and what your thoughts are about it? Well, I would say you guys fight. You fight for his prison, uh, for uh, his freedom. And you know why? Because they're gonna bury him alive. And therefore they will make him as an example for others who would like to talk publicly, who would like to, to who raise their voices against the war crimes. They will put him, like, it's like a, you know, burning a witch. Mm -hmm. And what's, what they do today, they make this case uh, maximum publicly. So everybody knows they, that they should shut up their mouths. The same they did with the people on the 6th of January. You know, many of them were just trying to show their position. Mm -hmm. uh, some charges, as much as they can see, they could be real. Some people were aggressive. This is true. But some people just came there. Mm -hmm. And they are charged for years in prison. And the extreme charges of money that they can never pay. So they can pay, can pay they go to prison. So what I would say to the, all the people who support Julian Assange, because if we guys give up, we all will be next. And they're gonna find everybody. You cannot even imagine how many people they extradited from different countries, how many Russians, mm -hmm. just for doing nothing, basically nothing. Mm -hmm. Even these people, even when they did something, it doesn't matter how the United States can just go to any country and take a person they don't like. Like it doesn't work this way. There should be safe places. There should be a fair court. How would you imagine the jury is gonna react on Julian Assange? Guilty. And even if one person is against, they just put this, all this case on hold, he goes back on solitary confinement and it, it can be uh, until, well, any time. There is no time limit. He could stay there forever. They will just, you know, have, have one person who disagrees with their, the decision of the jury, and it goes on and on and on again. I, I know this because I was given the same choice. That's why people plead to anything, because to have all the juries agree that you are not guilty, that's be real, it's impossible. Look at the, the percent of the people who were convicted, 99.8, sometimes 0.9, you're gonna right. be convicted. You have no, cho no choice. And what they do with this Assange, and they will, I know the conditions, they're gonna put him on solitary confinement. Just think for one moment, everybody who is watching this podcast now, just, you know, lock yourself up in there in the bathroom with no phones, no lights, nothing, just for an hour, two, well, okay, three hours. And then think about, I spent there four months. He's going to spend their life, life in these four walls and nothing else, alone with himself. Like basically each day, you're going to lose your mind and trying to first, you're gonna fight, then you're gonna give up and you're gonna fight again. And you go, you know how many people convict suicide uh, during being, being in solitary confinement? If you compare with it, like the average uh, general pop, general population mm -hmm. in prison, yeah. it's more in 60%. Wow. So you, you can't imagine what people do. I they didn't go realize crazy. that the number was that high. 60% of people in South California. Um, I'm happy to send you a link because yeah, I was for my book. When I came back, I was trying to understand why the time goes by when after my imprisonment, right? Mm -hmm. And I should be fine. It should get better, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I still have certain, you know, fear inside of me. 
fear of solitary confinement seems to be some, some, someone would say like, what's bad about it? You just go in solitary cell and you sleep all the time and you know, you're fine. Some people do it. They will offer you drugs, special medication and your brain is becoming a vegetable. Mm -hmm. You just become a, you know, a piece right. of British word, porridge, oatmeal. Yeah. This is your brain, this is it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But a human being, look at the Bible, is not born to be alone. We need social contact. We need somebody to talk with. We need so, safety connection, those two things. And that's what you exactly. take away. Mm -hmm. Right. So what I do today, and I was writing to the uh, United Nations about it, um, I think we should, um, well, the United States can call solitary confinement anything, but as it is said in Shakespeare, rose is still a rose. So in this case, right, in this case, so all these different names should be taken out people shall not be put on solitary confinement more than 15 days. The international rule is 15 days. And they're gonna put Julian and Saj there for life. This is not normal. people hi everybody this is indy so uh yeah we got jb in the chat jb hey jb and we've got bitch with comrade misty misty's in the chat she she came in to say hi everybody's agreeing with with ryan everybody's agreeing with rome making great points you guys are on points jewel of a conversation 100 percent. everybody's comfortable they don't have a sense of urgency like those of us who are working poor do that that, that was jb's jb's point uh again just everybody is 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 down and happy to see you and this you guys I love me some misty what great. up misty hey misty Hello, misty what's good jb jb yeah, said in a way get no hey, sense misty. of urgency <laughs> yeah and you know what while we're on misty let's talk a little bit about what happens when you do speak out against the empire and expose their embarrassing warmongering secrets like julian assange Misty is a great um, advocate uh, for bringing awareness and education about what Julian Assange, who's still in Belmarsh prison. Um, so when you see that kind of thing, Ryan and, and Rome, like how does it make you feel about activism yourself? Is it, it does it put you off in the sense of, you know, what the danger that it poses, um, or does it galvanize you to to even fight harder? Yeah, fight harder. I mean. <laughs> He could be worse. They could have Malcolm X his ass. Could have Martin Luther King his ass, right? So he still have a way to push his uh, his words. Even even he don't even have to say much. He can just show it on his face. So he still has that privilege to show his words. So this does, <coughs> you know, what I'm saying nothing to me as far as uh, pushing me out to do more. Like, okay, well, how can I get Julian Assange? Because Fuck, I'm trying to go down too. If I have to go down, I will go down for what I said and what I believe in. And you have to be able, like, you gotta know what's coming. You are not just saying, you are not just sitting here saying, fight the power, fight the power. When you are educating, when you are actual, when you actually lead and you are activists in your community and you are being, you know what I'm saying, notice for these things and you're gonna go down in stone for these things, they're gonna make sure that you go down. So either they're gonna kill your, your character or just kill your character, right? So the way, the whole thing, I look at Julian Assange thing like this. He could have been a little bit more smarter. I say that. With the way he was moving, he did that tour. I don't agree with it. I said, I would have said, stay the fuck away from NATO. Stay the fuck away from America and all of their fucking buddies, right? He could have did that. That was on his own, but he still was feeling like me. I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. I'm going to say what the fuck I want. And I'm going to go wherever the fuck I want. And that's just being, you know what I'm saying, a stubborn man. Assange made me get louder because he, you know, he really exposed the whole game. And that's why they're going after him so hard. I mean, I was, again, back in 2016, I did vote for Bernie. But I, again, I was still, like, I was, I was totally just like, 
buying the narratives that the Democrats were giving us still. I didn't have my awakening to much later. But when you remember, it was Julian Assange who released the emails that showed that Hillary Clinton and the DNC were actually rigging the primary against Bernie. Yes. And they were showing that the yeah, DNC exactly. was, favorite, was, was playing favorites on who they wanted to get the nominee. And they were helping Hillary. They were giving Hillary questions uh, of the debates ahead of time. They were using uh, the power of the party to fundraise for her. You know, they, were, pie, pie, they were literally pie, pie, rolling pie, out sure. the red carpet for her. That's not democracy. Rigging a primary <laughs> for your preferred corporate candidate that is not democracy. That is oligarchy. That is corruption. And Julian Assange called it all out. That's why and they're, they're, and like they're making. Yeah, they're that's making why they an that's why Democrats who say they yeah. believe in free speech. No, they don't. They believe in tyranny because yeah. censorship is a path to tyranny and fascism. It is not a path to democracy. So when you're locking someone up who's revealing the truth, who's revealing the truth about the corruption in the Democratic Party and then revealing war crimes that were committed, uh, by the U.S. military, by high-ranking U.S. government officials, and then you lock someone up who's revealing those war crimes? No, 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 no. We are so. This is and this and they're bringing the him US over Empire for, for on espionage charges, and he's an Australian citizen. Yeah, he's, he's not, not even an American <laughs> citizen, so you can't charge him with espionage charges. The whole case should be thrown out. Julian Assange should have a medal around his neck. But who, who's going to do it? Who's going to stand up? Who's going to stand up? He should up? not is, be in prison. Is it the EU? Who's going to stand up? Like. As far as these war crimes go, it isn't just America, you know what I'm saying? The US, everybody, all of these European nations, I should say, got a fucking hand in what Julian Assange was fucking exposing. So of course, they're gonna be like, look, they're gonna run him through these jails. They're gonna torture this man. And if they can't kill him just by, you know what I'm saying? Just by torture, they're gonna get in his head and tell him, hey, if you ever, if you ever see this fucking sunlight ever again, you better not fix your mouth to say something. We own you. You know what I'm saying? And he's you, gonna go through a probation period. He's gonna go. He's gonna be on a tether. He's gonna be. That's on if he arrest. lives, though, Rome. He's, gonna, he's in he's such bad health. In it's like watching a, you know. He, yeah, but Rome, I think you hit the nail on the head like maybe ten minutes ago when you said that they don't necessarily kill uh, these movement leaders anymore, but they kill their character. And yeah. in this new information age we live in, in the digital age where everyone is a Twitter account or a TikTok account or a Facebook account, that's all they need to do. That yeah. is all that they need to do is they need to assassinate people's character. And we know firsthand, Tara knows this, I know this, <laughs> Rome knows this. <laughs>some really good points i mean you were just actually um because we were warned years ago and we saw what happened to julian assange when he exposed the empire's war crimes and he's now in prison and basically being tortured to death in front of us collectively um but you were just this weekend um you know at in dc at a comedy um gathering talking about assange and, and all of that could you tell us a little bit about that yeah, it's a great uh, series of shows that Randy Credico has put together. And uh, if you want to, if you want to see how ridiculous our media has become, if you uh, if the name Randy Credico sounds familiar, it's probably because people know him as who the mainstream media for a brief moment pointed to as the cause of RussiaGate. They believe that this uh, you know 60 year old comedian uh, was the go between between uh, Assange and Roger Stone and Russia and. It's so utterly hilarious if you know the man and know how uh, how kind-hearted he is and what a great uh, you know comedian and, and guy he is. It's just hilarious. But anyway, uh, so he's put together a series of shows for, for Assange. Uh, we did one in New York with Roger Waters and Cornell West and so many great uh, people. I can't list them all. Um, and then we did we've done three here in D.C., with, uh, you know, Katie Halper, Marion Williamson, uh, of course, Randy, uh, Eleanor Goldfield, um, you know, I, uh, again, can't, can't remember and name them all, John Kariaku, of course. And, you know, for those of us who are comedians, uh, it's, Assange is not an easy thing to make fun of, so I don't spend a lot of my time uh, of the comedy portion of the show right. uh, discussing Assange, but because it's, right. you know, it's too, 
it's too real and gruesome to, uh, you know, for, for me at this time, uh, that doesn't mean that anything I think in comedy is off limits if you deal with it correctly. But so, so I generally, uh, you know, talk about other, other news stories, but then in the speaking portion of my show, I, I talk about how important Assange is uh, mm -hmm. and how he, he is the most reliable publisher, journalist, whatever you want to call him, that perhaps has ever lived. And nothing WikiLeaks ever published has been proven false. Not a single word. Compare right. that to CNN or Fox News, where every other minute they have to print a retraction. Well, you know, it was even more stunning is when, you know, they got called out um, for uh, Seal Island. Was it Seal Island? Um, that there was false reporting and some other false reporting. Yeah, Snake, um, uh, Snake, Snake Island. Island. Yeah, Snake Island. And they got, they got um, called out for the false reporting. And New York Times then um, said, well, yes, they didn't retract it, but they said, but this lifted people's spirits. And it was like, what? And that was yeah. the, like the propaganda, you know, they were the, just the, the propaganda. Exactly. The, the latest video, I just put it up about a half hour ago on mm -hmm. uh, on uh, patreon.com slash Lee Camp. But the video is about how the Biden administration and our government has now admitted, and, and Kayla Johnstone covered this well, has now admitted that they are making up this stuff. They've said uh, outwardly that they're in a break from the past, meaning this is not what used to be done. <laughs> they are now taking yeah. a, a feeling or a vibe they had uh, and they're using that as legitimate news, even if a week later it becomes proven false, that's okay. You know, like like uh, all the reports that uh, Russia was about to use chemical weapons and then they stopped talking about it. And, uh, you know, all the reports that they were going to pile bodies at Chernobyl and in, in a false flag and all this stuff ended up being false, but it doesn't matter. It serves the purpose. And now the Biden administration has admitted this is made up intelligence. It, it, it's stunning, yeah. Like how th they're just doubling down on on it, on the propaganda, and just admitting, okay, this is the course of action that we're taking. We're and, going to get inside your brains and and meld them to our thinking. Yeah, and and I just want to add one thing in case people you know have it twisted. I am opposed to the uh, to Russia's invasion. Uh, I'm also opposed to NATO's expansion. I'm also opposed to Nazis. Like you can be opposed to all those things at the same time, and right. so. I am opposed to Russia's invasion, but that doesn't mean I don't want the truth. That doesn't mean, oh, lie to me all you want, and I'll just repeat it like a moron. Like, no, I still want the truth. Exactly. I think I think that's a really good point. And, you know, the truth is what's being lost. And, you know, we turn to independent media, we turn to international sources, and then they shut those down, like they shut down RT. And like in, in Britain, you know, how they, in England, they took their license away. They can't even yeah. broadcast in England. Can you tell me if um, Obama's expansion of the Espionage Act has any impact on this case or not? Or are they relying on this um, antiquated, you know, interpretation of the hundred-year-old um, law? Well, okay, so let's see. Because Obama expanded, Nixon, as you know. Yeah, so the, the Obama had expanded the use of it, basically. Mm -hmm. So the Nixon administration, as far as I'm aware, is the first administration to use the Espionage Act against a whistleblower or two whistleblowers, Daniel Ellsberg and, and somebody else he worked with, right? And mm -hmm. the only reason that case failed, as I note in the interview, is because of all the illegality that was exposed d during the trial that, that got to the judge's attention. I mean, they broke into his psychiatrist's office to find material to blackmail him, with mm -hmm. various right-wing Cuban Miamans, who I'm pretty sure are linked to Watergate as well, and possibly the assassination of JFK. This is another story, but you, I don't know if you know of the link between the plumbers and, yes. and anyway, that's a whole mm -hmm. other story yeah. mm -hmm. um, that people can look I'm into. They can it. read The Devil's Chessboard uh, mm -hmm. by Talbot. Um, uh, and so, oh, and in the end, I think L. Rickman, who is, uh, was he, what was his position in the Nixon administration? I can't remember who what, what his cabinet position was, but he uh, apparently had gone to the judge at one point when it looked like mm -hmm. the case was going to fall apart um, mm -hmm. and, and said, uh, we'll make you FBI director. Nixon will appoint you FBI director if you keep this case going. And okay. amazingly, because they knew this is something he wanted. He wanted to be mm -hmm. FBI director, apparently. And amazingly, this judge ends up saying, OK, this case has been poisoned beyond repair. People can go and find a very small quote. And he just dismisses the case. But had it not been for that, the case would have continued and he would have had no defense because whenever he tried to speak on the stand to say, this is why I did what I did, the prosecution got up and said, objection, 
his motivations are irrelevant. And the judge would say mm. sustained, right? There is no, you know, intent. This is a strict liability offense. There's what you're intended. It doesn't matter. Uh, and and when he this tried to is say, why, this is why Edward Snowden, excuse me for interrupting, but yeah. this is exactly why Edward Snowden will not you know, want to come back to the UN United States to deal with- He's, he's you know. charged under the same laws mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. same district, the Eastern District of Virginia, originally right. by the same prosecutor, I think as well, which mm -hmm. is the same the same district where Julian Assange is charged, Eastern District of Virginia right. is where people, the only employers are the national security states. Nobody else lives there or family members mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. people who, who work there or retirees of people who work there, CIA- right. FBI, Homeland Security, the Pentagon, various mercenary or private military contractor firms, whatever you want to call them, and right, right, uh, right. various other like Lockheed Martin type places. And that's it. Nobody else lives there for any other reason. So that's where his jury is coming from. So it's mm -hmm. a jury. It is like a, a court which has a 100 percent conviction rate when it comes to the Espionage Act cases. We, so, yeah. And, look, and, and as you may know, I had Maria Butina on my show. Um, no, early no. on. Yeah. And she discussed um, just why she took the guilty plea for a technicality of not registering um, because, because a jury trial, she was, you know, it, it just wouldn't have worked and it, it, and kind of the same reason. So, but she described the harsh prison. She, she, he would be going to the same facility that Maria Butina was in and she described being held in solitary and all the, what was that ADX stuff. Florence or apparently. And she, I mean, she described horrific kind of experiences with solitary and other things. And then it, and then, you know, there's a good article um, that, uh, and I'm forgetting, I'm sorry, the outlet I'm blanking, but it's um, the spy who wasn't. In other words, they kind of went through and kind of showed how she was just kind of thrown under the bus. But, but go on with what you were saying, as far as like how this expansion kind of. Yes. So, yes, so thinks. Nixon, uh, so originally, so this is supposedly about defending against espionage, but was primarily mm -hmm. used, I mean, more uh, used against people uh, uh, during Woodrow Wilson's time who opposed First World War involvement than anyone mm -hmm. else. I mean, like I said, like 3,000 convictions. Then there, were, I, I, it kind of like gets mothballed, this law, if you like. Not mothballed, but you know what I mean, kind of forgotten about. Maybe it's right. used a couple of times against people who are actually maybe selling state secrets, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then Nixon uses it against Ellsberg and uh, what's his name, this other guy? Then uh, uh, with Ellsberg, it's, it's wrong that I can't remember his name, but I apologize. Okay, it's okay. Um, then, then a couple decades later, Obama is president, mm -hmm. and you've got a, a number of whistleblowers from the Bush era, and it's going into the Obama era. So, like Bill Binney from the NSA. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, there was somebody else whose name Daniel Hale. Daniel Hale reported about the drones. Ninety percent. Daniel Hale. That's much more recent, though. Daniel Hale. Yeah. That's under Obama. So I think oh, okay. if I recall, okay, Daniel Hale under back, Obama or Trump. Okay. So, That's Obama. so you had a Obama. couple who were who were who were mm -hmm. blowing the whistle during the Bush era. Then mm -hmm. Obama comes in, supposedly on a hope and change platform. Well, not right. supposedly on a hope and change platform. Mm -hmm. And he himself is a constitutional law professor. I remember lots of people made a big deal about that yes. when I was pointing out. I was like, yeah, but most most mem uh, members of Congress are lawyers. It's normal in the U.S. and in Britain for many members of Congress or of uh, the legislator to have law degrees. Right. Right. Uh, and uh, but anyway, he then ends up him and Eric Holder, the attorney general, who mm -hmm. was assistant uh, a AG under Clinton previously. So loads of the Obama people come from the Clinton administration, mm -hmm. previous Clinton administration. Um, and they end up ratcheting up. They use the Espionage Act more often to go after whistleblowers than all other presidents combined. And that's partially misleading statistics simply because very few previous presidencies had actually used the Espionage Act to go after leakers and whistleblowers. Does that make right. sense? So he yeah. just took that and he expanded it massively. And they also started to target journalists as well and threatened them, you know, with these kind of uh, these charges hanging over their head. If Julian is actually taken over to the United States, he will and is prosecuted. He'll be the very first publisher that is prosecuted under the Espionage Act for publishing uh, documents that were leaked to them, not under the basis that they stole them or hacked them, simply mm -hmm. for receiving and obtaining documents without authorization. So uh, does which is bring shocking. every every single journalist, regardless of the outlet, under scrutiny if this if this is the kind of precedent that they're trying to set here with this case? Well, as a matter of precedent, if you're able to prosecute and convict them for publishing 
documents leaked to them, then you can do that to anybody, U.S. Right. citizen or not. Okay, granted, they're trying to argue that uh, because he's not a U.S. citizen, he's not entitled to protections under the First Amendment. They explicitly argued that in court. But he should which, be called in anyway. That's yeah, the, that's but, the, but he should be subjected to criminal laws. The oh thing about how Kafkaesque that is. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we're yes. basically saying. Our lies, our it's criminal catch laws. Catch 22 apply to you outside of the United States or you can be prosecuted outside for mm -hmm. things that you've done outside of the United States but you don't get the protections under the first amendment I would um, guess that a judge would would not accept that argument right because it's pretty settled but it's it wouldn't absurd. matter because I told you the draconian nature of the espionage act it wouldn't really matter because unless a judge goes against however a hundred years of precedent in terms of applying the espionage act they're gonna mm -hmm. say it doesn't matter you don't have there's no public interest defense. There's no journalistic defense. Right. There's no, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, you could be, he could be convicted and then it could be a whole series of appeals. Right. But first of all, look at the courts of who, who the judges that are in court uh, right, right now. I mean, it's a pretty reactionary sets of judges, mm -hmm. loads of them in the federal system and going up to the mm -hmm. Supreme Court. Second of all, right. like this could take years and years and he could end up being suicided while in prison, right? Yeah. Uh, in the United yeah. States. So it's, the key yeah. thing is, no one should have to be subjected to this prosecution on this basis on the first place. How would you like it if you publish something based on hacked or leaked documents mm -hmm. that were, or you, when I mean you, I mean the general viewer, right. what have right, you, American, right, right. Uh, mm -hmm. from the Chinese state, say, exposing Chinese uh, alleged or real Chinese abuses, and then you're traveling to a country with an extradition treaty with China, and then all of a sudden you find yourself under arrest for violating Chinese espionage, act, uh, espionage laws, facing Sorry. up to 170 years in prison, which is what Julian faces, faces in terms of the, the maximum. So that is the reality of what's going on. People just don't seem to fully grasp that. They think it's got to do with the DNC or the 2016 election. Some of them seem to think of that because of wow. the, the nature yeah. of the reporting for the last few years implied that heavily, but it has got nothing to do with that, never did. In fact, the Mueller report concluded explicitly they found they had no evidence that could substantiate that WikiLeaks or Julian Assange knew of or was, quote, willfully blind to any conspiracy between Russia, Trump, etc. So their publication of documents, they said they could not. And if you know anything about U.S. conspiracy laws, they are very yeah. broad in terms of how they can yes. grab you in. And I right. wrote a piece at the time you. saying that the Mueller report said this, but it was redacted. So when it first came out, the public version, okay, the senators saw it, the, the mm -hmm. congressmen who had access to the full version saw it, but it wasn't until they were sued and then sued and forced by a court to unredact because you didn't know which, what was redacted. You just knew something was redacted. Oh, then wow. when it was unredacted, they only unredacted it months later after losing in court on the eve of the U.S. presidential election. When of course, nobody cared, like nobody's paying attention and there was right. barely any reporting on it. And I wrote a piece. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I wrote it for it at Sputnik at the time. And of course, Sputnik being uh, uh, partially funded by Russian foreign ministry, I think it's the foreign ministry, at least indirectly, and ads. Now people can't even see it. They'd have to use like a VPN. Perhaps Americans can, but in this country, you can, you can Sputnik see, is blocked. Yeah, yeah, you can see Sputnik. It is, it is censored. Um, I used to write opinion pieces for RT. Um, mm. You can still find them on Odyssey and Rumble. Um, unfortunately, yeah, they're, they've, the censorship has gotten to the point where there's really no balance to the narrative in the Western lens. And in England, I know that, that um, they pulled RT's license completely. Um, which is, you know, the legality of that. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. In France, they did that too. In fact, in France, they used an emergency. They had only just renewed it, mm -hmm. concluded it could be renewed, but then Ukraine happened. And mm -hmm. basically, you know, war justifies yeah. everything, right? Like during right. a time period of war, it's like, well, this is, is uh, and, and don't get me wrong, you can justify all kinds of things if you're facing an existential threat, but they're not really, this is just being used as an excuse. France is not at risk. If anything, right. you should see the speeches from Macron saying, you know, <laughs> yeah. the Russians yeah. have their own interests that we have mm -hmm. to be prepared to negotiate with. We can't we have to avoid escalation. France and Germany are typically the two countries which didn't which kind of push back a little bit against the the constant anti Russia pushes. Right. I think right. I don't know if Americans know this, but they are the two countries which because how they perceive what is in their own national interests is different than how Moldova will or how Britain will or, or the US will. Sometimes there's a. Uh, things are uh, appear to appear to the average person as though there's unanimity, like we're all on the same right. page. 
but uh, the more you look into things, the more you realize that they're not exactly. Well, I mean, when it comes and, and, to you know, selling you're, weapons, yeah. you're you're up. Yes, yeah, selling weapons exactly. They are and on like the same 40, page. 40 billion. Yeah, that sailed right through the Congress. And I think that this is a, a problem amongst uh, Assange supporters often. And, and don't come for me. I'm not like criticizing or anything like that. But I think that so often people see Julian Assange as superhuman. Uh, and, you know, he, oh, he can handle that. And he's so brave. He's so strong. And yes, those things are true. He is very brave. He is very strong. But he is just a dude. And he has been a victim of psychological torture for over a decade. And anybody who is subjected to that is going to have a very difficult time. Um, so we need to remember that he is still just flesh and blood. Uh, he's right. not superhuman. He's not, uh, you know, uh, you know, immortal. He's a dude. Um, he's a father. He's a brother. He's a husband. He's a son. He's a friend. Um, he's just a dude. So, um, and you know, he's not just a symbol. I think that that's, you know, part of it, obviously he is being used as kind of the figurehead uh, of the fight against, uh, you know, press freedom. Uh, but he is a, a human being and his life is valuable and worth fighting for. Um, and also, uh, you know, the UC global stuff is, I mean, it sounds like a bad spy movie, right? Uh, right. You know, the uh, UC Global is a Spanish security firm that was originally hired by the Ecuadorian embassy to provide security for the embassy and the president's family, in particular his children. Um, and then after there's a regime change or a, you know, uh, uh, an election in Ecuador and there's a new administration that takes office, uh, UC Global is very quickly co-opted by the CIA, funded by Sheldon Adelson, um, and turned into a spying operation against uh, Julian Assange. And that includes includes conversations with his legal team. Um, so he cannot get a fair trial in the United States. That's no. just not a thing that can happen. Well, and he's yeah. not a citizen of the United States. He's Australian. No. I still come back to the original point, regardless of whatever happened. He's not a U.S. citizen, yeah. nor, you know, and we have no jurisdiction over oh, but we do. The but United States can do. do whatever we yeah. want, whenever we want. We are above the law. We are the law. Um, at least that's the way that we see it. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's American you know, exceptionalism. There you have it. Right? Yes. And he's not an American citizen. WikiLeaks is not an American publication. They've never been in the United States. Um, so it is the United States seeking global jurisdiction over information and journalism. Um, so, yeah. And then I guess uh, to answer your question about how I came to Assange, I mean, I'd always been a supporter. I had always read the leaks and bought merch and donated and all of that stuff um, uh, and followed very closely what they were up to. Uh, but I like was really pushed into hyperdrive once he was yanked out of the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, right. I thought, you know, before then I was like, come on, they're not going to arrest a journalist for doing journalism. Like they're going to make him stay in the Ecuadorian embassy. They're going to, you know, kind of, you know, it, it screw around with them a little bit, but they're, they're not going to arrest. They arrested a journalist for doing journalism. <laughs> The first one is an audio visual and we haven't just like we haven't done enough Assange stories lately. We certainly haven't covered enough Caitlin Johnstone. And part of it is because I like how she has Legos in her bag. Well, of course she does. But her husband, Tim has is incredible on their YouTube channel and reading all of her articles. So I kind of feel bad bringing on an article of hers and reading it. It's like, it doesn't do them justice. So I kind of have, I, I love it. I share them and I include them in the updates and everything, but I just haven't covered one of her stories in a while. So obviously I think we, we all recognize what this, this photo is and this is, and she's going to explain in a minute. Um, and I'm going to play the YouTube video, but I first want to read the article and then, then listen to her tell it because it's, it's kind of heartbreaking in a way, but at the same time, it's, it's important for us to, to keep it alive. And she's, Talking about the disappearing of Julian Assange in my wallet, specifically this this picture. So she says in her wallet, she keeps a folded printout of an individual Julian Assange photo was taken on October 27th, 2021. I remember watching that um, on camera or on YouTube. Yep. 
It's blue, blurry, and velvety soft, a photo of the CCTV feed of the prisoner's dock at the moment he suffered a stroke. This is the last known image of Julian Assange. The disappearing of the image of Julian Assange has been slowly taking place since he entered in, into the Ecuadorian embassy 13 years ago. Internally, he was the most, the most surveilled person on the planet, but publicly, photos were rare. And then, for the last three years, he's been held in a maximum security prison where the taking of images is strictly forbidden. Mises. In my wallet, I keep a folded printout <laughs> yeah, of an image no, of them. Julian Assange. The photo was taken on October 27, no 2021. That's okay. It is blue, blurry, velvety soft. And go. it's a photo of the CCTV feed of the prisoner's dock at the moment he suffered a stroke. This is the last known image of Julian Assange. Is that Caitlin's actual voice? The disappearing yeah, of the image of Julian Assange has been slowly it. taking place since he entered the Ecuadorian embassy 13 years ago. Internally, he was one of the most surveilled people on the planet, but publicly, the photos were Julian. Rare. And then, for the last three years, he has been held in a maximum security prison where the taking of images is strictly forbidden. For me, the irony of the last known image of Julian Assange being of his brain mid-explosion is a powerful visual metaphor for how he himself... The idea of Julian Assange, of WikiLeaks, of journalism, of the free press, of everything he stands for, is being surgically wiped from the public's consciousness in a deliberate inducement of global aphasia. This is censorship via amnesia. This is a psychological disappearing of Julian Assange. And this is why I carry this photo in my wallet. Because I refuse to forget. <sighs> yep. <clears throat> she gets me all Good the stuff, time. though. She is a good painter. She's she's a good at everything. She's a good at everything. And we need to hear that voice more, Caitlin. It's good shit. Oh, yeah. It's good. She does. I saw her doing Daniel Ellsberg as well. Yeah. She, uh, um, she wrote a poem called The Wizard. And we <clears throat> played it one night on Action for Assange. And... She just she breaks me. Like Thanks. listen, that's that's also she reads the poem in uh in you know on on her YouTube and it uh, it's really wow. She's something. I I yep. love that woman. I, Indie Media Award honoree. Oh, and yeah, something so else. Indie Media Award honoree. Uh, one of these days, Caitlin will actually get an address to mail your to mail your award to. But she's on the website indiemediaawards.com. You can check that out. Um. Yeah, there's there's the little indie media awards thing. Who are these people? I got one more. I got one more in me. You know what it is. Oh, I do. Oh boy. Oh, now I'm really gonna. Now you're really gonna yep. kill me. Okay. Okay, folks. I asked for this one personally, um, mm -hmm. and we put it out yesterday on Substack, and it was World Press Freedom Week. <laughs> which that, such as it is holy shit yes believe it or not but for all the good it does us right we're gonna go conviction winter in belmarsh mm -hmm. free julian assange oh jesus christ what are you doing to me <laughs> uh yeah, that's great. Yes, Reef does play that before every Tara stream. I listen to it all the time. Um, and having the words up is really helpful. Also, I know Misty has commented often that she loves the fact that we put the words up and you can read along with it because, oh, Cynic is saying Depop. She wants Depop. Oh, <laughs> I guess this isn't such an awful place. I'll, if I'll I thought my voice you. could do it right now, I don't want to I don't want to butcher it. I've also played Depop a lot. Not that I haven't, you know, done these others, but um, deep pop. Not that it doesn't belong on my greatest hits by all I, means. I but, think what uh, we should. I, I think one night, like we'll have everybody else dial in and sing Jesse songs to him and serenade him <laughs> with his music. Oh, I would die. I would love that. How funny would that be? That would be great. If the next time we want to do like me singing a whole bunch, 
I might need to do an earlier episode because once it hits like 11 o'clock too, I just, I start drying. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We can do that. Drop the hashtags out. All right. Yeah, this, um, this piece is really what, what started me and Misty's friendship. I mean, she was uh, arguably the most vocal Assange supporter back when I first got on Twitter and, and still, um, and she, uh, I was watching her streams and started paying attention to the case more. And, you know, it was one of those things where you think you kind of understand it. And then the more you learn about it, you, you realize how, how misled we are about such an important issue and, uh, the implications, the massive implications of, of his treatment and what it, what it means, um, for so many things and writing this piece too, I, I realized that even if I wasn't talking directly about Julian, no matter where I went, it was one step to get back to, to Julian Assange, to tie it all in. It's like, it's like Kevin Bacon, only there is just like no, no more than one step away before you can get back to how this affects everything. Um, If there's anything that you want to protest about or make people aware of or, or learn about, um, your ability to do that is is quickly disappearing, and uh, I I've got some pieces that I feel like get you know a little a little more poignant as time goes on. And boy, if the the last line of this doesn't doesn't uh, just exponentially <laughs> for me, I is I'm I, it makes me really happy to see more people than ever putting pressure in some really big ways lately and i just hope to fuck it's uh uh, enough and not not too late um yeah in that in that vein uh, caroline kennedy was meeting with somebody from the australian parliament mm -hmm. she is our ambassador to australia and this is the first Mm -hmm. indication of any conversation and acknowledgement of the united states even of what's going on so for sure you know biden's due there in a couple of weeks Hmm? yep it's something Conviction, uh, winter in Belmarsh. If you thought you saw your freedom, it was truly a mirage. Freedoms locked a cell away from Julian Assange. Our First Amendment rights are by his side behind bars. And the next voices silenced will be ours. Rest assured, democracy is rotting in the dark. Rest assured, we vilified dissenters, pushed out black renters, and tore down their housing just to build a little urban park. God, I tell you, old America really knows how to leave its mark, how to blaze a trail and leave a hundred scars. Rip your free speech out your throat, demonize the man who told you it was so, and leave him freezing in a cell in Belmarsh, perpetually awaiting extradition thrown to the wolves of claustrophobia and malnutrition. And all that we can hope is that we catch Uncle Joe in a fleeting, lucid moment of his flickering, senile, fascist mission. That maybe we could trick him into thinking Julian is just a sweet, blonde, middle school Christian, and she got mixed up with a few bad apples, slapped with some charges, and thrown into prison. Joe would set him free without a moment's hesitation under one condition that he could sniff her hair before she goes back to school and he goes back to business. But if Joe's just had his shots, then we haven't got a chance of getting past his black and white vision, getting past his gut reaction to appease all of his donors' sick requests and shape policy and law around corporate mandated decisions. So really, all along, I think Julian was one man standing in a tempest with the fearlessness of true conviction. And if his is the only conviction we see after he shed a light on this country's most poisonous schemes all come to fruition, and we all collectively stare at the ground because we felt like our hands were too tied beyond signing petitions— while he's tortured to death for attempting to warn and enlighten admittedly not quite the brightest of citizens. And half of this country just won't take the time to uncover the truth, or they just don't mind, so they're quick to dismiss it and say it's a difficult position. Well, then we're back to the comfort of centrist delusion, 
right back to sleep for the ignorant sheep who resisted themselves into one protracted contusion, twisting themselves into knots to correct all your stimulus check-based confusion, wrapping their necks round their backs as they justify overflow migrant detention or fracking pollution. Then Kamala laughs, and the camera pans down to her shoes. And that footage is 90% of your 6 o'clock news. Except for a feel-good story about a man who, at 95 years young, just made Employee of the Month at Whole Foods. And the $50 gift card means this month he'll afford his prescriptions and meals, and he won't have to choose. This is the machine that a man named Julian Assange threw his body on the gears of for you. So to cry out for his freedom is the least that we can do. Now best believe the feds will serve to muddy up the truth, but rest assured the temperature in Belmarsh is an icy 22 and that Julian is shivering in a solitary room without a view. Rest assured Obama loves a whistleblower just about as much as he loves weddings where he doesn't get to detonate the groom. Rest assured Obama bought the plot where all our First Amendment rights are gonna rot and demanded that they carve his smiling likeness on the tomb. So when you come to pay respect to your free speech rights and a somber feeling hits you and you look up to the sky, the answer will be staring you right in of why and of who. So if you thought you saw your freedom, then they wanted you to. Human rights are mutable, and Julian is proof. Our First Amendment rights are stuck in solitary too. And the next voice silent might be you. That's conviction. Yes, it is. <clears throat> Although they haven't yep. convicted. And I hope they that they don't extradite and they don't have a trial mm -hmm. and we don't see that conviction and no more winters in Belmarsh. Um, yeah, we got to get this guy out. Um, here, here. I mean, they've already taken so much from him. It's yeah. Oof. I'm going to be in Sydney on the 24th as go start is saying, so, yeah, there's uh, Misty put up a link tonight so that you can call to the embassy to call to Caroline Kennedy and make a phone call, shoot a thing over to, to Merrick Garland. It, it, you know, believe it or not, it actually does, does matter. And they listen to that it stuff does. and all that, all this massive pressure campaign. Look, um, um, Lula was in London at the coronation and said something. And you've been hearing more and more. Albo just had an interview on AB on the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. We covered that on How Do We Miss That on Sunday night, where he's talking about, you know, being frustrated and basically saying as much as he can say. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think he's done nearly enough personally, of course, especially yeah. being friends with Jen Robinson, who is Julian's primary legal counsel. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, this was uh this was great. This was like therapy. I needed this too. I'm glad we got to do this. Um yeah, same. We'll definitely do another one. Um Yep. So for the 18 people who are here right now, I'm I'm going to drop a little surprise on you all right now. Um that and we're we're still working out the first debut on INN of when it's going to happen. But um and and Gregory Walker over on the Rockfin too. Thank you, and you're gonna hear this. people let's do powerless nice i'm okay. powerless in a minute i know we're powerless i know how to find powerless Mm -hmm. 
It just dawned on me how long it's been since I've played Powerless, which is bizarre. That's fine. Switching back to the nylon, these first couple songs I was using my uh, my guitar from when I was 10 that recently came back into my possession. But steel strings still just feel feel wrong. We're going back to nylon. Guitar feels giant now. It's so ah. bizarre. I'm like, what is all this? <laughs> How do I, I don't I don't know what to do with my hands. It's like that's like the Ricky Bobby. So let me but... here's just a quick size comparison. Here's the guitar I'm using now. And here's the guitar I used for the first couple songs. It's a little it's a little guy. It's a just little, a little, it's it's a like little a, fella. It's almost like a ukulele. But not, but not the kind of fellow that supports Nazis and gets you banned on Twitter. Oh goodness, no. Oh, Nafo, freaking clowns. Okay. Uh, I hear myself in your, in, in, coming from your ear, earphones. I'll scoot, I'll it's the it's all right. It's all right. Don't worry about it. It's, you know, it's only when I talk and you're close, so don't worry about it. It's not bad. When all right. Playing, that's what matters. So. Let's fuck up some powerless. <laughs> all right, here we go. <laughs> oh, we have fun here. gladly pay you by the hour for a minute or so so you can sign off on the towers where they'll piss on your home and if you feel like you're just powerless to answer them no it's cause you are They'll gladly pay you by the hour for a minute or so So you can sign off on the towers where they'll piss on your home And if you feel like you're just powerless to answer them no It's cause you are it's cause you are They'll gladly stagnate a living wage Snap the chains and bury it Labor slaves in rusty cages Dragged behind a chariot Led by Mr. Racial Jungle Joseph R. Iscariot Fighting over scraps as they barrage us all with variants And BuzzFeed clickbait Straight until we're paralyzed Trying to distract us from the concentration camps That Joe had swore we'd close But only chose to amplify Where they got 50-something kids in cages Made for five to occupy And no, she hasn't seen the camps But Harris swears they're paradise She tells us the facilities are safe And that right down to the women They are regularly sterilized Then she throws her head back And she proceeds to laugh That sort of heartless cackle you'd expect from someone working steadfastly on behalf of the virus and a congress full of parasites and where was i i was busy cashing every blue check demonstrating plainly all the narratives expected from the verified i was busy breeding verbal leeches by the terabyte Train them to exsanguinate the wealthy while they sleep at night Bleed the oil barons dry and bare and say they showed us how to share and now we share alike Tell them I contracted rabies from a feral mic Now I'm just another species losing sleep to noise pollution in these glaring lights Forced to change its habits and adapt to just survive but now it's safe to say that some of us are thriving in the moment Throwing shit on presidential homes beneath the Paris skies So if you think you're powerless, I guess you bought the lie But I can tell they're petrified of our collective might Cause I can hear those gentrifiers weeping at the sight of our collective rights 
And I only can imagine the intensifying fear of knowing revolution's near. And all that's left to do is simply wallow in the thick anticipation of a rabid bite. And maybe one day you can ask your leaders just what that was like before you grab a slice. <laughs> So if you think you're powerless, allow me now to change your mind. Honey, if you think you're powerless, allow me now to change your mind. You see, they'll pay you hourly, tax them each apart, and build a shining tower out of loopholes and cards, and tell you that you're powerless to keep you in the dark, because you aren't. Because we aren't. You see, they'll pay you hourly, tax them each apart, and make you build a shining tower out of loopholes and guards where they'll tell you that you're powerless to keep you in the dark because you aren't, because we aren't. And that's powerless. Tight. Beautiful new flyer with uh, Max and Gabriel and Stella Assange there, and of course pushing the 8th of October. But I can't do this alone with James. We need more people. So now there's uh, global actions happening all across uh, the, the globe. There's something in, I think, Toronto and Ottawa, DC, obviously, is what I'm doing. Um, there's stuff in Germany and all over the place. So um, the one in DC is going to be from noon to three outside the Department of Justice, which is obviously ground zero for the Assange case. Um, and we have just a ton of amazing speakers. I don't think Mr. Assange needs too much introduction. Julian Assange gave us the truth about the empire and we need more people like Julian Assange and we need to protect the Constitution. You know, I, I believe Julian's a hero and uh, he, he, he let us know what uh, the government is doing in our name. You know, what, what is the, the thin line between national security and, uh, and, and a citizen's right to know? what their government's doing. And I, I will say right up front that Julian Assange didn't just step over that line, he knocked the line down. He just said that line doesn't exist, he doesn't care. Assange is a warning yeah. shot. Assange yeah. is a warning shot. Julian took on the national security state and he is being punished relentlessly. You know, I think an important point to make is uh, WikiLeaks actually offered uh, it, it offered to collaborate with the State Department back in 2010 to um, redact certain uh, pieces of information, and the State Department declined. So, it's, so to, you know, for Mike Pompeo to have called it a hostile intelligence agency, I mean, is is crazy. So, anyone who thinks that this is not uh, a problem for all of us, it it absolutely is. People, we got to stand up, rise up, rise up, America. Rise up, people. It's in your interest to support people who are prepared to stand up against the state and say no to criminal activity. You gonna put all of us in prison? The, the truth is the truth. Assange is a warning yeah. shot. Assange is. is a warning shot. And just to be quickly uh, clear with people who maybe aren't aware, the, the different sets are that we had military war logs from Iraq. We had war logs, military incident reports from Afghanistan. There were hundreds of thousands of diplomatic cables. There were. Uh, detainee assessment briefs on each of the prisoners that have been held at Guantanamo Bay. There was also the collateral murder video, which was this this, this very vivid uh, military dash cam sort of video of the attack on a, a Reuters journalists and then some other innocent civilians inside of, uh, of Baghdad. They hate, I'm talking about an institution like the Times, they hate Julian. And they hated him when he was giving them that information. And the reason they hate him is because he shamed them into doing their job. But let me tell you, every corporate media outlet that remains silent about Assange, that will not bode well for them in the future because they could and will be next. The, the situation with Assange, he's still in Belmarsh Prison in London. The British Home Secretary has approved, signed off on his extradition to the U.S. Two defense experts said would lead him to commit suicide, even if he just learned that he'd be extradited before he even left. The UK. He had been confined, you know, to the Ecuadorian embassy in London, basically having sought asylum from what was really a, uh, a setup, a, an entrapment um, uh, plan that had been created uh, and was being executed by five so-called democracies who were really uh, cornering him and essentially entrapping him uh, in a process that's been very well uh, documented by the United Nations Repertoire on Torture, uh, Nils Melzer. Um, so, you know, these cases 
or, or I should say these attacks are dressed up as legal cases. But as Dr. Meltzer and Chris Hedges so eloquently pointed out, the legal case against Julian is a big nothing burger. Assange is the warning yeah. shot. Assange is the warning shot. Number one, most espionage cases are tried in the Eastern District because the Eastern District is home to the CIA, to the FBI Training Center, and to the Pentagon, as well as home to hundreds, literally hundreds, of defense and intelligence community contractors. Second, it's referred to as the espionage court because no national security defendant has ever won a case there. So of course that's where they're, uh, that's where, where they've charged uh, Julian Assange. Most government cover-ups succeed. You know, I've worked as an investigative journalist off and on for decades. Sometimes I can find good information, sometimes not. I often know that, okay, you know, I, I've hardly even seen the, the tip of the iceberg. So the Espionage Act charges against Assange, and there are 18 charges against him, 17 of them are under the Espionage Act, are very clearly about using the Espionage Act to criminalize the act of journalism. Assange is a warning yeah. shot. Assange is a warning shot. Nothing good can come of, of something like this. Merrick Garland actually can step in here too, uh, mm -hmm. but he's kind of uh, uh, just, invi like he's like non-existent. Like I never see this man. This is what's at stake here, the First Amendment. I, I'm saying this as a, a U.S. citizen. My name is Reverend Annie Chambers. I'm saying that America is doing this. We wouldn't permit this to be done to a dog, you know, and here it is being done to the world's you know, most uh, famous political prisoner and, and publisher. Rise up and say, we must stop what's going on in America. We will not, we are fighting for the freedom. Freedom, freedom. That's what we're fighting for. The freedom of Julius Assange, we stand with him. We are fighting that he be free. Free Julian Assange! 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 Free Julian Assange. Three, four. Free Julian, free Julian Assange. They aren't protecting you from misinformation, but hiding the truth. Free Julian, free Julian Assange. We can see the propaganda, and our silence has become the proof. Free Julian, free Julian Assange. They aren't coming for him, they're coming for us by way of him. Free Julian, free Julian Assange. He's an example of what happens when you don't give in. They smeared his name and took his freedom, robbed him of the best years of his life. It's a shame on our country if we don't return him to his children and his wife. Free Julian, free Julian Assange. It's a dark day for press freedom and democracy. Free Julian, free Julian Assange. The journalist is supposed to report on the corruption we can see. Free Julian, free Julian Assange. If he files the press, won't ever be free again. Free Julian, free Julian Assange. Knowledge is power, and what are they withholding? They smear his name, they take his freedom, to rob him of the gift of his own life Now it's a shame On our country if we don't return him To his children and his wife Protecting you from misinformation, but hiding the truth. Free 
Julian, free Julian Assange. We can see the propaganda, and our silence has become the proof. They smear his name and take his freedom and rob him of the gift of his own life. Now it's a shame on our country if we don't return him to his children and his Julian Assange and the Justice Department later indicted him is that he solicited and obtained and published truthful information on matters of clear public concern dating back to 2010 to, to war crimes effectively. The rules of engagement in Iraq are a joke. Adrian Lamo says Bradley Manning sensationally confessed that he'd passed vast amounts of classified material to WikiLeaks including a war log from Iraq containing 400,000 events. You're clear. All right, firing. Let me know when you have it. That's when I heard it. The very distinct fire of an Apache 30 millimeter cannon. All up. Come on, fire. Hey, Roger. And again, and again, over and over. The United States strongly condemns the illegal disclosure of classified information. It puts people's lives in danger, threatens our national security, and undermines our efforts to work with other countries to solve shared problems. This happens on a daily basis. I've watched it with Bradleys destroying bands full of children who were in the way when an IED went off. The destruction of the Iraqi people happens on a daily basis. People just going to the markets, people just going to work, children playing in their front yards. What's your response to that, that he put the lives of servicemen and women at, at risk? Yeah, he didn't, and neither did Chelsea Manning. And none of these leaks have ever put anyone in danger, and we know that because the U.S. government has gone into court after having generals in charge of teams of dozens and dozens of people combing through every record they could find to try and show that somehow Snowden or Manning or, or Assange or Kiriako or whoever did something to put somebody's life in jeopardy uh, and the U.S. government has never been able to show that. One, uh, I request permission to uh, engage. Okay, I'm picking up the wounded. Yeah, we're trying to get permission to engage. Classification government secrets. They're not meant to keep the American public safe from some external enemy. It's meant to keep the American government safe from the American people. And that's the reality of our classified programs, our secrets, you know, and the way that they go after these whistleblowers, these brave men and women, because they dare to expose like these ugly truths about the crimes that our government commits. Bushmaster 7, Roger. This is Bushmaster 7, Roger, engage. 1-8, okay, clear. Come on. Clear. Clear. Warning. Defense disabled. But shoot it. Low left. Clear left. should be free, uh, regardless of where it comes from or regardless of who wants to see it. You know, we should be able to control who gets to see what. In his ultimate fate, if we do not solve what is happening now, what is happening to Julian Assange is a crime.
and he must be free. If we're going to free the world, we have to free ourselves. Got a bunch of bodies laying there. Oh yeah, look at those dead bastards. Nice. Let's shoot. Thank you. If this video disgusts you, it should. It happens daily in Iraq. It was an extreme shock to my system. They didn't look human. I know that they had to be at one time, but the destroyed carnage that I was looking at didn't appear to be. Then there was the smell. The smell was un unlike anything I've smelled before. A mixture of feces, urine, blood, smoke, and something else indescribable. And this looming extradition, he has one more chance uh, to appeal, uh, to apply to appeal to the UK High Court. And if that appeal is rejected, uh, he could be extradited as early as uh, September. Uh, some small time ago he had a, a, a mini stroke and has got a, a consequence of that is a, um, a drooping uh, eyelid on the left hand side. It's very worrying and becoming dire now. Uh, and if the US uh, DOJ wants to have a fight about that uh, in relation to the TPP or anything else, uh, then bring it on. So are you a revolutionary? Well, we'll see if, if, if we end up with a decent revolution. Um, then perhaps uh, others uh, can make that judgment. This man is Eric Levy, age 92. I haven't seen him for a little while. He came to Iraq with us as a human shield back in 2003. Eric, why are you here today? Why are we here? Why are we here? Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you don't know, well, if you don't know, you'll never know. <laughs> now, if you don't know, you'll, you'll find out. Soon, the entire subject and focus of the trial has become you exposed war crimes and we don't like the way that you did it. We're going to shoot the messenger. They're sending a message. This is what will happen to you. You're going to go to jail for hundreds of years and they're dragging him all the fucking way to the U.S. to put him in jail because he showed the U.S. for what it really is. And you claim you're anti-fascist, really? You're anti-tyranny? Yeah, show me, man. At every stage, the law has been abused in order to victimize Julian. He has been silenced. He has been disappeared. Those who committed the war crimes or responsible for those war crimes have not been held accountable. Julian publishes through the courage of Chelsea Manning. Julian is in prison because WikiLeaks is a publisher that specializes in the secrets that states keep the most hidden. Julian revealed war crimes by the US government, the world's superpower in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the fact that it had normalized, institutionalized torture. This assassination plot was as revenge for what WikiLeaks had published. This is a country plotting to assassinate a journalist because of what he has published. Julian has done nothing wrong, and the prosecution against Julian is the single greatest attack that has been on the First Amendment, and that is Trump's legacy. Julian is not a US citizen, he's an Australian citizen who is working as a journalist in the United Kingdom. He owes no allegiance to the US government. Since the 11th of April 2019, Julian has been inside Belmarsh High Security Prison, which is the harshest prison in the UK, known as Britain's Guantanamo Bay. It's also a difficult struggle for him mentally. Julian suffers from clinical depression. He has all his adult life. I have two children with Julian. They are three and four. Our eldest was born when Julian was still in the embassy in 2017, and he would go to the embassy to visit Julian. We kept it secret so a friend would come in posing as his father. And that is the danger posed by the US prosecution of Julian Assange. And I have to say that the time for fence sitting has run out. Colleagues, this is our last chance for a say on this case. If Assange is surrendered, he's gone. How can we talk about rule of law and not resoundly condemn this criminal prosecution and demand his release? You know, across the country, we've learned there's so much support in America from, uh, you know, from normal Americans for Julian Assange. Uh, you know, we've moved all the way up the East Coast from Miami through DC, Washington, uh, Philadelphia. All right, so we're outside Maryland's house for a vigil. Really good turnout so far. This is right across the street from his house. So he can see us. He's home, apparently. Um, he can see us. Hi, everybody. Hi, hi. 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 
Assange, free all hey, political free Assange. We're live on A4A. Really important thing is that if this goes ahead, if this extradition and persecution of Julian Assange goes ahead under the auspices of the uh, Espionage Act of 1917, if that goes ahead, then every news outlet, publisher, publication and journalist can face the same prosecution for any comment whatsoever that the United States Department of Justice doesn't really like or Washington finds obnoxious or not to its taste. I just wanted to say this, until Julian Assange is free, none of us are free. The fight for Julian Assange's freedom is the fight for our freedom. The freedom to expose the lies of government. The freedom to expose war crimes and the freedom to tell the truth. Orwell has been credited as having said journalism is printing something that power doesn't want printed and everything else is public relations. Well, every day Julian Assange is in prison, that is a mockery of our society's supposed commitment to freedom of speech and freedom of the press. There are so many people here that, that really care about this case and care about their First Amendment rights. I, I know mean, people can. allege that I'm Glory Jones, Dingo, but I'm just an anonymous personality, you know? Yeah, I don't know who Glory Jones is. I've never met Glory Jones. Who are these people? My Substack, because I've been publishing every day an article about Julian Assange. Yep. Day, day X is coming up um, a week from tomorrow, uh, the 20th and 21st. So actually in six days, um, they are going to have a public trial, public hearing for two days to determine should they actually extradite him or not? A judge has already ruled that it would be cruel and inhumane to put him into the U.S. prison system, and it would be the equivalent to torture. I don't know why they're still hearing about this. We think it's unfortunately probably still a foregone conclusion that they're going to extradite him and rule that, yeah. but it's nice that we're going to have a public hearing. So if you go to IndyMediaToday.com, that's my Substack uh, newsletter, you can sign up for a free thing. I've been publishing literally one every day. Uh, today's was a, an interview that he did with Democracy Now! Uh, and so you can actually hear his voice sometimes. I've also right. been spotlighting some of the documentaries about his case, like this one that Naomi Brockwell had written for NBTV, uh, debunking some of the myths and some of the reasons why he should be set free, like the, the promises of, of allowing him to potentially, if he's ever found guilty in the end, serve any kind of sentence in Australia. Well, we've debunked that that's bullshit. And there's so many different things. And I'll tell you, I've been, again, doing this for, for weeks now, every day, putting something up. Sometimes it's from How Do We Miss That, showing a clip and tying in how we've been supporting this as well. This is a nice big shout out to Hardlands Media and to Jimmy Dore and the Convo Couch. So we've really tried to include and, and incorporate everybody, including Stella, of course, and Misty, who's been the inspira one of the inspirations for all of this. So please, I encourage everyone, share share these. Um they're doing pretty well. They're getting more likes than my average Substack post, which is nice. And it seems to be bringing more people in. It seems to be raising more awareness. So, yeah. Indymediatoday.com, free Julian Assange, by all means. Um, if he goes, all of it tends to start going. And we know that this is the case. And yeah. we, you know, it, there's a lot going on and a lot distracting. And I think part of it is. They don't want for you paying attention to this. You know, they, they don't want people. There's going to be protests yep. in more than 60 cities worldwide on the 20th and 21st. If you're in the London area at 830 in the morning at the courthouse, uh, there are details in every post, by the way, at the bottom of every post. Shout out to our boy, Big Mad Crab, who made this graphic, okay, on how to call call your senators and what to say. Uh, House Resolution 934, that they that they should sign off on that. And he actually did a video today where he called Bob Menendez's office and and and, and demanded as his, as our senator that he sign off on this. And of course, Bob's staff respectfully didn't. There was a voicemail, so he didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. But when they got it, they kind of laughed and had a drink and continued to move on with their I'm day. Sure they did. Um, I also wanted to remind people, and most people don't realize this. 
Julian Assange actually offered a deal of a pardon in 2020 if he was willing to turn over his sources and cooperate. This was during his old Bailey trial. And this was on NBC News. I don't even remember this myself. Um, but I will say, like, holy shit, he literally, like, was offered the ability to get out and turn it down. Mm -hmm. So, in the end, you know, that's how principled he was about all this. Yep. And has exactly. been. And why we're yep. fighting. Um, and why we continue yep. to every day. Um, so, free Julian Assange. Um, Absolutely. people <clears throat> yeah we do have a lovely guest with us this evening um day x is coming up as you all should know by now um so i figured we'd bring on one of the activists other than misty other than misty this time there is other ones so without further ado we're gonna bring that's on good. kendra christian i think that's how you pronounce things hopefully hi kendra how are you I'm good. How are you guys? Thanks for having us on. Appreciate it. I'm I'm fantastic. So we wanted to bring a bit of one of our favorite writers, Caitlin Johnstone. Um, so she writes the war on journalism in Belmarsh, the war on journalism in Gaza. Correct. So this was when January 25th. So not too long ago. Um, ooh. So she writes, I haven't written much about Julian Assange lately because I've been so fixated on what's been happening in Gaza, but we should all be acutely aware that the 20th and 21st of February may be WikiLeaks founder's final chance to avoid extradition to the United States to face persecution for the crime of good journalism. Assange and his legal team will face two high court judges during the two-day hearing in London who will then determine whether or not the UK will allow the Australian journalist to be dragged to the US in chains for a crooked show trial and cast into one of the world's most draconian prison systems for exposing the war crimes of the world's most powerful government, as you do. Some US lawmakers are attempting to block the extradition from the other end with House Resolution 934, which asserts that regular journalistic activities are protected under the First Amendment and that the United States ought to drop all charges against and attempts to extradite Julian Assange. If charges were dropped, it would not only prevent the extradition, but allow for Assange to be freed from the Belmarsh Maximum Security Prison, where he has been jailed by the British government since 2019, with nine years in an Ecuadorian embassy before that, if I'm not mistaken. So, here's WikiLeaks. Call your reps today and urge them to sign Resolution 934, Regular Journalistic Activities, are protected under the First Amendment and that the United States ought to drop all charges against attempts to extradite Julian Assange. Very simple. Very simple, people. The fight to free Assange is a fight to protect press freedoms around the world since the U.S. is using the case in an attempt to set a legal precedent for extraditing and imprisoning any journalist or publisher anywhere in the world who shares information with the public that the U.S. doesn't want shared. And it's worth mentioning that this fight is not actually separate from the fight against Israel's efforts to keep journalism out of Gaza by assassinating reporters and blocking the press from entering the enclave. It's also not separate from humanity's overall struggle to build a truth-based civilization, nor ultimately from our greater struggle to become a conscious species. All throughout humanity, there are pushes toward truth and seeing and pushes towards secrecy and darkness. In the press, we see both. The authentic journalists like Assange who want all that is hidden to be made transparent and the propagandists of the mainstream media who work to obfuscate and distort the truth. Those who seek the emergency of a harmonious and truth-based society want as much visibility into what's happening as possible while tyrannical powers such as the U.S. Empire and Israel are constantly working to dim the lights. Colin, Kendra, thoughts so far? 
Um, I, I always love reading a, one of Caitlin's articles, actually, when Assange was first, um, you know, dragged out of the embassy, you know, illegally renditioned out of the embassy. She had this wonderful article that the Ron Paul Institute actually reposted where she was just, you know, she just called out everybody and was like, shame, shame. And she's, you know, for us activists, she put, you know, she says it very clearly, um, you know, what's at stake. And you know, there's also, she has a great article for anybody who's interested that just, I mean, it debunks every smear that you've heard about Assange. So I, yes, yep. well said, Caitlin, again. <laughs> yeah, she always manages yeah. to like say the things I'm thinking somehow, you know, it's very nice. Right. So yeah. Colin, you're no, you're no stranger to, to Caitlin. What's your thoughts? No. I mean, when is she ever wrong? Uh, good question. I'm sure there's a couple of times, right? You know, but I'm that, sure her husband that, could come up with a few. You know, you know. Um, but he'd be wrong. He'd be wrong. <laughs> That's right. He, she tells him to read her words. And that's what we do. Um, so here's Stella. Day X is here. The public hearing at the Royal Courts of Justice will be on the 20th and 21st of February. Maybe the final chance for the UK to stop Julian's extradition. Gather outside the court, 8.30 a.m. on both days. Man, we got to get up early to fight injustice. Can we, like, do this after 12? You know? <laughs> like, just me. Um, so, wherever you see domination and abuse, you see efforts to limit perception and keep human minds from seeing and understanding what's going on. It's true of empires, it's true of governments, it's true of cult leaders, it's true of abusive spouses, and it's true of the unpleasant dynamics within our own psyches that we would rather not look at. The less seen there is, the more abusiveness is possible, the more seen things become, the closer we get to freedom. I'm no prophet, but I strongly suspect that our future as a species will be determined by the outcome of this struggle if the impulse toward truth and seeing wins out we are probably headed toward a world of health and harmony if the impulse to keep everything confused and hidden unconscious wins we are probably headed for dystopia and extinction in any case all we can do is fight to make things more visible so that health and harmony become possible fight to make these things conscious within ourselves fight to keep journalism legal in the shadow of the empire fight to spotlight israel's atrocities in gaza fight to make the unseen seen Fight to bring humanity into the light of consciousness. So, you wanted us to bring this video, correct, Kendra? Um, yeah, that'd be Perfect. It's super short. We love short videos. Um, cool. And if I just play... So, so what are you guys doing here today? So my name's Kendra and I'm with Denver Action to Free Assange and uh, we're here today. We're a small group of activists and we want to send a clear message to our elected representatives. Uh, we believe that they have an indisputable constitutional responsibility to uphold the First Amendment and by extension to free Julian Assange. And we thought we would write our request to them uh, where everybody can see it in chalk on the steps of the Capitol. It's just chalk, it will wash away. Um, be erased by the wind, rain, or snow in a few days. But the video we make here today will not be erased. Uh, and we'll do our best to make sure that many, many American citizens and even people around the world who feel as strongly about this issue as we do, see it. Here's the message you guys want to deliver here today. It's a message to our local and federal representatives. We voted for you, we elected you to be our representatives. We want you to listen to what we're saying. We want you to listen to your own conscience. We want you to do the right thing. We want you to step up. Since when yeah. is it a crime? Yeah. A report on secretive, illegal, and immoral criminal acts by the members of our government. To expose corrupt, treasonous members of government sworn to uphold the Constitution for which it stands. To count on, rely on, and trust in the principle of freedom of speech in reporting the truth. To hold you, our representatives, accountable to uphold that principle. Courageous journalist Julian Assange is not a criminal. He is a hero acting in the living spirit of our individual sovereign freedom. We ask you to not be hypocritical, negligent, 
misinformed, and disingenuous. We ask you to do the right thing. Represent us, we the people, and represent yourselves. Uphold your sworn oath to the United States Constitution. We know who you are. We're watching, waiting for you to act with integrity. Step up to do the right thing. Free Julian Assange now. Now. Free Julian Assange. Free Julian Assange. Free Julian Assange. Free Julian Assange. I mean, seems like a plan to me. Um, so you run the Denver branch of Action for Assange, I think, correct? correct? Um, so actually we started on our own from the very beginning. So our group is, um, it's a similar name, but it's Denver Action to Free Assange. And gotcha. we, um, so we're, not, we're just completely independent, but definitely we've been working with Action for Assange from from the very beginning we both kind of started at the same time and like so andrew and taylor took on yeah. those vigils and that's how we met misty and everybody but this whole there's a real core group of people who really you know stepped up right at the beginning who still who we still talk to and still you know work with it's just amazing good people through and there's been quite a few things that have happened you know in these past five years but um you know people from all different political backgrounds and things but that have you know, come together and supported each other on this, this issue, especially. Yeah. So tell me you have events happening on the 20th, correct? Um, mm -hmm. So that's four to 6 yeah. PM, right? State Capitol. This is um, for In Denver. Denver. Yeah. So, yep. and you got some guest MCs, right? Um. I think we'll get to them in a bit. So, yeah, any any specifics you want to tell people on on what they should do, where they should go on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, come meet us there at uh, four p.m. If you are interested in speaking, we have on our flyer now that little QR code, so you can you can click there and sign up if you want, which we'd like you to do just so we have kind of a general idea of how many more people will be speaking. But we do, you know, we always open the mic to the crowd and anybody that's there that wants to have their say, because it's really, you know, that's why we're out there is so that everybody can have their their say, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but yeah, we're gonna have, we'll have some great speakers there. We'll have uh, Jessica Fenske who spoke before at our rallies. Uh, she's um, uh, Forest Mommy on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And she's great. You know, I reached out to her. I reached out to a few people right away. And Jessica was like, of course, you know, I'll come and speak, you know, supports free, uh, free press. So we have one thing about our group that's important is that we are nonpartisan. You know, we don't have a political ideology. We actually have even from our very core committee at the very beginning, you know, people from all different sides of the spectrum who've been now working together for five years, you know, I mean, yeah. everybody in that video, I just, I love all those people, you know, <laughs> and lots and lots of different views. Um, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, so we'll have uh, Jessica Fenske speaking. We also have Dave Ashton with, um, and he's with KGNU and he's going to come and speak and also do a write up for us, which is so awesome because, um, it's really hard to get members of the press. You know, I think, um, when we've had some of these bigger events where, uh, you know, Julian's father, John Shipton and brother Gabriel Shipton were in town, uh, we have gotten some coverage. So, so we're happy about that. Um, Appreciate Dave coming down. Uh, we'll have Jacob Loria speaking, um, and he's with the Libertarian Party. And then there is also a uh, candidate running for Congress who supports Assange, and he's going to come and speak. Uh, his name is Galen Kent. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll be speaking there. A lot of the activists that you saw in that video will be speaking. Uh, we have one activist, uh, Justin, who is in there, and he's great. You know, he does his own little things around Colorado and I'm going to be posting some stuff on that too. So lots of speakers yeah. and then um, uh, we'll have musicians there as well. So I'll have some musical performances. Nice. Uh, the guy who Mike Chappelle is his name. He was speaking right after I was in that video and he put on back in August. Um, his idea was to do a, you know, poetry and like song contest for Assange. So we brought a lot of local 
people together and, um, you know, and since then some more people have become more involved. So it's been really neat. And a lot of those people were in that video, for instance, um, that whole video came about from, you know, a meeting and bros Roland, who I have that posted on our Twitter, if you guys want to see more about that, but that was, I mean, all him, the script, every, he's like, Hey, I have an idea. You know, it's like, nice. okay, I'll get a bunch of chalk and we'll meet there. And then he put that video together, which I think it's just, I think it's so amazing. I think he did such a good job and the script is just, it's perfect. It's, it's you know, what we want to say and, and what our reps need to do. Uh, we do have, uh, I'm just like going off because I don't know how much time. So if you want to so jump got, in here, too. you got all night. I, I could care not. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I'm wondering who's bringing tamales and green chili. I feel like that's important for Denver. You know, like I have, have I had, great Mexican. Dude, I had family. My mother's from Pueblo. So it's like not too oh, far nice. away from you. So Colorado Springs, Pueblo, that 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 area. You know, yeah. So I know yeah. all about the tamales. I, I I miss it so much. Mexican food there is legit. Um, it it really is. We have like, great great Mexican. So good, but anyway. Um, so we have Free Assange news, right? And they are telling you about ActionNetwork.org, right? Links description below. Right, and to donate to freeassange.org. Easy peasy. You got you got an extra two bucks that you haven't given to Starbucks because we're we don't like them right now. You'd send it <laughs> send it over there. Um so this lady, you know her, you love her, Miss Claire Daly. Um she's here to tell you what to do. This is Claire Daly, MEP. I'm hoping that you can join me on February the twentieth outside the Royal Courts of Justice in London to defend Julian Assange, defend a free press. This is the last ditch attempt before the British courts to stop Assange's extradition. Please come along and join the protest. Imprisoning a person for reporting true information is never justifiable. Julian Assange is a political prisoner. Free Julian Assange. I love her. And you wonder why they censor her in Parliament. You wonder why that happens. Um, so, like, literally, they took One the mic from her. It's so hilarious because she's just like used to it. She's just like, okay, I'm gonna just start shouting now. I guess that's what I do now. You know, <laughs> like, I had a microphone. Right. Now I don't. Anyway, um, like I said, links to donate in the description below. Um, so another place to donate, uh, Randy Credico again in the description below, he's doing another billboard truck. I know the billboard trucks have been a great success from what I've heard. So, um, you know, Credico been out there handing out flyers, doing the duty. So, you know, as well as Misty has a second billboard truck again, Links to donate in the description. Uh, she's getting there. 6,000. Easy peasy. Done. So, I'm and I'm, this is probably late number. I'm sure there's more by now. So, Kendra, anyone I'm missing? Um, uh, well, I know you're going to have Halo on, uh, I think, next week. But she's yeah. also putting together boxes and those are super helpful you know she sends those to activists all around the country and they're all you know they are like working boxes you know so it's like stuff for you to do in there but it's super helpful especially for someone that's maybe just like kind of getting started or a smaller group and honestly even for our established group it's been really helpful and yeah. those um to comment on those billboard trucks that's a huge deal in a city like new york city because there are a lot of people you know yeah, even us we are our bubbles yeah, yeah, and they and people don't even know about it. We still people just don't know about it. I mean, Denver is a pretty much a blackout for yeah. Assange, you know? and it's not because we haven't tried. We need to make a so, Assange hot air balloon. That's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. You know, one other thing people can do for the. Um, which a lot of our group, we already have a yellow ribbon there, but there's an activist uh, Truman Human on. Uh, uh, X as well, and he or Twitter, 
Sorry. Um, right. <laughs> it's always Twitter. It's fine. We, 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 you never have to change. Change is bad. <laughs> That's because, yeah, like, no. But he he writes, you know, you send him your name and you will be there, you know, in spirit in a, with a yellow ribbon. I mean, and this thing has just gotten gigantic. So yeah, it's really powerful. Yeah, believe. it's representing people all around the world. Um, so, you know, you can be there too uh, on that day. So. Skywriting, projector stuff, plenty of great ideas, people. Figure it out. Cardboard, Sharpie, you know, basic stuff. Um, so, riddle me this, Batman. The High Court in London has ruled that people in Scotland and Northern Ireland will not be permitted to log in and witness online the crucial public February 20th Assange appeal hearing. They, w they warn to do so will be contempt of court and up to two years in jail. Craig Murray, why? Working on an article. Why? Good question. Good question. How do you enforce? What if I go watch Consortium News's coverage? I'm now heading to Belmarsh myself. Like, I say, uh, you know, if if my Scotland heritage has anything to do with it, they're 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 gonna have lots. Of, they will just overrun you. This is how Scotland works. Like, they, they will just, you know, get a giant two-handed sword and be Mel Gibson in a field. This is what they do, you know? So, <laughs> like, and they will do it in a skirt. So, uh, figure it out. But, yeah, I mean, I just say have them all watch anyway. How many can you get to watch? They don't got that much prison space, you know? So... Sandra's heritage as well. Yeah, right. Is it? Good question. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, my last name is Bruce. So theoretically, I'm supposed to have a throne there, right? So maiden name. Um, but anyway, I think that's it. Any any thoughts on Craig Murray and what he is reporting on that before we head well, out of here? I was just gonna say, you know, it's really it's unbelievable to see that. And that's the thing is that that's a lot of that. I just, I do want to, um, you know, our two MCs, you've got Drew with Spiderland and then also we posted about that, but I also want to read something from Sleepy who's doing, you know, he has his own media. I really, I need to connect you guys so that you can, he can come Sleepy on your Josh. show. You could come on. Your show. Not Sleepy Josh. We have our own Sleepy in Denver now. Okay. Sleepy <laughs> them. I absolutely love him. All the sleepies are great. I guess if you know a sleepy, that's the, they're, right. they're going to be awesome. Um, but he had a good quote and he had said this, this is posted for us too. I just want to make sure that I get this correct. But, um, you know, he had said, uh, he was talking just about the corruption and he said, you know, the problem is that they also see a public that has not responded to protect brave people willing to speak up and expose a corrupt system. So I think, you know, Craig Murray's tweet is, you know, addressing what the consequences are of that. And if Assange is extradited, I mean, that's a completely closed court. It's something that most people, I think, don't even understand exists in the United States. And it does. And so that's, I mean, we wouldn't even, we here wouldn't know what's going on. I mean, God knows what they would come out with there or what kind of jail time that would be or what kind of jail time all the people reporting on Gaza right now would be looking at. You know, so it's really, it's just a, it's a terrifying situation we're in. So we really hope that everybody will come out to join us um, for day X. You know, we're going to keep standing up for this. Judy and our group has, um, you know, we have some uh, other people that I just want to mention because they, they're pretty amazing and have been at it from the beginning. Uh, so we're going to have Bill Howes uh, been with me from the beginning, uh, playing his song, The Messenger, uh, which yeah. I posted recently as well. And then, um, uh, you know, I, I do want to make a point that we have invited every single rep to speak. You know, we've sent them our video on House Resolution 934 and invited them to speak as well. So so maybe one of them will show up. It would be great. Yeah. One of them out of how many? Well, like... we did the ones in Denver onto the rest of Colorado, you know, uh, so. Have fun. Um 
but yeah, you got Drew and Mary, Spider Land, right? They're 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 supposed to be there, I do believe. Um, yeah, Drew and Mary. So, um, one thing I wanted to get your opinion on was we've seen uh quite a few politicians recently mention that in their first days in office they would extradite or um pardon Assange. Does that not? Wouldn't you have to have him convicted first to pardon? No, I think that, I don't think you do because that that came up, um, and I can't explain all the technicalities of it. But that came up when, um, you know, to when Trump was leaving office, there was a big movement to try to get him to pardon Assange. But I think right. what what will happen is that I think a pardon is actually a good thing. Because then I think that he can't be ever charged for that again well, I think, either. I think the thing is that he would be charged for that though. That would which would set precedent legally. You know? I don't think so. I don't I'm not positive. I would look into that, but I think um that I would look into. I don't know. Yeah. But I know that you have to be um definitely, yeah, the charges are there, but I think that it's like I think I don't think is, it's like a you also Belt. run the DOJ, just call them and have them drop the charges. And like, you know, statute of limitations on that means he would never get tried for it again. And there would be no precedent. So I don't know. I, I, don't, you know. I don't know. About that. I would look into that just because I do think there is something there. It's something weird, you know, like a technicality with the with the yeah. law there but a, a pardon's not a bad thing you know but i agree i mean pardon him for what he didn't do anything for anything. you know for writing, writing the truth as a foreigner as a foreigner right you know he's not even an american citizen and by charging him under the espionage espionage act they're declaring every single member of the public as a hostile force yep. you know it's ridiculous so yeah we will get uh next week we'll have Halo and Paula on most likely talking about Boston and DC. Um, so Colin, you will, you will definitely need to clear your schedule. Um, yep. you know, so, but yeah, anything else, Kendra, before we let you go here, make sure we, no. we plug. Um, no, thank you for having us on. I really appreciate anytime. it. Um, if you can't, if you're in Denver, please join us on February uh, 20th. It's a Tuesday from 4 to 6 p.m. at the Colorado State Capitol. Um, just c come join us to stand up for Assange and your, your free press. We'd love to see you there. Great. Um, and I think I have your Twitter underneath you and links in the description below. Um, before we go, let's make sure I plug this. Um, it is day 21. Right. So interesting backstory on the 21st day's post. This is the, what is it? Carmen de Santiago. Right. So this is Julian imagines him walking this pilgrimage every day. Right. As he walks his cell. And I think he said he wanted to complete the actual pilgrimage upon his freedom. So yeah, nice. Can nice I say one thing? Please. I'm sorry. I just remembered it. We also, after the rally, uh, we're having a an after rally meetup too at the Squirm Gallery. So uh, more people will, will be gathering there. Um, you know, just a, a community of people, uh, just freedom loving people. It'll be more music and things like that. So that's a. Um, they've opened the gallery for that, so that'll be um, also after the rally. So it's just really a whole a whole day Great. for Assange. So to make it, you're welcome to come there too. Perfect, Colin. Anything else? Um... No, just um, just want to appreciate you, Kendra, for your activism and you know just helping people. You know, I think what Kaden said is true. I think Gaza has been kind of inundated with in the new cycle and for good reason, but we have to remember, you know, what Hassan has done and that we still need to kind of lift him up in terms of activism for him as well, especially given the possible extritement 
here. So we need to do what we can to at least at minimum let uh, the world know how what Julian Assange stands for. And thank you and Misty and others for kind of leading that charge and helping people to keep that uh, in their memories in addition to everything else that's going Maybe on that's... In right now. Yep. So do do all the things. Make sure to share this. It will be heavily suppressed, as I'm sure most of the tonight's show will be. So <laughs> hit that hit that share button. I don't know if it does anything, but we'll find out. Um, leave a comment. That I know does some stuff. So let us know what you think. So and hit the hit the like and subscribe. You know what to do already. Very easy. Kendra, thank you for coming so much. We appreciate thank what you, you do. Um, so to our to our audience, we're gonna be right back. So don't go nowhere. Um, and we're just gonna say bye to our guest and be right back. So enjoy the Jesse Jet tunes while you wait. How it goes, we won't open our eyes. The first one is an audio visual and we haven't just like we haven't done enough Assange stories lately. We certainly haven't covered enough Caitlin Johnstone. And part of it is because I like how she has Legos in her bag. Well, of course she does. But her husband, Tim has is incredible on their YouTube channel and reading all of her articles. So I kind of feel bad bringing on an article of hers and reading it. It's like, it doesn't do them justice. So I kind of have, I, I love it. I share them and I include them in the updates and everything, but I just haven't covered one of her stories in a while. So obviously I think we, we all recognize what this, this photo is and this is, and she's going to explain in a minute. Um, and I'm going to play the YouTube video, but I first want to read the article and then, then listen to her tell it because it's, it's kind of heartbreaking in a way, but at the same time, it's, it's important for us to, to keep it alive. And she's, Talking about the disappearing of Julian Assange in my wallet, specifically this, this picture. So she says in her wallet, she keeps a folded printout of an individual Julian Assange photo was taken on October 27th, 2021. I remember watching that um, on camera or on YouTube. Yep. It's blue, blurry, and velvety soft. A photo of the CCTV feed of the prisoner's dock at the moment he suffered a stroke. This is the last known image of Julian Assange. The disappearing of the image of Julian Assange has been slowly taking place since he entered in, into the Ecuadorian embassy 13 years ago. Internally, he was the most, the most surveilled person on the planet, but publicly photos were rare. And then for the last three years, he's been held in a maximum security prison where the taking of images is strictly forbidden. For me, the irony of the last known image of Julian Assange being of his brain mid explosion is a powerful visual metaphor for how he himself, the idea of Julian Assange, WikiLeaks journalism, a free press, and all he stands for is being surgically wiped from the public's consciousness in a deliberate inducement of global aphasia. This is censorship via amnesia. This is the psychological disappearing of Julian Assange. And this is why I carry this photo in my wallet because I refuse to forget. That's that's the video, and I, I have it queued up. Um, so let me just switch real quick and turn off. I'll, uh, let's go to the thumbnail for a second. Turn off the slideshow. Click in here, escape out, go here. Bip. Uh, click control tab to change tabs, by the way. Thank you. I think. Uh, You're welcome. All right. Let's I said go it back. As a button on one of my... Here we go. Hey, Mouse, perfect. Mouses, okay. Mice, mice, mice. In my wallet, I keep a folded printout <laughs> yeah, of an image no, of them. Julian Assange. 
The photo was taken on October 27, no sound, 2021. Me, okay. It is blue, blurry, velvety soft. And go. it's a photo of the CCTV feed of the prisoner's dock at the moment he suffered a stroke. This is the last known image of Julian Assange. Is that Caitlin's actual voice? The disappearing yes, of the often. image of Julian Assange has been slowly it. taking place since he entered the Ecuadorian embassy 13 years ago. Internally, he was one of the most surveilled people on the planet, but publicly, the photos Julian. There. And then, for the last three years, he has been held in a maximum security prison where the taking of images is strictly forbidden. For me, the irony of the last known image of Julian Assange being of his brain mid-explosion is a powerful visual metaphor for how he himself, the idea of Julian Assange, of WikiLeaks, of journalism, of the free press, of everything he stands for, is being surgically wiped from the public's consciousness in a deliberate inducement of global aphasia. This is censorship via amnesia. This is a psychological disappearing of Julian Assange. And this is why I carry this photo in my wallet. Because I refuse to forget. Oh. Yep. <clears throat> she gets me all Good the stuff, time. though. She is a good painter. She's, she's a good at everything. Me. She's a good everything. And we need to hear that voice more, Caitlin. It's good shit. Oh, yeah. It's good. She does. I saw her doing Daniel Ellsberg as well. Yeah. She uh, um, she wrote a poem called The Wizard. And we <clears> played <throat> it one night on Action for Assange. And she just, she breaks me. Like, nice. listen, that's, that's also, she reads the poem in, uh, in, you know, on, on her YouTube. And it, ugh. It's really wow. She's something. I I yep. love that woman. I, Indie Media Award honoree. Oh, and yeah. Something so else. Indie Media Award honoree. Uh one of these days, Caitlin will actually get an address to mail your to mail your award to, but she's on the website, indiemediaawards.com. You can check that out. Um here, there's there's the little indie media awards thing. What was that? I don't know. Just the indie media award sound effect. You didn't know? Oh. No, I didn't. Every day, every day. What? Oh, <laughs> I, guess, I, guess, I guess now we have one of those. Or you could. Yes, have We some. could go like. You know, yay! Yes, have um, some. Uh, <laughs> that's weird. I'm trying to make your BOX a little bigger, but it's not working. Anyway, so. Hey. Wait a minute, I gotta go back to slideshow. Hey, now it's gonna fit right, okay. So, the other half of the Julian Assange story, now that I've stalled and trying to get gather myself again, uh, is interesting from Wyatt Reed, of all people. Um, Wyatt mm. posted an article on his Substack earlier in the week, CIA secretly hunting Assange activists. Bombshell report suggests, like, wait a minute, what? I, I thought we already kind of knew mm -hmm. this, but he's saying from late night break-ins and wiretaps to political persecutions, death threats, and conspicuous surveillance, almost nothing is off limits we know in the push to neutralize Julian's support network. So what, what new evidence do we have here? Well, activists, lawyers, and journalists we know linked to Julian were being subjected to extensive surveillance and intimidation. An explosive new report has detailed. Wait, there's a new report out? Yeah, there actually is. Individuals have been hacked, tracked, burglarized, threatened with death, thrown in jails for years on, on dubious charges. And while the identity of the perpetrators has yet to be conclusively proven, victims say it's clear who's behind the campaign of harassment and spying the CIA. What a shock. In a recent interview with Der Spiegel, yep. hacker and internet neutrality activist Andy Bueller Magoon, who links the incidents to the CIA's classification of WikiLeaks as hostile in 2017, condemned the tactics as intimidation surveillance by U.S. intelligence agencies and their collaborators abroad, saying, quote, the point all these years has been to make it abundantly clear, we're out to get you. Yeah. I don't really think that this is there, much I'm of a I'm surprised you didn't say Der Spiegel without going like, Spiegel! Der like, Spiegel! You, you kind of have to. Der Spiegel? Yes. Spiegel! 
Kind of have to. Spiegel and Schmiegel. Precious. Yes. Protect Misty at all costs by all, mm-hmm. by, and by all means, Rick. That's what we're here to do. All right. So so this yep. guy, Muller, Muller McGoon, whose phone was reportedly physically tapped with a field programmable gate array carrying U.S.-made chips and which, quote, cannot be detected with a normal frequency locator, unquote, was just, was, was just one of many apparent victims targeted by the CIA for their association with WikiLeaks, as Trump liked to call it. After the, mm-hmm. of course, groundbreaking website was labeled a hostile intelligence agency by then CIA director Mike Pompeo, who was running for president in 2024 in 2017, those in Assange's orbit reported the unnerving tactics were far behind. Yeah, we've heard this before. By declaring WikiLeaks not to be a journalistic outlet, but rather an enemy intelligence service, the CIA gave itself permission to take the gloves off. And a former senior counterintelligence official later told, of course, Yahoo News and Michael Isakoff, that, quote, there seem to be no boundaries anymore. Even his own lawyer, even Julian's own lawyer, Aitor Martinez, acknowledged that it is technically possible that it's simply a coincidence so many of, of Assange's cohorts began reporting being stalked and harassed by Americans at the same time. But yes, who could actually believe that? Uh, it's a vendetta against Julian Assange for his team. There's no question that Assange, the WikiLeaks organization, and everyone surrounding Julian are being systematically monitored and intimidated, whether supporters, journalists, lawyers, or family members. Martinez himself is reportedly no stranger to the unsavory activities of U.S. intel services. What do you mean? Having served as Julian's legal counsel for the better part of a decade, he also described a series of unsettling incident events which indicate that he's being monitored and harassed by CIA. What a shock. So shortly after Pompeo declared WikiLeaks a hostile intelligence agency, Martinez said that his wife was accosted by a stranger in the streets of the Paraguayan capital, uh, Montevideo, if I remember correctly, who grabbed her by the arm and whispered to her in English, watch your cell phone. Immediately afterwards, Mm. 230 screenshots of photos, private emails, and text messages suddenly appeared on her cell phone, apparently sent from Martinez's phone, which he said he hadn't touched. Mm. Oh, then when we left in a hurry, a man with a plug in his ear followed us at the airport, waving a friendly goodbye, he added. Mm-hmm. Goodbye. Oh, bye. Have a, have a good time. Isn't that what, isn't that what you, <laughs> you're closer? Uh, mm. Good time. Yeah. Thank you. His harassers, bye, have a great time. Yeah, his harassers didn't stop there, however. Martinez said that they've, since been uh, broken into both his office and his apartment in Madrid. Notice how I'm going with the yeah. Castilian accent there. Madrid, so, very good. Madrid. Yeah, dude. Uh, Madrid. So he reportedly had surveillance footage showing three masked men enter his place of work in the dead of night in December 2017. According to the footage, the burglars spent six minutes searching for something they're apparently unable to find before stealing a leg of ham from the kitchen. Okay. Quote, I've handled many delicate cases in my life. I've been threatened, sometimes even by police, but I've never experienced this level of intimidation, he said. He said that the perpetrators appear to be acting at the direction of the CIA, uh, shows why it's so worrisome that Assange could be extradited to the U.S., of course, which repeatedly has insisted that Jay WikiLeaks founder will receive a fair trial, and we all know that that's never going to happen. So this is the end of the Wyatt Mm -hmm. Reid article, and I, I messaged... Wyatt, because I happen to have a DM access to to him. And by the way, I think they're even open if you follow each other and you move to him. You know, I'm going to cover the story. I think it's important on, on Sunday night. Is there anything else that you can add? So he says, actually, yeah, I got the article. The Der Spiegel article was from a guy named Tariq Haddad. And Tariq, it was written in German, but he actually translated it into English. And here's the link. And there's actually a lot more there if you want to take a look. So I'm like, fuck, yeah, thank you. Um, so this was actually about two weeks earlier, uh, uh, about two weeks ago. And it, Tariq, it was by Von Jens Glusing and Jörg Schindler. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. But that, but that says, this says, uh, quote, at one point, a lawyer in London lost her laptop at another a journalist researching Assange's case had medical data stolen. 
The office of Assange's Spanish defense lawyers was broken into in a bizarre way. In Ecuador, a Swedish software developer, Ola Bini, had been held in country for nearly four years on flimsy grounds. Elsewhere, Assange supporters who preferred to remain anonymous reported similar spooky incidents. This is not a surprise to anyone who spooky followed... Spooky indeed. Spooky. This is not a, a, a surprise to anyone who closely follows the Julian Assange case. They routinely intimidate and mess with the supporters and the journalists and the people who are trying to accurately and honestly report on the persecution of what they're doing to this man. Uh, that they are connected cannot be proven, nor has it been possible to determine the authors beyond doubt in any case in, so far. It could be a matter of coincidence, as he says, you know, Aitor Martinez again quoted, you know, it's a vendetta focuses on not only on companions of family members, but also on lawyers and journalists who by law should be particularly protected from wiretapping. So yep. they go back and they're, they're telling a timeline of all the different times that they know that they had tapped him or illegally surveilled him. So at this point, he's living in the Ecuadorian embassy in, in London, where he fled in 2012 to avoid possible deportation. And guess who called him a high-tech terrorist? It's, it's, it's our creepy Uncle Joe. Yeah, Joe Biden. So that was in 2014. People who visit Assange so at the embassy. I, I did want to go, go back real quick mm -hmm. to the leg of the leg of ham. The leg of lamb. Yeah, leg um, of ham. Like, come on. Yes. Do you know how much we're in Spain, correct? Oh yeah, a leg of ham is real right? expensive. That's like five hundred bucks at least. Yeah. Hamoni Berco is like I mean, on Amazon, like thirteen hundred dollars for one leg. Wow. So and that's like they definitely go more than that. You can get some pretty pricey Hamoni Berco. Patricia, um, welcome. How are you over on the rock fins? Hi, thanks for hanging out. Um, so what, what this is also saying is that people who visit Assange at the embassy, according to this new lawsuit, fall unsuspectingly before camera traps, copies of their passports, recordings of private encounters end up in the wrong hands. Among those affected are celebrities such as Yoko Ono, Pamela Anderson, Michael Moore. But, and I think we've heard this too, also, journalists such as Snowden investigator Glenn Greenwald and employees of Spiegel, as well as quite a few lawyers. Freedom of the press, client confidentiality, apparently long, no longer count everywhere in the Pompeo era. And it's really interesting that because he has never been in the United States to break, and, you know, never been a United States citizen to break U.S. laws and hasn't been in the U.S. this entire time, that they are then, you know, they should at least apply all the U.S. laws across the board, and he should be offered freedom of the press protection, but somehow he's not. But they did mention Olabini, probably one of the most monitored people in Ecuador. And this, I believe, was written right before he was released from prison after four years. But three or four security services are on his heels, he says. Yet even without the constant surveillance, he would have had little chance of escaping Every Friday, he has to report to the public prosecutor's office and is not allowed to leave the country. So the, the situation is destroying him psychologically. So this is Olabini's uh -huh. trial. Why is he not allowed to leave? And he won the trial. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He won in January mm -hmm. 2022. Finally present evidence. The fed-up judge asked the prosecution on the fourth day of the trial unsuccessfully. Finally, the trial was adjourned again and again until he was acquitted January 31st of this year. Completely unexpectedly, happy ending, however, still a long time coming since the public prosecutor's office immediately filed an appeal. So that's why he can't leave because he's under appeal. So he continues to be barred from leaving the country. The day after the verdict, he says his surveillance even increased with people who had been tailing him now openly carrying. So, yeah, openly carrying, openly carrying okay. in, in Ecuador. Um. One of the things, yep. and I asked why it's so. This is Olabini saying that he's being trailed okay. by open carry agents of some kind. Um, so I asked why it's so. Like, what what's like the the new part of this? And he's like, well, it's it's that we knew that they were actually like tracking these guys at the embassy, but what's new is that we did right. not know that out in the field, in the wild. He said, quote. Yeah, I mean, we've known they 
they took tons of info and recorded the conversations, but chasing them out into the wild is new. So that's why I said that okay. there was some new information. And this is a good article written by by Wyatt, and I appreciate him doing so. He's he's a good art, good dude. At Wyatt Reed on uh, thirteen, I believe is his handle on. Yep, at W Y A T T Reed, just like you can see down there. Thirteen is his handle. He's also got a sub like my stack. name, but with a D. Right. That's it, just like what Kara calls you all the time, or types you, missed yes. you know, typos. Uh, his yeah. his Substack is called End of. Well, normally M- hers is like her last name, you right? know. Right, it's the like, same thing. Yeah, not like, her last name. Reed the other Reed. Reed. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So End of Empire is is why yeah. it's Substack. So give him a, give him a sub. And oh yeah, we got a merch store, Independent Left dot Shop. There, that's where you can get all this stuff. Or there's no there's a new link called um, I N N Merch dot com innmerch dot com is going to have links to our merch store as well as uh, the Big Man Crab merch store and the inn merch store all from one central hub and we're going to be Shut able to up link- and take my money yeah I know we're going to be able to link all the other merch stores for all the other members anyone who has them we're going to be able to link to that hub as well so that's the reason for innmerch dot com you see I added um, for indies tech tips there's a little little uh, notebook we got the flip-flops for how do we miss that with the bong father on it we also got a tank top in there we're gonna have to get rid of the knit cap because we're getting out of out of winter time now but 